XXXI, Invasion of Italy, Occupation of Territories by Barbarians. Invasion of Italy by Alaric. Manners of the Roman Senate and People. Rome is thrice besieged, and at length pillaged, by the Goths. Death of Alaric. The Goths evacuate Italy. Fall of Constantine. Gaul and Spain are occupied by the barbarians. Independence of Britain. The incapacity of a weak and distracted government may often assume the appearance, and produce the effects, of a treasonable correspondence with the public enemy. If Alaric himself had been introduced into the Council of Ravenna, he would probably have advised the same measures which were actually pursued by the ministers of Honorius. 3731 The king of the Goths would have conspired, perhaps with some reluctance, to destroy the formidable adversary, by whose arms, in Italy, as well as in Greece, he had been twice overthrown. Their active and interested hatred laboriously accomplished the disgrace and ruin of the great Stilicho. The valor of Ceres, his fame in arms, and his personal, or hereditary, influence over the confederate barbarians, could recommend him only to the friends of their country, who despised, or detested, the worthless characters of Trapilio, Veronese, and Vigilantius. By the pressing instances of the new favorites, these generals, unworthy as they had shown themselves of the names of soldiers 3732 were promoted to the command of the cavalry, of the infantry, and of the domestic troops. The Gothic prince would have subscribed with pleasure the edict which the fanaticism of Olympus dictated to the simple and devout emperor. Honorius excluded all persons, who were adverse to the Catholic Church, from holding any office in the state. Obstinately rejected the service of all those who dissented from his religion, and rashly disqualified many of his bravest and most skillful officers, who adhered to the pagan worship, or who had imbibed the opinions of Arianism. 3733 These measures, so advantageous to an enemy, Alaric would have approved, and might perhaps have suggested. But it may seem doubtful, whether the barbarian would have promoted his interest at the expense of the inhuman and absurd cruelty which was perpetrated by the direction, or at least with the connivance of the imperial ministers. The foreign auxiliaries, who had been attached to the person of Stilicho, lamented his death, but the desire of revenge was checked by a natural apprehension for the safety of their wives and children, who were detained as hostages in the strong cities of Italy, where they had likewise deposited their most valuable effects. At the same hour, and as if by a common signal, the cities of Italy were polluted by the same horrid scenes of universal massacre and pillage, which involved, in promiscuous destruction, the families and fortunes of the barbarians. Exasperated by such an injury, which might have awakened the tamest and most servile spirit, they cast a look of indignation and hope towards the camp of Alaric, and unanimously swore to pursue, with just and implacable war. The perfidious nation who had so basely violated the laws of hospitality. By the imprudent conduct of the ministers of Honorius, the Republic lost the assistance, and deserved the enmity, of thirty thousand of her bravest soldiers. And the weight of that formidable army, which alone might have determined the event of the war, was transferred from the scale of the Romans into that of the Goths. In the arts of negotiation, as well as in those of war, the Gothic king maintained his superior ascendant over an enemy, whose seeming changes proceeded from the total want of counsel and design. From his camp, on the confines of Italy, Alaric attentively observed the revolutions of the palace, watched the progress of faction and discontent, disguised the hostile aspect of a barbarian invader, and assumed the more popular appearance of the friend and ally of the great Stilicho, to whose virtues, when they were no longer formidable, he could pay a just tribute of sincere praise and regret. The pressing invitation of the male contents, who urged the king of the Goths to invade Italy, was enforced by a lively sense of his personal injuries. And he might especially complain, that the imperial ministers still delayed and eluded the payment of the four thousand pounds of gold which had been granted by the Roman Senate, either to reward his services, or to appease his fury. His decent firmness was supported by an artful moderation, which contributed to the success of his designs. He required a fair and reasonable satisfaction. But he gave the strongest assurances, that, as soon as he had obtained it, he would immediately retire. He refused to trust the faith of the Romans, unless Aetius and Jason, the sons of two great officers of state, were sent as hostages to his camp. 
but he offered to deliver, in exchange, several of the noblest youths of the Gothic nation. The modesty of Alaric was interpreted, by the ministers of Ravenna, as a sure evidence of his weakness and fear. They disdained either to negotiate a treaty, or to assemble an army, and with a rash confidence, derived only from their ignorance of the extreme danger, irretrievably wasted the decisive moments of peace and war. While they expected, in sullen silence, that the barbarians would evacuate the confines of Italy, Alaric, with bold and rapid marches, passed the Alps and the Po. Hastily pillaged the cities of Aquileia, Altinum, Concordia, and Cremona, which yielded to his arms, increased his forces by the accession of thirty thousand auxiliaries. And, without meeting a single enemy in the field, advanced as far as the edge of the morass which protected the impregnable residence of the Emperor of the West. Instead of attempting the hopeless siege of Ravenna, the prudent leader of the Goths proceeded to Rimini, stretched his ravages along the sea coast of the Hadriatic, and meditated the conquest of the ancient mistress of the world. An Italian hermit, whose zeal and sanctity were respected by the barbarians themselves, encountered the victorious monarch, and boldly denounced the indignation of heaven against the oppressors of the earth. But the saint himself was confounded by the solemn asseveration of Alaric, that he felt a secret and preternatural impulse, which directed, and even compelled, his march to the gates of Rome. He felt that his genius and his fortune were equal to the most arduous enterprises. And the enthusiasm which he communicated to the Goths insensibly removed the popular, and almost superstitious, reverence of the nations for the majesty of the Roman name. His troops, animated by the hopes of spoil, followed the course of the Flaminian Way, occupied the unguarded passes of the Apennine 3734 descended into the rich plains of Umbria. And, as they lay encamped on the banks of the Clitumnus, might wantonly slaughter and devour the milk-white oxen, which had been so long reserved for the use of Roman triumphs. A lofty situation, and a seasonable tempest of thunder and lightning, preserved the little city of Narni, but the king of the Goths, despising the ignoble prey, still advanced with unabated vigor. And after he had passed through the stately arches, adorned with the spoils of barbaric victories, he pitched his camp under the walls of Rome. 3735. During a period of 619 years, the seat of empire had never been violated by the presence of a foreign enemy. The unsuccessful expedition of Hannibal 3736 served only to display the character of the Senate and people. Of a Senate degraded, rather than ennobled, by the comparison of an assembly of kings, and of a people, to whom the ambassador of Pyrrhus ascribed the inexhaustible resources of the Hydra. 3737 Each of the senators, in the time of the Punic War, had accomplished his term of the military service either in a subordinate or a superior station. And the decree, which invested with temporary command all those who had been consuls, or censors, or dictators, gave the Republic the immediate assistance of many brave and experienced generals. In the beginning of the war, the Roman people consisted of 250,000 citizens of an age to bear arms. 3738 50,000 had already died in the defense of their country. And the 23 legions which were employed in the different camps of Italy, Greece, Sardinia, Sicily, and Spain, required about 100,000 men. But there still remained an equal number in Rome, and the adjacent territory, who were animated by the same intrepid courage, and every citizen was trained, from his earliest youth, in the discipline and exercises of a soldier. Hannibal was astonished by the constancy of the Senate, who, without raising the siege of Capua, or recalling their scattered forces, expected his approach. He encamped on the banks of the Anio, at the distance of three miles from the city. And he was soon informed, that the ground on which he had pitched his tent, was sold for an adequate price at a public auction, 3739 and that a body of troops was dismissed by an opposite road, to reinforce the legions of Spain. 3740 he led his Africans to the gates of Rome, where he found three armies in order of battle, prepared to receive him, but Hannibal dreaded the event of a combat, from which he could not hope to escape, unless he destroyed the last of his enemies. And his speedy retreat confessed the invincible courage of the Romans. From the time of the Punic War, the uninterrupted succession of senators had preserved the name and image of the Republic. 
and the degenerate subjects of Honorius ambitiously derived their descent from the heroes who had repulsed the arms of Hannibal, and subdued the nations of the earth. The temporal honors which the devout Paula 3741 inherited and despised, are carefully recapitulated by Jerem, the guide of her conscience, and the historian of her life. The genealogy of her father, Rogatus, which ascended as high as Agamemnon, might seem to betray a Grecian origin, but her mother, Blasilla, numbered the Scipios, Emilius Paulus, and the Gracchi, in the list of her ancestors. And Toxotius, the husband of Paula, deduced his royal lineage from Aeneas, the father of the Julian line. The vanity of the rich, who desired to be noble, was gratified by these lofty pretensions. Encouraged by the applause of their parasites, they easily imposed on the credulity of the vulgar. And were countenanced, in some measure, by the custom of adopting the name of their patron, which had always prevailed among the freedmen and clients of illustrious families. Most of those families, however, attacked by so many causes of external violence or internal decay, were gradually extirpated. And it would be more reasonable to seek for a lineal descent of twenty generations, among the mountains of the Alps, or in the peaceful solitude of Apulia, than on the theatre of Rome, the seat of fortune, of danger, and of perpetual revolutions. Under each successive reign, and from every province of the empire, a crowd of hardy adventurers, rising to eminence by their talents or their vices, usurped the wealth, the honours, and the palaces of Rome. And oppressed, or protected, the poor and humble remains of consular families, who were ignorant, perhaps, of the glory of their ancestors. 3742. In the time of Jerem and Claudian, the senators unanimously yielded the preeminence to the Anician line. And a slight view of their history will serve to appreciate the rank and antiquity of the noble families, which contended only for the second place. 3743 During the five first ages of the city, the name of the Anicians was unknown. They appear to have derived their origin from Prenest, and the ambition of those new citizens was long satisfied with the plebeian honors of tribunes of the people. 3744 168 years before the Christian era, the family was ennobled by the praetorship of Anicius, who gloriously terminated the Illyrian War, by the conquest of the nation, and the captivity of their king. 3745 From the triumph of that general, three consulships, in distant periods, marked the succession of the Anician name. 3746 From the reign of Diocletian to the final extinction of the Western Empire, that name shone with a luster which was not eclipsed, in the public estimation, by the majesty of the imperial purple. 3747 The several branches, to whom it was communicated, united, by marriage or inheritance, the wealth and titles of the Annian, the Petronian, and the Olibrian houses. And in each generation the number of consulships was multiplied by an hereditary claim. 3748 The Anician family excelled in faith and in riches, they were the first of the Roman Senate who embraced Christianity. And it is probable that Anicius Julian, who was afterwards consul and prefect of the city, atoned for his attachment to the party of Maxentius, by the readiness with which he accepted the religion of Constantine. 3749 Their ample patrimony was increased by the industry of Probus, the chief of the Anician family, who shared with Gratian the honours of the consulship, and exercised, for times, the high office of Praetorian Prefect. 3750 His immense estates were scattered over the wide extent of the Roman world. And though the public might suspect or disapprove the methods by which they had been acquired, the generosity and magnificence of that fortunate statesman deserved the gratitude of his clients, and the admiration of strangers. 3751 Such was the respect entertained for his memory, that the two sons of Probus, in their earliest youth, and at the request of the Senate, were associated in the consular dignity, a memorable distinction, without example, in the annals of Rome. 3752 the marbles of the Anician palace, were used as a proverbial expression of opulence and splendor, 3753 but the nobles and senators of Rome aspired, in due gradation, to imitate that illustrious family. The accurate description of the city, which was composed in the Theodosian age, enumerates 1780 houses, the residence of wealthy and honorable citizens. 3754 Many of these stately mansions might almost excuse the exaggeration of the poet. 
that Rome contained a multitude of palaces, and that each palace was equal to a city, since it included within its own precincts everything which could be subservient either to use or luxury. Markets, hippodromes, temples, fountains, baths, porticos, shady groves, and artificial aviaries. 3755 The historian Olympiodorus, who represents the state of Rome when it was besieged by the Goths, 3756 continues to observe, that several of the richest senators received from their estates an annual income of £4,000 of gold. Above £160,000 sterling. Without computing the stated provision of corn and wine, which, had they been sold, might have equaled in value one-third of the money. Compared to this immoderate wealth, an ordinary revenue of a thousand or fifteen hundred pounds of gold might be considered as no more than adequate to the dignity of the senatorian rank, which required many expenses of a public and ostentatious kind. Several examples are recorded, in the age of Honorius, of vain and popular nobles, who celebrated the year of their praetorship by a festival, which lasted seven days, and cost above one hundred thousand pounds sterling. 3757 The estates of the Roman senators, which so far exceeded the proportion of modern wealth, were not confined to the limits of Italy. Their possessions extended far beyond the Ionian and Aegean seas, to the most distant provinces, the city of Nicopolis, which Augustus had founded as an eternal monument of the Actian victory, was the property of the devout Paula. 3758 And it is observed by Seneca, that the rivers, which had divided hostile nations, now flowed through the lands of private citizens. 3759 According to their temper and circumstances, the estates of the Romans were either cultivated by the labor of their slaves, or granted, for a certain and stipulated rent, to the industrious farmer. The economical writers of antiquity strenuously recommend the former method, wherever it may be practicable. But if the object should be removed, by its distance or magnitude, from the immediate eye of the master, they prefer the active care of an old hereditary tenant, attached to the soil, and interested in the produce. To the mercenary administration of a negligent, perhaps an unfaithful, steward. 3760. The opulent nobles of an immense capital, who were never excited by the pursuit of military glory, and seldom engaged in the occupations of civil government, naturally resigned their leisure to the business and amusements of private life. At Rome, commerce was always held in contempt, but the senators, from the first age of the Republic, increased their patrimony, and multiplied their clients, by the lucrative practice of usury. And the obsolete laws were eluded, or violated, by the mutual inclinations and interest of both parties. 3761 A considerable mass of treasure must always have existed at Rome, either in the current coin of the empire, or in the form of gold and silver plate. And there were many sideboards in the time of Pliny which contained more solid silver, than had been transported by Scipio from vanquished Carthage. 3762 The greater part of the nobles, who dissipated their fortunes in profuse luxury, found themselves poor in the midst of wealth, and idle in a constant round of dissipation. Their desires were continually gratified by the labor of a thousand hands, of the numerous train of their domestic slaves, who were actuated by the fear of punishment. And of the various professions of artificers and merchants, who were more powerfully impelled by the hopes of gain. The ancients were destitute of many of the conveniences of life, which have been invented or improved by the progress of industry. And the plenty of glass and linen has diffused more real comforts among the modern nations of Europe, than the senators of Rome could derive from all the refinements of pompous or sensual luxury. 3763 Their luxury, and their manners, have been the subject of minute and laborious disposition, but as such inquiries would divert me too long from the design of the present work, I shall produce an authentic state of Rome and its inhabitants. Which is more peculiarly applicable to the period of the Gothic invasion. Ammianus Marcellinus, who prudently chose the capital of the empire as the residence the best adapted to the historian of his own times, has mixed with the narrative of public events a lively representation of the scenes with which he was familiarly conversant. The judicious reader will not always approve of the asperity of censure, the choice of circumstances, or the style of expression, he will perhaps detect the latent prejudices, and personal resentments, which soured the temper of Ammianus himself. 
but he will surely observe, with philosophic curiosity, the interesting and original picture of the manners of Rome. 3764. The greatness of Rome, such is the language of the historian, was founded on the rare, and almost incredible, alliance of virtue and of fortune. The long period of her infancy was employed in a laborious struggle against the tribes of Italy, the neighbors and enemies of the rising city. In the strength and ardor of youth, she sustained the storms of war, carried her victorious arms beyond the seas and the mountains, and brought home triumphal laurels from every country of the globe. At length, verging towards old age, and sometimes conquering by the terror only of her name, she sought the blessings of ease and tranquility. The venerable city, which had trampled on the necks of the fiercest nations, and established a system of laws, the perpetual guardians of justice and freedom, was content, like a wise and wealthy parent, to devolve on the Caesars, her favorite sons. The care of governing her ample patrimony. 3765 A secure and profound peace, such as had been once enjoyed in the reign of Numa, succeeded to the tumults of a republic, while Rome was still adored as the queen of the earth. And the subject nations still reverenced the name of the people, and the majesty of the senate. But this native splendor, continues Ammianus, is degraded, and sullied, by the conduct of some nobles, who, unmindful of their own dignity, and of that of their country, assume an unbounded license of vice and folly. They contend with each other in the empty vanity of titles and surnames. And curiously select, or invent, the most lofty and sonorous appellations, Reburus, or Fabunius, Pagonius, or Tarasius, 3766 which may impress the ears of the vulgar with astonishment and respect. From a vain ambition of perpetuating their memory, they affect to multiply their likeness, in statues of bronze and marble, nor are they satisfied, unless those statues are covered with plates of gold. An honorable distinction, first granted to Asilius the consul, after he had subdued, by his arms and counsels, the power of King Antiochus. The ostentation of displaying, of magnifying, perhaps, the rent roll of the estates which they possess in all the provinces, from the rising to the setting sun, provokes the just resentment of every man, who recollects that their poor and invincible ancestors were not distinguished from the meanest of the soldiers, by the delicacy of their food, or the splendor of their apparel. But the modern nobles measure their rank and consequence according to the loftiness of their chariots 3767 and the weighty magnificence of their dress. Their long robes of silk and purple float in the wind. And as they are agitated, by art or accident, they occasionally discover the undergarments, the rich tunics, embroidered with the figures of various animals. 3768 followed by a train of fifty servants, and tearing up the pavement, they move along the streets with the same impetuous speed as if they traveled with post-horses. And the example of the senators is boldly imitated by the matrons and ladies, whose covered carriages are continually driving round the immense space of the city and suburbs. Whenever these persons of high distinction condescend to visit the public baths, they assume, on their entrance, a tone of loud and insolent command, and appropriate to their own use the conveniences which were designed for the Roman people. If, in these places of mixed and general resort, they meet any of the infamous ministers of their pleasures, they express their affection by a tender embrace. While they proudly decline the salutations of their fellow citizens, who are not permitted to aspire above the honor of kissing their hands, or their knees. As soon as they have indulged themselves in the refreshment of the bath, they resume their rings, and the other ensigns of their dignity, select from their private wardrobe of the finest linen, such as might suffice for a dozen persons. The garments the most agreeable to their fancy, and maintain till their departure the same haughty demeanor. Which perhaps might have been excused in the great Marcellus, after the conquest of Syracuse. Sometimes, indeed, these heroes undertake more arduous achievements. They visit their estates in Italy, and procure themselves, by the toil of servile hands, the amusements of the chase. 3769 If at any time, but more especially on a hot day, they have courage to sail, in their painted galleys, from the Lucran Lake 3770 to their elegant villas on the seacoast of Putili and Caeda. 3771 They compare their own expeditions to the marches of Caesar and Alexander. 
yet should a fly presume to settle on the silken folds of their gilded umbrellas. Should a sunbeam penetrate through some unguarded and imperceptible chink, they deplore their intolerable hardships, and lament, in affected language, that they were not born in the land of the Sumerians, 3772 The regions of eternal darkness. In these journeys into the country, 3773 The whole body of the household marches with their master. In the same manner as the cavalry and infantry, the heavy and the light armed troops, the advanced guard and the rear, are marshaled by the skill of their military leaders. So the domestic officers, who bear a rod, as an ensign of authority, distribute and arrange the numerous train of slaves and attendants. The baggage and wardrobe move in the front. And are immediately followed by a multitude of cooks, and inferior ministers, employed in the service of the kitchens, and of the table. The main body is composed of a promiscuous crowd of slaves, increased by the accidental concourse of idle or dependent plebeians. The rear is closed by the favorite band of eunuchs, distributed from age to youth, according to the order of seniority. Their numbers and their deformity excite the horror of the indignant spectators, who are ready to execrate the memory of Semiramis, for the cruel art which she invented, of frustrating the purposes of nature. And of blasting in the bud the hopes of future generations. In the exercise of domestic jurisdiction, the nobles of Rome express an exquisite sensibility for any personal injury, and a contemptuous indifference for the rest of the human species. When they have called for warm water, if a slave has been tardy in his obedience, he is instantly chastised with three hundred lashes, but should the same slave commit a willful murder, the master will mildly observe, that he is a worthless fellow. But that, if he repeats the offence, he shall not escape punishment. Hospitality was formerly the virtue of the Romans, and every stranger, who could plead either merit or misfortune, was relieved or rewarded by their generosity. At present, if a foreigner, perhaps of no contemptible rank, is introduced to one of the proud and wealthy senators, he is welcomed indeed in the first audience, with such warm professions, and such kind inquiries, that he retires. Enchanted with the affability of his illustrious friend, and full of regret that he had so long delayed his journey to Rome, the active seat of manners, as well as of empire. Secure of a favorable reception, he repeats his visit the ensuing day, and is mortified by the discovery, that his person, his name, and his country, are already forgotten. If he still has resolution to persevere, he is gradually numbered in the train of dependence, and obtains the permission to pay his assiduous and unprofitable court to a haughty patron, incapable of gratitude or friendship. Who scarcely deigns to remark his presence, his departure, or his return. Whenever the rich prepare a solemn and popular entertainment, 3774 whenever they celebrate, with profuse and pernicious luxury, their private banquets. The choice of the guests is the subject of anxious deliberation. The modest, the sober, and the learned, are seldom preferred. And the nomenclators, who are commonly swayed by interested motives, have the address to insert, in the list of invitations, the obscure names of the most worthless of mankind. But the frequent and familiar companions of the great, are those parasites, who practice the most useful of all arts, the art of flattery, who eagerly applaud each word, and every action, of their immortal patron. Gaze with rapture on his marble columns and variegated pavements, and strenuously praise the pomp and elegance which he is taught to consider as a part of his personal merit. At the Roman tables, the birds, the squirrels, 3775 or the fish, which appear of an uncommon size, are contemplated with curious attention, a pair of scales is accurately applied, to ascertain their real weight. And, while the more rational guests are disgusted by the vain and tedious repetition, notaries are summoned to attest, by an authentic record, the truth of such a marvelous event. Another method of introduction into the houses and society of the great, is derived from the profession of gaming, or, as it is more politely styled, of play. The confederates are united by a strict and indissoluble bond of friendship, or rather of conspiracy. A superior degree of skill in the tesserarian art, which may be interpreted the game of dice and tables, 3776 is a sure road to wealth and reputation. A master of that sublime science, who in a supper, or assembly, is placed below a magistrate, 
displays in his countenance the surprise and indignation which Cato might be supposed to feel. When he was refused the praetorship by the votes of a capricious people. The acquisition of knowledge seldom engages the curiosity of nobles, who abhor the fatigue, and disdain the advantages, of study. And the only books which they peruse are the satires of Juvenal, and the verbose and fabulous histories of Marius Maximus. 3777 The libraries, which they have inherited from their fathers, are secluded, like dreary sepulchres, from the light of day. 3778 But the costly instruments of the theatre, flutes, and enormous lyres, and hydraulic organs, are constructed for their use, and the harmony of vocal and instrumental music is incessantly repeated in the palaces of Rome. In those palaces, sound is preferred to sense, and the care of the body to that of the mind. It is allowed as a salutary maxim, that the light and frivolous suspicion of a contagious malady, is of sufficient weight to excuse the visits of the most intimate friends. And even the servants, who are dispatched to make the decent inquiries, are not suffered to return home, till they have undergone the ceremony of a previous ablution. Yet this selfish and unmanly delicacy occasionally yields to the more imperious passion of avarice. The prospect of gain will urge a rich and gouty senator as far as Spoleto. Every sentiment of arrogance and dignity is subdued by the hopes of an inheritance, or even of a legacy, and a wealthy childless citizen is the most powerful of the Romans. The art of obtaining the signature of a favorable testament, and sometimes of hastening the moment of its execution, is perfectly understood. And it has happened, that in the same house, though in different apartments, a husband and a wife, with the laudable design of overreaching each other, have summoned their respective lawyers, to declare, at the same time, their mutual, but contradictory, intentions. The distress which follows and chastises extravagant luxury, often reduces the great to the use of the most humiliating expedients. When they desire to borrow, they employ the base and supplicating style of the slave in the comedy. But when they are called upon to pay, they assume the royal and tragic declamation of the grandsons of Hercules. If the demand is repeated, they readily procure some trusty sycophant, instructed to maintain a charge of poison, or magic, against the insolent creditor, who is seldom released from prison, till he has signed a discharge of the whole debt. These vices, which degrade the moral character of the Romans, are mixed with a puerile superstition, that disgraces their understanding. They listen with confidence to the predictions of Heruspices, who pretend to read, in the entrails of victims, the signs of future greatness and prosperity. And there are many who do not presume either to bathe, or to dine, or to appear in public, till they have diligently consulted, according to the rules of astrology, the situation of Mercury, and the aspect of the moon. 3779 It is singular enough, that this vain credulity may often be discovered among the profane skeptics, who impiously doubt, or deny, the existence of a celestial power. In populous cities, which are the seat of commerce and manufactures, the middle ranks of inhabitants, who derive their subsistence from the dexterity or labor of their hands, are commonly the most prolific, the most useful, and, in that sense, the most respectable part of the community. But the plebeians of Rome, who disdained such sedentary and servile arts, had been oppressed from the earliest times by the weight of debt and usury. And the husbandman, during the term of his military service, was obliged to abandon the cultivation of his farm. 3780 The lands of Italy which had been originally divided among the families of free and indigent proprietors, were insensibly purchased or usurped by the avarice of the nobles. And in the age which preceded the fall of the Republic, it was computed that only two thousand citizens were possessed of an independent substance. 3781 Yet as long as the people bestowed, by their suffrages, the honors of the state, the command of the legions, and the administration of wealthy provinces, their conscious pride alleviated in some measure, the hardships of poverty. And their wants were seasonably supplied by the ambitious liberality of the candidates, who aspired to secure a venal majority in the thirty-five tribes, or the hundred and ninety-three centuries, of Rome. But when the prodigal commons had not only imprudently alienated the use, but the inheritance of power, they sunk, under the reign of the Caesars, into a vile and wretched populace, which must, in a few generations, have been totally extinguished. If it had not been continually recruited by the manumission of slaves, 
and the influx of strangers. As early as the time of Hadrian, it was the just complaint of the ingenuous natives, that the capital had attracted the vices of the universe, and the manners of the most opposite nations. The intemperance of the Gauls, the cunning and levity of the Greeks, the savage obstinacy of the Egyptians and Jews, the servile temper of the Asiatics, and the dissolute, effeminate prostitution of the Syrians, were mingled in the various multitude, which, under the proud and false denomination of Romans, presumed to despise their fellow subjects, and even their sovereigns, who dwelt beyond the precincts of the Eternal City. 3782 Yet the name of that city was still pronounced with respect, the frequent and capricious tumults of its inhabitants were indulged with impunity. And the successors of Constantine, instead of crushing the last remains of the democracy by the strong arm of military power, embraced the mild policy of Augustus, and studied to relieve the poverty, and to amuse the idleness of an innumerable people. 3783 I. For the convenience of the lazy plebeians, the monthly distributions of corn were converted into a daily allowance of bread, a great number of ovens were constructed and maintained at the public expense. And at the appointed hour, each citizen, who was furnished with a ticket, ascended the flight of steps, which had been assigned to his peculiar quarter or division, and received, either as a gift, or at a very low price. A loaf of bread of the weight of three pounds, for the use of his family. Two, the forest of Lucania, whose acorns fattened large droves of wild hogs 3784 afforded, as a species of tribute, a plentiful supply of cheap and wholesome meat. During five months of the year, a regular allowance of bacon was distributed to the poorer citizens. And the annual consumption of the capital, at a time when it was much declined from its former luster, was ascertained, by an edict from Valentinian III, at three million six hundred and twenty-eight thousand pounds point thirty-seven eighty-five three. In the manners of antiquity, the use of oil was indispensable for the lamp, as well as for the bath. And the annual tax, which was imposed on Africa for the benefit of Rome, amounted to the weight of three millions of pounds, to the measure, perhaps, of three hundred thousand English gallons. 4. The anxiety of Augustus to provide the metropolis with sufficient plenty of corn, was not extended beyond that necessary article of human subsistence. And when the popular clamor accused the dearness and scarcity of wine, a proclamation was issued, by the grave reformer, to remind his subjects that no man could reasonably complain of thirst. Since the aqueducts of Agrippa had introduced into the city so many copious streams of pure and salubrious water. 3786 This rigid sobriety was insensibly relaxed, and, although the generous design of Aurelian 3787 does not appear to have been executed in its full extent, the use of wine was allowed on very easy and liberal terms. The administration of the public cellars was delegated to a magistrate of honorable rank, and a considerable part of the vintage of Campania was reserved for the fortunate inhabitants of Rome. The stupendous aqueducts, so justly celebrated by the praises of Augustus himself, replenished the thermo, or baths, which had been constructed in every part of the city, with imperial magnificence. The baths of Antoninus Caracalla, which were open, at stated hours, for the indiscriminate service of the senators and the people, contained above sixteen hundred seats of marble. And more than three thousand were reckoned in the baths of Diocletian. 3788 The walls of the lofty apartments were covered with curious mosaics, that imitated the art of the pencil in the elegance of design, and the variety of colors. The Egyptian granite was beautifully encrusted with the precious green marble of Numidia, the perpetual stream of hot water was poured into the capacious basins, through so many wide mouths of bright and massy silver. And the meanest Roman could purchase, with a small copper coin, the daily enjoyment of a scene of pomp and luxury, which might excite the envy of the kings of Asia. 3789 From these stately palaces issued a swarm of dirty and ragged plebeians, without shoes and without a mantle, who loitered away whole days in the street of Forum, to hear news and to hold disputes. Who dissipated in extravagant gaming, the miserable pittance of their wives and children, and spent the hours of the night in the obscure taverns, and brothels, in the indulgence of gross and vulgar sensuality. 3790. 
but the most lively and splendid amusement of the idle multitude, depended on the frequent exhibition of public games and spectacles. The piety of Christian princes had suppressed the inhuman combats of gladiators. But the Roman people still considered the circus as their home, their temple, and the seat of the Republic. The impatient crowd rushed at the dawn of day to secure their places, and there were many who passed a sleepless and anxious night in the adjacent porticos. From the morning to the evening, careless of the sun, or of the rain, the spectators, who sometimes amounted to the number of four hundred thousand, remained in eager attention. Their eyes fixed on the horses and charioteers, their minds agitated with hope and fear, for the success of the colors which they espoused, and the happiness of Rome appeared to hang on the event of a race. 3791 The same immoderate ardor inspired their clamors and their applause, as often as they were entertained with the hunting of wild beasts, and the various modes of theatrical representation. These representations in modern capitals may deserve to be considered as a pure and elegant school of taste, and perhaps of virtue. But the tragic and comic muse of the Romans, who seldom aspired beyond the imitation of Attic genius, 3792 had been almost totally silent since the fall of the Republic. 3793 and their place was unworthily occupied by licentious farce, effeminate music, and splendid pageantry. The pantomimes, 3794 who maintained their reputation from the age of Augustus to the 6th century, expressed, without the use of words, the various fables of the gods and heroes of antiquity. And the perfection of their art, which sometimes disarmed the gravity of the philosopher, always excited the applause and wonder of the people. The vast and magnificent theatres of Rome were filled by three thousand female dancers, and by three thousand singers, with the masters of the respective choruses. Such was the popular favour which they enjoyed, that, in a time of scarcity, when all strangers were banished from the city, the merit of contributing to the public pleasures exempted them from a law which was strictly executed against the professors of the liberal arts. 3795. It is said, that the foolish curiosity of Elagabalus attempted to discover, from the quantity of spiders' webs, the number of the inhabitants of Rome. A more rational method of inquiry might not have been undeserving of the attention of the wisest princes, who could easily have resolved a question so important for the Roman government, and so interesting to succeeding ages. The births and deaths of the citizens were duly registered. And if any writer of antiquity had condescended to mention the annual amount, or the common average, we might now produce some satisfactory calculation, which would destroy the extravagant assertions of critics. And perhaps confirm the modest and probable conjectures of philosophers. 3796 The most diligent researches have collected only the following circumstances, which, slight and imperfect as they are, may tend, in some degree, to illustrate the question of the populousness of ancient Rome. I. When the capital of the empire was besieged by the Goths, the circuit of the walls was accurately measured, by Ammonius, the mathematician, who found it equal to twenty-one miles. 3797 It should not be forgotten that the form of the city was almost that of a circle, the geometrical figure which is known to contain the largest space within any given circumference. 2. The architect Vitruvius, who flourished in the Augustan age, and whose evidence, on this occasion, has peculiar weight and authority, observes that the innumerable habitations of the Roman people would have spread themselves far beyond the narrow limits of the city. And that the want of ground, which was probably contracted on every side by gardens and villas, suggested the common, though inconvenient, practice of raising the houses to a considerable height in the air. 3798 But the loftiness of these buildings, which often consisted of hasty work and insufficient materials, was the cause of frequent and fatal accidents. And it was repeatedly enacted by Augustus, as well as by Nero, that the height of private edifices within the walls of Rome, should not exceed the measure of seventy feet from the ground. 3793. Juvenal 3800 laments, as it should seem from his own experience, the hardships of the poorer citizens, to whom he addresses the salutary advice of emigrating, without delay, from the smoke of Rome, since they might purchase. In the little towns of Italy, a cheerful commodious dwelling, at the same price which they annually paid for a dark and miserable lodging. 
House rent was therefore immoderately dear, the rich acquired, at an enormous expense, the ground, which they covered with palaces and gardens, but the body of the Roman people was crowded into a narrow space. And the different floors, and apartments, of the same house, were divided, as it is still the custom of Paris, and other cities, among several families of plebeians. 4. The total number of houses in the fourteen regions of the city, is accurately stated in the description of Rome, composed under the reign of Theodosius, and they amount to 48,382. 3801 The two classes of domus and of insuli, into which they are divided, include all the habitations of the capital, of every rank and condition from the marble palace of the Initii, with a numerous establishment of freedmen and slaves. To the lofty and narrow lodging house, where the poet Codrus and his wife were permitted to hire a wretched garret immediately under the tiles. If we adopt the same average, which, under similar circumstances, has been found applicable to Paris 3802 and indifferently allow about twenty-five persons for each house, of every degree. We may fairly estimate the inhabitants of Rome at twelve hundred thousand, a number which cannot be thought excessive for the capital of a mighty empire, though it exceeds the populousness of the greatest cities of modern Europe. 3803-3804 such was the state of Rome under the reign of Honorius, at the time when the Gothic army formed the siege, or rather the blockade, of the city. 3805 By a skillful disposition of his numerous forces, who impatiently watched the moment of an assault, Alaric encompassed the walls, commanded the twelve principal gates, intercepted all communication with the adjacent country, and vigilantly guarded the navigation of the Tiber, from which the Romans derived the surest and most plentiful supply of provisions. The first emotions of the nobles, and of the people, were those of surprise and indignation, that a vile barbarian should dare to insult the capital of the world, but their arrogance was soon humbled by misfortune. And their unmanly rage, instead of being directed against an enemy in arms, was meanly exercised on a defenseless and innocent victim. Perhaps in the person of Serena, the Romans might have respected the niece of Theodosius, the aunt, nay, even the adoptive mother, of the reigning emperor, but they abhorred the widow of Stilicho. And they listened with credulous passion to the tale of calumny, which accused her of maintaining a secret and criminal correspondence with the Gothic invader. Actuated, or overawed, by the same popular frenzy, the Senate, without requiring any evidence of his guilt, pronounced the sentence of her death. Serena was ignominiously strangled. And the infatuated multitude were astonished to find, that this cruel act of injustice did not immediately produce the retreat of the barbarians, and the deliverance of the city. That unfortunate city gradually experienced a distress of scarcity, and at length the horrid calamities of famine. The daily allowance of three pounds of bread was reduced to one half, to one third, to nothing and the price of corn still continued to rise in a rapid and extravagant proportion. The poorer citizens, who were unable to purchase the necessaries of life, solicited the precarious charity of the rich. And for a while the public misery was alleviated by the humanity of Leda, the widow of the Emperor Gratian, who had fixed her residence at Rome, and consecrated to the use of the indigent the princely revenue which she annually received from the grateful successors of her husband. 3806 But these private and temporary donatives were insufficient to appease the hunger of a numerous people, and the progress of famine invaded the marble palaces of the senators themselves. The persons of both sexes, who had been educated in the enjoyment of ease and luxury, discovered how little is requisite to supply the demands of nature, and lavished their unavailing treasures of gold and silver, to obtain the coarse and scanty sustenance which they would formerly have rejected with disdain. The food the most repugnant to sense or imagination, the aliments the most unwholesome and pernicious to the constitution, were eagerly devoured, and fiercely disputed, by the rage of hunger. A dark suspicion was entertained, that some desperate wretches fed on the bodies of their fellow creatures, whom they had secretly murdered. And even mothers, such was the horrid conflict of the two most powerful instincts implanted by nature in the human breast, even mothers are said to have tasted the flesh of their slaughtered infants. 3807 Many thousands of the inhabitants of Rome expired in their houses, or in the streets, for want of sustenance. 
And as the public sepulchres without the walls were in the power of the enemy the stench, which arose from so many putrid and unburied carcasses, infected the air. And the miseries of famine were succeeded and aggravated by the contagion of a pestilential disease. The assurances of speedy and effectual relief, which were repeatedly transmitted from the court of Ravenna, supported for some time, the fainting resolution of the Romans. Till at length the despair of any human aid tempted them to accept the offers of a preternatural deliverance. Pompeianus, prefect of the city, had been persuaded, by the art or fanaticism of some Tuscan diviners, that, by the mysterious force of spells and sacrifices, they could extract the lightning from the clouds. And point those celestial fires against the camp of the barbarians. 3808 The important secret was communicated to Innocent, the Bishop of Rome, and the successor of St. Peter is accused, perhaps without foundation, of preferring the safety of the Republic to the rigid severity of the Christian worship. But when the question was agitated in the Senate, when it was proposed, as an essential condition, that those sacrifices should be performed in the capital, by the authority, and in the presence, of the magistrates, the majority of that respectable assembly, apprehensive either of the divine or of the imperial displeasure, refused to join in an act, which appeared almost equivalent to the public restoration of paganism. 3809. The last resource of the Romans was in the clemency, or at least in the moderation, of the king of the Goths. The Senate, who in this emergency assumed the supreme powers of government, appointed two ambassadors to negotiate with the enemy. This important trust was delegated to Basilius, a senator, of Spanish extraction, and already conspicuous in the administration of provinces. And to John, the first tribune of the notaries, who was peculiarly qualified, by his dexterity in business, as well as by his former intimacy with the Gothic prince. When they were introduced into his presence, they declared, perhaps in a more lofty style than became their abject condition, that the Romans were resolved to maintain their dignity either in peace or war. And that, if Alaric refused them a fair and honorable capitulation, he might sound his trumpets, and prepare to give battle to an innumerable people, exercised in arms, and animated by despair. The thicker the hay, the easier it is mowed, was the concise reply of the barbarian. And this rustic metaphor was accompanied by a loud and insulting laugh, expressive of his contempt for the menaces of an unwarlike populace, enervated by luxury before they were emaciated by famine. He then condescended to fix the ransom, which he would accept as the price of his retreat from the walls of Rome, all the gold and silver in the city, whether it were the property of the state, or of individuals, all the rich and precious movables. And all the slaves that could prove their title to the name of barbarians. The ministers of the Senate presumed to ask, in a modest and suppliant tone, if such, O King, are your demands, what do you intend to leave us? Your lives. Replied the haughty conqueror, they trembled, and retired. Yet, before they retired, a short suspension of arms was granted, which allowed some time for a more temperate negotiation. The stern features of Alaric were insensibly relaxed. He abetted much of the rigor of his terms. And at length consented to raise the siege, on the immediate payment of five thousand pounds of gold, of thirty thousand pounds of silver, of four thousand robes of silk, of three thousand pieces of fine scarlet cloth. And of three thousand pounds weight of pepper. 3810 But the public treasury was exhausted, the annual rents of the great estates in Italy and the provinces, had been exchanged, during the famine, for the vilest sustenance. The hordes of secret wealth were still concealed by the obstinacy of avarice, and some remains of consecrated spoils afforded the only resource that could avert the impending ruin of the city. As soon as the Romans had satisfied the rapacious demands of Alaric, they were restored, in some measure, to the enjoyment of peace and plenty. Several of the gates were cautiously opened. The importation of provisions from the river and the adjacent country was no longer obstructed by the Goths, the citizens resorted in crowds to the free market, which was held during three days in the suburbs. And while the merchants who undertook this gainful trade made a considerable profit, the future subsistence of the city was secured by the ample magazines which were deposited in the public and private granaries. A more regular discipline than could have been expected, 
was maintained in the camp of Alaric. And the wise barbarian justified his regard for the faith of treaties, by the just severity with which he chastised a party of licentious Goths, who had insulted some Roman citizens on the road to Ostia. His army, enriched by the contributions of the capital, slowly advanced into the fair and fruitful province of Tuscany, where he proposed to establish his winter quarters. And the Gothic standard became the refuge of forty thousand barbarian slaves, who had broke their chains, and aspired, under the command of their great deliverer, to revenge the injuries and the disgrace of their cruel servitude. About the same time, he received a more honorable reinforcement of Goths and Huns, whom Adolphus, 3811 the brother of his wife, had conducted, at his pressing invitation, from the banks of the Danube to those of the Tiber, and who had cut their way. With some difficulty and loss, through the superior number of the imperial troops. A victorious leader, who united the daring spirit of a barbarian with the art and discipline of a Roman general, was at the head of a hundred thousand fighting men, and Italy pronounced, with terror and respect, the formidable name of Alaric. 3812. At the distance of fourteen centuries, we may be satisfied with relating the military exploits of the conquerors of Rome, without presuming to investigate the motives of their political conduct. In the midst of his apparent prosperity, Alaric was conscious, perhaps, of some secret weakness, some internal defect. Or perhaps the moderation which he displayed, was intended only to deceive and disarm the easy credulity of the ministers of Honorius. The king of the Goths repeatedly declared, that it was his desire to be considered as the friend of peace, and of the Romans. Three senators, at his earnest request, were sent ambassadors to the court of Ravenna, to solicit the exchange of hostages, and the conclusion of the treaty. And the proposals, which he more clearly expressed during the course of the negotiations, could only inspire a doubt of his sincerity, as they might seem inadequate to the state of his fortune. The barbarian still aspired to the rank of master general of the armies of the West, he stipulated an annual subsidy of corn and money. And he chose the provinces of Dalmatia, Naricum, and Venetia, for the seat of his new kingdom, which would have commanded the important communication between Italy and the Danube. If these modest terms should be rejected, Alaric showed a disposition to relinquish his pecuniary demands, and even to content himself with the possession of Naricum. An exhausted and impoverished country, perpetually exposed to the inroads of the barbarians of Germany. 3813 But the hopes of peace were disappointed by the weak obstinacy, or interested views, of the minister Olympus. Without listening to the salutary remonstrances of the Senate, he dismissed their ambassadors under the conduct of a military escort, too numerous for a retinue of honor, and too feeble for any army of defense. Six thousand Dalmatians, the flower of the imperial legions, were ordered to march from Ravenna to Rome, through an open country which was occupied by the formidable myriads of the barbarians. These brave legionaries, encompassed and betrayed, fell a sacrifice to ministerial folly, their general, Valens, with a hundred soldiers, escaped from the field of battle. And one of the ambassadors, who could no longer claim the protection of the law of nations, was obliged to purchase his freedom with a ransom of thirty thousand pieces of gold. Yet Alaric, instead of resenting this act of impotent hostility, immediately renewed his proposals of peace. And the second embassy of the Roman Senate, which derived weight and dignity from the presence of Innocent, bishop of the city, was guarded from the dangers of the road by a detachment of Gothic soldiers. 3814 Olympus 3815 might have continued to insult the just resentment of a people who loudly accused him as the author of the public calamities, but his power was undermined by the secret intrigues of the palace. The favorite eunuchs transferred the government of Honorius, and the empire, to Jovius, the praetorian prefect, an unworthy servant, who did not atone, by the merit of personal attachment, for the errors and misfortunes of his administration. The exile, or escape, of the guilty Olympus, reserved him for more vicissitudes of fortune, he experienced the adventures of an obscure and wandering life, he again rose to power, he fell a second time into disgrace, his ears were cut off. He expired under the lash, and his ignominious death afforded a grateful spectacle to the friends of Stilicho. After the removal of Olympus, whose character was deeply tainted with religious fanaticism, 
the pagans and heretics were delivered from the impolitic proscription, which excluded them from the dignities of the state. The brave generate 3816 a soldier of barbarian origin, who still adhered to the worship of his ancestors, had been obliged to lay aside the military belt, and though he was repeatedly assured by the emperor himself. That laws were not made for persons of his rank or merit, he refused to accept any partial dispensation, and persevered in honorable disgrace, till he had extorted a general act of justice from the distress of the Roman government. The conduct of Generate in the important station to which he was promoted or restored, of Master General of Dalmatia, Pannonia, Naricum, and Rhaetia, seemed to revive the discipline and spirit of the Republic. From a life of idleness and want, his troops were soon habituated to severe exercise and plentiful subsistence, and his private generosity often supplied the rewards, which were denied by the avarice, or poverty, of the court of Ravenna. The valor of Generate, formidable to the adjacent barbarians, was the firmest bulwark of the Illyrian frontier. And his vigilant care assisted the empire with a reinforcement of ten thousand Huns, who arrived on the confines of Italy, attended by such a convoy of provisions, and such a numerous train of sheep and oxen, as might have been sufficient. Not only for the march of an army, but for the settlement of a colony. But the court and councils of Honorius still remained a scene of weakness and distraction, of corruption and anarchy. Instigated by the prefect Jovius, the guards rose in furious mutiny, and demanded the heads of two generals, and of the two principal eunuchs. The generals, under a perfidious promise of safety, were sent on shipboard, and privately executed. While the favor of the eunuchs procured them a mild and secure exile at Milan and Constantinople, Eusebius the eunuch, and the barbarian Alabic, succeeded to the command of the bedchamber and of the guards. And the mutual jealousy of these subordinate ministers was the cause of their mutual destruction. By the insolent order of the Count of the Domestics, the great chamberlain was shamefully beaten to death with sticks, before the eyes of the astonished emperor. And the subsequent assassination of Alabic, in the midst of a public procession, is the only circumstance of his life, in which Honorius discovered the faintest symptom of courage or resentment. Yet before they fell, Eusebius and Alabic had contributed their part to the ruin of the empire, by opposing the conclusion of a treaty which Jovius, from a selfish, and perhaps a criminal, motive, had negotiated with Alaric. In a personal interview under the walls of Rimini. During the absence of Jovius, the emperor was persuaded to assume a lofty tone of inflexible dignity, such as neither his situation, nor his character, could enable him to support. And a letter, signed with the name of Honorius, was immediately dispatched to the Praetorian Prefect, granting him a free permission to dispose of the public money. But sternly refusing to prostitute the military honours of Rome to the proud demands of a barbarian. This letter was imprudently communicated to Alaric himself. And the Goth, who in the whole transaction had behaved with temper and decency, expressed, in the most outrageous language, his lively sense of the insult so wantonly offered to his person and to his nation. The conference of Rimini was hastily interrupted, and the prefect Jovius, on his return to Ravenna, was compelled to adopt, and even to encourage, the fashionable opinions of the court. By his advice and example, the principal officers of the state and army were obliged to swear, that, without listening, in any circumstances, to any conditions of peace. They would still persevere in perpetual and implacable war against the enemy of the Republic. This rash engagement opposed an insuperable bar to all future negotiation. The ministers of Honorius were heard to declare, that, if they had only invoked the name of the deity, they would consult the public safety, and trust their souls to the mercy of heaven, but they had sworn by the sacred head of the emperor himself. They had touched, in solemn ceremony, that august seat of majesty and wisdom, and the violation of their oath would expose them to the temporal penalties of sacrilege and rebellion. 3817. While the emperor and his court enjoyed, with sullen pride, the security of the marches and fortifications of Ravenna, they abandoned Rome, almost without defense, to the resentment of Alaric. Yet such was the moderation which he still preserved, or affected, that, as he moved with his army along the Flaminian Way, he successively dispatched the bishops of the towns of Italy to reiterate his offers of peace, and to conjure the emperor. 
that he would save the city and its inhabitants from hostile fire, and the sword of the barbarians. 3818 These impending calamities were, however, averted, not indeed by the wisdom of Honorius, but by the prudence or humanity of the Gothic king, who employed a milder, though not less effectual, method of conquest. Instead of assaulting the capital, he successfully directed his efforts against the port of Ostia, one of the boldest and most stupendous works of Roman magnificence. 3819 The accidents to which the precarious subsistence of the city was continually exposed in a winter navigation, and an open road, had suggested to the genius of the first Caesar the useful design, which was executed under the reign of Claudius. The artificial moles, which formed the narrow entrance, advanced far into the sea, and firmly repelled the fury of the waves, while the largest vessels securely rode at anchor within three deep and capacious basins, which received the northern branch of the Tiber, about two miles from the ancient colony of Ostia. 3820 The Roman port insensibly swelled to the size of an episcopal city, 3821 where the corn of Africa was deposited in spacious granaries for the use of the capital. As soon as Alaric was in possession of that important place, he summoned the city to surrender at discretion. And his demands were enforced by the positive declaration, that a refusal, or even a delay, should be instantly followed by the destruction of the magazines, on which the life of the Roman people depended. The clamors of that people, and the terror of famine, subdued the pride of the Senate, they listened, without reluctance, to the proposal of placing a new emperor on the throne of the unworthy Honorius. And the suffrage of the Gothic conqueror bestowed the purple on Attalus, prefect of the city. The grateful monarch immediately acknowledged his protector as master general of the armies of the West. Adolphus, with the rank of Count of the Domestics, obtained the custody of the person of Attalus, and the two hostile nations seemed to be united in the closest bands of friendship and alliance. 3822. The gates of the city were thrown open, and the new emperor of the Romans, encompassed on every side by the Gothic arms, was conducted, in tumultuous procession, to the palace of Augustus and Trajan. After he had distributed the civil and military dignities among his favorites and followers, Attalus convened an assembly of the Senate before whom, in a formal and florid speech, he asserted his resolution of restoring the majesty of the Republic, and of uniting to the Empire the provinces of Egypt and the East, which had once acknowledged the sovereignty of Rome. Such extravagant promises inspired every reasonable citizen with a just contempt for the character of an unwarlike usurper, whose elevation was the deepest and most ignominious wound which the Republic had yet sustained from the insolence of the barbarians. But the populace, with their usual levity, applauded the change of masters. The public discontent was favorable to the rival of Honorius. And the sectaries, oppressed by his persecuting edicts, expected some degree of countenance, or at least of toleration, from a prince, who, in his native country of Ionia, had been educated in the pagan superstition. And who had since received the sacrament of baptism from the hands of an Arian bishop. 3823 The first days of the reign of Attalus were fair and prosperous. An officer of confidence was sent with an inconsiderable body of troops to secure the obedience of Africa, the greatest part of Italy submitted to the terror of the Gothic powers. And though the city of Bologna made a vigorous and effectual resistance, the people of Milan, dissatisfied perhaps with the absence of Honorius, accepted, with loud acclamations, the choice of the Roman Senate. At the head of a formidable army, Alaric conducted his royal captive almost to the gates of Ravenna. And a solemn embassy of the principal ministers, of Jovius, the Praetorian prefect, of Valens, master of the cavalry and infantry, of the quaestor Potamius, and of Julian, the first of the notaries, was introduced, with martial pomp, into the Gothic camp. In the name of their sovereign, they consented to acknowledge the lawful election of his competitor, and to divide the provinces of Italy and the West between the two emperors. Their proposals were rejected with disdain. And the refusal was aggravated by the insulting clemency of Attalus, who condescended to promise, that, if Honorius would instantly resign the purple, he should be permitted to pass the remainder of his life in the peaceful exile of some remote island. 
3824 So desperate indeed did the situation of the son of Theodosius appear, to those who were the best acquainted with his strength and resources, that Jovius and Valens, his minister and his general, betrayed their trust. Infamously deserted the sinking cause of their benefactor, and devoted their treacherous allegiance to the service of his more fortunate rival. Astonished by such examples of domestic treason, Honorius trembled at the approach of every servant, at the arrival of every messenger. He dreaded the secret enemies, who might lurk in his capital, his palace, his bedchamber. And some ships lay ready in the harbour of Ravenna, to transport the abdicated monarch to the dominions of his infant nephew, the Emperor of the East. But there is a providence, such at least was the opinion of the historian Procopius, 3825 that watches over innocence and folly, and the pretensions of Honorius to its peculiar care cannot reasonably be disputed. At the moment when his despair, incapable of any wise or manly resolution, meditated a shameful flight, a seasonable reinforcement of four thousand veterans unexpectedly landed in the port of Ravenna. To these valiant strangers, whose fidelity had not been corrupted by the factions of the court, he committed the walls and gates of the city. And the slumbers of the emperor were no longer disturbed by the apprehension of imminent and internal danger. The favorable intelligence which was received from Africa suddenly changed the opinions of men, and the state of public affairs. The troops and officers, whom Attalus had sent into that province, were defeated and slain, and the active zeal of Heraclion maintained his own allegiance, and that of his people. The faithful Count of Africa transmitted a large sum of money, which fixed the attachment of the imperial guards, and his vigilance, in preventing the exportation of corn and oil, introduced famine, tumult, and discontent, into the walls of Rome. The failure of the African expedition was the source of mutual complaint and recrimination in the party of Attalus. And the mind of his protector was insensibly alienated from the interest of a prince, who wanted spirit to command, or docility to obey. The most imprudent measures were adopted, without the knowledge, or against the advice, of Alaric. And the obstinate refusal of the Senate, to allow, in the embarkation, the mixture even of five hundred Goths, betrayed a suspicious and distrustful temper, which, in their situation, was neither generous nor prudent. The resentment of the Gothic king was exasperated by the malicious arts of Jovius, who had been raised to the rank of patrician, and who afterwards excused his double perfidy, by declaring, without a blush, that he had only seemed to abandon the service of Honorius, more effectually to ruin the cause of the usurper. In a large plain near Rimini, and in the presence of an innumerable multitude of Romans and barbarians, the wretched Attalus was publicly despoiled of the diadem and purple. And those ensigns of royalty were sent by Alaric, as the pledge of peace and friendship, to the son of Theodosius. 3826 The officers who returned to their duty, were reinstated in their employments, and even the merit of a tardy repentance was graciously allowed. But the degraded emperor of the Romans, desirous of life, and insensible of disgrace, implored the permission of following the Gothic camp, in the train of a haughty and capricious barbarian. 3827. The degradation of Attalus removed the only real obstacle to the conclusion of the peace. And Alaric advanced within three miles of Ravenna, to press the irresolution of the imperial ministers, whose insolence soon returned with the return of fortune. His indignation was kindled by the report, that a rival chieftain, that Ceres, the personal enemy of Adolphus, and the hereditary foe of the house of Bolti, had been received into the palace. At the head of three hundred followers, that fearless barbarian immediately sallied from the gates of Ravenna, surprised, and cut in pieces, a considerable body of Goths, re-entered the city in triumph. And was permitted to insult his adversary, by the voice of a herald, who publicly declared that the guilt of Alaric had forever excluded him from the friendship and alliance of the emperor. 3828 The crime and folly of the court of Ravenna was expiated, a third time, by the calamities of Rome. The king of the Goths, who no longer dissembled his appetite for plunder and revenge, appeared in arms under the walls of the capital. And the trembling senate, without any hopes of relief, prepared, by a desperate resistance, to defray the ruin of their country. But they were unable to guard against the secret conspiracy of their slaves and domestics. Who, either from birth or interest, 
were attached to the cause of the enemy. At the hour of midnight, the Salarian gate was silently opened, and the inhabitants were awakened by the tremendous sound of the Gothic trumpet. 1163 years after the foundation of Rome, the imperial city, which had subdued and civilized so considerable a part of mankind, was delivered to the licentious fury of the tribes of Germany in Scythia. 3829. The proclamation of Alaric, when he forced his entrance into a vanquished city, discovered, however, some regard for the laws of humanity and religion. He encouraged his troops boldly to seize the rewards of valor, and to enrich themselves with the spoils of a wealthy and effeminate people, but he exhorted them, at the same time, to spare the lives of the unresisting citizens. And to respect the churches of the Apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul, as holy and inviolable sanctuaries. Amidst the horrors of a nocturnal tumult, several of the Christian Goths displayed the fervor of a recent conversion. And some instances of their uncommon piety and moderation are related, and perhaps adorned, by the zeal of ecclesiastical writers. 3830 While the barbarians roamed through the city in quest of prey, the humble dwelling of an aged virgin, who had devoted her life to the service of the altar, was forced open by one of the powerful Goths. He immediately demanded, though in civil language, all the gold and silver in her possession. And was astonished at the readiness with which she conducted him to a splendid hoard of massy plate, of the richest materials, and the most curious workmanship. The barbarian viewed with wonder and delight this valuable acquisition, till he was interrupted by a serious admonition, addressed to him in the following words, These, said she, are the consecrated vessels belonging to Street. Peter, if you presume to touch them, the sacrilegious deed will remain on your conscience. For my part, I dare not keep what I am unable to defend. The Gothic captain, struck with reverential awe, dispatched a messenger to inform the king of the treasure which he had discovered. And received a peremptory order from Alaric, that all the consecrated plate and ornaments should be transported, without damage or delay, to the church of the apostle. From the extremity, perhaps, of the Quirinal Hill, to the distant quarter of the Vatican, a numerous detachment of Goths, marching in order of battle through the principal streets, protected, with glittering arms. The long train of their devout companions, who bore aloft, on their heads, the sacred vessels of gold and silver. And the martial shouts of the barbarians were mingled with the sound of religious psalmody. From all the adjacent houses, a crowd of Christians hastened to join this edifying procession. And a multitude of fugitives, without distinction of age or rank or even of sect, had the good fortune to escape to the secure and hospitable sanctuary of the Vatican. The learned work, concerning the City of God, was professedly composed by St. Augustine, to justify the ways of providence in the destruction of the Roman greatness. He celebrates, with peculiar satisfaction, this memorable triumph of Christ. And insults his adversaries, by challenging them to produce some similar example of a town taken by storm, in which the fabulous gods of antiquity had been able to protect either themselves or their deluded votaries. 3831. In the sack of Rome, some rare and extraordinary examples of barbarian virtue have been deservedly applauded. But the holy precincts of the Vatican, and the apostolic churches, could receive a very small proportion of the Roman people. Many thousand warriors, more especially of the Huns, who served under the standard of Alaric, were strangers to the name, or at least to the faith, of Christ. And we may suspect, without any breach of charity or candor, that in the hour of savage license, when every passion was inflamed, and every restraint was removed, the precepts of the gospel seldom influenced the behavior of the Gothic Christians. The writers, the best disposed to exaggerate their clemency, have freely confessed, that a cruel slaughter was made of the Romans. 3832 And that the streets of the city were filled with dead bodies, which remained without burial during the general consternation. The despair of the citizens was sometimes converted into fury, and whenever the barbarians were provoked by opposition, they extended the promiscuous massacre to the feeble, the innocent, and the helpless. The private revenge of forty thousand slaves was exercised without pity or remorse, and the ignominious lashes, which they had formerly received, were washed away in the blood of the guilty, or obnoxious, families. 
the matrons and virgins of Rome were exposed to injuries more dreadful, in the apprehension of chastity, than death itself, and the ecclesiastical historian has selected an example of female virtue, for the admiration of future ages. 3833 A Roman lady, of singular beauty and orthodox faith, had excited the impatient desires of a young Goth, who, according to the sagacious remark of Sozomen, was attached to the Arian heresy. Exasperated by her obstinate resistance, he drew his sword, and, with the anger of a lover, slightly wounded her neck. The bleeding heroine still continued to brave his resentment, and to repel his love, till the ravisher desisted from his unavailing efforts, respectfully conducted her to the sanctuary of the Vatican, and gave six pieces of gold to the guards of the church, on condition that they should restore her inviolate to the arms of her husband. Such instances of courage and generosity were not extremely common. The brutal soldiers satisfied their sensual appetites, without consulting either the inclination or the duties of their female captives, and a nice question of casuistry was seriously agitated, whether those tender victims who had inflexibly refused their consent to the violation which they sustained, had lost, by their misfortune, the glorious crown of virginity. 3834 There were other losses indeed of a more substantial kind, and more general concern. It cannot be presumed, that all the barbarians were at all times capable of perpetrating such amorous outrages. And the want of youth, or beauty, or chastity, protected the greatest part of the Roman women from the danger of a rape. But avarice is an insatiate and universal passion. Since the enjoyment of almost every object that can afford pleasure to the different tastes and tempers of mankind may be procured by the possession of wealth. In the pillage of Rome, a just preference was given to gold and jewels, which contain the greatest value in the smallest compass and weight, but, after these portable riches had been removed by the more diligent robbers, the palaces of Rome were rudely stripped of their splendid and costly furniture. The sideboards of massy plate, and the variegated wardrobes of silk and purple, were irregularly piled in the wagons, that always followed the march of a Gothic army. The most exquisite works of art were roughly handled, or wantonly destroyed. Many a statue was melted for the sake of the precious materials. And many a vase, in the division of the spoil, was shivered into fragments by the stroke of a battle-axe. The acquisition of riches served only to stimulate the avarice of the rapacious barbarians, who proceeded, by threats, by blows, and by tortures, to force from their prisoners the confession of hidden treasure. 38-35 Visible splendor and expense were alleged as the proof of a plentiful fortune, the appearance of poverty was imputed to a parsimonious disposition. And the obstinacy of some misers, who endured the most cruel torments before they would discover the secret object of their affection, was fatal to many unhappy wretches, who expired under the lash, for refusing to reveal their imaginary treasures. The edifices of Rome, though the damage has been much exaggerated, received some injury from the violence of the Goths. At their entrance through the Salarian Gate, they fired the adjacent houses to guide their march, and to distract the attention of the citizens. The flames, which encountered no obstacle in the disorder of the night, consumed many private and public buildings, and the ruins of the palace of Sallust 3836 remained, in the age of Justinian, a stately monument of the Gothic conflagration. 3837 Yet a contemporary historian has observed, that fire could scarcely consume the enormous beams of solid brass, and that the strength of man was insufficient to subvert the foundations of ancient structures. Some truth may possibly be concealed in his devout assertion, that the wrath of heaven supplied the imperfections of hostile rage. And that the proud Forum of Rome, decorated with the statues of so many gods and heroes, was leveled in the dust by the stroke of lightning. 3838. Whatever might be the numbers of equestrian or plebeian rank, who perished in the massacre of Rome, it is confidently affirmed that only one senator lost his life by the sword of the enemy. 3839 But it was not easy to compute the multitudes, who, from an honorable station and a prosperous fortune, were suddenly reduced to the miserable condition of captives and exiles. As the barbarians had more occasion for money than for slaves, they fixed at a moderate price the redemption of their indigent prisoners, and the ransom was often paid by the benevolence of their friends, or the charity of strangers. 
3840 The captives, who were regularly sold, either in open market, or by private contract, would have legally regained their native freedom, which it was impossible for a citizen to lose, or to alienate. 3841 But as it was soon discovered that the vindication of their liberty would endanger their lives, and that the Goths, unless they were tempted to sell, might be provoked to murder, their useless prisoners. The civil jurisprudence had been already qualified by a wise regulation, that they should be obliged to serve the moderate term of five years, till they had discharged by their labor the price of their redemption. 3842 The nations who invaded the Roman Empire, had driven before them, into Italy, whole troops of hungry and affrighted provincials, less apprehensive of servitude than of famine. The calamities of Rome and Italy dispersed the inhabitants to the most lonely, the most secure, the most distant places of refuge. While the Gothic cavalry spread terror and desolation along the seacoast of Campania and Tuscany, the little island of Igilium, separated by a narrow channel from the Argentarian promontory, repulsed, or eluded, their hostile attempts. And at so small a distance from Rome, great numbers of citizens were securely concealed in the thick woods of that sequestered spot. 3843 The ample patrimonies, which many senatorian families possessed in Africa, invited them, if they had time, and prudence, to escape from the ruin of their country, to embrace the shelter of that hospitable province. The most illustrious of these fugitives was the noble and pious Proba, 3844 the widow of the prefect Petronius. After the death of her husband, the most powerful subject of Rome, she had remained at the head of the Anician family, and successively supplied, from her private fortune, the expense of the consulships of her three sons. When the city was besieged and taken by the Goths, Proba supported, with Christian resignation, the loss of immense riches. Embarked in a small vessel, from whence she beheld, at sea, the flames of her burning palace, and fled with her daughter Leda, and her granddaughter, the celebrated virgin, Demetrius, to the coast of Africa. The benevolent profusion with which the matron distributed the fruits, or the price, of her estates, contributed to alleviate the misfortunes of exile and captivity. But even the family of Proba herself was not exempt from the rapacious oppression of Count Heraclion, who basely sold, in matrimonial prostitution, the noblest maidens of Rome to the lust or avarice of the Syrian merchants. The Italian fugitives were dispersed through the provinces, along the coast of Egypt and Asia, as far as Constantinople and Jerusalem, and the village of Bethlehem, the solitary residence of Asti. Jerem and his female converts, was crowded with illustrious beggars of either sex, and every age, who excited the public compassion by the remembrance of their past fortune. 3845 This awful catastrophe of Rome filled the astonished empire with grief and terror. So interesting a contrast of greatness and ruin, disposed the fond credulity of the people to deplore, and even to exaggerate, the afflictions of the queen of cities. The clergy, who applied to recent events the lofty metaphors of oriental prophecy, were sometimes tempted to confound the destruction of the capital and the dissolution of the globe. There exists in human nature a strong propensity to depreciate the advantages, and to magnify the evils, of the present times. Yet, when the first emotions had subsided, and a fair estimate was made of the real damage, the more learned and judicious contemporaries were forced to confess, that infant Rome had formerly received more essential injury from the Gauls. Than she had now sustained from the Goths in her declining age. 3846 The experience of eleven centuries has enabled posterity to produce a much more singular parallel. And to affirm with confidence, that the ravages of the barbarians, whom Alaric had led from the banks of the Danube, were less destructive than the hostilities exercised by the troops of Charles V, a Catholic prince, who styled himself Emperor of the Romans. 3847 The Goths evacuated the city at the end of six days, but Rome remained above nine months in the possession of the imperialists, and every hour was stained by some atrocious act of cruelty, lust, and rapine. The authority of Alaric preserved some order and moderation among the ferocious multitude which acknowledged him for their leader and king, but the constable of Bourbon had gloriously fallen in the attack of the walls. And the death of the general removed every restraint of discipline from an army which consisted of three independent nations, the Italians, the Spaniards, and the Germans. In the beginning of the sixteenth century, 
the manners of Italy exhibited a remarkable scene of the depravity of mankind. They united the sanguinary crimes that prevail in an unsettled state of society, with the polished vices which spring from the abuse of art and luxury. And the loose adventurers, who had violated every prejudice of patriotism and superstition to assault the palace of the Roman pontiff, must deserve to be considered as the most profligate of the Italians. At the same era, the Spaniards were the terror both of the old and new world, but their high-spirited valor was disgraced by gloomy pride, rapacious avarice, and unrelenting cruelty. Indefatigable in the pursuit of fame and riches, they had improved, by repeated practice, the most exquisite and effectual methods of torturing their prisoners, many of the Castilians, who pillaged Rome, were familiars of the Holy Inquisition. And some volunteers, perhaps, were lately returned from the conquest of Mexico. The Germans were less corrupt than the Italians, less cruel than the Spaniards. And the rustic, or even savage, aspect of those Tremontane warriors, often disguised a simple and merciful disposition. But they had imbibed, in the first fervor of the Reformation, the spirit, as well as the principles, of Luther. It was their favorite amusement to insult, or destroy, the consecrated objects of Catholic superstition. They indulged, without pity or remorse, a devout hatred against the clergy of every denomination and degree, who formed so considerable a part of the inhabitants of modern Rome. And their fanatic zeal might aspire to subvert the throne of Antichrist, to purify, with blood and fire, the abominations of the spiritual Babylon. 3848. The retreat of the victorious Goths, who evacuated Rome on the sixth day, 3849 might be the result of prudence, but it was not surely the effect of fear. 3850 at the head of an army encumbered with rich and weighty spoils, their intrepid leader advanced along the Appian Way into the southern provinces of Italy, destroying whatever dared to oppose his passage. And contenting himself with the plunder of the unresisting country. The fate of Capua, the proud and luxurious metropolis of Campania, and which was respected, even in its decay, as the eighth city of the empire, 3851 is buried in oblivion. Whilst the adjacent town of Nola 3852 has been illustrated, on this occasion, by the sanctity of Paulinus 3853 who was successively a consul, a monk, and a bishop. At the age of forty, he renounced the enjoyment of wealth and honor, of society and literature, to embrace a life of solitude and penance. And the loud applause of the clergy encouraged him to despise the reproaches of his worldly friends, who ascribed this desperate act to some disorder of the mind or body. 3854 An early and passionate attachment determined him to fix his humble dwelling in one of the suburbs of Nola, near the miraculous tomb of St. Felix, which the public devotion had already surrounded with five large and populous churches. The remains of his fortune, and of his understanding, were dedicated to the service of the glorious martyr, whose praise, on the day of his festival, Paulinus never failed to celebrate by a solemn hymn. And in whose name he erected a sixth church, of superior elegance and beauty, which was decorated with many curious pictures, from the history of the Old and New Testament. Such assiduous seal secured the favor of the saint, 3855 or at least of the people, and, after fifteen years' retirement, the Roman consul was compelled to accept the bishopric of Nola, a few months before the city was invested by the Goths. During the siege, some religious persons were satisfied that they had seen, either in dreams or visions, the divine form of their tutelar patron. Yet it soon appeared by the event, that Felix wanted power, or inclination, to preserve the flock of which he had formerly been the shepherd. Nola was not saved from the general devastation. 3856 and the captive bishop was protected only by the general opinion of his innocence and poverty. Above four years elapsed from the successful invasion of Italy by the arms of Alaric, to the voluntary retreat of the Goths under the conduct of his successor Adolphus. And, during the whole time, they reigned without control over a country, which, in the opinion of the ancients, had united all the various excellences of nature and art. The prosperity, indeed, which Italy had attained in the auspicious age of the Antonines, had gradually declined with the decline of the empire. The fruits of a long peace perished under the rude grasp of the barbarians. 
and they themselves were incapable of tasting the more elegant refinements of luxury, which had been prepared for the use of the soft and polished Italians. Each soldier, however, claimed an ample portion of the substantial plenty, the corn and cattle, oil and wine, that was daily collected and consumed in the Gothic camp. And the principal warriors insulted the villas and gardens, once inhabited by Lucullus and Cicero, along the beauteous coast of Campania. Their trembling captives, the sons and daughters of Roman senators, presented, in goblets of gold and gems, large draughts of Falernian wine to the haughty victors, who stretched their huge limbs under the shade of plane trees 3857 artificially disposed to exclude the scorching rays, and to admit the genial warmth, of the sun. These delights were enhanced by the memory of past hardships, the comparison of their native soil, the bleak and barren hills of Scythia, and the frozen banks of the Elba and Danube, added new charms to the felicity of the Italian climate. 3858. Whether fame, or conquest, or riches, were the object or Alaric, he pursued that object with an indefatigable ardor, which could neither be quelled by adversity nor satiated by success. No sooner had he reached the extreme land of Italy, than he was attracted by the neighboring prospect of a fertile and peaceful island. Yet even the possession of Sicily he considered only as an intermediate step to the important expedition, which he already meditated against the continent of Africa. The Straits of Regium and Messina 3859 are twelve miles in length, and, in the narrowest passage, about one mile and a half broad. And the fabulous monsters of the deep, the rocks of Scylla, and the whirlpool of Charybdis, could terrify none but the most timid and unskillful mariners. Yet as soon as the first division of the Goths had embarked, a sudden tempest arose, which sunk, or scattered, many of the transports, their courage was daunted by the terrors of a new element. And the whole design was defeated by the premature death of Alaric, which fixed, after a short illness, the fatal term of his conquests. The ferocious character of the barbarians was displayed in the funeral of a hero whose valor and fortune they celebrated with mournful applause. By the labor of a captive multitude, they forcibly diverted the course of the Bucentinus, a small river that washes the walls of Consentia. The royal sepulcher, adorned with the splendid spoils and trophies of Rome, was constructed in the vacant bed, the waters were then restored to their natural channel. And the secret spot, where the remains of Alaric had been deposited, was forever concealed by the inhuman massacre of the prisoners, who had been employed to execute the work. 3860. The personal animosities and hereditary feuds of the barbarians were suspended by the strong necessity of their affairs, and the brave Adolphus, the brother-in-law of the deceased monarch, was unanimously elected to succeed to his throne. The character and political system of the new king of the Goths may be best understood from his own conversation with an illustrious citizen of Narbonne, who afterwards, in a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, related it to St. Jerem, in the presence of the historian Orosius. In the full confidence of valor and victory, I once aspired, said Adolphus, to change the face of the universe, to obliterate the name of Rome, to erect on its ruins the dominion of the Goths. And to acquire, like Augustus, the immortal fame of the founder of a new empire. By repeated experiments, I was gradually convinced, that laws are essentially necessary to maintain and regulate a well-constituted state. And that the fierce, untractable humor of the Goths was incapable of bearing the salutary yoke of laws and civil government. From that moment I proposed to myself a different object of glory and ambition. And it is now my sincere wish that the gratitude of future ages should acknowledge the merit of a stranger, who employed the sword of the Goths, not to subvert, but to restore and maintain, the prosperity of the Roman Empire. 3861 With these pacific views, the successor of Alaric suspended the operations of war, and seriously negotiated with the imperial court a treaty of friendship and alliance. It was the interest of the ministers of Honorius, who were now released from the obligation of their extravagant oath, to deliver Italy from the intolerable weight of the Gothic powers. And they readily accepted their service against the tyrants and barbarians who infested the provinces beyond the Alps. 3862 Adolphus, assuming the character of a Roman general, directed his march from the extremity of Campania to the southern provinces of Gaul. 
His troops, either by force or agreement, immediately occupied the cities of Narbonne, Thulaus, and Bordeaux. And though they were repulsed by Count Boniface from the walls of Marseilles, they soon extended their quarters from the Mediterranean to the ocean. The oppressed provincials might exclaim, that the miserable remnant, which the enemy had spared, was cruelly ravished by their pretended allies, yet some specious colors were not wanting to palliate or justify the violence of the Goths. The cities of Gaul, which they attacked, might perhaps be considered as in a state of rebellion against the government of Honorius, the articles of the treaty, or the secret instructions of the court. Might sometimes be alleged in favor of the seeming usurpations of Adolphus. And the guilt of any irregular, unsuccessful act of hostility might always be imputed, with an appearance of truth, to the ungovernable spirit of a barbarian host, impatient of peace or discipline. The luxury of Italy had been less effectual to soften the temper than to relax the courage of the Goths, and they had imbibed the vices, without imitating the arts and institutions, of civilized society. 3863. The professions of Adolphus were probably sincere, and his attachment to the cause of the Republic was secured by the ascendant which a Roman princess had acquired over the heart and understanding of the barbarian king. Placidia, 3864 The daughter of the great Theodosius, and of Galla, his second wife, had received a royal education in the palace of Constantinople. But the eventful story of her life is connected with the revolutions which agitated the Western Empire under the reign of her brother Honorius. When Rome was first invested by the arms of Alaric, Placidia, who was then about twenty years of age, resided in the city. And her ready consent to the death of her cousin Serena has a cruel and ungrateful appearance, which, according to the circumstances of the action, may be aggravated, or excused, by the consideration of her tender age. 3865 The victorious barbarians detained, either as a hostage or a captive, 3866 The sister of Honorius. But, while she was exposed to the disgrace of following round Italy the motions of a Gothic camp, she experienced, however, a decent and respectful treatment. The authority of Jornans, who praises the beauty of Placidia, may perhaps be counterbalanced by the silence, the expressive silence, of her flatterers, yet the splendor of her birth, the bloom of youth, the elegance of manners. And the dexterous insinuation which she condescended to employ, made a deep impression on the mind of Adolphus. And the Gothic king aspired to call himself the brother of the emperor. The ministers of Honorius rejected with disdain the proposal of an alliance so injurious to every sentiment of Roman pride, and repeatedly urged the restitution of Placidia, as an indispensable condition of the treaty of peace. But the daughter of Theodosius submitted, without reluctance, to the desires of the conqueror, a young and valiant prince, who yielded to Alaric in loftiness of stature, but who excelled in the more attractive qualities of grace and beauty. The marriage of Adolphus and Placidia 3867 was consummated before the Goths retired from Italy. And the solemn, perhaps the anniversary day of their nuptials was afterward celebrated in the house of Ingenuus, one of the most illustrious citizens of Narbonne in Gaul. The bride, attired and adorned like a Roman empress, was placed on a throne of state, and the king of the Goths, who assumed, on this occasion, the Roman habit, contented himself with a less honorable seat by her side. The nuptial gift, which, according to the custom of his nation, 3868 was offered to Placidia, consisted of the rare and magnificent spoils of her country. Fifty beautiful youths, in silken robes, carried a basin in each hand. And one of these basins was filled with pieces of gold, the other with precious stones of an inestimable value. Attalus, so long the sport of fortune, and of the Goths, was appointed to lead the chorus of the hymeneal song. And the degraded emperor might aspire to the praise of a skillful musician. The barbarians enjoyed the insolence of their triumph. And the provincials rejoiced in this alliance, which tempered, by the mild influence of love and reason, the fierce spirit of their Gothic lord. 3869. The hundred basins of gold and gems, presented to Placidia at her nuptial feast, formed an inconsiderable portion of the Gothic treasures, of which some extraordinary specimens may be selected from the history of the successors of Adolphus. Many curious and costly ornaments of pure gold, enriched with jewels, 
were found in their palace of Narbonne, when it was pillaged, in the 6th century, by the Franks, 60 cups, or chalices. 15 patents, or plates, for the use of the communion. 20 boxes, or cases, to hold the books of the Gospels, this consecrated wealth 3870 was distributed by the son of Clovis among the churches of his dominions, and his pious liberality seems to upbraid some former sacrilege of the Goths. They possessed, with more security of conscience, the famous Missorium, or great dish for the service of the table, of massy gold, of the weight of five hundred pounds, and of far superior value, from the precious stones, the exquisite workmanship. And the tradition, that it had been presented by Aetius, the patrician, to Torismund, king of the Goths. One of the successors of Torismund purchased the aid of the French monarch by the promise of this magnificent gift. When he was seated on the throne of Spain, he delivered it with reluctance to the ambassadors of Dagobert. Despoiled them on the road, stipulated, after a long negotiation, the inadequate ransom of two hundred thousand pieces of gold, and preserved the Missorium, as the pride of the Gothic treasury. 3871 When that treasury, after the conquest of Spain, was plundered by the Arabs, they admired, and they have celebrated, another object still more remarkable. A table of considerable size, of one single piece of solid emerald 3872 encircled with three rows of fine pearls, supported by 365 feet of gems and massy gold and estimated at the price of 500,000 pieces of gold. 3873 Some portion of the Gothic treasures might be the gift of friendship, or the tribute of obedience, but the far greater part had been the fruits of war and rapine, the spoils of the empire, and perhaps of Rome. After the deliverance of Italy from the oppression of the Goths, some secret counselor was permitted, amidst the factions of the palace, to heal the wounds of that afflicted country. 3874 By a wise and humane regulation, the eight provinces which had been the most deeply injured, Campania, Tuscany, Picinum, Samnium, Apulia, Calabria, Brutium, and Lucania, obtained an indulgence of five years, the ordinary tribute was reduced to one-fifth, and even that fifth was destined to restore and support the useful institution of the public posts. By another law, the lands which had been left without inhabitants or cultivation, were granted, with some diminution of taxes, to the neighbors who should occupy, or the strangers who should solicit them. And the new possessors were secured against the future claims of the fugitive proprietors. About the same time a general amnesty was published in the name of Honorius, to abolish the guilt and memory of all the involuntary offenses which had been committed by his unhappy subjects, during the term of the public disorder and calamity. A decent and respectful attention was paid to the restoration of the capital, the citizens were encouraged to rebuild the edifices which had been destroyed or damaged by hostile fire. And extraordinary supplies of corn were imported from the coast of Africa. The crowds that so lately fled before the sword of the barbarians, were soon recalled by the hopes of plenty and pleasure. And Albinus, prefect of Rome, informed the court, with some anxiety and surprise, that, in a single day, he had taken an account of the arrival of fourteen thousand strangers. 3875 In less than seven years, the vestiges of the Gothic invasion were almost obliterated, and the city appeared to resume its former splendor and tranquility. The venerable matron replaced her crown of laurel, which had been ruffled by the storms of war, and was still amused, in the last moment of her decay, with the prophecies of revenge, of victory, and of eternal dominion. 3876. This apparent tranquillity was soon disturbed by the approach of a hostile armament from the country which afforded the daily subsistence of the Roman people. Heraclian, Count of Africa, who, under the most difficult and distressful circumstances, had supported, with active loyalty, the cause of Honorius, was tempted, in the year of his consulship, to assume the character of a rebel. And the title of emperor. The ports of Africa were immediately filled with the naval forces, at the head of which he prepared to invade Italy, and his fleet, when it cast anchor at the mouth of the Tiber, indeed surpassed the fleets of Xerxes and Alexander. If all the vessels, including the royal galley, and the smallest boat, did actually amount to the incredible number of 3,200. 3877 Yet with such an armament, which might have subverted, 
or restored, the greatest empires of the earth, the African usurper made a very faint and feeble impression on the provinces of his rival. As he marched from the port, along the road which leads to the gates of Rome, he was encountered, terrified, and routed, by one of the imperial captains. And the lord of this mighty host, deserting his fortune and his friends, ignominiously fled with a single ship. 3878 When Heraclian landed in the harbour of Carthage, he found that the whole province, disdaining such an unworthy ruler, had returned to their allegiance. The rebel was beheaded in the ancient temple of memory. His consulship was abolished, 3879 and the remains of his private fortune, not exceeding the moderate sum of four thousand pounds of gold, were granted to the brave Constantius, who had already defended the throne. Which he afterwards shared with his feeble sovereign. Honorius viewed, with supine indifference, the calamities of Rome and Italy, 3880 but the rebellious attempts of Attalus and Heraclian, against his personal safety, awakened, for a moment, the torpid instinct of his nature. He was probably ignorant of the causes and events which preserved him from these impending dangers. And as Italy was no longer invaded by any foreign or domestic enemies, he peaceably existed in the palace of Ravenna, while the tyrants beyond the Alps were repeatedly vanquished in the name, and by the lieutenants, of the son of Theodosius. 3881 In the course of a busy and interesting narrative I might possibly forget to mention the death of such a prince, and I shall therefore take the precaution of observing, in this place, that he survived the last siege of Rome about thirteen years. The usurpation of Constantine, who received the purple from the legions of Britain, had been successful, and seemed to be secure. His title was acknowledged, from the wall of Antoninus to the columns of Hercules. And, in the midst of the public disorder he shared the dominion, and the plunder, of Gaul and Spain, with the tribes of barbarians, whose destructive progress was no longer checked by the Rhine or Pyrenees. Stained with the blood of the kinsmen of Honorius, he extorted, from the court of Ravenna, with which he secretly corresponded, the ratification of his rebellious claims. Constantine engaged himself, by a solemn promise, to deliver Italy from the Goths, advanced as far as the banks of the Po. And after alarming, rather than assisting, his pusillanimous ally, hastily returned to the palace of Alls, to celebrate, with intemperate luxury, his vain and ostentatious triumph. But this transient prosperity was soon interrupted and destroyed by the revolt of Count Gerontius, the bravest of his generals who, during the absence of his son Constans, a prince already invested with the imperial purple, had been left to command in the provinces of Spain. From some reason, of which we are ignorant, Gerontius, instead of assuming the diadem, placed it on the head of his friend Maximus, who fixed his residence at Tarragona, while the active count pressed forwards, through the Pyrenees. To surprise the two emperors, Constantine and Constans, before they could prepare for their defence. The son was made prisoner at Vienna, and immediately put to death, and the unfortunate youth had scarcely leisure to deplore the elevation of his family, which had tempted, or compelled him, sacrilegiously to desert the peaceful obscurity of the monastic life. The father maintained a siege within the walls of Alls. But those walls must have yielded to the assailants, had not the city been unexpectedly relieved by the approach of an Italian army. The name of Honorius, the proclamation of a lawful emperor, astonished the contending parties of the rebels. Gerontius, abandoned by his own troops, escaped to the confines of Spain, and rescued his name from oblivion, by the Roman courage which appeared to animate the last moments of his life. In the middle of the night, a great body of his perfidious soldiers surrounded and attacked his house, which he had strongly barricaded. His wife, a valiant friend of the nation of the Alani, and some faithful slaves, were still attached to his person. And he used, with so much skill and resolution, a large magazine of darts and arrows, that above three hundred of the assailants lost their lives in the attempt. His slaves when all the missile weapons were spent, fled at the dawn of day. And Gerontius, if he had not been restrained by conjugal tenderness, might have imitated their example, till the soldiers, provoked by such obstinate resistance, applied fire on all sides to the house. In this fatal extremity, he complied with the request of his barbarian friend, and cut off his head. 
the wife of Gerontius, who conjured him not to abandon her to a life of misery and disgrace, eagerly presented her neck to his sword. And the tragic scene was terminated by the death of the Count himself, who, after three ineffectual strokes, drew a short dagger, and sheathed it in his heart. 3882 The unprotected Maximus, whom he had invested with the purple, was indebted for his life to the contempt that was entertained of his power and abilities. The caprice of the barbarians, who ravaged Spain, once more seated this imperial phantom on the throne, but they soon resigned him to the justice of Honorius. And the tyrant Maximus, after he had been shown to the people of Ravenna and Rome, was publicly executed. The general, Constantius was his name, who raised by his approach the siege of Alls, and dissipated the troops of Gerontius, was born a Roman. And this remarkable distinction is strongly expressive of the decay of military spirit among the subjects of the empire. The strength and majesty which were conspicuous in the person of that general 3883 marked him, in the popular opinion, as a candidate worthy of the throne, which he afterwards ascended. In the familiar intercourse of private life, his manners were cheerful and engaging, nor would he sometimes disdain, in the license of convivial mirth, to vie with the pantomimes themselves, in the exercises of their ridiculous profession. But when the trumpet summoned him to arms, when he mounted his horse, and, bending down, for such was his singular practice, almost upon the neck, fiercely rolled his large animated eyes round the field, Constantius then struck terror into his foes and inspired his soldiers with the assurance of victory. He had received from the court of Ravenna the important commission of extirpating rebellion in the provinces of the West. And the pretended Emperor Constantine, after enjoying a short and anxious respite, was again besieged in his capital by the arms of a more formidable enemy. Yet this interval allowed time for a successful negotiation with the Franks and Alamanni and his ambassador, Edobic, soon returned at the head of an army, to disturb the operations of the siege of Alls. The Roman general, instead of expecting the attack in his lines, boldly and perhaps wisely, resolved to pass the Rhone, and to meet the barbarians. His measures were conducted with so much skill and secrecy, that, while they engaged the infantry of Constantius in the front, they were suddenly attacked, surrounded, and destroyed, by the cavalry of his lieutenant Ulfilus, who had silently gained an advantageous post in their rear. The remains of the army of Edobic were preserved by flight or submission, and their leader escaped from the field of battle to the house of a faithless friend. Who too clearly understood, that the head of his obnoxious guest would be an acceptable and lucrative present for the imperial general. On this occasion, Constantius behaved with the magnanimity of a genuine Roman. Subduing, or suppressing, every sentiment of jealousy, he publicly acknowledged the merit and services of Ulfilus but he turned with horror from the assassin of Edobic, and sternly intimated his commands, that the camp should no longer be polluted by the presence of an ungrateful wretch, who had violated the laws of friendship and hospitality. The usurper, who beheld, from the walls of Alls, the ruin of his last hopes, was tempted to place some confidence in so generous a conqueror. He required a solemn promise for his security. And after receiving, by the imposition of hands, the sacred character of a Christian presbyter, he ventured to open the gates of the city. But he soon experienced that the principles of honor and integrity, which might regulate the ordinary conduct of Constantius, were superseded by the loose doctrines of political morality. The Roman general, indeed, refused to sully his laurels with the blood of Constantine, but the abdicated emperor, and his son Julian, were sent under a strong guard into Italy. And before they reached the palace of Ravenna, they met the ministers of death. At a time when it was universally confessed, that almost every man in the empire was superior in personal merit to the princes whom the accident of their birth had seated on the throne, a rapid succession of usurpers. Regardless of the fate of their predecessors, still continued to arise. This mischief was peculiarly felt in the provinces of Spain and Gaul, where the principles of order and obedience had been extinguished by war and rebellion. Before Constantine resigned the purple, and in the fourth month of the siege of Alls, intelligence was received in the imperial camp, that Jovinus has assumed the diadem at Mentz, in the upper Germany, at the instigation of Gore, king of the Alani, and of Guntiarius, king of the Burgundians. 
and that the candidate, on whom they had bestowed the empire, advanced with a formidable host of barbarians, from the banks of the Rhine to those of the Rhone. Every circumstance is dark and extraordinary in the short history of the reign of Jovinus. It was natural to expect, that a brave and skillful general, at the head of a victorious army, would have asserted, in a field of battle, the justice of the cause of Honorius. The hasty retreat of Constantius might be justified by weighty reasons. But he resigned, without a struggle, the possession of Gaul, and Dardanus, the Praetorian prefect, is recorded as the only magistrate who refused to yield obedience to the usurper. 3884 When the Goths, two years after the siege of Rome, established their quarters in Gaul, it was natural to suppose that their inclinations could be divided only between the Emperor Honorius, with whom they had formed a recent alliance. And the degraded Attalus, whom they reserved in their camp for the occasional purpose of acting the part of a musician or a monarch. Yet in a moment of disgust, for which it is not easy to assign a cause, or a date, Adolphus connected himself with the usurper of Gaul, and imposed on Attalus the ignominious task of negotiating the treaty, which ratified his own disgrace. We are again surprised to read, that, instead of considering the Gothic alliance as the firmest support of his throne, Jovinus upbraided, in dark and ambiguous language, the officious importunity of Attalus. That, scorning the advice of his great ally, he invested with the purple his brother Sebastian. And that he most imprudently accepted the service of Ceres, when that gallant chief, the soldier of Honorius, was provoked to desert the court of a prince, who knew not how to reward or punish. Adolphus, educated among a race of warriors, who esteemed the duty of revenge as the most precious and sacred portion of their inheritance, advanced with a body of ten thousand Goths to encounter the hereditary enemy of the house of Bolti. He attacked Ceres at an unguarded moment, when he was accompanied only by eighteen or twenty of his valiant followers. United by friendship, animated by despair, but at length oppressed by multitudes, this band of heroes deserved the esteem, without exciting the compassion, of their enemies. And the lion was no sooner taken in the toils 3885 than he was instantly dispatched. The death of Ceres dissolved the loose alliance which Adolphus still maintained with the usurpers of Gaul. He again listened to the dictates of love and prudence. And soon satisfied the brother of Placidia, by the assurance that he would immediately transmit to the palace of Ravenna the heads of the two tyrants, Jovinus and Sebastian. The king of the Goths executed his promise without difficulty or delay. The helpless brothers, unsupported by any personal merit, were abandoned by their barbarian auxiliaries, and the short opposition of Valentia was expiated by the ruin of one of the noblest cities of Gaul. The emperor, chosen by the Roman Senate, who had been promoted, degraded, insulted, restored, again degraded, and again insulted, was finally abandoned to his fate. But when the Gothic king withdrew his protection, he was restrained, by pity or contempt, from offering any violence to the person of Attalus. The unfortunate Attalus, who was left without subjects or allies, embarked in one of the ports of Spain, in search of some secure and solitary retreat, but he was intercepted at sea, conducted to the presence of Honorius. Led in triumph through the streets of Rome or Ravenna, and publicly exposed to the gazing multitude, on the second step of the throne of his invincible conqueror. The same measure of punishment, with which, in the days of his prosperity, he was accused of menacing his rival, was inflicted on Attalus himself. He was condemned, after the amputation of two fingers, to a perpetual exile in the Isle of Lepari, where he was supplied with the decent necessaries of life. The remainder of the reign of Honorius was undisturbed by rebellion. And it may be observed, that, in the space of five years, seven usurpers had yielded to the fortune of a prince, who was himself incapable either of counsel or of action. The situation of Spain, separated, on all sides, from the enemies of Rome, by the sea, by the mountains, and by intermediate provinces, had secured the long tranquillity of that remote and sequestered country. And we may observe, as a sure symptom of domestic happiness, that, in a period of four hundred years, Spain furnished very few materials to the history of the Roman Empire. The footsteps of the barbarians, who, in the reign of Gallienus, had penetrated beyond the Pyrenees, were soon obliterated by the return of peace. 
And in the 4th century of the Christian era, the cities of Emerita, or Merida, of Cordoba, Seville, Bracara, and Tarragona, were numbered with the most illustrious of the Roman world. The various plenty of the animal, the vegetable, and the mineral kingdoms, was improved and manufactured by the skill of an industrious people, and the peculiar advantages of naval stores contributed to support an extensive and profitable trade. 3886 The arts and sciences flourished under the protection of the emperors. And if the character of the Spaniards was enfeebled by peace and servitude, the hostile approach of the Germans, who had spread terror and desolation from the Rhine to the Pyrenees, seemed to rekindle some sparks of military ardor. As long as the defense of the mountains was entrusted to the hardy and faithful militia of the country, they successfully repelled the frequent attempts of the barbarians. But no sooner had the national troops been compelled to resign their post to the Honorian bands, in the service of Constantine, than the gates of Spain were treacherously betrayed to the public enemy. About ten months before the sack of Rome by the Goths. 3887 The consciousness of guilt and the thirst of rapine prompted the mercenary guards of the Pyrenees to desert their station, to invite the arms of the Suevi, the Vandals, and the Alani. And to swell the torrent which was poured with irresistible violence from the frontiers of Gaul to the Sea of Africa. The misfortunes of Spain may be described in the language of its most eloquent historian, who has concisely expressed the passionate and perhaps exaggerated declamations of contemporary writers. 3888 The eruption of these nations was followed by the most dreadful calamities, as the barbarians exercised their indiscriminate cruelty on the fortunes of the Romans and the Spaniards, and ravaged with equal fury the cities and the open country. The progress of famine reduced the miserable inhabitants to feed on the flesh of their fellow creatures. And even the wild beasts, who multiplied, without control, in the desert, were exasperated, by the taste of blood, and the impatience of hunger, boldly to attack and devour their human prey. Pestilence soon appeared, the inseparable companion of famine, a large proportion of the people was swept away, and the groans of the dying excited only the envy of their surviving friends. At length the barbarians, satiated with carnage and rapine, and afflicted by the contagious evils which they themselves had introduced, fixed their permanent seats in the depopulated country. The ancient Galicia, whose limits included the kingdom of Old Castile, was divided between the Suevi and the Vandals, the Alani were scattered over the provinces of Carthagena and Lusitania, from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic Ocean. And the fruitful territory of Boetica was allotted to the Silingi, another branch of the Vandalic nation. After regulating this partition, the conquerors contracted with their new subjects some reciprocal engagements of protection and obedience, the lands were again cultivated, and the towns and villages were again occupied by a captive people. The greatest part of the Spaniards was even disposed to prefer this new condition of poverty and barbarism, to the severe oppressions of the Roman government, yet there were many who still asserted their native freedom. And who refused, more especially in the mountains of Galicia, to submit to the barbarian yoke. 3889. The important present of the heads of Jovinus and Sebastian had approved the friendship of Adolphus, and restored Gaul to the obedience of his brother Honorius. Peace was incompatible with the situation and temper of the king of the Goths. He readily accepted the proposal of turning his victorious arms against the barbarians of Spain. The troops of Constantius intercepted his communication with the seaports of Gaul, and gently pressed his march towards the Pyrenees. 3890 He passed the mountains, and surprised, in the name of the emperor, the city of Barcelona. The fondness of Adolphus for his Roman bride, was not abetted by time or possession, and the birth of a son, surnamed, from his illustrious grandsire, Theodosius, appeared to fix him forever in the interest of the Republic. The loss of that infant, whose remains were deposited in a silver coffin in one of the churches near Barcelona, afflicted his parents, but the grief of the Gothic king was suspended by the labours of the field. And the course of his victories was soon interrupted by domestic treason. He had imprudently received into his service one of the followers of Ceres, a barbarian of a daring spirit, but of a diminutive stature whose secret desire of revenging the death of his beloved patron was continually irritated by the sarcasms of his insolent master. Adolphus was assassinated in the palace of Barcelona. 
The laws of the succession were violated by a tumultuous faction, 3891 and a stranger to the royal race, Singeric, the brother of Ceres himself, was seated on the Gothic throne. The first act of his reign was the inhuman murder of the six children of Adolphus, the issue of a former marriage, whom he tore, without pity, from the feeble arms of a venerable bishop. 3892 The unfortunate Placidia, instead of the respectful compassion, which she might have excited in the most savage breasts, was treated with cruel and wanton insult. The daughter of the emperor Theodosius, confounded among a crowd of vulgar captives, was compelled to march on foot above twelve miles, before the horse of a barbarian, the assassin of a husband whom Placidia loved and lamented. 3893 but Placidia soon obtained the pleasure of revenge, and the view of her ignominious sufferings might rouse an indignant people against the tyrant, who was assassinated on the seventh day of his usurpation. After the death of Singeric, the free choice of the nation bestowed the Gothic scepter on Wulia, whose warlike and ambitious temper appeared, in the beginning of his reign, extremely hostile to the Republic. He marched in arms from Barcelona to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, which the ancients revered and dreaded as the boundary of the world. But when he reached the southern promontory of Spain 3894 and, from the rock now covered by the fortress of Gibraltar, contemplated the neighboring and fertile coast of Africa, Wulia resumed the designs of conquest, which had been interrupted by the death of Alaric. The winds and waves again disappointed the enterprise of the Goths, and the minds of a superstitious people were deeply affected by the repeated disasters of storms and shipwrecks. In this disposition the successor of Adolphus no longer refused to listen to a Roman ambassador, whose proposals were enforced by the real, or supposed, approach of a numerous army, under the conduct of the brave Constantius. A solemn treaty was stipulated and observed, Placidia was honorably restored to her brother, six hundred thousand measures of wheat were delivered to the hungry Goths, 3895 and Wulia engaged to draw his sword in the service of the empire. A bloody war was instantly excited among the barbarians of Spain. And the contending princes are said to have addressed their letters, their ambassadors, and their hostages, to the throne of the western emperor, exhorting him to remain a tranquil spectator of their contest. The events of which must be favorable to the Romans, by the mutual slaughter of their common enemies. 3896 The Spanish War was obstinately supported, during three campaigns, with desperate valor, and various success. And the martial achievements of Wulia diffused through the empire the superior renown of the Gothic hero. He exterminated the Silingi, who had irretrievably ruined the elegant plenty of the province of Boetica. He slew, in battle, the king of the Alani. And the remains of those Scythian wanderers, who escaped from the field, instead of choosing a new leader, humbly sought a refuge under the standard of the Vandals, with whom they were ever afterwards confounded. The Vandals themselves, and the Suevi, yielded to the efforts of the invincible Goths. The promiscuous multitude of barbarians, whose retreat had been intercepted, were driven into the mountains of Galicia. Where they still continued, in a narrow compass and on a barren soil, to exercise their domestic and implacable hostilities. In the pride of victory, Wulia was faithful to his engagements, he restored his Spanish conquests to the obedience of Honorius. And the tyranny of the imperial officers soon reduced an oppressed people to regret the time of their barbarian servitude. While the event of the war was still doubtful, the first advantages obtained by the arms of Wulia had encouraged the court of Ravenna to decree the honors of a triumph to their feeble sovereign. He entered Rome like the ancient conquerors of nations. And if the monuments of servile corruption had not long since met with the fate which they deserved, we should probably find that a crowd of poets and orators, of magistrates and bishops, applauded the fortune, the wisdom, and the invincible courage, of the Emperor Honorius. 3897 Such a triumph might have been justly claimed by the ally of Rome, if Wulia, before he repassed the Pyrenees, had extirpated the seeds of the Spanish War. His victorious Goths, forty-three years after they had passed the Danube, were established, according to the faith of treaties, in the possession of the Second Aquitaine. A maritime province between the Garonne and the Loire, under the civil and ecclesiastical jurisdiction of Bordeaux. 
that metropolis, advantageously situated for the trade of the ocean, was built in a regular and elegant form. And its numerous inhabitants were distinguished among the Gauls by their wealth, their learning, and the politeness of their manners. The adjacent province, which has been fondly compared to the Garden of Eden, is blessed with a fruitful soil, and a temperate climate, the face of the country displayed the arts and the rewards of industry. And the Goths, after their martial toils, luxuriously exhausted the rich vineyards of Aquitaine. 3898 The Gothic limits were enlarged by the additional gift of some neighboring dioceses. And the successors of Alaric fixed their royal residence at Thulaus, which included five populous quarters, or cities, within the spacious circuit of its walls. About the same time, in the last years of the reign of Honorius, the Goths, the Burgundians, and the Franks, obtained a permanent seat and dominion in the provinces of Gaul. The liberal grant of the usurper Jovinus to his Burgundian allies, was confirmed by the lawful emperor, the lands of the first, or upper, Germany, were ceded to those formidable barbarians. And they gradually occupied, either by conquest or treaty, the two provinces which still retain, with the titles of duchy and county, the national appellation of Burgundy. 3899 The Franks, the valiant and faithful allies of the Roman Republic, were soon tempted to imitate the invaders, whom they had so bravely resisted. Treves, the capital of Gaul, was pillaged by their lawless bands. And the humble colony, which they so long maintained in the district of Tuxandia, in Brabant, insensibly multiplied along the banks of the Meuse and Scheldt, till their independent power filled the whole extent of the second, or lower Germany. These facts may be sufficiently justified by historic evidence. But the foundation of the French monarchy by Pharamond, the conquests, the laws, and even the existence, of that hero, have been justly arraigned by the impartial severity of modern criticism. 3900 the ruin of the opulent provinces of Gaul may be dated from the establishment of these barbarians, whose alliance was dangerous and oppressive, and who were capriciously impelled, by interest or passion, to violate the public peace. A heavy and partial ransom was imposed on the surviving provincials, who had escaped the calamities of war, the fairest and most fertile lands were assigned to the rapacious strangers, for the use of their families, their slaves, and their cattle and the trembling natives relinquished with a sigh the inheritance of their fathers. Yet these domestic misfortunes, which are seldom the lot of a vanquished people, had been felt and inflicted by the Romans themselves, not only in the insolence of foreign conquest, but in the madness of civil discord. The triumvirs proscribed eighteen of the most flourishing colonies of Italy, and distributed their lands and houses to the veterans who revenged the death of Caesar, and oppressed the liberty of their country. Two poets of unequal fame have deplored, in similar circumstances, the loss of their patrimony, but the legionaries of Augustus appear to have surpassed, in violence and injustice, the barbarians who invaded Gaul under the reign of Honorius. It was not without the utmost difficulty that Virgil escaped from the sword of the centurion, who had usurped his farm in the neighborhood of Mantua. 3901 But Paulinus of Bordeaux received a sum of money from his Gothic purchaser, which he accepted with pleasure and surprise. And though it was much inferior to the real value of his estate, this act of rapine was disguised by some colors of moderation and equity. 3902 The odious name of conquerors was softened into the mild and friendly appellation of the guests of the Romans. And the barbarians of Gaul, more especially the Goths, repeatedly declared, that they were bound to the people by the ties of hospitality, and to the emperor by the duty of allegiance and military service. The title of Honorius and his successors, their laws, and their civil magistrates, were still respected in the provinces of Gaul, of which they had resigned the possession to the barbarian allies. And the kings, who exercised a supreme and independent authority over their native subjects, ambitiously solicited the more honorable rank of master generals of the imperial armies. 3903 Such was the involuntary reverence which the Roman name still impressed on the minds of those warriors, who had borne away in triumph the spoils of the capital. Whilst Italy was ravaged by the Goths, and a succession of feeble tyrants oppressed the provinces beyond the Alps, the British island separated itself from the body of the Roman Empire. The regular forces, which guarded that remote province, had been gradually withdrawn, 
and Britain was abandoned without defence to the Saxon pirates, and the savages of Ireland and Caledonia. The Britons, reduced to this extremity, no longer relied on the tardy and doubtful aid of a declining monarchy. They assembled in arms, repelled the invaders, and rejoiced in the important discovery of their own strength. 3904 Afflicted by similar calamities, and actuated by the same spirit, the Armorican provinces, a name which comprehended the maritime countries of Gaul between the Seine and the lawyer 3905 resolved to imitate the example of the neighboring island. They expelled the Roman magistrates who acted under the authority of the usurper Constantine, and a free government was established among a people who had so long been subject to the arbitrary will of a master. The independence of Britain and Armorica was soon confirmed by Honorius himself, the lawful emperor of the West. And the letters, by which he committed to the new states the care of their own safety, might be interpreted as an absolute and perpetual abdication of the exercise and rights of sovereignty. This interpretation was, in some measure, justified by the event. After the usurpers of Gaul had successively fallen, the maritime provinces were restored to the empire. Yet their obedience was imperfect and precarious, the vain, inconstant, rebellious disposition of the people, was incompatible either with freedom or servitude. 3906 and Armorica, though it could not long maintain the form of a republic, 3907 was agitated by frequent and destructive revolts. Britain was irrecoverably lost. 3908 But as the emperors wisely acquiesced in the independence of a remote province, the separation was not embittered by the reproach of tyranny or rebellion. And the claims of allegiance and protection were succeeded by the mutual and voluntary offices of national friendship. 3909. This revolution dissolved the artificial fabric of civil and military government. And the independent country, during a period of forty years, till the descent of the Saxons, was ruled by the authority of the clergy, the nobles, and the municipal towns. 3910i. Zosimus, who alone has preserved the memory of this singular transaction, very accurately observes, that the letters of Honorius were addressed to the cities of Britain. 3911 Under the protection of the Romans, ninety-two considerable towns had arisen in the several parts of that great province, and, among these, thirty-three cities were distinguished above the rest by their superior privileges and importance. 3912 Each of these cities, as in all the other provinces of the empire, formed a legal corporation, for the purpose of regulating their domestic policy. And the powers of municipal government were distributed among annual magistrates, a select senate, and the assembly of the people, according to the original model of the Roman constitution. 3913 The management of a common revenue, the exercise of civil and criminal jurisdiction, and the habits of public counsel and command, were inherent to these petty republics. And when they asserted their independence, the youth of the city, and of the adjacent districts, would naturally range themselves under the standard of the magistrate. But the desire of obtaining the advantages, and of escaping the burdens, of political society, is a perpetual and inexhaustible source of discord. Nor can it reasonably be presumed, that the restoration of British freedom was exempt from tumult and faction. The preeminence of birth and fortune must have been frequently violated by bold and popular citizens. And the haughty nobles, who complained that they were become the subjects of their own servants, 3914 would sometimes regret the reign of an arbitrary monarch. 2. The jurisdiction of each city over the adjacent country, was supported by the patrimonial influence of the principal senators. And the smaller towns, the villages, and the proprietors of land, consulted their own safety by adhering to the shelter of these rising republics. The sphere of their attraction was proportioned to the respective degrees of their wealth and populousness. But the hereditary lords of ample possessions, who were not oppressed by the neighborhood of any powerful city, aspired to the rank of independent princes, and boldly exercised the rights of peace and war. The gardens and villas, which exhibited some faint imitation of Italian elegance, would soon be converted into strong castles, the refuge, in time of danger. Of the adjacent country, 3915 the produce of the land was applied to purchase arms and horses. To maintain a military force of slaves, of peasants, and of licentious followers, and the chieftain might assume, within his own domain, 
the powers of a civil magistrate. Several of these British chiefs might be the genuine posterity of ancient kings, and many more would be tempted to adopt this honourable genealogy, and to vindicate their hereditary claims, which had been suspended by the usurpation of the Caesars. 39-16 Their situation and their hopes would dispose them to affect the dress, the language, and the customs of their ancestors. If the princes of Britain relapsed into barbarism, while the cities studiously preserved the laws and manners of Rome, the whole island must have been gradually divided by the distinction of two national parties. Again broken into a thousand subdivisions of war and faction, by the various provocations of interest and resentment. The public strength, instead of being united against a foreign enemy, was consumed in obscure and intestine quarrels. And the personal merit which had placed a successful leader at the head of his equals, might enable him to subdue the freedom of some neighboring cities. And to claim a rank among the tyrants 3917 who infested Britain after the dissolution of the Roman government. 3. The British church might be composed of 30 or 40 bishops 3918 with an adequate proportion of the inferior clergy. And the want of riches, for they seem to have been poor 3919, would compel them to deserve the public esteem, by a decent and exemplary behaviour. The interest, as well as the temper of the clergy, was favourable to the peace and union of their distracted country, those salutary lessons might be frequently inculcated in their popular discourses. And the episcopal synods were the only councils that could pretend to the weight and authority of a national assembly. In such councils, where the princes and magistrates sat promiscuously with the bishops, the important affairs of the state, as well as of the church, might be freely debated. Differences reconciled, alliances formed, contributions imposed, wise resolutions often concerted, and sometimes executed. And there is reason to believe, that, in moments of extreme danger, a Pendragon, or dictator, was elected by the general consent of the Britons. These pastoral cares, so worthy of the episcopal character, were interrupted, however, by zeal and superstition. And the British clergy incessantly laboured to eradicate the Pelagian heresy, which they abhorred, as the peculiar disgrace of their native country. 3920. It is somewhat remarkable, or rather it is extremely natural, that the revolt of Britain and Armorica should have introduced an appearance of liberty into the obedient provinces of Gaul. In a solemn edict, 3921 filled with the strongest assurances of that paternal affection which princes so often express, and so seldom feel. The Emperor Honorius promulgated his intention of convening an annual assembly of the seven provinces, a name peculiarly appropriated to Aquitaine and the ancient Narbonese, which had long since exchanged their Celtic rudeness for the useful and elegant arts of Italy. 3922 Alls, the seat of government and commerce, was appointed for the place of the assembly, which regularly continued twenty-eight days, from the 15th of August to the 13th of September, of every year. It consisted of the Praetorian Prefect of the Gauls, of seven provincial governors, one consular, and six presidents, of the magistrates, and perhaps the bishops, of about sixty cities. And of a competent, though indefinite, number of the most honourable and opulent possessors of land, who might justly be considered as the representatives of their country. They were empowered to interpret and communicate the laws of their sovereign. To expose the grievances and wishes of their constituents, to moderate the excessive or unequal weight of taxes. And to deliberate on every subject of local or national importance, that could tend to the restoration of the peace and prosperity of the seven provinces. If such an institution, which gave the people an interest in their own government, had been universally established by Trajan or the Antonines, the seeds of public wisdom and virtue might have been cherished and propagated in the empire of Rome. The privileges of the subject would have secured the throne of the monarch, the abuses of an arbitrary administration might have been prevented, in some degree, or corrected, by the interposition of these representative assemblies. And the country would have been defended against a foreign enemy by the arms of natives and freemen. Under the mild and generous influence of liberty, the Roman Empire might have remained invincible and immortal. Or if its excessive magnitude, and the instability of human affairs, had opposed such perpetual continuance, its vital and constituent members might have separately preserved their vigor and independence. 
But in the decline of the empire, when every principle of health and life had been exhausted, the tardy application of this partial remedy was incapable of producing any important or salutary effects. The Emperor Honorius expresses his surprise, that he must compel the reluctant provinces to accept a privilege which they should ardently have solicited. A fine of three, or even five, pounds of gold, was imposed on the absent representatives. Who seem to have declined this imaginary gift of a free constitution, as the last and most cruel insult of their oppressors. XXXA, Emperors Arcadius, Eutropius, Theodosius II. Arcadius Emperor of the East. Administration and disgrace of Eutropius. Revolt of Gynas. Persecution of St. John Chrysostom. Theodosius II. Emperor of the East. His sister Pulcheria. His wife Eudocia. The Persian War, and division of Armenia. The division of the Roman world between the sons of Theodosius marks the final establishment of the Empire of the East, which, from the reign of Arcadius to the taking of Constantinople by the Turks, subsisted 1,058 years. In a state of premature and perpetual decay, the sovereign of that empire assumed, and obstinately retained, the vain, and at length fictitious, title of Emperor of the Romans. And the hereditary appellation of Caesar and Augustus continued to declare that he was the legitimate successor of the first of men, who had reigned over the first of nations. The place of Constantinople rivaled, and perhaps excelled, the magnificence of Persia, and the eloquent sermons of St. Chrysostom 3923 celebrate, while they condemn, the pompous luxury of the reign of Arcadius. The emperor, says he, wears on his head either a diadem, or a crown of gold, decorated with precious stones of inestimable value. These ornaments, and his purple garments, are reserved for his sacred person alone. And his robes of silk are embroidered with the figures of golden dragons. His throne is of massy gold. Whenever he appears in public, he is surrounded by his courtiers, his guards, and his attendants. Their spears, their shields, their cuirasses, the bridles and trappings of their horses, have either the substance or the appearance of gold. And the large splendid boss in the midst of their shield is encircled with smaller bosses, which represent the shape of the human eye. The two mules that drew the chariot of the monarch are perfectly white, and shining all over with gold. The chariot itself, of pure and solid gold, attracts the admiration of the spectators, who contemplate the purple curtains, the snowy carpet, the size of the precious stones, and the resplendent plates of gold. That glitter as they are agitated by the motion of the carriage. The imperial pictures are white, on a blue ground, the emperor appears seated on his throne, with his arms, his horses, and his guards beside him, and his vanquished enemies in chains at his feet. The successors of Constantine established their perpetual residence in the royal city, which he had erected on the verge of Europe and Asia. Inaccessible to the menaces of their enemies, and perhaps to the complaints of their people, they received, with each wind, the tributary productions of every climate. While the impregnable strength of their capital continued for ages to defy the hostile attempts of the barbarians. Their dominions were bounded by the Adriatic and the Tigris. And the whole interval of twenty-five days' navigation, which separated the extreme cold of Scythia from the torrid zone of Ethiopia, 3924 was comprehended within the limits of the Empire of the East. The populous countries of that empire were the seat of art and learning, of luxury and wealth. And the inhabitants, who had assumed the language and manners of Greeks, styled themselves, with some appearance of truth, the most enlightened and civilized portion of the human species. The form of government was a pure and simple monarchy. The name of the Roman Republic, which so long preserved a faint tradition of freedom, was confined to the Latin provinces, and the princes of Constantinople measured their greatness by the servile obedience of their people. They were ignorant how much this passive disposition enervates and degrades every faculty of the mind. The subjects, who had resigned their will to the absolute commands of a master, were equally incapable of guarding their lives and fortunes against the assaults of the barbarians, or of defending their reason from the terrors of superstition. The first events of the reign of Arcadius and Honorius are so intimately connected, that the rebellion of the Goths, and the fall of Rufinus, have already claimed a place in the history of the West. 
It has already been observed, that Eutropius, 3925 one of the principal eunuchs of the palace of Constantinople, succeeded the haughty minister whose ruin he had accomplished, and whose vices he soon imitated. Every order of the state bowed to the new favorite, and their tame and obsequious submission encouraged him to insult the laws, and, what is still more difficult and dangerous, the manners of his country. Under the weakest of the predecessors of Arcadius, the reign of the eunuchs had been secret and almost invisible. They insinuated themselves into the confidence of the prince. But their ostensible functions were confined to the menial service of the wardrobe and imperial bedchamber. They might direct, in a whisper, the public councils, and blast, by their malicious suggestions, the fame and fortunes of the most illustrious citizens. But they never presumed to stand forward in the front of empire 3926 or to profane the public honors of the state. Eutropius was the first of his artificial sects, who dared to assume the character of a Roman magistrate and general. Sometimes, in the presence of the blushing senate, he ascended the tribunal to pronounce judgment, or to repeat elaborate harangues, and, sometimes, appeared on horseback, at the head of his troops, in the dress and armor of a hero. The disregard of custom and decency always betrays a weak and ill-regulated mind, nor does Eutropius seem to have compensated for the folly of the design by any superior merit or ability in the execution. His former habits of life had not introduced him to the study of the laws, or the exercises of the field, his awkward and unsuccessful attempts provoked the secret contempt of the spectators. The Goths expressed their wish that such a general might always command the armies of Rome, and the name of the minister was branded with ridicule, more pernicious, perhaps, than hatred, to a public character. The subjects of Arcadius were exasperated by the recollection, that this deformed and decrepit eunuch 3927 who so perversely mimicked the actions of a man, was born in the most abject condition of servitude. That before he entered the imperial palace, he had been successively sold and purchased by a hundred masters, who had exhausted his youthful strength in every mean and infamous office, and at length dismissed him, in his old age. To freedom and poverty. 3928 While these disgraceful stories were circulated, and perhaps exaggerated, in private conversation, the vanity of the favorite was flattered with the most extraordinary honors. In the Senate, in the capital, in the provinces, the statues of Eutropius were erected, in brass, or marble, decorated with the symbols of his civil and military virtues, and inscribed with the pompous title of the third founder of Constantinople. He was promoted to the rank of patrician, which began to signify in a popular, and even legal, acceptation, the father of the emperor, and the last year of the fourth century was polluted by the consulship of a eunuch and a slave. This strange and inexpiable prodigy 3929 awakened, however, the prejudices of the Romans. The effeminate consul was rejected by the West, as an indelible stain to the annals of the Republic. And without invoking the shades of Brutus and Camillus, the colleague of Eutropius, a learned and respectable magistrate, 3930 sufficiently represented the different maxims of the two administrations. The bold and vigorous mind of Rufinus seems to have been actuated by a more sanguinary and revengeful spirit, but the avarice of the eunuch was not less insatiate than that of the prefect. 3931 As long as he despoiled the oppressors, who had enriched themselves with the plunder of the people, Eutropius might gratify his covetous disposition without much envy or injustice, but the progress of his rapine soon invaded the wealth which had been acquired by lawful inheritance, or laudable industry. The usual methods of extortion were practiced and improved, and Claudian has sketched a lively and original picture of the public auction of the state. The impotence of the eunuch, says that agreeable satirist, has served only to stimulate his avarice, the same hand which in his servile condition, was exercised in petty thefts, to unlock the coffers of his master. Now grasps the riches of the world. And this infamous broker of the empire appreciates and divides the Roman provinces from Mount Hemus to the Tigris. One man, at the expense of his villa, is made proconsul of Asia, a second purchases Syria with his wife's jewels. And a third laments that he has exchanged his paternal estate for the government of Bithynia. In the antechamber of Eutropius, a large tablet is exposed to public view, which marks the respective prices of the provinces. The different value of Pontus, of Galatia, 
of Lydia, is accurately distinguished. Lycia may be obtained for so many thousand pieces of gold, but the opulence of Phrygia will require a more considerable sum. The eunuch wishes to obliterate, by the general disgrace, his personal ignominy, and as he has been sold himself, he is desirous of selling the rest of mankind. In the eager contention, the balance, which contains the fate and fortunes of the province, often trembles on the beam, until one of the scales is inclined, by a superior weight, the mind of the impartial judge remains in anxious suspense. Such, continues the indignant poet, are the fruits of Roman valor, of the defeat of Antiochus, and of the triumph of Pompey. This venal prostitution of public honors secured the impunity of future crimes. But the riches, which Eutropius derived from confiscation, were already stained with injustice, since it was decent to accuse, and to condemn, the proprietors of the wealth, which he was impatient to confiscate. Some noble blood was shed by the hand of the executioner, and the most inhospitable extremities of the empire were filled with innocent and illustrious exiles. Among the generals and consuls of the East, Abandantius 3932 had reason to dread the first effects of the resentment of Eutropius. He had been guilty of the unpardonable crime of introducing that abject slave to the palace of Constantinople. And some degree of praise must be allowed to a powerful and ungrateful favorite, who was satisfied with the disgrace of his benefactor. Abandantius was stripped of his ample fortunes by an imperial rescript, and banished to Pityus, on the Euxine, the last frontier of the Roman world. Where he subsisted by the precarious mercy of the barbarians, till he could obtain, after the fall of Eutropius, a milder exile at Sidon, in Phoenicia. The destruction of Timasius 3933 required a more serious and regular mode of attack. That great officer, the master general of the armies of Theodosius, had signalized his valor by a decisive victory, which he obtained over the Goths of Thessaly. But he was too prone, after the example of his sovereign, to enjoy the luxury of peace, and to abandon his confidence to wicked and designing flatterers. Timasius had despised the public clamor, by promoting an infamous dependent to the command of a cohort, and he deserved to feel the ingratitude of Bargus, who was secretly instigated by the favorite to accuse his patron of a treasonable conspiracy. The general was arraigned before the tribunal of Arcadius himself, and the principal eunuch stood by the side of the throne to suggest the questions and answers of his sovereign. But as this form of trial might be deemed partial and arbitrary, the further inquiry into the crimes of Timasius was delegated to Saturninus and Procopius. The former of consular rank, the latter still respected as the father-in-law of the Emperor Valens. The appearances of a fair and legal proceeding were maintained by the blunt honesty of Procopius. And he yielded with reluctance to the obsequious dexterity of his colleague, who pronounced a sentence of condemnation against the unfortunate Timasius. His immense riches were confiscated in the name of the emperor, and for the benefit of the favorite, and he was doomed to perpetual exile a oasis, a solitary spot in the midst of the sandy deserts of Libya. 3934 Secluded from all human converse, the master general of the Roman armies was lost forever to the world but the circumstances of his fate have been related in a various and contradictory manner. It is insinuated that Eutropius dispatched a private order for his secret execution. Point 3935 It was reported, that, in attempting to escape from Oasis, he perished in the desert, of thirst and hunger. And that his dead body was found on the sands of Libya. Point 3936 It has been asserted, with more confidence, that his son Syagrius, after successfully eluding the pursuit of the agents and emissaries of the court, collected a band of African robbers. That he rescued Timasius from the place of his exile, and that both the father and the son disappeared from the knowledge of mankind. 3937 But the ungrateful Bargus, instead of being suffered to possess the reward of guilt was soon after circumvented and destroyed, by the more powerful villainy of the minister himself who retained sense and spirit enough to abhor the instrument of his own crimes. The public hatred, and the despair of individuals, continually threatened, or seemed to threaten, the personal safety of Eutropius, as well as of the numerous adherents, who were attached to his fortune, and had been promoted by his venal favor. For their mutual defense, he contrived the safeguard of a law, which violated every principle of humanity and justice. 3938 I. 
It is enacted, in the name, and by the authority of Arcadius, that all those who should conspire, either with subjects or with strangers, against the lives of any of the persons whom the emperor considers as the members of his own body, shall be punished with death and confiscation. This species of fictitious and metaphorical treason is extended to protect, not only the illustrious officers of the state and army, who were admitted into the sacred consistory, but likewise the principal domestics of the palace. The senators of Constantinople, the military commanders, and the civil magistrates of the provinces. A vague and indefinite list, which, under the successors of Constantine, included an obscure and numerous train of subordinate ministers. 2. This extreme severity might perhaps be justified, had it been only directed to secure the representatives of the sovereign from any actual violence in the execution of their office. But the whole body of imperial dependents claimed a privilege, or rather impunity, which screened them, in the loosest moments of their lives, from the hasty, perhaps the justifiable, resentment of their fellow citizens. And, by a strange perversion of the laws, the same degree of guilt and punishment was applied to a private quarrel, and to a deliberate conspiracy against the emperor and the empire. The edicts of Arcadius most positively and most absurdly declares, that in such cases of treason, thoughts and actions ought to be punished with equal severity. That the knowledge of a mischievous intention, unless it be instantly revealed, becomes equally criminal with the intention itself. 3939 And that those rash men, who shall presume to solicit the pardon of traitors, shall themselves be branded with public and perpetual infamy. 3. With regard to the sons of the traitors, continues the emperor, although they ought to share the punishment, since they will probably imitate the guilt of their parents, yet, by the special effect of our imperial lenity, we grant them their lives. But, at the same time, we declare them incapable of inheriting, either on the father's or on the mother's side, or of receiving any gift or legacy, from the testament either of kinsmen or of strangers. Stigmatized with hereditary infamy, excluded from the hopes of honors or fortune, let them endure the pangs of poverty and contempt, till they shall consider life as a calamity, and death as a comfort and relief. In such words, so well adapted to insult the feelings of mankind, did the emperor, or rather his favorite eunuch, applaud the moderation of a law, which transferred the same unjust and inhuman penalties to the children of all those who had seconded, or who had not disclosed, their fictitious conspiracies. Some of the noblest regulations of Roman jurisprudence have been suffered to expire, but this edict, a convenient and forcible engine of ministerial tyranny, was carefully inserted in the codes of Theodosius and Justinian. And the same maxims have been revived in modern ages, to protect the electors of Germany, and the cardinals of the Church of Rome. 3940. Yet these sanguinary laws, which spread terror among a disarmed and dispirited people, were of too weak a texture to restrain the bold enterprise of Tribigild 3941 the Ostrogoth. The colony of that warlike nation, which had been planted by Theodosius in one of the most fertile districts of Phrygia, 3942 impatiently compared the slow returns of laborious husbandry with the successful rapine and liberal rewards of Alaric. And their leader resented, as a personal affront, his own ungracious reception in the palace of Constantinople. A soft and wealthy province, in the heart of the empire, was astonished by the sound of war. And the faithful vassal who had been disregarded or oppressed, was again respected, as soon as he resumed the hostile character of a barbarian. The vineyards and fruitful fields, between the rapid Marcius and the winding meander, 3943 were consumed with fire, the decayed walls of the cities crumbled into dust, at the first stroke of an enemy. The trembling inhabitants escaped from a bloody massacre to the shores of the Hellespont, and a considerable part of Asia Minor was desolated by the rebellion of Tribigild. His rapid progress was checked by the resistance of the peasants of Pamphylia. And the Ostrogoths, attacked in a narrow pass, between the city of Selgi, 3944 a deep morass, and the craggy cliffs of Mount Taurus, were defeated with the loss of their bravest troops. But the spirit of their chief was not daunted by misfortune. And his army was continually recruited by swarms of barbarians and outlaws, who were desirous of exercising the profession of robbery, under the more honorable names of war and conquest. 
The rumors of the success of Tribigild might for some time be suppressed by fear, or disguised by flattery, yet they gradually alarmed both the court and the capital. Every misfortune was exaggerated in dark and doubtful hints. And the future designs of the rebels became the subject of anxious conjecture. Whenever Tribigild advanced into the inland country, the Romans were inclined to suppose that he meditated the passage of Mount Taurus, and the invasion of Syria. If he descended towards the sea, they imputed, and perhaps suggested, to the Gothic chief, the more dangerous project of arming a fleet in the harbours of Ionia, and of extending his depredations along the maritime coast. From the mouth of the Nile to the port of Constantinople. The approach of danger, and the obstinacy of Tribigild, who refused all terms of accommodation, compelled Eutropius to summon a council of war. 3945 After claiming for himself the privilege of a veteran soldier, the eunuch entrusted the guard of Thrace and the Hellespont to Gynas the Goth, and the command of the Asiatic army to his favorite, Leo. Two generals, who differently, but effectually, promoted the cause of the rebels. Leo, 3946 who, from the bulk of his body, and the dullness of his mind, was surnamed the Ajax of the East, had deserted his original trade of a woolcomber, to exercise, with much less skill and success, the military profession. And his uncertain operations were capriciously framed and executed, with an ignorance of real difficulties, and a timorous neglect of every favorable opportunity. The rashness of the Ostrogoths had drawn them into a disadvantageous position between the rivers Melas and Eurymedon, where they were almost besieged by the peasants of Pamphylia. But the arrival of an imperial army, instead of completing their destruction, afforded the means of safety and victory. Tribigild surprised the unguarded camp of the Romans, in the darkness of the night. Seduced the faith of the greater part of the barbarian auxiliaries, and dissipated, without much effort, the troops, which had been corrupted by the relaxation of discipline, and the luxury of the capital. The discontent of Gynas, who had so boldly contrived and executed the death of Rufinus, was irritated by the fortune of his unworthy successor, he accused his own dishonorable patience under the servile reign of a eunuch. And the ambitious Goth was convicted, at least in the public opinion, of secretly fomenting the revolt of Tribigild, with whom he was connected by a domestic, as well as by a national alliance. 3947 When Gynas passed the Hellespont, to unite under his standard the remains of the Asiatic troops, he skillfully adapted his motions to the wishes of the Ostrogoths, abandoning, by his retreat, the country which they desired to invade. Or facilitating, by his approach, the desertion of the barbarian auxiliaries. To the imperial court he repeatedly magnified the valor, the genius, the inexhaustible resources of Tribigild, confessed his own inability to prosecute the war. And extorted the permission of negotiating with his invincible adversary. The conditions of peace were dictated by the haughty rebel, and the peremptory demand of the head of Eutropius revealed the author and the design of this hostile conspiracy. The bold satirist, who has indulged his discontent by the partial and passionate censure of the Christian emperors, violates the dignity, rather than the truth, of history. By comparing the son of Theodosius to one of those harmless and simple animals, who scarcely feel that they are the property of their shepherd. Two passions, however, fear and conjugal affection, awakened the languid soul of Arcadius, he was terrified by the threats of a victorious barbarian. And he yielded to the tender eloquence of his wife Eudoxia, who, with a flood of artificial tears, presenting her infant children to their father, implored his justice for some real or imaginary insult, which she imputed to the audacious eunuch. 3948 The emperor's hand was directed to sign the condemnation of Eutropius, the magic spell, which during four years had bound the prince and the people, was instantly dissolved. And the acclamations that so lately hailed the merit and fortune of the favorite, were converted into the clamors of the soldiers and people, who reproached his crimes, and pressed his immediate execution. In this hour of distress and despair, his only refuge was in the sanctuary of the church, whose privileges he had wisely or profanely attempted to circumscribe. And the most eloquent of the saints, John Chrysostom, enjoyed the triumph of protecting a prostrate minister, whose choice had raised him to the ecclesiastical throne of Constantinople. The archbishop, ascending the pulpit of the cathedral, that he might be distinctly seen and heard by an innumerable crowd of either sex and of every age, 
pronounced a seasonable and pathetic discourse on the forgiveness of injuries. And the instability of human greatness. The agonies of the pale and affrighted wretch, who lay groveling under the table of the altar, exhibited a solemn and instructive spectacle. And the orator, who was afterwards accused of insulting the misfortunes of Eutropius, labored to excite the contempt, that he might assuage the fury, of the people. Point thirty nine forty nine the powers of humanity, of superstition, and of eloquence, prevailed. The Empress Eudoxia was restrained by her own prejudices, or by those of her subjects, from violating the sanctuary of the church. And Eutropius was tempted to capitulate, by the milder arts of persuasion, and by an oath, that his life should be spared. 3950 Careless of the dignity of their sovereign, the new ministers of the palace immediately published an edict to declare, that his late favorite had disgraced the names of consul and patrician, to abolish his statues, to confiscate his wealth, and to inflict a perpetual exile in the island of Cyprus. 3951 A despicable and decrepit eunuch could no longer alarm the fears of his enemies, nor was he capable of enjoying what yet remained, the comforts of peace, of solitude, and of a happy climate. But their implacable revenge still envied him the last moments of a miserable life, and Eutropius had no sooner touched the shores of Cyprus, than he was hastily recalled. The vain hope of eluding, by a change of place, the obligation of an oath, engaged the empress to transfer the scene of his trial and execution from Constantinople to the adjacent suburb of Chalcedon. The consul Aurelian pronounced the sentence. And the motives of that sentence exposed the jurisprudence of a despotic government. The crimes which Eutropius had committed against the people might have justified his death. But he was found guilty of harnessing to his chariot the sacred animals, who, from their breed or color, were reserved for the use of the emperor alone. 3952. While this domestic revolution was transacted, Gainas 3953 openly revolted from his allegiance, united his forces at Thyatira in Lydia, with those of Tribigild and still maintained his superior ascendant over the rebellious leader of the Ostrogoths. The confederate armies advanced, without resistance, to the straits of the Hellespont and the Bosphorus. And Arcadius was instructed to prevent the loss of his Asiatic dominions, by resigning his authority and his person to the faith of the barbarians. The church of the holy martyr Euphemia, situate on a lofty eminence near Chalcedon 3954 was chosen for the place of the interview. Gynas bowed with reverence at the feet of the emperor, whilst he required the sacrifice of Aurelian and Saturninus, two ministers of consular rank. And their naked necks were exposed, by the haughty rebel, to the edge of the sword, till he condescended to grant them a precarious and disgraceful respite. The Goths, according to the terms of the agreement, were immediately transported from Asia into Europe. And their victorious chief, who accepted the title of Master General of the Roman armies, soon filled Constantinople with his troops, and distributed among his dependents the honors and rewards of the empire. In his early youth, Gainas had passed the Danube as a suppliant and a fugitive, his elevation had been the work of valor and fortune, and his indiscreet or perfidious conduct was the cause of his rapid downfall. Notwithstanding the vigorous opposition of the archbishop, he importunately claimed for his Arian sectaries the possession of a peculiar church, and the pride of the Catholics was offended by the public toleration of heresy. 3955 Every quarter of Constantinople was filled with tumult and disorder. And the barbarians gazed with such ardor on the rich shops of the jewelers, and the tables of the bankers, which were covered with gold and silver, that it was judged prudent to remove those dangerous temptations from their sight. They resented the injurious precaution, and some alarming attempts were made, during the night, to attack and destroy with fire the imperial palace. 3956 In this state of mutual and suspicious hostility, the guards and the people of Constantinople shut the gates, and rose in arms to prevent or to punish the conspiracy of the Goths. During the absence of Gynas, his troops were surprised and oppressed, 7,000 barbarians perished in this bloody massacre. In the fury of the pursuit, the Catholics uncovered the roof, and continued to throw down flaming logs of wood, till they overwhelmed their adversaries, who had retreated to the church or conventicle of the Arians. Gynas was either innocent of the design, or too confident of his success, 
he was astonished by the intelligence that the flower of his army had been ingloriously destroyed, that he himself was declared a public enemy. And that his countryman, Fravida, a brave and loyal confederate, had assumed the management of the war by sea and land. The enterprises of the rebel, against the cities of Thrace, were encountered by a firm and well-ordered defense. His hungry soldiers were soon reduced to the grass that grew on the margin of the fortifications, and Gynas, who vainly regretted the wealth and luxury of Asia, embraced a desperate resolution of forcing the passage of the Hellespont. He was destitute of vessels, but the woods of the Chersonesus afforded materials for rafts, and his intrepid barbarians did not refuse to trust themselves to the waves. But Fravida attentively watched the progress of their undertaking. As soon as they had gained the middle of the stream, the Roman galleys 3957 impelled by the full force of oars, of the current, and of a favorable wind, rushed forwards in compact order, and with irresistible weight. And the Hellespont was covered with the fragments of the Gothic shipwreck. After the destruction of his hopes, and the loss of many thousands of his bravest soldiers, Gynas, who could no longer aspire to govern or to subdue the Romans, determined to resume the independence of a savage life. A light and active body of barbarian horse, disengaged from their infantry and baggage, might perform in eight or ten days a march of three hundred miles from the Hellespont to the Danube. Three thousand nine hundred and fifty-eight the garrisons of that important frontier had been gradually annihilated, the river, in the month of December, would be deeply frozen, and the unbounded prospect of Scythia was open to the ambition of Gynas. This design was secretly communicated to the national troops, who devoted themselves to the fortunes of their leader. And before the signal of departure was given, a great number of provincial auxiliaries, whom he suspected of an attachment to their native country, were perfidiously massacred. The Goths advanced, by rapid marches, through the plains of Thrace. And they were soon delivered from the fear of a pursuit, by the vanity of Fravida 3959 who, instead of extinguishing the war, hastened to enjoy the popular applause, and to assume the peaceful honors of the consulship. But a formidable ally appeared in arms to vindicate the majesty of the empire, and to guard the peace and liberty of Scythia. 3960 The superior forces of Uldin, king of the Huns, opposed the progress of Gainas. A hostile and ruined country prohibited his retreat, he disdained to capitulate, and after repeatedly attempting to cut his way through the ranks of the enemy, he was slain, with his desperate followers, in the field of battle. Eleven days after the naval victory of the Hellespont, the head of Gynas, the inestimable gift of the conqueror, was received at Constantinople with the most liberal expressions of gratitude. And the public deliverance was celebrated by festivals and illuminations. The triumphs of Arcadius became the subject of epic poems. 3961 And the monarch, no longer oppressed by any hostile terrors, resigned himself to the mild and absolute dominion of his wife, the fair and artful Eudoxia, who was sullied her fame by the persecution of St. John Chrysostom. After the death of the indolent Nectarius, the successor of Gregory Nazianzen, the Church of Constantinople was distracted by the ambition of rival candidates, who were not ashamed to solicit, with gold or flattery, the suffrage of the people. Or of the favorite. On this occasion Eutropius seems to have deviated from his ordinary maxims, and his uncorrupted judgment was determined only by the superior merit of a stranger. In a late journey into the East, he had admired the sermons of John, a native and presbyter of Antioch, whose name has been distinguished by the epithet of Chrysostom, or the Golden Mouth. 3962 A private order was dispatched to the governor of Syria. And as the people might be unwilling to resign their favorite preacher, he was transported, with speed and secrecy in a post chariot, from Antioch to Constantinople. The unanimous and unsolicited consent of the court, the clergy, and the people, ratified the choice of the minister, and, both as a saint and as an orator, the new archbishop surpassed the sanguine expectations of the public. Born of a noble and opulent family, in the capital of Syria, Chrysostom had been educated, by the care of a tender mother, under the tuition of the most skillful masters. He studied the art of rhetoric in the school of Libanius. And that celebrated sophist, who soon discovered the talents of his disciple, ingenuously confessed that John would have deserved to succeed him, had he not been stolen away by the Christians. 
his piety soon disposed him to receive the sacrament of baptism, to renounce the lucrative and honorable profession of the law, and to bury himself in the adjacent desert, where he subdued the lusts of the flesh by an austere penance of six years. His infirmities compelled him to return to the society of mankind. And the authority of Miletius devoted his talents to the service of the church, but in the midst of his family, and afterwards on the archiepiscopal throne, Chrysostom still persevered in the practice of the monastic virtues. The ample revenues, which his predecessors had consumed in pomp and luxury, he diligently applied to the establishment of hospitals. And the multitudes, who were supported by his charity, preferred the eloquent and edifying discourses of their archbishop to the amusements of the theatre or the circus. The monuments of that eloquence, which was admired near twenty years at Antioch and Constantinople, have been carefully preserved. And the possession of near one thousand sermons, or homilies has authorized the critics 3963 of succeeding times to appreciate the genuine merit of Chrysostom. They unanimously attribute to the Christian orator the free command of an elegant and copious language, the judgment to conceal the advantages which he derived from the knowledge of rhetoric and philosophy. An inexhaustible fund of metaphors and similitudes of ideas and images, to vary and illustrate the most familiar topics, the happy art of engaging the passions in the service of virtue. And of exposing the folly, as well as the turpitude, of vice, almost with the truth and spirit of a dramatic representation. The pastoral labors of the Archbishop of Constantinople provoked, and gradually united against him, two sorts of enemies. The aspiring clergy, who envied his success, and the obstinate sinners, who were offended by his reproofs. When Chrysostom thundered, from the pulpit of St. Sophia, against the degeneracy of the Christians, his shafts were spent among the crowd, without wounding, or even marking, the character of any individual. When he declaimed against the peculiar vices of the rich, poverty might obtain a transient consolation from his invectives, but the guilty were still sheltered by their numbers. And the reproach itself was dignified by some ideas of superiority and enjoyment. But as the pyramid rose towards the summit, it insensibly diminished to a point. And the magistrates, the ministers, the favorite eunuchs, the ladies of the court, 3964 the Empress Eudoxia herself, had a much larger share of guilt to divide among a smaller proportion of criminals. The personal applications of the audience were anticipated, or confirmed, by the testimony of their own conscience, and the intrepid preacher assumed the dangerous right of exposing both the offense and the offender to the public abhorrence. The secret resentment of the court encouraged the discontent of the clergy and monks of Constantinople, who were too hastily reformed by the fervent zeal of their archbishop. He had condemned, from the pulpit, the domestic females of the clergy of Constantinople, who, under the name of servants, or sisters, afforded a perpetual occasion either of sin or of scandal. The silent and solitary ascetics, who had secluded themselves from the world, were entitled to the warmest approbation of Chrysostom. But he despised and stigmatized, as the disgrace of their holy profession, the crowd of degenerate monks, who, from some unworthy motives of pleasure or profit, so frequently infested the streets of the capital. To the voice of persuasion, the archbishop was obliged to add the terrors of authority, and his ardor, in the exercise of ecclesiastical jurisdiction, was not always exempt from passion, nor was it always guided by prudence. Chrysostom was naturally of a choleric disposition. 3965 Although he struggled, according to the precepts of the Gospel, to love his private enemies, he indulged himself in the privilege of hating the enemies of God and of the Church. And his sentiments were sometimes delivered with too much energy of countenance and expression. He still maintained, from some considerations of health or abstinence, his former habits of taking his repasts alone. And this inhospitable custom, 3966 which his enemies imputed to pride, contributed, at least, to nourish the infirmity of a morose and unsocial humor. Separated from that familiar intercourse, which facilitates the knowledge and the dispatch of business, he reposed an unsuspecting confidence in his deacon Serapion. And seldom applied his speculative knowledge of human nature to the particular character either of his dependents or of his equals. Conscious of the purity of his intentions, 
and perhaps of the superiority of his genius, the Archbishop of Constantinople extended the jurisdiction of the imperial city, that he might enlarge the sphere of his pastoral labors. And the conduct which the profane imputed to an ambitious motive, appeared to Chrysostom himself in the light of a sacred and indispensable duty. In his visitation through the Asiatic provinces, he deposed thirteen bishops of Lydia and Phrygia. And indiscreetly declared that a deep corruption of simony and licentiousness had infected the whole episcopal order. 3967 If those bishops were innocent, such a rash and unjust condemnation must excite a well grounded discontent. If they were guilty, the numerous associates of their guilt would soon discover that their own safety depended on the ruin of the archbishop, whom they studied to represent as the tyrant of the Eastern Church. This ecclesiastical conspiracy was managed by Theophilus, 3968 Archbishop of Alexandria, an active and ambitious prelate, who displayed the fruits of rapine in monuments of ostentation. His national dislike to the rising greatness of a city which degraded him from the second to the third rank in the Christian world, was exasperated by some personal dispute with Chrysostom himself. 3969 By the private invitation of the Empress, Theophilus landed at Constantinople with a still body of Egyptian mariners, to encounter the populace, and a train of dependent bishops, to secure, by their voices, the majority of a synod. The Synod 3970 was convened in the suburb of Chalcedon, surnamed the Oak, where Rufinus had erected a stately church and monastery, and their proceedings were continued during fourteen days, or sessions. A bishop and a deacon accused the Archbishop of Constantinople, but the frivolous or improbable nature of the forty-seven articles which they presented against him, may justly be considered as a fair and unexceptional panegyric. For successive summons were signified to Chrysostom. But he still refused to trust either his person or his reputation in the hands of his implacable enemies, who, prudently declining the examination of any particular charges, condemned his contumacious disobedience. And hastily pronounced a sentence of deposition. The Synod of the Oak immediately addressed the Emperor to ratify and execute their judgment, and charitably insinuated, that the penalties of treason might be inflicted on the audacious preacher, who had reviled, under the name of Jezebel. The Empress Eudoxia herself. The Archbishop was rudely arrested, and conducted through the city, by one of the imperial messengers, who landed him, after a short navigation, near the entrance of the Euxine. From whence, before the expiration of two days, he was gloriously recalled. The first astonishment of his faithful people had been mute and passive, they suddenly rose with unanimous and irresistible fury. Theophilus escaped, but the promiscuous crowd of monks and Egyptian mariners was slaughtered without pity in the streets of Constantinople. 3971 A seasonable earthquake justified the interposition of heaven. The torrent of sedition rolled forwards to the gates of the palace, and the empress, agitated by fear or remorse, threw herself at the feet of Arcadius, and confessed that the public safety could be purchased only by the restoration of Chrysostom. The Bosphorus was covered with innumerable vessels, the shores of Europe and Asia were profusely illuminated, and the acclamations of a victorious people accompanied, from the port to the cathedral, the triumph of the archbishop. Who, too easily, consented to resume the exercise of his functions, before his sentence had been legally reversed by the authority of an ecclesiastical synod. Ignorant, or careless, of the impending danger, Chrysostom indulged his zeal, or perhaps his resentment, declaimed with peculiar asperity against female vices, and condemned the profane honours which were addressed, almost in the precincts of street. Sophia, to the statue of the Empress. His imprudence tempted his enemies to inflame the haughty spirit of Eudoxia, by reporting, or perhaps inventing, the famous exordium of a sermon, Herodias is again furious, Herodias again dances. She once more requires the head of John, an insolent illusion, which, as a woman and a sovereign, it was impossible for her to forgive. 3972 The short interval of a perfidious truce was employed to concert more effectual measures for the disgrace and ruin of the archbishop. A numerous council of the eastern prelates, who were guided from a distance by the advice of Theophilus, confirmed the validity, without examining the justice, of the former sentence. And a detachment of barbarian troops was introduced into the city, to suppress the emotions of the people. On the vigil of Easter, 
the solemn administration of baptism was rudely interrupted by the soldiers, who alarmed the modesty of the naked catechumens, and violated, by their presence, the awful mysteries of the Christian worship. Arsatius occupied the Church of St. Sophia, and the archiepiscopal throne. The Catholics retreated to the Baths of Constantine, and afterwards to the fields, where they were still pursued and insulted by the guards, the bishops, and the magistrates. The fatal day of the second and final exile of Chrysostom was marked by the conflagration of the cathedral, of the senate house, and of the adjacent buildings. And this calamity was imputed, without proof, but not without probability, to the despair of a persecuted faction. 3973. Cicero might claim some merit, if his voluntary banishment preserved the peace of the Republic. 3974 But the submission of Chrysostom was the indispensable duty of a Christian and a subject. Instead of listening to his humble prayer, that he might be permitted to reside at Cyzicus, or Nicomedia, the inflexible empress assigned for his exile the remote and desolate town of Cucusus, among the ridges of Mount Taurus, in the Lesser Armenia. A secret hope was entertained, that the archbishop might perish in a difficult and dangerous march of seventy days, in the heat of summer, through the provinces of Asia Minor, where he was continually threatened by the hostile attacks of the Isaurians, and the more implacable fury of the monks. Yet Chrysostom arrived in safety at the place of his confinement, and the three years which he spent at Cucusus, and the neighboring town of Arabissus, were the last and most glorious of his life. His character was consecrated by absence and persecution, the faults of his administration were no longer remembered. But every tongue repeated the praises of his genius and virtue, and the respectful attention of the Christian world was fixed on a desert spot among the mountains of Taurus. From that solitude the archbishop, whose active mind was invigorated by misfortunes, maintained a strict and frequent correspondence 3975 with the most distant provinces. Exhorted the separate congregation of his faithful adherents to persevere in their allegiance, urged the destruction of the temples of Phoenicia, and the extirpation of heresy in the Isle of Cyprus. Extended his pastoral care to the missions of Persia and Scythia, negotiated, by his ambassadors, with the Roman pontiff and the emperor Honorius, and boldly appealed, from a partial synod, to the supreme tribunal of a free and general council. The mind of the illustrious exile was still independent, but his captive body was exposed to the revenge of the oppressors, who continued to abuse the name and authority of Arcadius. 3976 An order was dispatched for the instant removal of Chrysostom to the extreme desert of Pityus, and his guards so faithfully obeyed their cruel instructions, that, before he reached the sea coast of the Euxine, he expired at Comana, in Pontus. In the sixtieth year of his age, the succeeding generation acknowledged his innocence and merit. The archbishops of the East, who might blush that their predecessors had been the enemies of Chrysostom, were gradually disposed, by the firmness of the Roman pontiff, to restore the honours of that venerable name. 3977 At the pious solicitation of the clergy and people of Constantinople, his relics, thirty years after his death, were transported from their obscure sepulchre to the royal city. 3978 The emperor Theodosius advanced to receive them as far as Chalcedon, and, falling prostrate on the coffin, implored, in the name of his guilty parents, Arcadius and Eudoxia, the forgiveness of the injured saint. 3979. Yet a reasonable doubt may be entertained, whether any stain of hereditary guilt could be derived from Arcadius to his successor. Eudoxia was a young and beautiful woman, who indulged her passions, and despised her husband. Count John enjoyed, at least, the familiar confidence of the Empress, and the public named him as the real father of Theodosius the Younger. 3980 The birth of a son was accepted, however, by the pious husband, as an event the most fortunate and honourable to himself, to his family, and to the Eastern world, and the royal infant, by an unprecedented favour, was invested with the titles of Caesar and Augustus. In less than four years afterwards, Eudoxia, in the bloom of youth, was destroyed by the consequences of a miscarriage. And this untimely death confounded the prophecy of a holy bishop, 3981 who, amidst the universal joy, had ventured to foretell, that she should behold the long and auspicious reign of her glorious son. 
The Catholics applauded the justice of heaven, which avenged the persecution of St. Chrysostom, and perhaps the emperor was the only person who sincerely bewailed the loss of the haughty and rapacious Eudoxia. Such a domestic misfortune afflicted him more deeply than the public calamities of the East. 3982 The licentious excursions, from Pontus to Palestine, of the Isaurian robbers, whose impunity accused the weakness of the government. And the earthquakes, the conflagrations, the famine, and the flights of locusts, 3983 which the popular discontent was equally disposed to attribute to the incapacity of the monarch. At length, in the thirty-first year of his age, after a reign, if we may abuse that word, of thirteen years, three months, and fifteen days, Arcadius expired in the palace of Constantinople. It is impossible to delineate his character. Since, in a period very copiously furnished with historical materials, it has not been possible to remark one action that properly belongs to the son of the great Theodosius. The historian Procopius 3984 has indeed illuminated the mind of the dying emperor with a ray of human prudence, or celestial wisdom. Arcadius considered, with anxious foresight, the helpless condition of his son Theodosius, who was no more than seven years of age, the dangerous factions of a minority, and the aspiring spirit of Jesdigerd, the Persian monarch. Instead of tempting the allegiance of an ambitious subject, by the participation of supreme power, he boldly appealed to the magnanimity of a king, and placed, by a solemn testament, the scepter of the East in the hands of Jesdigerd himself. The royal guardian accepted and discharged this honorable trust with unexampled fidelity, and the infancy of Theodosius was protected by the arms and counsels of Persia. Such is the singular narrative of Procopius. And his veracity is not disputed by Agathias 3985 while he presumes to dissent from his judgment, and to arraign the wisdom of a Christian emperor, who, so rashly, though so fortunately, committed his son and his dominions to the unknown faith of a stranger, a rival, and a heathen. At the distance of 150 years, this political question might be debated in the court of Justinian, but a prudent historian will refuse to examine the propriety, till he has ascertained the truth, of the testament of Arcadius. As it stands without a parallel in the history of the world, we may justly require, that it should be attested by the positive and unanimous evidence of contemporaries. The strange novelty of the event, which excites our distrust, must have attracted their notice, and their universal silence annihilates the vain tradition of the succeeding age. The maxims of Roman jurisprudence, if they could fairly be transferred from private property to public dominion, would have adjudged to the Emperor Honorius the guardianship of his nephew, till he had attained, at least, the fourteenth year of his age. But the weakness of Honorius, and the calamities of his reign, disqualified him from prosecuting this natural claim. And such was the absolute separation of the two monarchies, both in interest and affection, that Constantinople would have obeyed, with less reluctance, the orders of the Persian, than those of the Italian, court. Under a prince whose weakness is disguised by the external signs of manhood and discretion, the most worthless favorites may secretly dispute the empire of the palace. And dictate to submissive provinces the commands of a master, whom they direct and despise. But the ministers of a child, who is incapable of arming them with the sanction of the royal name, must acquire and exercise an independent authority. The great officers of the state and army, who had been appointed before the death of Arcadius, formed an aristocracy, which might have inspired them with the idea of a free republic. And the government of the Eastern Empire was fortunately assumed by the prefect Anthemius, 3986 who obtained, by his superior abilities, a lasting ascendant over the minds of his equals. The safety of the young emperor proved the merit and integrity of Anthemius, and his prudent firmness sustained the force and reputation of an infant reign. Alden, with a formidable host of barbarians, was encamped in the heart of Thrace. He proudly rejected all terms of accommodation, and, pointing to the rising sun, declared to the Roman ambassadors, that the course of that planet should alone terminate the conquest of the Huns. But the desertion of his confederates, who were privately convinced of the justice and liberality of the imperial ministers, obliged Alden to repass the Danube, the tribe of the Syri, which composed his rearguard, was almost extirpated. And many thousand captives were dispersed to cultivate, with servile labor, 
the fields of Asia. 3987 In the midst of the public triumph, Constantinople was protected by a strong enclosure of new and more extensive walls. The same vigilant care was applied to restore the fortifications of the Illyrian cities. And a plan was judiciously conceived, which, in the space of seven years, would have secured the command of the Danube, by establishing on that river a perpetual fleet of 250 armed vessels. 3988. But the Romans had so long been accustomed to the authority of a monarch, that the first, even among the females, of the imperial family, who displayed any courage or capacity, was permitted to ascend the vacant throne of Theodosius. His sister Pulcheria, 3989 who was only two years older than himself, received, at the age of sixteen, the title of Augusta. And though her favor might be sometimes clouded by caprice or intrigue, she continued to govern the Eastern Empire near forty years. During the long minority of her brother, and after his death, in her own name, and in the name of Martian, her nominal husband. From a motive either of prudence or religion, she embraced a life of celibacy. And notwithstanding some aspersions on the chastity of Pulcheria, 3990 this resolution, which she communicated to her sisters Arcadia and Marina, was celebrated by the Christian world, as the sublime effort of heroic piety. In the presence of the clergy and people, the three daughters of Arcadius 3991 dedicated their virginity to God, and the obligation of their solemn vow was inscribed on a tablet of gold and gems, which they publicly offered in the great church of Constantinople. Their palace was converted into a monastery. And all males, except the guides of their conscience, the saints who had forgotten the distinction of sexes, were scrupulously excluded from the holy threshold. Pulcheria, her two sisters, and a chosen train of favorite damsels, formed a religious community, they denounced the vanity of dress, interrupted, by frequent fasts, their simple and frugal diet. Allotted a portion of their time to works of embroidery, and devoted several hours of the day and night to the exercises of prayer and psalmody. The piety of a Christian virgin was adorned by the zeal and liberality of an empress. Ecclesiastical history describes the splendid churches, which were built at the expense of Pulcheria, in all the provinces of the East, her charitable foundations for the benefit of strangers and the poor. The ample donations which she assigned for the perpetual maintenance of monastic societies, and the active severity with which she labored to suppress the opposite heresies of Nestorius and Eutyches. Such virtues were supposed to deserve the peculiar favor of the deity, and the relics of martyrs, as well as the knowledge of future events, were communicated in visions and revelations to the imperial saint. 3992 Yet the devotion of Pulcheria never diverted her indefatigable attention from temporal affairs, and she alone, among all the descendants of the great Theodosius, appears to have inherited any share of his manly spirit and abilities. The elegant and familiar use which she had acquired, both of the Greek and Latin languages, was readily applied to the various occasions of speaking or writing, on public business, her deliberations were maturely weighed. Her actions were prompt and decisive, and, while she moved, without noise or ostentation, the wheel of government, she discreetly attributed to the genius of the emperor the long tranquillity of his reign. In the last years of his peaceful life, Europe was indeed afflicted by the arms of war, but the more extensive provinces of Asia still continued to enjoy a profound and permanent repose. Theodosius the Younger was never reduced to the disgraceful necessity of encountering and punishing a rebellious subject, and since we cannot applaud the vigor, some praise may be due to the mildness and prosperity of the administration of Pulcheria. The Roman world was deeply interested in the education of its master. A regular course of study and exercise was judiciously instituted, of the military exercises of riding and shooting with the bow. Of the liberal studies of grammar, rhetoric, and philosophy, the most skillful masters of the East ambitiously solicited the attention of their royal pupil and several noble youths were introduced into the palace, to animate his diligence by the emulation of friendship. Pulcheria alone discharged the important task of instructing her brother in the arts of government. But her precepts may countenance some suspicions of the extent of her capacity, or of the purity of her intentions. She taught him to maintain a grave and majestic deportment. To walk, 
to hold his robes, to seat himself on his throne, in a manner worthy of a great prince, to abstain from laughter, to listen with condescension, to return suitable answers. To assume, by turns, a serious or a placid countenance, in a word, to represent with grace and dignity the external figure of a Roman emperor. But Theodosius 3993 was never excited to support the weight and glory of an illustrious name, and, instead of aspiring to support his ancestors. He degenerated, if we may presume to measure the degrees of incapacity, below the weakness of his father and his uncle. Arcadius and Honorius had been assisted by the guardian care of a parent, whose lessons were enforced by his authority and example. But the unfortunate prince, who is born in the purple, must remain a stranger to the voice of truth. And the son of Arcadius was condemned to pass his perpetual infancy encompassed only by a servile train of women and eunuchs. The ample leisure which he acquired by neglecting the essential duties of his high office, was filled by idle amusements and unprofitable studies. Hunting was the only active pursuit that could tempt him beyond the limits of the palace. But he most assiduously labored, sometimes by the light of a midnight lamp, in the mechanic occupations of painting and carving. And the elegance with which he transcribed religious books entitled the Roman Emperor to the singular epithet of calligraphs, or a fair writer. Separated from the world by an impenetrable veil, Theodosius trusted the persons whom he loved. He loved those who were accustomed to amuse and flatter his indolence, and as he never perused the papers that were presented for the royal signature, the acts of injustice the most repugnant to his character were frequently perpetrated in his name. The emperor himself was chaste, temperate, liberal, and merciful. But these qualities, which can only deserve the name of virtues when they are supported by courage and regulated by discretion, were seldom beneficial, and they sometimes proved mischievous, to mankind. His mind, enervated by a royal education, was oppressed and degraded by abject superstition, he fasted, he sung psalms, he blindly accepted the miracles and doctrines with which his faith was continually nourished. Theodosius devoutly worshipped the dead and living saints of the Catholic Church. And he once refused to eat, till an insolent monk, who had cast an excommunication on his sovereign, condescended to heal the spiritual wound which he had inflicted. 3994 the story of a fair and virtuous maiden, exalted from a private condition to the imperial throne, might be deemed an incredible romance, if such a romance had not been verified in the marriage of Theodosius. The celebrated Athenais 3995 was educated by her father Leontius in the religion and sciences of the Greeks. And so advantageous was the opinion which the Athenian philosopher entertained of his contemporaries, that he divided his patrimony between his two sons, bequeathing to his daughter a small legacy of one hundred pieces of gold. In the lively confidence that her beauty and merit would be a sufficient portion. The jealousy and avarice of her brothers soon compelled Athenais to seek a refuge at Constantinople, and, with some hopes either of justice or favor, to throw herself at the feet of Pulcheria. That sagacious princess listened to her eloquent complaint, and secretly destined the daughter of the philosopher Leontius for the future wife of the Emperor of the East, who had now attained the twentieth year of his age. She easily excited the curiosity of her brother, by an interesting picture of the charms of Athenais. Large eyes, a well-proportioned nose, a fair complexion, golden locks, a slender person, a graceful demeanor, an understanding improved by study, and a virtue tried by distress. Theodosius, concealed behind a curtain in the apartment of his sister, was permitted to behold the Athenian virgin, the modest youth immediately declared his pure and honorable love. And the royal nuptials were celebrated amidst the acclamations of the capital and the provinces. Athenais, who was easily persuaded to renounce the errors of paganism, received at her baptism the Christian name of Eudocha. But the cautious Pulcheria withheld the title of Augusta, till the wife of Theodosius had approved her fruitfulness by the birth of a daughter, who espoused, fifteen years afterwards, the Emperor of the West. The brothers of Eudocha obeyed, with some anxiety, her imperial summons. But as she could easily forgive their unfortunate unkindness, she indulged the tenderness, or perhaps the vanity, of a sister, by promoting them to the rank of consuls and prefects. 
In the luxury of the palace, she still cultivated those ingenuous arts which had contributed to her greatness, and wisely dedicated her talents to the honor of religion and of her husband. Eudocha composed a poetical paraphrase of the first eight books of the Old Testament, and of the prophecies of Daniel and Zechariah, a cento of the verses of Homer, applied to the life and miracles of Christ, the legend of Asti. Cyprian, and a panegyric on the Persian victories of Theodosius, and her writings, which were applauded by a servile and superstitious age, have not been disdained by the candor of impartial criticism. 3996 The fondness of the emperor was not abetted by time and possession, and Eudocha, after the marriage of her daughter, was permitted to discharge her grateful vows by a solemn pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Her ostentatious progress through the East may seem inconsistent with the spirit of Christian humility. She pronounced, from a throne of gold and gems, an eloquent oration to the Senate of Antioch, declared her royal intention of enlarging the walls of the city, bestowed a donative of two hundred pounds of gold to restore the public baths, and accepted the statues, which were decreed by the gratitude of Antioch. In the Holy Land, her alms and pious foundations exceeded the munificence of the great Helena, and though the public treasure might be impoverished by this excessive liberality, she enjoyed the conscious satisfaction of returning to Constantinople with the chains of Asti. Peter, the right arm of St. Stephen, and an undoubted picture of the Virgin, painted by St. Luke.3997 But this pilgrimage was the fatal term of the glories of Eudocha. Satiated with empty pomp, and unmindful, perhaps, of her obligations to Pulcheria, she ambitiously aspired to the government of the Eastern Empire, the palace was distracted by female discord. But the victory was at last decided, by the superior ascendant of the sister of Theodosius. The execution of Paulinus, master of the offices, and the disgrace of Cyrus, praetorian prefect of the East, convinced the public that the favor of Eudocha was insufficient to protect her most faithful friends. And the uncommon beauty of Paulinus encouraged the secret rumor, that his guilt was that of a successful lover. 3998 As soon as the empress perceived that the affection of Theodosius was irretrievably lost, she requested the permission of retiring to the distant solitude of Jerusalem. She obtained her request. But the jealousy of Theodosius, or the vindictive spirit of Pulcheria, pursued her in her last retreat, and Saturninus, count of the domestics, was directed to punish with death two ecclesiastics, her most favored servants. Eudocha instantly revenged them by the assassination of the count, the furious passions which she indulged on this suspicious occasion, seemed to justify the severity of Theodosius. And the empress, ignominiously stripped of the honors of her rank, 3999 was disgraced, perhaps unjustly, in the eyes of the world. The remainder of the life of Eudocha, about sixteen years, was spent in exile and devotion. And the approach of age, the death of Theodosius, the misfortunes of her only daughter, who was led a captive from Rome to Carthage, and the society of the holy monks of Palestine, insensibly confirmed the religious temper of her mind. After a full experience of the vicissitudes of human life, the daughter of the philosopher Leontius expired, at Jerusalem, in the sixty-seventh year of her age. Protesting, with her dying breath, that she had never transgressed the bounds of innocence and friendship. Point four thousand. The gentle mind of Theodosius was never inflamed by the ambition of conquest or military renown. And the slight alarm of a Persian war scarcely interrupted the tranquility of the East. The motives of this war were just and honorable. In the last year of the reign of Jesdigerd, the supposed guardian of Theodosius, a bishop, who aspired to the crown of martyrdom, destroyed one of the fire temples of Susa. For thousand and one his zeal and obstinacy were revenged on his brethren the Magi excited a cruel persecution, and the intolerant zeal of Jesdigerd was imitated by his son Veronis, or Baram, who soon afterwards ascended the throne. Some Christian fugitives, who escaped to the Roman frontier, were sternly demanded, and generously refused, and the refusal, aggravated by commercial disputes, soon kindled a war between the rival monarchies. The mountains of Armenia, and the plains of Mesopotamia, were filled with hostile armies, but the operations of two successive campaigns were not productive of any decisive or memorable events. Some engagements were fought, some towns were besieged, with various and doubtful success, 
and if the Romans failed in their attempt to recover the long-lost possession of Nisibis, the Persians were repulsed from the walls of a Mesopotamian city. By the valor of a martial bishop, who pointed his thundering engine in the name of Asti. Thomas the Apostle. Yet the splendid victories which the incredible speed of the messenger Palladius repeatedly announced to the palace of Constantinople, were celebrated with festivals and panegyrics. From these panegyrics the historians 4002 of the age might borrow their extraordinary, and, perhaps, fabulous tales, of the proud challenge of a Persian hero, who was entangled by the net, and dispatched by the sword, of Ariobindus the Goth. Of the ten thousand immortals, who were slain in the attack of the Roman camp, and of the hundred thousand Arabs, or Saracens, who were impelled by a panic terror to throw themselves headlong into the Euphrates. Such events may be disbelieved or disregarded, but the charity of a bishop, Bacatius of Amida, whose name might have dignified the saintly calendar, shall not be lost in oblivion. Boldly declaring, that vases of gold and silver are useless to a god who neither eats nor drinks, the generous prelate sold the plate of the church of Amida, employed the price in the redemption of seven thousand Persian captives, supplied their wants with affectionate liberality, and dismissed them to their native country, to inform their king of the true spirit of the religion which he persecuted. The practice of benevolence in the midst of war must always tend to assuage the animosity of contending nations, and I wish to persuade myself, that Acacius contributed to the restoration of peace. In the conference which was held on the limits of the two empires, the Roman ambassadors degraded the personal character of their sovereign, by a vain attempt to magnify the extent of his power. When they seriously advised the Persians to prevent, by a timely accommodation, the wrath of a monarch, who was yet ignorant of this distant war. A truce of one hundred years was solemnly ratified. And although the revolutions of Armenia might threaten the public tranquillity, the essential conditions of this treaty were respected near fourscore years by the successors of Constantine and Artaxerxes. Since the Roman and Parthian standards first encountered on the banks of the Euphrates, the kingdom of Armenia 4003 was alternately oppressed by its formidable protectors. And in the course of this history, several events, which incline the balance of peace and war, have been already related. A disgraceful treaty had resigned Armenia to the ambition of Sapper, and the scale of Persia appeared to preponderate. But the royal race of Arzaces impatiently submitted to the house of Sassan, the turbulent nobles asserted, or betrayed, their hereditary independence, and the nation was still attached to the Christian princes of Constantinople. In the beginning of the 5th century, Armenia was divided by the progress of war and faction, 4004 and the unnatural division precipitated the downfall of that ancient monarchy. Khosros, the Persian vassal, reigned over the eastern most extensive portion of the country, while the western province acknowledged the jurisdiction of Arzaces, and the supremacy of the emperor Arcadius. 4005 after the death of Arzaces, the Romans suppressed the regal government, and imposed on their allies the condition of subjects. The military command was delegated to the count of the Armenian frontier. The city of Theodosiopolis 4006 was built and fortified in a strong situation, on a fertile and lofty ground, near the sources of the Euphrates. And the dependent territories were ruled by five satraps, whose dignity was marked by a peculiar habit of gold and purple. The less fortunate nobles, who lamented the loss of their king, and envied the honors of their equals, were provoked to negotiate their peace and pardon at the Persian court. And returning, with their followers, to the palace of Artaxida, acknowledged Khosrows 4007 for their lawful sovereign. About thirty years afterwards, Artisires, the nephew and successor of Khosrows, fell under the displeasure of the haughty and capricious nobles of Armenia, and they unanimously desired a Persian governor in the room of an unworthy king. The answer of the Archbishop Isaac, whose sanction they earnestly solicited, is expressive of the character of a superstitious people. He deplored the manifest and inexcusable vices of Artisires, and declared, that he should not hesitate to accuse him before the tribunal of a Christian emperor, who would punish, without destroying, the sinner. Our king, continued Isaac, is too much addicted to licentious pleasures, but he has been purified in the holy waters of baptism. He is a lover of women, but he does not adore the fire or the elements. 
He may deserve the reproach of lewdness, but he is an undoubted Catholic, and his faith is pure, though his manners are flagitious. I will never consent to abandon my sheep to the rage of devouring wolves. And you would soon repent your rash exchange of the infirmities of a believer, for the specious virtues of a heathen. For thousand and eight exasperated by the firmness of Isaac, the factious nobles accused both the king and the archbishop as the secret adherents of the emperor. And absurdly rejoiced in the sentence of condemnation, which, after a partial hearing, was solemnly pronounced by Baram himself. The descendants of Arzaces were degraded from the royal dignity for thousand and nine which they had possessed above five hundred and sixty years. 4010 and the dominions of the unfortunate Artisires, 4011 under the new and significant appellation of Persarmenia, were reduced into the form of a province. This usurpation excited the jealousy of the Roman government. But the rising disputes were soon terminated by an amicable, though unequal, partition of the ancient kingdom of Armenia, 4012 and a territorial acquisition, which Augustus might have despised reflected some luster on the declining empire of the younger Theodosius. 33. Conquest of Africa by the Vandals. Death of Honorius. Valentinian III. Emperor of the East. Administration of his mother Placidia, Aetius and Boniface. Conquest of Africa by the Vandals. During a long and disgraceful reign of twenty-eight years, Honorius, Emperor of the West, was separated from the friendship of his brother, and afterwards of his nephew, who reigned over the East. And Constantinople beheld, with apparent indifference and secret joy, the calamities of Rome. The strange adventures of Placidia 4013 gradually renewed and cemented the alliance of the two empires. The daughter of the great Theodosius had been the captive, and the queen, of the Goths, she lost an affectionate husband, she was dragged in chains by his insulting assassin. She tasted the pleasure of revenge, and was exchanged, in the Treaty of Peace, for six hundred thousand measures of wheat. After her return from Spain to Italy, Placidia experienced a new persecution in the bosom of her family. She was averse to a marriage which had been stipulated without her consent. And the brave Constantius, as a noble reward for the tyrants whom he had vanquished, received, from the hand of Honorius himself, the struggling in the reluctant hand of the widow of Adolphus. But her resistance ended with the ceremony of the nuptials, nor did Placidia refuse to become the mother of Honoria and Valentinian III, or to assume and exercise an absolute dominion over the mind of her grateful husband. The generous soldier, whose time had hitherto been divided between social pleasure and military service, was taught new lessons of avarice and ambition, he extorted the title of Augustus, and the servant of Honorius was associated to the Empire of the West. The death of Constantius, in the seventh month of his reign, instead of diminishing, seemed to interest the power of Placidia. And the indecent familiarity 4014 of her brother, which might be no more than the symptoms of a childish affection, were universally attributed to incestuous love. On a sudden, by some base intrigues of a steward and a nurse, this excessive fondness was converted into an irreconcilable quarrel, the debates of the emperor and his sister were not long confined within the walls of the palace. And as the Gothic soldiers adhered to their queen, the city of Ravenna was agitated with bloody and dangerous tumults, which could only be appeased by the forced or voluntary retreat of Placidia and her children. The royal exiles landed at Constantinople, soon after the marriage of Theodosius, during the festival of the Persian victories. They were treated with kindness and magnificence. But as the statues of the Emperor Constantius had been rejected by the Eastern Court, the title of Augusta could not decently be allowed to his widow. Within a few months after the arrival of Placidia, a swift messenger announced the death of Honorius, the consequence of a dropsy. But the important secret was not divulged, till the necessary orders had been dispatched for the march of a large body of troops to the sea coast of Dalmatia. The shops and the gates of Constantinople remained shut during seven days. And the loss of a foreign prince, who could neither be esteemed nor regretted, was celebrated with loud and affected demonstrations of the public grief. While the ministers of Constantinople deliberated, the vacant throne of Honorius was usurped by the ambition of a stranger. The name of the rebel was John. He filled the confidential office of Primacerius, 
or principal secretary, and history has attributed to his character more virtues, than can easily be reconciled with the violation of the most sacred duty. Elated by the submission of Italy, and the hope of an alliance with the Huns, John presumed to insult, by an embassy, the majesty of the Eastern Emperor. But when he understood that his agents had been banished, imprisoned, and at length chased away with deserved ignominy, John prepared to assert, by arms, the injustice of his claims. In such a cause, the grandson of the great Theodosius should have marched in person, but the young emperor was easily diverted, by his physicians, from so rash and hazardous a design. And the conduct of the Italian expedition was prudently entrusted to Artaburius, and his son Aspar, who had already signalized their valor against the Persians. It was resolved, that Artaburius should embark with the infantry. Whilst Aspar, at the head of the cavalry, conducted Placidia and her son Valentinian along the sea coast of the Adriatic. The march of the cavalry was performed with such active diligence, that they surprised, without resistance, the important city of Aquileia, when the hopes of Aspar were unexpectedly confounded by the intelligence. That a storm had dispersed the imperial fleet. And that his father, with only two galleys, was taken and carried a prisoner into the port of Ravenna. Yet this incident, unfortunate as it might seem, facilitated the conquest of Italy. Artaburius employed, or abused, the courteous freedom which he was permitted to enjoy, to revive among the troops a sense of loyalty and gratitude. And as soon as the conspiracy was ripe for execution, he invited, by private messages, and pressed the approach of, Aspar. A shepherd, whom the popular credulity transformed into an angel, guided the eastern cavalry by a secret, and, it was thought, an impassable road, through the morasses of the Pe, the gates of Ravenna, after a short struggle, were thrown open. And the defenseless tyrant was delivered to the mercy, or rather to the cruelty, of the conquerors. His right hand was first cut off. And, after he had been exposed, mounted on an ass, to the public derision, John was beheaded in the circus of Aquileia. The Emperor Theodosius, when he received the news of the victory, interrupted the horse races. And singing, as he marched through the streets, a suitable psalm, conducted his people from the Hippodrome to the church, where he spent the remainder of the day in grateful devotion. 4015. In a monarchy, which, according to various precedents, might be considered as elective, or hereditary, or patrimonial, it was impossible that the intricate claims of female and collateral succession should be clearly defined. 4016 and Theodosius, by the right of consanguinity or conquest, might have reigned the sole legitimate emperor of the Romans. For a moment, perhaps, his eyes were dazzled by the prospect of unbounded sway. But his indolent temper gradually acquiesced in the dictates of sound policy. He contented himself with the possession of the East. And wisely relinquished the laborious task of waging a distant and doubtful war against the barbarians beyond the Alps. Or of securing the obedience of the Italians and Africans, whose minds were alienated by the irreconcilable difference of language and interest. Instead of listening to the voice of ambition, Theodosius resolved to imitate the moderation of his grandfather, and to seat his cousin Valentinian on the throne of the West. The royal infant was distinguished at Constantinople by the title of Nobilissimus, he was promoted, before his departure from Thessalonica, to the rank and dignity of Caesar. And after the conquest of Italy, the patrician Helion, by the authority of Theodosius, and in the presence of the Senate, saluted Valentinian III by the name of Augustus, and solemnly invested him with the diadem and the imperial purple. 4017 By the agreement of the three females who governed the Roman world, the son of Placidia was betrothed to Eudoxia, the daughter of Theodosius and Athenais. And as soon as the lover and his bride had attained the age of puberty, this honorable alliance was faithfully accomplished. At the same time, as a compensation, perhaps, for the expenses of the war, the western Illyricum was detached from the Italian dominions, and yielded to the throne of Constantinople. 4018 The Emperor of the East acquired the useful dominion of the rich and maritime province of Dalmatia, and the dangerous sovereignty of Pannonia and Naricum, which had been filled and ravaged above twenty years by a promiscuous crowd of Huns, Ostrogoths, Vandals, and Bavarians. 
Theodosius and Valentinian continued to respect the obligations of their public and domestic alliance, but the unity of the Roman government was finally dissolved. By a positive declaration, the validity of all future laws was limited to the dominions of their peculiar author, unless he should think proper to communicate them, subscribed with his own hand, for the approbation of his independent colleague. 4019. Valentinian, when he received the title of Augustus, was no more than six years of age, and his long minority was entrusted to the guardian care of a mother, who might assert a female claim to the succession of the Western Empire. Placidia envied, but she could not equal, the reputation and virtues of the wife and sister of Theodosius, the elegant genius of Eudocia, the wise and successful policy of Pulcheria. The mother of Valentinian was jealous of the power which she was incapable of exercising, 4020 she reigned twenty-five years, in the name of her son. And the character of that unworthy emperor gradually countenanced the suspicion that Placidia had enervated his youth by a dissolute education, and studiously diverted his attention from every manly and honorable pursuit. Amidst the decay of military spirit, her armies were commanded by two generals, Aetius 4021 and Boniface 4022 who may be deservedly named as the last of the Romans. Their union might have supported a sinking empire. Their discord was the fatal and immediate cause of the loss of Africa. The invasion and defeat of Attila have immortalized the fame of Aetius. And though time has thrown a shade over the exploits of his rival, the defense of Marseilles, and the deliverance of Africa, attest the military talents of Count Boniface. In the field of battle, in partial encounters, in single combats, he was still the terror of the barbarians, the clergy, and particularly his friend Augustine, were edified by the Christian piety which had once tempted him to retire from the world. The people applauded his spotless integrity, the army dreaded his equal and inexorable justice, which may be displayed in a very singular example. A peasant, who complained of the criminal intimacy between his wife and a Gothic soldier, was directed to attend his tribunal the following day, in the evening the count, who had diligently informed himself of the time and place of the assignation. Mounted his horse, rode ten miles into the country, surprised the guilty couple, punished the soldier with instant death, and silenced the complaints of the husband by presenting him, the next morning, with the head of the adulterer. The abilities of Aetius and Boniface might have been usefully employed against the public enemies, in separate and important commands, but the experience of their past conduct should have decided the real favor and confidence of the Empress Placidia. In the melancholy season of her exile and distress, Boniface alone had maintained her cause with unshaken fidelity, and the troops and treasures of Africa had essentially contributed to extinguish the rebellion. The same rebellion had been supported by the zeal and activity of Aetius, who brought an army of sixty thousand Huns from the Danube to the confines of Italy, for the service of the usurper. The untimely death of John compelled him to accept an advantageous treaty. But he still continued, the subject and the soldier of Valentinian, to entertain a secret, perhaps a treasonable, correspondence with his barbarian allies, whose retreat had been purchased by liberal gifts, and more liberal promises. But Aetius possessed an advantage of singular moment in a female reign, he was present, he besieged, with artful and assiduous flattery, the palace of Ravenna, disguised his dark designs with the mask of loyalty and friendship. And at length deceived both his mistress and his absent rival, by a subtle conspiracy, which a weak woman and a brave man could not easily suspect. He had secretly persuaded 4023 Placidia to recall Boniface from the government of Africa. He secretly advised Boniface to disobey the imperial summons, to the one, he represented the order as a sentence of death, to the other, he stated the refusal as a signal of revolt. And when the credulous and unsuspectful count had armed the province in his defense, Aetius applauded his sagacity in foreseeing the rebellion, which his own perfidy had excited. A temperate inquiry into the real motives of Boniface would have restored a faithful servant to his duty and to the Republic. But the arts of Aetius still continued to betray and to inflame, and the count was urged, by persecution, to embrace the most desperate counsels. The success with which he eluded or repelled the first attacks, could not inspire a vain confidence, that at the head of some loose, disorderly Africans, he should be able to withstand the regular forces of the West, commanded by a rival. 
whose military character it was impossible for him to despise. After some hesitation, the last struggles of prudence and loyalty, Boniface dispatched a trusty friend to the court, or rather to the camp, of Gonderic, king of the Vandals, with the proposal of a strict alliance. And the offer of an advantageous and perpetual settlement. After the retreat of the Goths, the authority of Honorius had obtained a precarious establishment in Spain. Except only in the province of Galicia, where the Suevi and the Vandals had fortified their camps, in mutual discord and hostile independence. The Vandals prevailed. And their adversaries were besieged in the Nervasian hills, between Leon and Oviedo, till the approach of Count Asterius compelled, or rather provoked, the victorious barbarians to remove the scene of the war to the plains of Boetica. The rapid progress of the Vandals soon acquired a more effectual opposition, and the master general Castinus marched against them with a numerous army of Romans and Goths. Vanquished in battle by an inferior army, Castinus fled with dishonor to Tarragona, and this memorable defeat, which has been represented as the punishment, was most probably the effect of his rash presumption. 4024 Seville and Carthagena became the reward, or rather the prey, of the ferocious conquerors. And the vessels which they found in the harbour of Carthagena might easily transport them to the isles of Majorca and Menorca, where the Spanish fugitives, as in a secure recess, had vainly concealed their families and their fortunes. The experience of navigation, and perhaps the prospect of Africa, encouraged the Vandals to accept the invitation which they received from Count Boniface, and the death of Gonderic served only to forward and animate the bold enterprise. In the room of a prince not conspicuous for any superior powers of the mind or body, they acquired his bastard brother, the terrible Genseric. 4025 A name, which, in the destruction of the Roman Empire, has deserved an equal rank with the names of Alaric and Attila. The king of the Vandals is described to have been of a middle stature, with a lameness in one leg, which he had contracted by an accidental fall from his horse. His slow and cautious speech seldom declared the deep purposes of his soul. He disdained to imitate the luxury of the vanquished, but he indulged the sterner passions of anger and revenge. The ambition of Genseric was without bounds and without scruples. And the warrior could dexterously employ the dark engines of policy to solicit the allies who might be useful to his success, or to scatter among his enemies the seeds of hatred and contention. Almost in the moment of his departure he was informed that Hermann Rick, king of the Suevi, had presumed to ravage the Spanish territories, which he was resolved to abandon. Impatient of the insult, Genseric pursued the hasty retreat of the Suevi as far as Merida, precipitated the king and his army into the river Anas, and calmly returned to the seashore to embark his victorious troops. The vessels which transported the Vandals over the modern Straits of Gibraltar, a channel only twelve miles in breadth, were furnished by the Spaniards, who anxiously wished their departure. And by the African general, who had implored their formidable assistance. 4026. Our fancy, so long accustomed to exaggerate and multiply the martial swarms of barbarians that seem to issue from the north, will perhaps be surprised by the account of the army which Genseric mustered on the coast of Mauritania. The Vandals, who in twenty years had penetrated from the Elba to Mount Atlas, were united under the command of their warlike king. And he reigned with equal authority over the Alani, who had passed, within the term of human life, from the cold of Scythia to the excessive heat of an African climate. The hopes of the bold enterprise had excited many brave adventurers of the Gothic nation, and many desperate provincials were tempted to repair their fortunes by the same means which had occasioned their ruin. Yet this various multitude amounted only to fifty thousand effective men. And though Genseric artfully magnified his apparent strength, by appointing eighty chinarchs, or commanders of thousands, the fallacious increase of old men, of children, and of slaves would scarcely have swelled his army to the number of fourscore thousand persons. 4027 But his own dexterity, and the discontents of Africa, soon fortified the Vandal powers, by the accession of numerous and active allies. The parts of Mauritania which border on the Great Desert and the Atlantic Ocean, were filled with a fierce and untractable race of men, whose savage temper had been exasperated, rather than reclaimed, by their dread of the Roman arms. The wandering Moors, 4028 as they gradually ventured to approach the seashore, 
and the camp of the Vandals, must have viewed with terror and astonishment the dress, the armor. The martial pride and discipline of the unknown strangers who had landed on their coast. And the fair complexions of the blue-eyed warriors of Germany formed a very singular contrast with the swarthy or olive hue which is derived from the neighborhood of the torrid zone. After the first difficulties had in some measure been removed, which arose from the mutual ignorance of their respective language, the Moors, regardless of any future consequence, embraced the alliance of the enemies of Rome. And a crowd of naked savages rushed from the woods and valleys of Mount Atlas, to satiate their revenge on the polished tyrants, who had injuriously expelled them from the native sovereignty of the land. The persecution of the Donatists 4029 was an event not less favorable to the designs of Genseric. Seventeen years before he landed in Africa, a public conference was held at Carthage, by the order of the magistrate. The Catholics were satisfied, that, after the invincible reasons which they had alleged, the obstinacy of the schismatics must be inexcusable and voluntary. And the Emperor Honorius was persuaded to inflict the most rigorous penalties on a faction which had so long abused his patience and clemency. Three hundred bishops, forty-thirty with many thousands of the inferior clergy, were torn from their churches, stripped of their ecclesiastical possessions, banished to the islands, and proscribed by the laws. If they presumed to conceal themselves in the provinces of Africa. Their numerous congregations, both in cities and in the country, were deprived of the rights of citizens, and of the exercise of religious worship. A regular scale of fines, from ten to two hundred pounds of silver, was curiously ascertained, according to the distinction of rank and fortune, to punish the crime of assisting at a schismatic conventicle. And if the fine had been levied five times, without subduing the obstinacy of the offender, his future punishment was referred to the discretion of the imperial court. 4031 by these severities, which obtained the warmest approbation of St. Augustine, 4032 great numbers of Donatists were reconciled to the Catholic Church, but the fanatics, who still persevered in their opposition, were provoked to madness and despair, the distracted country was filled with tumult and bloodshed. The armed troops of Circumcellions alternately pointed their rage against themselves, or against their adversaries, and the calendar of martyrs received on both sides a considerable augmentation. 4033 Under these circumstances, Genseric, a Christian, but an enemy of the Orthodox Communion, showed himself to the Donatists as a powerful deliverer. From whom they might reasonably expect the repeal of the odious and oppressive edicts of the Roman emperors. 4034 The conquest of Africa was facilitated by the active zeal, or the secret favor, of a domestic faction. The wanton outrages against the churches and the clergy of which the Vandals are accused, may be fairly imputed to the fanaticism of their allies. And the intolerant spirit which disgraced the triumph of Christianity, contributed to the loss of the most important province of the West. 4035 the court and the people were astonished by the strange intelligence, that a virtuous hero, after so many favors, and so many services, had renounced his allegiance, and invited the barbarians to destroy the province entrusted to his command. The friends of Boniface, who still believed that his criminal behavior might be excused by some honorable motive, solicited, during the absence of Aetius, a free conference with the Count of Africa. And Darius, an officer of high distinction, was named for the important embassy. 4036 In their first interview at Carthage, the imaginary provocations were mutually explained, the opposite letters of Aetius were produced and compared. And the fraud was easily detected. Placidia and Boniface lamented their fatal error, and the Count had sufficient magnanimity to confide in the forgiveness of his sovereign, or to expose his head to her future resentment. His repentance was fervent and sincere but he soon discovered that it was no longer in his power to restore the edifice which he had shaken to its foundations. Carthage and the Roman garrisons returned with their general to the allegiance of Valentinian, but the rest of Africa was still distracted with war and faction. And the inexorable king of the Vandals, disdaining all terms of accommodation, sternly refused to relinquish the possession of his prey. The band of veterans who marched under the standard of Boniface, and his hasty levies of provincial troops, were defeated with considerable loss, the victorious barbarians insulted the open country. And Carthage, Cerda, 
and Hippo Regius, were the only cities that appeared to rise above the general inundation. The long and narrow tract of the African coast was filled with frequent monuments of Roman art and magnificence. And the respective degrees of improvement might be accurately measured by the distance from Carthage and the Mediterranean. A simple reflection will impress every thinking mind with the clearest idea of fertility and cultivation, the country was extremely populous, the inhabitants reserved a liberal subsistence for their own use. And the annual exportation, particularly of wheat, was so regular and plentiful, that Africa deserved the name of the common granary of Rome and of mankind. On a sudden the seven fruitful provinces, from Tangier to Tripoli, were overwhelmed by the invasion of the Vandals, whose destructive rage has perhaps been exaggerated by popular animosity, religious zeal, and extravagant declamation. War, in its fairest form, implies a perpetual violation of humanity and justice, and the hostilities of barbarians are inflamed by the fierce and lawless spirit which incessantly disturbs their peaceful and domestic society. The Vandals, where they found resistance, seldom gave quarter, and the deaths of their valiant countrymen were expiated by the ruin of the cities under whose walls they had fallen. Careless of the distinctions of age, or sex, or rank, they employed every species of indignity and torture, to force from the captives a discovery of their hidden wealth. The stern policy of Genseric justified his frequent examples of military execution, he was not always the master of his own passions, or of those of his followers. And the calamities of war were aggravated by the licentiousness of the Moors, and the fanaticism of the Donatists. Yet I shall not easily be persuaded, that it was the common practice of the Vandals to extirpate the olives, and other fruit trees. Of a country where they intended to settle, nor can I believe that it was a usual stratagem to slaughter great numbers of their prisoners before the walls of a besieged city, for the sole purpose of infecting the air, and producing a pestilence. Of which they themselves must have been the first victims. 4037. The generous mind of Count Boniface was tortured by the exquisite distress of beholding the ruin which he had occasioned, and whose rapid progress he was unable to check. After the loss of a battle he retired into Hippo Regius. Where he was immediately besieged by an enemy, who considered him as the real bulwark of Africa. The maritime colony of Hippo, 4038 about 200 miles westward of Carthage, had formerly acquired the distinguishing epithet of Regius, from the residence of Numidian kings. And some remains of trade and populousness still adhere to the modern city, which is known in Europe by the corrupted name of Bona. The military labors, and anxious reflections, of Count Boniface, were alleviated by the edifying conversation of his friend Street Augustine. 4039 Till that bishop, the light and pillar of the Catholic Church, was gently released, in the third month of the siege, and in the seventy-sixth year of his age, from the actual and the impending calamities of his country. The youth of Augustine had been stained by the vices and errors which he so ingenuously confesses. But from the moment of his conversion to that of his death, the manners of the Bishop of Hippo were pure and austere, and the most conspicuous of his virtues was an ardent zeal against heretics of every denomination. The Manichaeans, the Donatists, and the Pelagians, against whom he waged a perpetual controversy. When the city, some months after his death, was burnt by the Vandals, the library was fortunately saved, which contained his voluminous writings. 232 separate books or treatises on theological subjects, besides a complete exposition of the Psalter and the Gospel, and a copious magazine of epistles and homilies. 4040 According to the judgment of the most impartial critics, the superficial learning of Augustine was confined to the Latin language. 4041 And his style, though sometimes animated by the eloquence of passion, is usually clouded by false and affected rhetoric. But he possessed a strong, capacious, argumentative mind. He boldly sounded the dark abyss of grace, predestination, free will, and original sin, and the rigid system of Christianity which he framed or restored, 4042 has been entertained, with public applause, and secret reluctance, by the Latin Church. 4043. By the skill of Boniface, and perhaps by the ignorance of the Vandals, the siege of Hippo was protracted above fourteen months, the sea was continually open. And when the adjacent country had been exhausted by irregular rapine, 
the besiegers themselves were compelled by famine to relinquish their enterprise. The importance and danger of Africa were deeply felt by the regent of the West. Placidia implored the assistance of her eastern ally, and the Italian fleet and army were reinforced by Asper, who sailed from Constantinople with a powerful armament. As soon as the force of the two empires was united under the command of Boniface, he boldly marched against the Vandals, and the loss of a second battle irretrievably decided the fate of Africa. He embarked with the precipitation of despair. And the people of Hippo were permitted, with their families and effects, to occupy the vacant place of the soldiers, the greatest part of whom were either slain or made prisoners by the Vandals. The Count, whose fatal credulity had wounded the vitals of the Republic, might enter the palace of Ravenna with some anxiety, which was soon removed by the smiles of Placidia. Boniface accepted with gratitude the rank of patrician, and the dignity of Master General of the Roman armies, but he must have blushed at the sight of those medals, in which he was represented with the name and attributes of victory. 4044 The discovery of his fraud, the displeasure of the Empress, and the distinguished favor of his rival, exasperated the haughty and perfidious soul of Aetius. He hastily returned from Gaul to Italy, with a retinue, or rather with an army, of barbarian followers, and such was the weakness of the government, that the two generals decided their private quarrel in a bloody battle. Boniface was successful. But he received in the conflict a mortal wound from the spear of his adversary, of which he expired within a few days, in such Christian and charitable sentiments, that he exhorted his wife, a rich heiress of Spain, to accept Aetius for her second husband. But Aetius could not derive any immediate advantage from the generosity of his dying enemy, he was proclaimed a rebel by the justice of Placidia. And though he attempted to defend some strong fortresses, erected on his patrimonial estate, the imperial power soon compelled him to retire into Pannonia, to the tents of his faithful Huns. The Republic was deprived, by their mutual discord, of the service of her two most illustrious champions. 4045. It might naturally be expected, after the retreat of Boniface, that the Vandals would achieve, without resistance or delay, the conquest of Africa. Eight years, however, elapsed, from the evacuation of Hippo to the reduction of Carthage. In the midst of that interval, the ambitious Genseric, in the full tide of apparent prosperity, negotiated a treaty of peace, by which he gave his son Hanaric for a hostage and consented to leave the Western Emperor in the undisturbed possession of the three Mauritanias. 4046 This moderation, which cannot be imputed to the justice, must be ascribed to the policy, of the conqueror. His throne was encompassed with domestic enemies, who accused the baseness of his birth, and asserted the legitimate claims of his nephews, the sons of Gonderic. Those nephews, indeed, he sacrificed to his safety. And their mother, the widow of the deceased king, was precipitated, by his order, into the river Ampsaga. But the public discontent burst forth in dangerous and frequent conspiracies. And the warlike tyrant is supposed to have shed more vandal blood by the hand of the executioner, than in the field of battle. 4047 The convulsions of Africa, which had favored his attack, opposed the firm establishment of his power. And the various seditions of the Moors and Germans, the Donatists and Catholics, continually disturbed, or threatened, the unsettled reign of the conqueror. As he advanced towards Carthage, he was forced to withdraw his troops from the western provinces, the sea coast was exposed to the naval enterprises of the Romans of Spain and Italy. And, in the heart of Numidia, the strong inland city of Corda still persisted in obstinate independence. 4048 These difficulties were gradually subdued by the spirit, the perseverance, and the cruelty of Genseric who alternately applied the arts of peace and war to the establishment of his African kingdom. He subscribed a solemn treaty, with the hope of deriving some advantage from the term of its continuance, and the moment of its violation. The vigilance of his enemies was relaxed by the protestations of friendship, which concealed his hostile approach. And Carthage was at length surprised by the Vandals, 585 years after the destruction of the city and republic by the younger Scipio. 4049. A new city had arisen from its ruins, with the title of a colony. And though Carthage might yield to the royal prerogatives of Constantinople, and perhaps to the trade of Alexandria, 
or the splendor of Antioch, she still maintained the second rank in the West. As the Rome, if we may use the style of contemporaries, of the African world. That wealthy and opulent metropolis 4050 displayed, in a dependent condition, the image of a flourishing republic. Carthage contained the manufactures, the arms, and the treasures of the six provinces. A regular subordination of civil honors gradually ascended from the procurators of the streets and quarters of the city, to the tribunal of the supreme magistrate, who, with the title of proconsul, represented the state and dignity of a consul of ancient Rome. Schools and gymnasia were instituted for the education of the African youth, and the liberal arts and manners, grammar, rhetoric, and philosophy, were publicly taught in the Greek and Latin languages. The buildings of Carthage were uniform and magnificent, a shady grove was planted in the midst of the capital, the new port, a secure and capacious harbor, was subservient to the commercial industry of citizens and strangers. And the splendid games of the circus and theater were exhibited almost in the presence of the barbarians. The reputation of the Carthaginians was not equal to that of their country, and the reproach of Punic faith still adhered to their subtle and faithless character. 4051 The habits of trade, and the abuse of luxury, had corrupted their manners. But their impious contempt of monks, and the shameless practice of unnatural lusts, are the two abominations which excite the pious vehemence of Salvian, the preacher of the age. 4052 The king of the Vandals severely reformed the vices of a voluptuous people, and the ancient, noble, ingenuous freedom of Carthage, these expressions of victor are not without energy, was reduced by Genseric into a state of ignominious servitude. After he had permitted his licentious troops to satiate their rage and avarice, he instituted a more regular system of rapine and oppression. An edict was promulgated, which enjoined all persons, without fraud or delay, to deliver their gold, silver, jewels, and valuable furniture or apparel, to the royal officers. And the attempt to secrete any part of their patrimony was inexorably punished with death and torture, as an act of treason against the state. The lands of the proconsular province, which formed the immediate district of Carthage, were accurately measured, and divided among the barbarians. And the conqueror reserved for his peculiar domain the fertile territory of Byzantium, and the adjacent parts of Numidia and Gatulia. 4053 it was natural enough that Genseric should hate those whom he had injured, the nobility and senators of Carthage were exposed to his jealousy and resentment. And all those who refused the ignominious terms, which their honor and religion forbade them to accept, were compelled by the Arian tyrant to embrace the condition of perpetual banishment. Rome, Italy, and the provinces of the East, were filled with a crowd of exiles, of fugitives, and of ingenuous captives, who solicited the public compassion. And the benevolent epistles of Theodoret still preserve the names and misfortunes of Calestian and Maria. 4054 The Syrian bishop deplores the misfortunes of Calestian, who, from the state of a noble and opulent senator of Carthage, was reduced, with his wife and family, and servants, to beg his bread in a foreign country. But he applauds the resignation of the Christian exile, and the philosophic temper, which, under the pressure of such calamities, could enjoy more real happiness than was the ordinary lot of wealth and prosperity. The story of Maria, the daughter of the magnificent Eudaemon, is singular and interesting. In the sack of Carthage, she was purchased from the Vandals by some merchants of Syria, who afterwards sold her as a slave in their native country. A female attendant, transported in the same ship, and sold in the same family, still continued to respect a mistress whom fortune had reduced to the common level of servitude. And the daughter of Eudaemon received from her grateful affection the domestic services which she had once required from her obedience. This remarkable behavior divulged the real condition of Maria, who, in the absence of the bishop of Cyrus, was redeemed from slavery by the generosity of some soldiers of the garrison. The liberality of Theodoret provided for her decent maintenance, and she passed ten months among the deaconesses of the church. Till she was unexpectedly informed, that her father, who had escaped from the ruin of Carthage, exercised an honorable office in one of the western provinces. Her filial impatience was seconded by the pious bishop, Theodoret, in a letter still extant, recommends Maria to the bishop of Egi, a maritime city of Cilicia, which was frequented, during the annual fair, 
by the vessels of the West. Most earnestly requesting, that his colleague would use the maiden with a tenderness suitable to her birth. And that he would entrust her to the care of such faithful merchants, as would esteem it a sufficient gain, if they restored a daughter, lost beyond all human hope, to the arms of her afflicted parent. Among the insipid legends of ecclesiastical history, I am tempted to distinguish the memorable fable of the Seven Sleepers, 4055 whose imaginary date corresponds with the reign of the younger Theodosius, and the conquest of Africa by the Vandals. 4056 When the Emperor Decius persecuted the Christians, seven noble youths of Ephesus concealed themselves in a spacious cavern in the side of an adjacent mountain. Where they were doomed to perish by the tyrant, who gave orders that the entrance should be firmly secured by the a pile of huge stones. They immediately fell into a deep slumber, which was miraculously prolonged without injuring the powers of life, during a period of 187 years. At the end of that time, the slaves of Adolius, to whom the inheritance of the mountain had descended, removed the stones to supply materials for some rustic edifice, the light of the sun darted into the cavern. And the seven sleepers were permitted to awake. After a slumber, as they thought of a few hours, they were pressed by the calls of hunger, and resolved that Jamblichus, one of their number, should secretly return to the city to purchase bread for the use of his companions. The youth, if we may still employ that appellation, could no longer recognize the once familiar aspect of his native country, and his surprise was increased by the appearance of a large cross, triumphantly erected over the principal gate of Ephesus. His singular dress, and obsolete language, confounded the baker, to whom he offered an ancient medal of Decius as the current coin of the empire, and Jamblichus, on the suspicion of a secret treasure, was dragged before the judge. Their mutual inquiries produced the amazing discovery, that two centuries were almost elapsed since Jamblichus and his friends had escaped from the rage of a pagan tyrant. The bishop of Ephesus, the clergy, the magistrates, the people, and, as it is said, the emperor Theodosius himself, hastened to visit the cavern of the seven sleepers. Who bestowed their benediction, related their story, and at the same instant peaceably expired. The origin of this marvelous fable cannot be ascribed to the pious fraud and credulity of the modern Greeks, since the authentic tradition may be traced within half a century of the supposed miracle. James of Sarug, a Syrian bishop, who was born only two years after the death of the younger Theodosius, has devoted one of his 230 homilies to the praise of the young men of Ephesus. 4057 Their legend, before the end of the 6th century, was translated from the Syriac into the Latin language, by the care of Gregory of Tours. The hostile communions of the East preserve their memory with equal reverence. And their names are honorably inscribed in the Roman, the Abyssinian, and the Russian calendar. 4058 Nor has their reputation been confined to the Christian world. This popular tale, which Muhammad might learn when he drove his camels to the fairs of Syria, is introduced as a divine revelation, into the Quran. 4059 The story of the seven sleepers has been adopted and adorned by the nations, from Bengal to Africa, who professed the Mahometan religion, 4060 and some vestiges of a similar tradition have been discovered in the remote extremities of Scandinavia. 4061 This easy and universal belief, so expressive of the sense of mankind, may be ascribed to the genuine merit of the fable itself. We imperceptibly advance from youth to age, without observing the gradual, but incessant, change of human affairs. And even in our larger experience of history, the imagination is accustomed, by a perpetual series of causes and effects, to unite the most distant revolutions. But if the interval between two memorable eras could be instantly annihilated. If it were possible, after a momentary slumber of two hundred years, to display the new world to the eyes of a spectator, who still retained a lively and recent impression of the old. His surprise and his reflections would furnish the pleasing subject of a philosophical romance. The scene could not be more advantageously placed, than in the two centuries which elapsed between the reigns of Decius and of Theodosius the Younger. During this period, the seat of government had been transported from Rome to a new city on the banks of the Thracian Bosphorus, and the abuse of military spirit had been suppressed by an artificial system of tame and ceremonious servitude. The throne of the persecuting Decius was filled by a succession of Christian and Orthodox princes. 
who had extirpated the fabulous gods of antiquity, and the public devotion of the age was impatient to exalt the saints and martyrs of the Catholic Church on the altars of Diana and Hercules. The union of the Roman Empire was dissolved, its genius was humbled in the dust, and armies of unknown barbarians, issuing from the frozen regions of the north, had established their victorious reign over the fairest provinces of Europe and Africa. XXXIV, Attila. The character, conquests, and court of Attila, king of the Huns. Death of Theodosius the Younger. Elevation of Martian to the Empire of the East. The Western world was oppressed by the Goths and Vandals, who fled before the Huns. But the achievements of the Huns themselves were not adequate to their power and prosperity. Their victorious hordes had spread from the Volga to the Danube, but the public force was exhausted by the discord of independent chieftains. Their valor was idly consumed in obscure and predatory excursions, and they often degraded their national dignity, by condescending, for the hopes of spoil, to enlist under the banners of their fugitive enemies. In the reign of Attila 4062 the Huns again became the terror of the world, and I shall now describe the character and actions of that formidable barbarian. Who alternately insulted and invaded the East and the West, and urged the rapid downfall of the Roman Empire. In the tide of emigration which impetuously rolled from the confines of China to those of Germany, the most powerful and populous tribes may commonly be found on the verge of the Roman provinces. The accumulated weight was sustained for a while by artificial barriers. And the easy condescension of the emperors invited, without satisfying, the insolent demands of the barbarians, who had acquired an eager appetite for the luxuries of civilized life. The Hungarians, who ambitiously insert the name of Attila among their native kings, may affirm with truth that the hordes, which were subject to his uncle Roas, or Rugilus, had formed their encampments within the limits of modern Hungary. 4063 In a fertile country, which liberally supplied the wants of a nation of hunters and shepherds. In this advantageous situation, Rugilus, and his valiant brothers, who continually added to their power and reputation, commanded the alternative of peace or war with the two empires. His alliance with the Romans of the West was cemented by his personal friendship for the great Aetius, who was always secure of finding, in the barbarian camp, a hospitable reception and a powerful support. At his solicitation, and in the name of John the Usurper, 60,000 Huns advanced to the confines of Italy, their march and their retreat were alike expensive to the state. And the grateful policy of Aetius abandoned the possession of Pannonia to his faithful confederates. The Romans of the East were not less apprehensive of the arms of Rugilus, which threatened the provinces, or even the capital. Some ecclesiastical historians have destroyed the barbarians with lightning and pestilence. 4064 But Theodosius was reduced to the more humble expedient of stipulating an annual payment of 350 pounds of gold, and of disguising this dishonorable tribute by the title of general. Which the king of the Huns condescended to accept. The public tranquility was frequently interrupted by the fierce impatience of the barbarians, and the perfidious intrigues of the Byzantine court. For dependent nations, among whom we may distinguish the barbarians, disclaimed the sovereignty of the Huns, and their revolt was encouraged and protected by a Roman alliance. Till the just claims, and formidable power, of Rugilus, were effectually urged by the voice of Esla his ambassador. Peace was the unanimous wish of the Senate, their decree was ratified by the Emperor. And two ambassadors were named, Plinthas, a general of Scythian extraction, but of consular rank, and the quester Epigenes, a wise and experienced statesman, who was recommended to that office by his ambitious colleague. The death of Rugilus suspended the progress of the treaty. His two nephews, Attila and Bleda, who succeeded to the throne of their uncle, consented to a personal interview with the ambassadors of Constantinople. But as they proudly refused to dismount, the business was transacted on horseback, in a spacious plain near the city of Margus, in the Upper Mesia. The kings of the Huns assumed the solid benefits, as well as the vain honors, of the negotiation. They dictated the conditions of peace, and each condition was an insult on the majesty of the empire. Besides the freedom of a safe and plentiful market on the banks of the Danube, they required that the annual contribution should be augmented from 350 to 700 pounds of gold. 
that a fine or ransom of eight pieces of gold should be paid for every Roman captive who had escaped from his barbarian master, that the emperor should renounce all treaties and engagements with the enemies of the Huns. And that all the fugitives who had taken refuge in the court or provinces of Theodosius, should be delivered to the justice of their offended sovereign. This justice was rigorously inflicted on some unfortunate youths of a royal race. They were crucified on the territories of the empire, by the command of Attila, and as soon as the king of the Huns had impressed the Romans with the terror of his name, he indulged them in a short and arbitrary respite. Whilst he subdued the rebellious or independent nations of Scythia and Germany. 4065. Attila, the son of Munzuk, deduced his noble, perhaps his regal, descent 4066 from the ancient Huns, who had formerly contended with the monarchs of China. His features, according to the observation of a Gothic historian, bore the stamp of his national origin, and the portrait of Attila exhibits the genuine deformity of a modern Kalmuk. 4067 A large head, a swarthy complexion, small, deep-seated eyes, a flat nose, a few hairs in the place of a beard, broad shoulders, and a short square body, of nervous strength, though of a disproportioned form. The haughty step and demeanor of the king of the Huns expressed the consciousness of his superiority above the rest of mankind, and he had a custom of fiercely rolling his eyes, as if he wished to enjoy the terror which he inspired. Yet this savage hero was not inaccessible to pity, his suppliant enemies might confide in the assurance of peace or pardon, and Attila was considered by his subjects as a just and indulgent master. He delighted in war. But, after he had ascended the throne in a mature age, his head, rather than his hand, achieved the conquest of the north, and the fame of an adventurous soldier was usefully exchanged for that of a prudent and successful general. The effects of personal valor are so inconsiderable, except in poetry or romance, that victory, even among barbarians, must depend on the degree of skill with which the passions of the multitude are combined and guided for the service of a single man. The Scythian conquerors, Attila and Zingis, surpassed their rude countrymen in art rather than in courage. And it may be observed that the monarchies, both of the Huns and of the Mughals, were erected by their founders on the basis of popular superstition. The miraculous conception, which fraud and credulity ascribed to the virgin mother of Zingis, raised him above the level of human nature. And the naked prophet, who in the name of the deity invested him with the empire of the earth, pointed the valor of the Mughals with irresistible enthusiasm. 4068 The religious arts of Attila were not less skillfully adapted to the character of his age and country. It was natural enough that the Scythians should adore, with peculiar devotion, the god of war. But as they were incapable of forming either an abstract idea, or a corporeal representation, they worshipped their tutelar deity under the symbol of an iron scimitar. 4069 One of the shepherds of the Huns perceived, that a heifer, who was grazing, had wounded herself in the foot, and curiously followed the track of the blood, till he discovered, among the long grass, the point of an ancient sword. Which he dug out of the ground and presented to Attila. That magnanimous, or rather that artful, prince accepted, with pious gratitude, this celestial favor, and, as the rightful possessor of the sword of Mars, asserted his divine and indefeasible claim to the dominion of the earth. 4070 If the rites of Scythia were practiced on this solemn occasion, a lofty altar, or rather pile of faggots, three hundred yards in length and in breadth, was raised in a spacious plain. And the sword of Mars was placed erect on the summit of this rustic altar, which was annually consecrated by the blood of sheep, horses, and of the hundredth captive. 4071 Whether human sacrifices formed any part of the worship of Attila, or whether he propitiated the god of war with the victims which he continually offered in the field of battle, the favorite of Mars soon acquired a sacred character, which rendered his conquests more easy and more permanent. And the barbarian princes confessed, in the language of devotion or flattery, that they could not presume to gaze, with a steady eye, on the divine majesty of the king of the Huns. 4072 His brother Bleda, who reigned over a considerable part of the nation, was compelled to resign his scepter and his life. Yet even this cruel act was attributed to a supernatural impulse. And the vigor with which Attila wielded the sword of Mars, convinced the world that it had been reserved alone for his invincible arm. 
4073 but the extent of his empire affords the only remaining evidence of the number and importance of his victories. And the Scythian monarch, however ignorant of the value of science and philosophy, might perhaps lament that his illiterate subjects were destitute of the art which could perpetuate the memory of his exploits. If a line of separation were drawn between the civilized and the savage climates of the globe, between the inhabitants of cities, who cultivated the earth, and the hunters and shepherds, who dwelt in tents, Attila might aspire to the title of supreme and sole monarch of the barbarians. 4074 He alone, among the conquerors of ancient and modern times, united the two mighty kingdoms of Germany and Scythia, and those vague appellations, when they are applied to his reign, may be understood with an ample latitude. Thuringia, which stretched beyond its actual limits as far as the Danube, was in the number of his provinces, he interposed, with the weight of a powerful neighbor, in the domestic affairs of the Franks. And one of his lieutenants chastised, and almost exterminated, the Burgundians of the Rhine. He subdued the islands of the ocean, the kingdoms of Scandinavia, encompassed and divided by the waters of the Baltic. And the Huns might derive a tribute of furs from that northern region, which has been protected from all other conquerors by the severity of the climate, and the courage of the natives. Towards the east it is difficult to circumscribe the dominion of Attila over the Scythian deserts, yet we may be assured, that he reigned on the banks of the Volga, that the king of the Huns was dreaded, not only as a warrior, but as a magician. 4075 That he insulted and vanquished the Khan of the formidable Jujin, and that he sent ambassadors to negotiate an equal alliance with the Empire of China. In the proud review of the nations who acknowledged the sovereignty of Attila, and who never entertained, during his lifetime, the thought of a revolt, the Jeopardy and the Ostrogoths were distinguished by their numbers, their bravery, and the personal merits of their chiefs. The renowned Arderic, king of the Jeopardy, was the faithful and sagacious counselor of the monarch, who esteemed his intrepid genius, whilst he loved the mild and discreet virtues of the noble Wallamir, king of the Ostrogoths. The crowd of vulgar kings, the leaders of so many martial tribes, who served under the standard of Attila, were ranged in the submissive order of guards and domestics round the person of their master. They watched his nod. They trembled at his frown, and at the first signal of his will, they executed, without murmur or hesitation, his stern and absolute commands. In time of peace, the dependent princes, with their national troops, attended the royal camp in regular succession. But when Attila collected his military force, he was able to bring into the field an army of five, or, according to another account, of seven hundred thousand barbarians. 4076. The ambassadors of the Huns might awaken the attention of Theodosius, by reminding him that they were his neighbors both in Europe and Asia, since they touched the Danube on one hand, and reached, with the other, as far as the Tanais. In the reign of his father Arcadius, a band of adventurous Huns had ravaged the provinces of the east, from whence they brought away rich spoils and innumerable captives. 4077 They advanced, by a secret path, along the shores of the Caspian Sea. Traversed the snowy mountains of Armenia, passed the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Halles, recruited their weary cavalry with the generous breed of Cappadocian horses. Occupied the hilly country of Cilicia, and disturbed the festal songs and dances of the citizens of Antioch. Egypt trembled at their approach, and the monks and pilgrims of the Holy Land prepared to escape their fury by a speedy embarkation. The memory of this invasion was still recent in the minds of the Orientals. The subjects of Attila might execute, with superior forces, the design which these adventurers had so boldly attempted. And it soon became the subject of anxious conjecture, whether the tempest would fall on the dominions of Rome, or of Persia. Some of the great vassals of the King of the Huns, who were themselves in the rank of powerful princes, had been sent to ratify an alliance and society of arms with the Emperor, or rather with the General of the West. They related, during their residence at Rome, the circumstances of an expedition, which they had lately made into the East. After passing a desert and a morass, supposed by the Romans to be the Lake Maeotis, they penetrated through the mountains, and arrived, at the end of fifteen days' march, on the confines of Media. Where they advanced as far as the unknown cities of Basic and Kursic. 4078 They encountered the Persian army in the plains of Media and the air, 
according to their own expression, was darkened by a cloud of arrows. But the Huns were obliged to retire before the numbers of the enemy. Their laborious retreat was effected by a different road, they lost the greatest part of their booty. And at length returned to the royal camp, with some knowledge of the country, and an impatient desire of revenge. In the free conversation of the imperial ambassadors, who discussed, at the court of Attila, the character and designs of their formidable enemy, the ministers of Constantinople expressed their hope. That his strength might be diverted and employed in a long and doubtful contest with the princes of the House of Sassan. The more sagacious Italians admonished their eastern brethren of the folly and danger of such a hope, and convinced them, that the Medes and Persians were incapable of resisting the arms of the Huns. And that the easy and important acquisition would exalt the pride, as well as power, of the conqueror. Instead of contenting himself with a moderate contribution, and a military title, which equaled him only to the generals of Theodosius. Attila would proceed to impose a disgraceful and intolerable yoke on the necks of the prostrate and captive Romans, who would then be encompassed, on all sides, by the empire of the Huns. 4079. While the powers of Europe and Asia were solicitous to avert the impending danger, the alliance of Attila maintained the Vandals in the possession of Africa. An enterprise had been concerted between the courts of Ravenna and Constantinople, for the recovery of that valuable province, and the ports of Sicily were already filled with the military and naval forces of Theodosius. But the subtle Genseric, who spread his negotiations round the world, prevented their designs, by exciting the king of the Huns to invade the Eastern Empire, and a trifling incident soon became the motive, or pretense, of a destructive war. 4080 Under the faith of the Treaty of Margus, a free market was held on the northern side of the Danube, which was protected by a Roman fortress surnamed Constantia. A troop of barbarians violated the commercial security. Killed, or dispersed, the unsuspecting traders, and leveled the fortress with the ground. The Huns justified this outrage as an act of reprisal. Alleged, that the Bishop of Margus had entered their territories, to discover and steal a secret treasure of their kings. And sternly demanded the guilty prelate, the sacrilegious spoil, and the fugitive subjects, who had escaped from the justice of Attila. The refusal of the Byzantine court was the signal of war. And the Mesians at first applauded the generous firmness of their sovereign. But they were soon intimidated by the destruction of Viminiacum and the adjacent towns. And the people was persuaded to adopt the convenient maxim, that a private citizen, however innocent or respectable, may be justly sacrificed to the safety of his country. The Bishop of Margus, who did not possess the spirit of a martyr, resolved to prevent the designs which he suspected. He boldly treated with the princes of the Huns, secured, by solemn oaths, his pardon and reward. Posted a numerous detachment of barbarians, in silent ambush, on the banks of the Danube, and, at the appointed hour, opened, with his own hand, the gates of his episcopal city. This advantage, which had been obtained by treachery, served as a prelude to more honorable and decisive victories. The Illyrian frontier was covered by a line of castles and fortresses. And though the greatest part of them consisted only of a single tower, with a small garrison, they were commonly sufficient to repel, or to intercept, the inroads of an enemy, who was ignorant of the art, and impatient of the delay. Of a regular siege. But these slight obstacles were instantly swept away by the inundation of the Huns. 4081 they destroyed, with fire and sword, the populous cities of Sirmium and Singidunum, of Rachiaria and Martianopolis, of Nisus and Sardica. Where every circumstance of the discipline of the people, and the construction of the buildings, had been gradually adapted to the sole purpose of defense. The whole breadth of Europe, as it extends above 500 miles from the Euxine to the Hadriatic, was at once invaded, and occupied, and desolated, by the myriads of barbarians whom Attila led into the field. The public danger and distress could not, however, provoke Theodosius to interrupt his amusements and devotion, or to appear in person at the head of the Roman legions. But the troops, which had been sent against Genseric, were hastily recalled from Sicily, the garrisons, on the side of Persia, were exhausted. 
and a military force was collected in Europe, formidable by their arms and numbers, if the generals had understood the science of command, and the soldiers the duty of obedience. The armies of the Eastern Empire were vanquished in three successive engagements, and the progress of Attila may be traced by the fields of battle. The two former, on the banks of the Utus, and under the walls of Martianopolis, were fought in the extensive plains between the Danube and Mount Hemus. As the Romans were pressed by a victorious enemy, they gradually, and unskillfully, retired towards the Chersonesus of Thrace, and that narrow peninsula, the last extremity of the land, was marked by their third, and irreparable, defeat. By the destruction of this army, Attila acquired the indisputable possession of the field. From the Hellespont to Thermopylae, and the suburbs of Constantinople, he ravaged, without resistance, and without mercy, the provinces of Thrace and Macedonia. Heraclea and Hadrianople might, perhaps, escape this dreadful eruption of the Huns. But the words, the most expressive of total extirpation and erasure, are applied to the calamities which they inflicted on seventy cities of the Eastern Empire. 4082 Theodosius, his court, and the unwarlike people, were protected by the walls of Constantinople, but those walls had been shaken by a recent earthquake, and the fall of fifty-eight towers had opened a large and tremendous breach. The damage indeed was speedily repaired. But this accident was aggravated by a superstitious fear, that heaven itself had delivered the imperial city to the shepherds of Scythia, who were strangers to the laws, the language, and the religion, of the Romans. 4083. In all their invasions of the civilized empires of the south, the Scythian shepherds have been uniformly actuated by a savage and destructive spirit. The laws of war, that restrain the exercise of national rapine and murder, are founded on two principles of substantial interest, the knowledge of the permanent benefits which may be obtained by a moderate use of conquest. And a just apprehension, lest the desolation which we inflict on the enemy's country may be retaliated on our own. But these considerations of hope and fear are almost unknown in the pastoral state of nations. The Huns of Attila may, without injustice, be compared to the Mughals and Tartars, before their primitive manners were changed by religion and luxury. And the evidence of Oriental history may reflect some light on the short and imperfect annals of Rome. After the Mughals had subdued the northern provinces of China, it was seriously proposed, not in the hour of victory and passion, but in calm deliberate counsel, to exterminate all the inhabitants of that populous country. That the vacant land might be converted to the pasture of cattle. The firmness of a Chinese Mandarin 4084 who insinuated some principles of rational policy into the mind of Zingis, diverted him from the execution of this horrid design. But in the cities of Asia, which yielded to the Mughals, the inhuman abuse of the rights of war was exercised with a regular form of discipline, which may, with equal reason, though not with equal authority, be imputed to the victorious Huns. The inhabitants, who had submitted to their discretion, were ordered to evacuate their houses, and to assemble in some plain adjacent to the city, where a division was made of the vanquished into three parts. The first class consisted of the soldiers of the garrison, and of the young men capable of bearing arms. And their fate was instantly decided, they were either enlisted among the Mughals, or they were massacred on the spot by the troops, who, with pointed spears and bended bows, had formed a circle round the captive multitude. The second class, composed of the young and beautiful women, of the artificers of every rank and profession, and of the more wealthy or honorable citizens, from whom a private ransom might be expected, was distributed in equal or proportionable lots. The remainder, whose life or death was alike useless to the conquerors, were permitted to return to the city, which, in the meanwhile, had been stripped of its valuable furniture. And a tax was imposed on those wretched inhabitants for the indulgence of breathing their native air. Such was the behavior of the Mughals, when they were not conscious of any extraordinary rigor. 4085 But the most casual provocation, the slightest motive of caprice or convenience, often provoked them to involve a whole people in an indiscriminate massacre. And the ruin of some flourishing cities was executed with such unrelenting perseverance, that, according to their own expression, horses might run, without stumbling, over the ground where they had once stood. The three great capitals of Khorasan, Maru, Nizabur, and Herat, 
were destroyed by the armies of Zingis, and the exact account which was taken of the slain amounted to 4,347,000 persons. 4086 Timur, or Tamerlane, was educated in a less barbarous age, and in the profession of the Mahometan religion. Yet, if Attila equaled the hostile ravages of Tamerlane, 4087 either the Tartar or the Hun might deserve the epithet of the scourge of God. 4088. It may be affirmed, with bolder assurance, that the Huns depopulated the provinces of the empire, by the number of Roman subjects whom they led away into captivity. In the hands of a wise legislator, such an industrious colony might have contributed to diffuse through the deserts of Scythia the rudiments of the useful and ornamental arts. But these captives, who had been taken in war, were accidentally dispersed among the hordes that obeyed the empire of Attila. The estimate of their respective value was formed by the simple judgment of unenlightened and unprejudiced barbarians. Perhaps they might not understand the merit of a theologian, profoundly skilled in the controversies of the Trinity in the Incarnation, yet they respected the ministers of every religion. And the active zeal of the Christian missionaries, without approaching the person or the palace of the monarch, successfully labored in the propagation of the gospel. 4089 The pastoral tribes, who were ignorant of the distinction of landed property, must have disregarded the use, as well as the abuse, of civil jurisprudence, and the skill of an eloquent lawyer could excite only their contempt or their abhorrence. 4090 The perpetual intercourse of the Huns and the Goths had communicated the familiar knowledge of the two national dialects, and the barbarians were ambitious of conversing in Latin, the military idiom even of the Eastern Empire. 4091 But they disdained the language and the sciences of the Greeks. And the vain sophist, or grave philosopher, who had enjoyed the flattering applause of the schools, was mortified to find that his robust servant was a captive of more value and importance than himself. The mechanic arts were encouraged and esteemed, as they tended to satisfy the wants of the Huns. An architect in the service of Onegesius, one of the favorites of Attila, was employed to construct a bath. But this work was a rare example of private luxury, and the trades of the smith, the carpenter, the armorer, were much more adapted to supply a wandering people with the useful instruments of peace and war. But the merit of the physician was received with universal favor and respect, the barbarians, who despised death, might be apprehensive of disease. And the haughty conqueror trembled in the presence of a captive, to whom he ascribed, perhaps, an imaginary power of prolonging or preserving his life. 4092 The Huns might be provoked to insult the misery of their slaves, over whom they exercised a despotic command, 4093 But their manners were not susceptible of a refined system of oppression. And the efforts of courage and diligence were often recompensed by the gift of freedom. The historian Priscus, whose embassy is a source of curious instruction, was accosted in the camp of Attila by a stranger, who saluted him in the Greek language, but whose dress and figure displayed the appearance of a wealthy Scythian. In the siege of Viminiacum, he had lost, according to his own account, his fortune and liberty, he became the slave of Onegesius. But his faithful services, against the Romans and the Akatsires, had gradually raised him to the rank of the native Huns, to whom he was attached by the domestic pledges of a new wife and several children. The spoils of war had restored and improved his private property, he was admitted to the table of his former lord, and the apostate Greek blessed the hour of his captivity, since it had been the introduction to a happy and independent state, which he held by the honorable tenure of military service. This reflection naturally produced a dispute on the advantages and defects of the Roman government, which was severely arraigned by the apostate, and defended by Priscus in a prolix and feeble declamation. The freedmen of Onegesius exposed, in true and lively colors, the vices of a declining empire, of which he had so long been the victim. The cruel absurdity of the Roman princes, unable to protect their subjects against the public enemy, unwilling to trust them with arms for their own defense. The intolerable weight of taxes, rendered still more oppressive by the intricate or arbitrary modes of collection, the obscurity of numerous and contradictory laws, the tedious and expensive forms of judicial proceedings. The partial administration of justice, and the universal corruption, which increased the influence of the rich, and aggravated the misfortunes of the poor. 
a sentiment of patriotic sympathy was at length revived in the breast of the fortunate exile. And he lamented, with a flood of tears, the guilt or weakness of those magistrates who had perverted the wisest and most salutary institutions. Point 4094. The timid or selfish policy of the Western Romans had abandoned the Eastern Empire to the Huns. 4095 The loss of armies, and the want of discipline or virtue, were not supplied by the personal character of the monarch. Theodosius might still affect the style, as well as the title, of Invincible Augustus. But he was reduced to solicit the clemency of Attila, who imperiously dictated these harsh and humiliating conditions of peace. I. The Emperor of the East resigned, by an express or tacit convention, an extensive and important territory, which stretched along the southern banks of the Danube, from Singidunum, or Belgrade, as far as Novi, in the Diocese of Thrace. The breadth was defined by the vague computation of 154096 days' journey. But, from the proposal of Attila to remove the situation of the national market, it soon appeared, that he comprehended the ruined city of Nisus within the limits of his dominions. 2. The king of the Huns required and obtained, that his tribute or subsidy should be augmented from 700 pounds of gold to the annual sum of 2,100. And he stipulated the immediate payment of 6,000 pounds of gold, to defray the expenses, or to expiate the guilt, of the war. One might imagine, that such a demand, which scarcely equaled the measure of private wealth, would have been readily discharged by the opulent empire of the East. And the public distress affords a remarkable proof of the impoverished, or at least of the disorderly, state of the finances. A large proportion of the taxes extorted from the people was detained and intercepted in their passage, though the foulest channels, to the treasury of Constantinople. The revenue was dissipated by Theodosius and his favorites in wasteful and profuse luxury, which was disguised by the names of imperial magnificence, or Christian charity. The immediate supplies had been exhausted by the unforeseen necessity of military preparations. A personal contribution, rigorously, but capriciously, imposed on the members of the Senatorian order, was the only expedient that could disarm, without loss of time, the impatient avarice of Attila. And the poverty of the nobles compelled them to adopt the scandalous resource of exposing to public auction the jewels of their wives, and the hereditary ornaments of their palaces. 4097 The king of the Huns appears to have established, as a principle of national jurisprudence, that he could never lose the property, which he had once acquired, in the persons who had yielded either a voluntary, or reluctant submission to his authority. From this principle he concluded, and the conclusions of Attila were irrevocable laws, that the Huns, who had been taken prisoner in war, should be released without delay, and without ransom. That every Roman captive, who had presumed to escape, should purchase his right to freedom at the price of twelve pieces of gold. And that all the barbarians, who had deserted the standard of Attila, should be restored, without any promise or stipulation of pardon. In the execution of this cruel and ignominious treaty, the imperial officers were forced to massacre several loyal and noble deserters, who refused to devote themselves to certain death. And the Romans forfeited all reasonable claims to the friendship of any Scythian people, by this public confession, that they were destitute either of faith, or power, to protect the suppliant, who had embraced the throne of Theodosius. 4098. The firmness of a single town, so obscure, that, except on this occasion, it has never been mentioned by any historian or geographer, exposed the disgrace of the emperor and empire. Azimus, or Azimuntium, a small city of Thrace on the Illyrian borders, 4099 had been distinguished by the martial spirit of its youth, the skill and reputation of the leaders whom they had chosen and their daring exploits against the innumerable host of the barbarians. Instead of tamely expecting their approach, the Azimuntines attacked, in frequent and successful sallies, the troops of the Huns, who gradually declined the dangerous neighborhood, rescued from their hands the spoil and the captives, and recruited their domestic force by the voluntary association of fugitives and deserters. After the conclusion of the treaty, Attila still menaced the empire with implacable war, unless the Azimuntines were persuaded, or compelled, to comply with the conditions which their sovereign had accepted. The ministers of Theodosius confessed with shame, and with truth, 
that they no longer possessed any authority over a society of men, who so bravely asserted their natural independence. And the king of the Huns condescended to negotiate an equal exchange with the citizens of Azimus. They demanded the restitution of some shepherds, who, with their cattle, had been accidentally surprised. A strict, though fruitless, inquiry was allowed, but the Huns were obliged to swear, that they did not detain any prisoners belonging to the city, before they could recover two surviving countrymen, whom the Azamuntines had reserved as pledges for the safety of their lost companions. Attila, on his side, was satisfied, and deceived, by their solemn asseveration, that the rest of the captives had been put to the sword. And that it was their constant practice, immediately to dismiss the Romans and the deserters, who had obtained the security of the public faith. This prudent and officious dissimulation may be condemned, or excused, by the casuists, as they incline to the rigid decree of St. Augustine, or to the milder sentiment of St. Jerem and St. Chrysostom, but every soldier, every statesman, must acknowledge, that, if the race of the Azamuntines had been encouraged and multiplied, the barbarians would have ceased to trample on the majesty of the empire. 4100. It would have been strange, indeed, if Theodosius had purchased, by the loss of honor, a secure and solid tranquillity, or if his tameness had not invited the repetition of injuries. The Byzantine court was insulted by five or six successive embassies, 4101 and the ministers of Attila were uniformly instructed to press the tardy or imperfect execution of the last treaty. To produce the names of fugitives and deserters, who were still protected by the empire. And to declare, with seeming moderation, that, unless their sovereign obtained complete and immediate satisfaction, it would be impossible for him, were it even his wish, to check the resentment of his warlike tribes. Besides the motives of pride and interest, which might prompt the king of the Huns to continue this train of negotiation, he was influenced by the less honorable view of enriching his favorites at the expense of his enemies. The imperial treasury was exhausted, to procure the friendly offices of the ambassadors and their principal attendants, whose favorable report might conduce to the maintenance of peace. The barbarian monarch was flattered by the liberal reception of his ministers. He computed, with pleasure, the value and splendor of their gifts, rigorously exacted the performance of every promise which would contribute to their private emolument, and treated as an important business of state the marriage of his secretary Constantius. 4102 That Gallic adventurer, who was recommended by Aetius to the king of the Huns, had engaged his service to the ministers of Constantinople, for the stipulated reward of a wealthy and noble wife. And the daughter of Count Saturninus was chosen to discharge the obligations of her country. The reluctance of the victim, some domestic troubles, and the unjust confiscation of her fortune, cooled the ardor of her interested lover. But he still demanded, in the name of Attila, an equivalent alliance. And, after many ambiguous delays and excuses, the Byzantine court was compelled to sacrifice to this insolent stranger the widow of Armatius, whose birth, opulence, and beauty, placed her in the most illustrious rank of the Roman matrons. For these importunate and oppressive embassies, Attila claimed a suitable return, he weighed, with suspicious pride, the character and station of the imperial envoys. But he condescended to promise that he would advance as far as Sardica to receive any ministers who had been invested with the consular dignity. The council of Theodosius eluded this proposal, by representing the desolate and ruined condition of Sardica and even ventured to insinuate that every officer of the army or household was qualified to treat with the most powerful princes of Scythia. Maximin, 4103 a respectable courtier, whose abilities had been long exercised in civil and military employments, accepted, with reluctance, the troublesome, and perhaps dangerous, commission of reconciling the angry spirit of the king of the Huns. His friend, the historian Priscus 4104 embraced the opportunity of observing the barbarian hero in the peaceful and domestic scenes of life, but the secret of the embassy, a fatal and guilty secret, was entrusted only to the interpreter Vigilius. The two last ambassadors of the Huns, Orestes, a noble subject of the Pannonian province, and Eid Khan, a valiant chieftain of the tribe of the Syri, returned at the same time from Constantinople to the royal camp. Their obscure names were afterwards illustrated by the extraordinary fortune and the contrast of their sons, 
the two servants of Attila became the fathers of the last Roman emperor of the West, and of the first barbarian king of Italy. The ambassadors, who were followed by a numerous train of men and horses, made their first halt at Sardica, at the distance of 350 miles, or 13 days' journey, from Constantinople. As the remains of Sardica were still included within the limits of the empire, it was incumbent on the Romans to exercise the duties of hospitality. They provided, with the assistance of the provincials, a sufficient number of sheep and oxen, and invited the Huns to a splendid, or at least, a plentiful supper. But the harmony of the entertainment was soon disturbed by mutual prejudice and indiscretion. The greatness of the emperor and the empire was warmly maintained by their ministers. The Huns, with equal ardor, asserted the superiority of their victorious monarch, the dispute was inflamed by the rash and unseasonable flattery of Vigilius, who passionately rejected the comparison of a mere mortal with the divine Theodosius. And it was with extreme difficulty that Maximin and Priscus were able to divert the conversation, or to suit the angry minds, of the barbarians. When they rose from table, the imperial ambassador presented Edkan and Orestes with rich gifts of silk robes and Indian pearls, which they thankfully accepted. Yet Orestes could not forbear insinuating that he had not always been treated with such respect and liberality, and the offensive distinction which was implied. Between his civil office and the hereditary rank of his colleague seems to have made Edkan a doubtful friend, and Orestes an irreconcilable enemy. After this entertainment, they travelled about one hundred miles from Sardica to Nysus. That flourishing city, which has given birth to the great Constantine, was levelled with the ground, the inhabitants were destroyed or dispersed. And the appearance of some sick persons, who were still permitted to exist among the ruins of the churches, served only to increase the horror of the prospect. The surface of the country was covered with the bones of the slain. And the ambassadors, who directed their course to the northwest, were obliged to pass the hills of modern Servia, before they descended into the flat and marshy grounds which are terminated by the Danube. The Huns were masters of the great river, their navigation was performed in large canoes, hollowed out of the trunk of a single tree, the ministers of Theodosius were safely landed on the opposite bank. And their barbarian associates immediately hastened to the camp of Attila, which was equally prepared for the amusements of hunting or of war. No sooner had Maximin advanced about two miles 4105 from the Danube, than he began to experience the fastidious insolence of the conqueror. He was sternly forbid to pitch his tents in a pleasant valley, lest he should infringe the distant awe that was due to the royal mansion. 4106 The ministers of Attila pressed them to communicate the business, and the instructions, which he reserved for the ear of their sovereign. When Maximin temperately urged the contrary practice of nations, he was still more confounded to find that the resolutions of the sacred consistory, those secrets, says Priscus, which should not be revealed to the gods themselves, had been treacherously disclosed to the public enemy. On his refusal to comply with such ignominious terms, the imperial envoy was commanded instantly to depart, the order was recalled, it was again repeated, and the Huns renewed their ineffectual attempts to subdue the patient firmness of Maximin. At length, by the intercession of Scotta, the brother of Onegesius, whose friendship had been purchased by a liberal gift, he was admitted to the royal presence. But, instead of obtaining a decisive answer, he was compelled to undertake a remote journey towards the north, that Attila might enjoy the proud satisfaction of receiving, in the same camp, the ambassadors of the eastern and western empires. His journey was regulated by the guides, who obliged him to halt, to hasten his march, or to deviate from the common road, as it best suited the convenience of the king. The Romans, who traversed the plains of Hungary, supposed that they passed several navigable rivers, either in canoes or portable boats. But there is reason to suspect that the winding stream of the Tice, or Tibiscus, might present itself in different places under different names. From the contiguous villages they received a plentiful and regular supply of provisions. Mead instead of wine, millet in the place of bread, and a certain liquor named Camu, which according to the report of Priscus, was distilled from barley. 4107 Such fare might appear coarse and indelicate to men who had tasted the luxury of Constantinople, 
but, in their accidental distress, they were relieved by the gentleness and hospitality of the same barbarians, so terrible and so merciless in war. The ambassadors had encamped on the edge of a large morass. A violent tempest of wind and rain, of thunder and lightning, overturned their tents, immersed their baggage and furniture in the water, and scattered their retinue, who wandered in the darkness of the night, uncertain of their road. And apprehensive of some unknown danger, till they awakened by their cries the inhabitants of a neighboring village, the property of the widow of Bleda. A bright illumination, and, in a few moments, a comfortable fire of reeds, was kindled by their officious benevolence, the wants, and even the desires, of the Romans were liberally satisfied. And they seemed to have been embarrassed by the singular politeness of Bledis widow, who added to her other favors the gift, or at least the loan, of a sufficient number of beautiful and obsequious damsels. The sunshine of the succeeding day was dedicated to repose, to collect and dry the baggage, and to the refreshment of the men and horses, but, in the evening, before they pursued their journey. The ambassadors expressed their gratitude to the bounteous lady of the village, by a very acceptable present of silver cups, red fleeces, dried fruits, and Indian pepper. Soon after this adventure, they rejoined the march of Attila, from whom they had been separated about six days, and slowly proceeded to the capital of an empire, which did not contain, in the space of several thousand miles, a single city. As far as we may ascertain the vague and obscure geography of Priscus, this capital appears to have been seated between the Danube, the Tice, and the Carpathian hills, in the plains of Upper Hungary. And most probably in the neighborhood of Jesperin, Agria, or Tokay. 4108 In its origin it could be no more than an accidental camp, which, by the long and frequent residence of Attila, had insensibly swelled into a huge village, for the reception of his court, of the troops who followed his person, and of the various multitude of idle or industrious slaves and retainers. 4109 The baths, constructed by Onegesius, were the only edifice of stone, the materials had been transported from Pannonia. And since the adjacent country was destitute even of large timber, it may be presumed, that the meaner habitations of the royal village consisted of straw, or mud, or of canvas. The wooden houses of the more illustrious Huns were built and adorned with rude magnificence, according to the rank, the fortune, or the taste of the proprietors. They seem to have been distributed with some degree of order and symmetry. And each spot became more honorable as it approached the person of the sovereign. The palace of Attila, which surpassed all other houses in his dominions, was built entirely of wood, and covered an ample space of ground. The outward enclosure was a lofty wall, or palisade, of smooth square timber, intersected with high towers, but intended rather for ornament than defense. This wall, which seems to have encircled the declivity of a hill, comprehended a great variety of wooden edifices, adapted to the uses of royalty. A separate house was assigned to each of the numerous wives of Attila. And, instead of the rigid and illiberal confinement imposed by Asiatic jealousy they politely admitted the Roman ambassadors to their presence, their table, and even to the freedom of an innocent embrace. When Maximin offered his presence to circa 4110 the principal queen, he admired the singular architecture on her mansion, the height of the round columns, the size and beauty of the wood, which was curiously shaped or turned or polished or carved. And his attentive eye was able to discover some taste in the ornaments and some regularity in the proportions. After passing through the guards who watched before the gate, the ambassadors were introduced into the private apartment of Circa. The wife of Attila received their visit sitting, or rather lying, on a soft couch, the floor was covered with a carpet, the domestics formed a circle round the queen. And her damsels, seated on the ground, were employed in working the variegated embroidery which adorned the dress of the barbaric warriors. The Huns were ambitious of displaying those riches which were the fruit and evidence of their victories, the trappings of their horses, their swords, and even their shoes, were studded with gold and precious stones. And their tables were profusely spread with plates, and goblets, and vases of gold and silver, which had been fashioned by the labor of Grecian artists. The monarch alone assumed the superior pride of still adhering to the simplicity of his Scythian ancestors. 4111 The dress of Attila, his arms, and the furniture of his horse, were plain, without ornament, and of a single color. 
The royal table was served in wooden cups and platters, flesh was his only food, and the conqueror of the north never tasted the luxury of bread. When Attila first gave audience to the Roman ambassadors on the banks of the Danube, his tent was encompassed with a formidable guard. The monarch himself was seated in a wooden chair. His stern countenance, angry gestures, and impatient tone, astonished the firmness of Maximin. But Vigilius had more reason to tremble, since he distinctly understood the menace, that if Attila did not respect the law of nations, he would nail the deceitful interpreter to the cross. And leave his body to the vultures. The barbarian condescended, by producing an accurate list, to expose the bold falsehood of Vigilius, who had affirmed that no more than seventeen deserters could be found. But he arrogantly declared, that he apprehended only the disgrace of contending with his fugitive slaves. Since he despised their impotent efforts to defend the provinces which Theodosius had entrusted to their arms, for what fortress, added Attila, what city, in the wide extent of the Roman Empire, can hope to exist, secure and impregnable? If it is our pleasure that it should be erased from the earth? He dismissed, however, the interpreter, who returned to Constantinople with his peremptory demand of more complete restitution, and a more splendid embassy. His anger gradually subsided, and his domestic satisfaction in a marriage which he celebrated on the road with the daughter of Eslam, 4112 might perhaps contribute to mollify the native fierceness of his temper. The entrance of Attila into the royal village was marked by a very singular ceremony. A numerous troop of women came out to meet their hero and their king. They marched before him, distributed into long and regular files. The intervals between the files were filled by white veils of thin linen, which the women on either side bore aloft in their hands, and which formed a canopy for a chorus of young virgins, who chanted hymns and songs in the Scythian language. The wife of his favorite Onegesius, with a train of female attendants, saluted Attila at the door of her own house, on his way to the palace. And offered, according to the custom of the country, her respectful homage, by entreating him to taste the wine and meat which she had prepared for his reception. As soon as the monarch had graciously accepted her hospitable gift, his domestics lifted a small silver table to a convenient height, as he sat on horseback. And Attila, when he had touched the goblet with his lips, again saluted the wife of Onegesius, and continued his march. During his residence at the seat of empire, his hours were not wasted in the recluse idleness of a seraglio. And the king of the Huns could maintain his superior dignity, without concealing his person from the public view. He frequently assembled his council, and gave audience to the ambassadors of the nations. And his people might appeal to the supreme tribunal, which he held at stated times, and, according to the eastern custom, before the principal gate of his wooden palace. The Romans, both of the east and of the west, were twice invited to the banquets, where Attila feasted with the princes and nobles of Scythia. Maximin and his colleagues were stopped on the threshold, till they had made a devout libation to the health and prosperity of the king of the Huns, and were conducted, after this ceremony, to their respective seats in a spacious hall. The royal table and couch, covered with carpets and fine linen, was raised by several steps in the midst of the hall, and a son, an uncle, or perhaps a favorite king, were admitted to share the simple and homely repast of Attila. Two lines of small tables, each of which contained three or four guests, were ranged in order on either hand, the right was esteemed the most honorable, but the Romans ingenuously confess, that they were placed on the left. And that Beric, an unknown chieftain, most probably of the Gothic race, preceded the representatives of Theodosius and Valentinian. The barbarian monarch received from his cupbearer a goblet filled with wine, and courteously drank to the health of the most distinguished guest, who rose from his seat, and expressed, in the same manner, his loyal and respectful vows. This ceremony was successively performed for all, or at least for the illustrious persons of the assembly, and a considerable time must have been consumed, since it was thrice repeated as each course or service was placed on the table. But the wine still remained after the meat had been removed, and the Huns continued to indulge their intemperance long after the sober and decent ambassadors of the two empires had withdrawn themselves from the nocturnal banquet. Yet before they retired, they enjoyed a singular opportunity of observing the manners of the nation in their convivial amusements. Two Scythians stood before the couch of Attila, 
and recited the verses which they had composed, to celebrate his valor and his victories. 4113 A profound silence prevailed in the hall. And the attention of the guests was captivated by the vocal harmony, which revived and perpetuated the memory of their own exploits, a martial ardor flashed from the eyes of the warriors, who were impatient for battle. And the tears of the old men expressed their generous despair, that they could no longer partake the danger and glory of the field. 4114 This entertainment, which might be considered as a school of military virtue, was succeeded by a farce, that debased the dignity of human nature. A Moorish and a Scythian buffoon successively excited the mirth of the rude spectators, by their deformed figure, ridiculous dress, antic gestures, absurd speeches, and the strange, unintelligible confusion of the Latin, the Gothic, and the Hunnic languages. And the hall resounded with loud and licentious peals of laughter. In the midst of this intemperate riot, Attila alone, without a change of countenance, maintained his steadfast and inflexible gravity. Which was never relaxed, except on the entrance of Ernak, the youngest of his sons, he embraced the boy with a smile of paternal tenderness, gently pinched him by the cheek, and betrayed a partial affection. Which was justified by the assurance of his prophets, that Ernak would be the future support of his family and empire. Two days afterwards, the ambassadors received a second invitation, and they had reason to praise the politeness, as well as the hospitality, of Attila. The king of the Huns held a long and familiar conversation with Maximin. But his civility was interrupted by rude expressions and haughty reproaches, and he was provoked, by a motive of interest, to support, with unbecoming zeal, the private claims of his secretary Constantius. The emperor, said Attila, has long promised him a rich wife, Constantius must not be disappointed, nor should a Roman emperor deserve the name of liar. On the third day, the ambassadors were dismissed. The freedom of several captives was granted, for a moderate ransom, to their pressing entreaties, and, besides the royal presence, they were permitted to accept from each of the Scythian nobles the honorable and useful gift of a horse. Maximin returned, by the same road, to Constantinople. And though he was involved in an accidental dispute with Beric, the new ambassador of Attila, he flattered himself that he had contributed, by the laborious journey, to confirm the peace and alliance of the two nations. A Latin poem, De Prima Expedition Adelie, Regis Honorum, in Gallius, was published in the year 1780, by Fisher at Leipzig. It contains, with the continuation, 1452 lines. It abounds in metrical faults, but is occasionally not without some rude spirit and some copiousness of fancy in the variation of the circumstances in the different combats of the hero Walther, Prince of Aquitania. It contains little which can be supposed historical, and still less which is characteristic concerning Attila. It relates to a first expedition of Attila into Europe which cannot be traced in history, during which the kings of the Franks, of the Burgundians, and of Aquitaine, submit themselves, and give hostages to Attila, the king of the Franks. A personage who seems the same with the Hagen of Teutonic Romance. The king of Burgundy, his daughter Heldgund, the king of Aquitaine, his son Walther. The main subject of the poem is the escape of Walther and Heldgund from the camp of Attila, and the combat between Walther and Gunther, king of the Franks. With his twelve peers, among whom is Hagen. Walther had been betrayed while he passed through Worms, the city of the Frankish king, by paying for his ferry over the Rhine with some strange fish, which he had caught during his flight, and which were unknown in the waters of the Rhine. Gunther was desirous of plundering him of the treasure, which Walther had carried off from the camp of Attila. The author of this poem is unknown, nor can I, on the vague and rather doubtful allusion to Thule, as Iceland, venture to assign its date. It was, evidently, recited in a monastery, as appears by the first line, and no doubt composed there. The faults of meter would point out a late date. And it may have been formed upon some local tradition, as Walther, the hero, seems to have turned monk. This poem, however, in its character and its incidents, bears no relation to the Teutonic cycle, of which the Nibelungen Lied is the most complete form. In this, in the Heldenbuch, in some of the Danish sagas, in Countess Lays and Ballads in all the dialects of Scandinavia, appears King Etzel, Attila, 
in strife with the Burgundians and the Franks. With these appears, by a poetic anachronism, Dietrich of Bern. Theodoric of Verona, the celebrated Ostrogothic king, and many other very singular coincidences of historic names, which appear in the poems. See Lachman Critiker Sage in his volume of various readings to the Nibelungen, Berlin, 1836, page 336. I must acknowledge myself unable to form any satisfactory theory as to the connection of these poems with the history of the time, or the period, from which they may date their origin. Notwithstanding the laborious investigations and critical sagacity of the Schlegels, the Grimms, of P. E. Muller and Lachmann, and a whole host of German critics and antiquaries, not to omit our own countrymen, Mr. Herbert, whose theory concerning Attila is certainly neither deficient in boldness nor originality. I conceive the only way to obtain anything like a clear conception on this point would be what Lachmann has begun, see above, patiently to collect and compare the various forms which the traditions have assumed, without any preconceived, either mythical or poetical, theory, and, if possible, to discover the original basis of the whole rich and fantastic legend. One point, which to me is strongly in favor of the antiquity of this poetic cycle, is, that the manners are so clearly anterior to chivalry, and to the influence exercised on the poetic literature of Europe by the chivalrous poems and romances. I think I find some traces of that influence in the Latin poem, though strained through the imagination of a monk. The English reader will find an amusing account of the German Nibelungen and Heldenbuch, and of some of the Scandinavian sagas, in the volume of Northern Antiquities published by Weber, the friend of Sir Walter Scott. Scott himself contributed a considerable, no doubt far the most valuable, part to the work. Point forty one fifteen forty one sixteen. But the Roman ambassador was ignorant of the treacherous design, which had been concealed under the mask of the public faith. The surprise and satisfaction of Eid Khan, when he contemplated the splendor of Constantinople, had encouraged the interpreter Vigilius to procure for him a secret interview with the eunuch Chrysaphius 4117 who governed the emperor and the empire. After some previous conversation, and a mutual oath of secrecy, the eunuch, who had not, from his own feelings or experience, imbibed any exalted notions of ministerial virtue, ventured to propose the death of Attila, as an important service by which Eid Khan might deserve a liberal share of the wealth and luxury which he admired. The ambassador of the Huns listened to the tempting offer, and professed, with apparent zeal, his ability, as well as readiness, to execute the bloody deed. The design was communicated to the master of the offices, and the devout Theodosius consented to the assassination of his invincible enemy. But this perfidious conspiracy was defeated by the dissimulation, or the repentance, of Eid Khan. And though he might exaggerate his inward abhorrence for the treason, which he seemed to approve, he dexterously assumed the merit of an early involuntary confession. If we now review the embassy of Maximin, and the behavior of Attila, we must applaud the barbarian, who respected the laws of hospitality, and generously entertained and dismissed the minister of a prince who had conspired against his life. But the rashness of Vigilius will appear still more extraordinary, since he returned, conscious of his guilt and danger, to the royal camp, accompanied by his son, and carrying with him a weighty purse of gold, which the favorite eunuch had furnished, to satisfy the demands of Eid Khan, and to corrupt the fidelity of the guards. The interpreter was instantly seized, and dragged before the tribunal of Attila, where he asserted his innocence with specious firmness. Till the threat of inflicting instant death on his son extorted from him a sincere discovery of the criminal transaction. Under the name of ransom, or confiscation, the rapacious king of the Huns accepted two hundred pounds of gold for the life of a traitor, whom he disdained to punish. He pointed his just indignation against a nobler object. His ambassadors, Esla and Orestes, were immediately dispatched to Constantinople, with a peremptory instruction, which it was much safer for them to execute than to disobey. They boldly entered the imperial presence with the fatal purse hanging down from the neck of Orestes, who interrogated the eunuch Chrysaphius, as he stood beside the throne, whether he recognized the evidence of his guilt. But the office of reproof was reserved for the superior dignity of his colleague Islaw, who gravely addressed the emperor of the East in the following words, Theodosius is the son of an illustrious and respectable parent, 
Attila likewise is descended from a noble race. And he has supported, by his actions, the dignity which he inherited from his father Munzuk. But Theodosius has forfeited his paternal honors, and, by consenting to pay tribute has degraded himself to the condition of a slave. It is therefore just, that he should reverence the man whom fortune and merit have placed above him, instead of attempting, like a wicked slave, clandestinely to conspire against his master. The son of Arcadius, who was accustomed only to the voice of flattery, heard with astonishment the severe language of truth, he blushed and trembled. Nor did he presume directly to refuse the head of Chrysaphius, which Eslaw and Orestes were instructed to demand. A solemn embassy, armed with full powers and magnificent gifts, was hastily sent to deprecate the wrath of Attila. And his pride was gratified by the choice of Nomius and Anatolius, two ministers of consular or patrician rank, of whom the one was great treasurer, and the other was master general of the armies of the east. He condescended to meet these ambassadors on the banks of the river Drenko, and though he at first affected a stern and haughty demeanor, his anger was insensibly mollified by their eloquence and liberality. He condescended to pardon the emperor, the eunuch, and the interpreter, bound himself by an oath to observe the conditions of peace, released a great number of captives, abandoned the fugitives and deserters to their fate, and resigned a large territory, to the south of the Danube, which he had already exhausted of its wealth and inhabitants. But this treaty was purchased at an expense which might have supported a vigorous and successful war. And the subjects of Theodosius were compelled to redeem the safety of a worthless favorite by oppressive taxes, which they would more cheerfully have paid for his destruction. 4118. The Emperor Theodosius did not long survive the most humiliating circumstance of an inglorious life. As he was riding, or hunting, in the neighborhood of Constantinople, he was thrown from his horse into the river Lycus, the spine of the back was injured by the fall. And he expired some days afterwards, in the fiftieth year of his age, and the forty-third of his reign. 4119 His sister Pulcheria, whose authority had been controlled both in civil and ecclesiastical affairs by the pernicious influence of the eunuchs, was unanimously proclaimed Empress of the East. And the Romans, for the first time, submitted to a female reign. No sooner had Pulcheria ascended the throne, than she indulged her own and the public resentment, by an act of popular justice. Without any legal trial, the eunuch Chrysaphius was executed before the gates of the city, and the immense riches which had been accumulated by the rapacious favorite, served only to hasten and to justify his punishment. 4120 Amidst the general acclamations of the clergy and people, the empress did not forget the prejudice and disadvantage to which her sex was exposed. And she wisely resolved to prevent their murmurs by the choice of a colleague, who would always respect the superior rank and virgin chastity of his wife. She gave her hand to Martian, a senator, about sixty years of age. And the nominal husband of Pulcheria was solemnly invested with the imperial purple. The zeal which he displayed for the Orthodox creed, as it was established by the Council of Chalcedon, would alone have inspired the grateful eloquence of the Catholics. But the behavior of Martian in a private life, and afterwards on the throne, may support a more rational belief, that he was qualified to restore and invigorate an empire which had been almost dissolved by the successive weakness of two hereditary monarchs. He was born in Thrace, and educated to the profession of arms. But Martian's youth had been severely exercised by poverty and misfortune, since his only resource, when he first arrived at Constantinople, consisted in two hundred pieces of gold, which he had borrowed of a friend. He passed nineteen years in the domestic and military service of Aspar, and his son Ardaburius, followed those powerful generals to the Persian and African wars, and obtained, by their influence, the honorable rank of tribune and senator. His mild disposition, and useful talents, without alarming the jealousy, recommended Martian to the esteem and favor of his patrons, he had seen, perhaps he had felt, the abuses of a venal and oppressive administration. And his own example gave weight and energy to the laws, which he promulgated for the reformation of manners. Point forty one twenty one. XXXV, Invasion by Attila. Invasion of Gaul by Attila. He is repulsed by Aetius and the Visigoths. Attila invades and evacuates Italy. 
the deaths of Attila, Aetius, and Valentinian III. It was the opinion of Martian, that war should be avoided, as long as it is possible to preserve a secure and honorable peace. But it was likewise his opinion, that peace cannot be honorable or secure, if the sovereign betrays a pusillanimous aversion to war. This temperate courage dictated his reply to the demands of Attila, who insolently pressed the payment of the annual tribute. The emperor signified to the barbarians, that they must no longer insult the majesty of Rome by the mention of a tribute. That he was disposed to reward, with becoming liberality, the faithful friendship of his allies, but that, if they presumed to violate the public peace, they should feel that he possessed troops, and arms, and resolution, to repel their attacks. The same language, even in the camp of the Huns, was used by his ambassador Apollonius, whose bold refusal to deliver the presents, till he had been admitted to a personal interview, displayed a sense of dignity, and a contempt of danger. Which Attila was not prepared to expect from the degenerate Romans. 4122 He threatened to chastise the rash successor of Theodosius, but he hesitated whether he should first direct his invincible arms against the Eastern or the Western Empire. While mankind awaited his decision with awful suspense, he sent an equal defiance to the courts of Ravenna and Constantinople, and his ministers saluted the two emperors with the same haughty declaration. Attila, my lord, and thy lord, commands thee to provide a palace for his immediate reception. 4123 But as the barbarian despised, or affected to despise, the Romans of the East, whom he had so often vanquished, he soon declared his resolution of suspending the easy conquest, till he had achieved a more glorious and important enterprise. In the memorable invasions of Gaul and Italy, the Huns were naturally attracted by the wealth and fertility of those provinces. But the particular motives and provocations of Attila can only be explained by the state of the Western Empire under the reign of Valentinian, or, to speak more correctly, under the administration of Aetius. 4124. After the death of his rival Boniface, Aetius had prudently retired to the tents of the Huns, and he was indebted to their alliance for his safety and his restoration. Instead of the suppliant language of a guilty exile, he solicited his pardon at the head of sixty thousand barbarians. And the Empress Placidia confessed, by a feeble resistance, that the condescension, which might have been ascribed to clemency, was the effect of weakness or fear. She delivered herself, her son Valentinian, and the Western Empire, into the hands of an insolent subject. Nor could Placidia protect the son-in-law of Boniface, the virtuous and faithful Sebastian 4125 from the implacable persecution which urged him from one kingdom to another, till he miserably perished in the service of the Vandals. The fortunate Aetius, who was immediately promoted to the rank of patrician, and thrice invested with the honours of the consulship, assumed, with the title of master of the cavalry and infantry, the whole military power of the state. And he is sometimes styled, by contemporary writers, the duke, or general, of the Romans of the West. His prudence, rather than his virtue, engaged him to leave the grandson of Theodosius in the possession of the purple. And Valentinian was permitted to enjoy the peace and luxury of Italy, while the patrician appeared in the glorious light of a hero and a patriot, who supported near twenty years the ruins of the Western Empire. The Gothic historian ingenuously confesses that Aetius was born for the salvation of the Roman Republic. 4126 and the following portrait, though it is drawn in the fairest colors, must be allowed to contain a much larger proportion of truth than of flattery. 4127 His mother was a wealthy and noble Italian, and his father Gadentius, who held a distinguished rank in the province of Scythia, gradually rose from the station of a military domestic, to the dignity of master of the cavalry. Their son, who was enrolled almost in his infancy in the guards, was given as a hostage, first to Alaric, and afterwards to the Huns. 4128 And he successively obtained the civil and military honours of the palace, for which he was equally qualified by superior merit. The graceful figure of Aetius was not above the middle stature. But his manly limbs were admirably formed for strength, beauty, and agility, and he excelled in the martial exercises of managing a horse, drawing the bow, and darting the javelin. He could patiently endure the want of food, or of sleep. 
and his mind and body were alike capable of the most laborious efforts. He possessed the genuine courage that can despise not only dangers, but injuries, and it was impossible either to corrupt, or deceive, or intimidate the firm integrity of his soul. 4129 The barbarians, who had seated themselves in the western provinces, were insensibly taught to respect the faith and valor of the patrician Aetius. He soothed their passions, consulted their prejudices, balanced their interests, and checked their ambition. 4130 A seasonable treaty, which he concluded with Genseric, protected Italy from the depredations of the Vandals. The independent Britons implored and acknowledged his salutary aid, the imperial authority was restored and maintained in Gaul and Spain. And he compelled the Franks and the Suevi, whom he had vanquished in the field, to become the useful confederates of the Republic. From a principle of interest, as well as gratitude, Aetius assiduously cultivated the alliance of the Huns. While he resided in their tents as a hostage, or an exile, he had familiarly conversed with Attila himself, the nephew of his benefactor. And the two famous antagonists appeared to have been connected by a personal and military friendship, which they afterwards confirmed by mutual gifts, frequent embassies, and the education of Carpilio, the son of Aetius, in the camp of Attila. By the specious professions of gratitude and voluntary attachment, the patrician might disguise his apprehensions of the Scythian conqueror, who pressed the two empires with his innumerable armies. His demands were obeyed or eluded. When he claimed the spoils of a vanquished city, some vases of gold, which had been fraudulently embezzled, the civil and military governors of Naricum were immediately dispatched to satisfy his complaints, 4131 and it is evident. From their conversation with Maximin and Priscus, in the royal village, that the valour and prudence of Aetius had not saved the western Romans from the common ignominy of tribute. Yet his dexterous policy prolonged the advantages of a salutary peace, and a numerous army of Huns and Alani, whom he had attached to his person, was employed in the defence of Gaul. Two colonies of these barbarians were judiciously fixed in the territories of Valens and Orleans, 4132 and their active cavalry secured the important passages of the Rhone and of the Loyer. These savage allies were not indeed less formidable to the subjects than to the enemies of Rome. Their original settlement was enforced with the licentious violence of conquest. And the province through which they marched was exposed to all the calamities of a hostile invasion. 4133 Strangers to the Emperor or the Republic, the Alani of Gaul were devoted to the ambition of Aetius, and though he might suspect, that, in a contest with Attila himself, they would revolt to the standard of their national king. The patrician laboured to restrain, rather than to excite, their zeal and resentment against the Goths, the Burgundians, and the Franks. The kingdom established by the Visigoths in the southern provinces of Gaul, had gradually acquired strength and maturity, and the conduct of those ambitious barbarians, either in peace or war, engaged the perpetual vigilance of Aetius. After the death of Wolia, the Gothic scepter devolved to Theodoric, the son of the great Alaric. 4134 In his prosperous reign of more than thirty years, over a turbulent people, may be allowed to prove, that his prudence was supported by uncommon vigour, both of mind and body. Impatient of his narrow limits, Theodoric aspired to the possession of Alls, the wealthy seat of government and commerce, but the city was saved by the timely approach of Aetius. And the Gothic king, who had raised the siege with some loss and disgrace, was persuaded, for an adequate subsidy, to divert the martial valour of his subjects in a Spanish war. Yet Theodoric still watched, and eagerly seized, the favourable moment of renewing his hostile attempts. The Goths besieged Narbonne, while the Belgic provinces were invaded by the Burgundians. And the public safety was threatened on every side by the apparent union of the enemies of Rome. On every side, the activity of Aetius, and his Scythian cavalry, opposed a firm and successful resistance. Twenty thousand Burgundians were slain in battle, and the remains of the nation humbly accepted a dependent seat in the mountains of Savoy. 4135 The walls of Narbonne had been shaken by the battering engines, and the inhabitants had endured the last extremities of famine, when Count Latorius, approaching in silence, and directing each horseman to carry behind him two sacks of flour, cut his way through the entrenchments of the besiegers. The siege was immediately raised, 
and the more decisive victory, which is ascribed to the personal conduct of Aetius himself, was marked with the blood of eight thousand Goths. But in the absence of the patrician, who was hastily summoned to Italy by some public or private interest, Count Latorius succeeded to the command. And his presumption soon discovered that far different talents are required to lead a wing of cavalry, or to direct the operations of an important war. At the head of an army of Huns, he rashly advanced to the gates of Thulaus, full of careless contempt for an enemy whom his misfortunes had rendered prudent, and his situation made desperate. The predictions of the augurs had inspired Latorius with the profane confidence that he should enter the Gothic capital in triumph. And the trust which he reposed in his pagan allies, encouraged him to reject the fair conditions of peace, which were repeatedly proposed by the bishops in the name of Theodoric. The king of the Goths exhibited in his distress the edifying contrast of Christian piety and moderation, nor did he lay aside his sackcloth and ashes till he was prepared to arm for the combat. His soldiers, animated with martial and religious enthusiasm, assaulted the camp of Latorius. The conflict was obstinate, the slaughter was mutual. The Roman general, after a total defeat, which could be imputed only to his unskillful rashness, was actually led through the streets of Thulaus, not in his own, but in a hostile triumph. And the misery which he experienced, in a long and ignominious captivity, excited the compassion of the barbarians themselves. 4136 Such a loss, in a country whose spirit and finances were long since exhausted, could not easily be repaired. And the Goths, assuming, in their turn, the sentiments of ambition and revenge, would have planted their victorious standards on the banks of the Rhone, if the presence of Aetius had not restored strength and discipline to the Romans. 4137 The two armies expected the signal of a decisive action, but the generals, who were conscious of each other's force, and doubtful of their own superiority, prudently sheathed their swords in the field of battle. And their reconciliation was permanent and sincere. Theodoric, king of the Visigoths, appears to have deserved the love of his subjects, the confidence of his allies, and the esteem of mankind. His throne was surrounded by six valiant sons, who were educated with equal care in the exercises of the barbarian camp, and in those of the Gallic schools, from the study of the Roman jurisprudence, they acquired the theory, at least, of law and justice. And the harmonious sense of Virgil contributed to soften the asperity of their native manners. 4138 The two daughters of the Gothic king were given in marriage to the eldest sons of the kings of the Suevi and of the Vandals, who reigned in Spain and Africa, but these illustrious alliances were pregnant with guilt and discord. The queen of the Suevi bewailed the death of a husband inhumanly massacred by her brother. The princess of the Vandals was the victim of a jealous tyrant, whom she called her father. The cruel Genseric suspected that his son's wife had conspired to poison him, the supposed crime was punished by the amputation of her nose and ears. And the unhappy daughter of Theodoric was ignominiously returned to the court of Thulaus in that deformed and mutilated condition. This horrid act, which must seem incredible to a civilized age drew tears from every spectator. But Theodoric was urged, by the feelings of a parent and a king, to revenge such irreparable injuries. The imperial ministers, who always cherished the discord of the barbarians, would have supplied the Goths with arms, and ships, and treasures, for the African war. And the cruelty of Genseric might have been fatal to himself, if the artful vandal had not armed, in his cause, the formidable power of the Huns. His rich gifts and pressing solicitations inflamed the ambition of Attila. And the designs of Aetius and Theodoric were prevented by the invasion of Gaul. 4139. The Franks, whose monarchy was still confined to the neighborhood of the Lower Rhine, had wisely established the right of hereditary succession in the noble family of the Merovingians. 4140 These princes were elevated on a buckler, the symbol of military command, 4141 and the royal fashion of long hair was the ensign of their birth and dignity. Their flaxen locks, which they combed and dressed with singular care, hung down in flowing ringlets on their back and shoulders. While the rest of the nation were obliged, either by law or custom, to shave the hinder part of their head, to comb their hair over the forehead, and to content themselves with the ornament of two small whiskers. 
4142 the lofty stature of the Franks, and their blue eyes, denoted a Germanic origin, their close apparel accurately expressed the figure of their limbs, a weighty sword was suspended from a broad belt, their bodies were protected by a large shield. And these warlike barbarians were trained, from their earliest youth, to run, to leap, to swim, to dart the javelin, or battle-axe, with unerring aim, to advance, without hesitation, against a superior enemy. And to maintain, either in life or death, the invincible reputation of their ancestors. 4143 Clodian, the first of their long-haired kings, whose name and actions are mentioned in authentic history, held his residence at Despargum, 4144 a village or fortress, whose place may be assigned between Louvain and Brussels. From the report of his spies, the king of the Franks was informed, that the defenceless state of the second Belgic must yield, on the slightest attack, to the valour of his subjects. He boldly penetrated through the thickets and morasses of the Carbonarian forest. 4145 occupied Ternay and Cambrai, the only cities which existed in the 5th century, and extended his conquests as far as the river Somme, over a desolate country, whose cultivation and populousness are the effects of more recent industry. 4146 While Clodian lay encamped in the plains of Artois, 4147 and celebrated, with vain and ostentatious security, the marriage, perhaps, of his son, the nuptial feast was interrupted by the unexpected and unwelcome presence of Aetius, who had passed the psalm at the head of his light cavalry. The tables, which had been spread under the shelter of a hill, along the banks of a pleasant stream, were rudely overturned, the Franks were oppressed before they could recover their arms, or their ranks. And their unavailing valour was fatal only to themselves. The loaded wagons, which had followed their march, afforded a rich booty. And the virgin bride, with her female attendants, submitted to the new lovers, who were imposed on them by the chance of war. This advance, which had been obtained by the skill and activity of Aetius, might reflect some disgrace on the military prudence of Clodian. But the king of the Franks soon regained his strength and reputation, and still maintained the possession of his Gallic kingdom from the Rhine to the Somme. 4148 Under his reign, and most probably from the enterprising spirit of his subjects, his three capitals, Mentz, Treves, and Cologne, experienced the effects of hostile cruelty and avarice. The distress of Cologne was prolonged by the perpetual dominion of the same barbarians, who evacuated the ruins of Treves. And Treves, which in the space of forty years had been four times besieged and pillaged, was disposed to lose the memory of her afflictions in the vain amusements of the circus. 4149 The death of Clodian, after a reign of twenty years, exposed his kingdom to the discord and ambition of his two sons. Merovius, the younger, 4150 was persuaded to implore the protection of Rome. He was received at the imperial court, as the ally of Valentinian, and the adopted son of the patrician Aetius, and dismissed to his native country, with splendid gifts, and the strongest assurances of friendship and support. During his absence, his elder brother had solicited, with equal ardour, the formidable aid of Attila. And the king of the Huns embraced an alliance, which facilitated the passage of the Rhine, and justified, by a specious and honourable pretense, the invasion of Gaul. 4151 when Attila declared his resolution of supporting the cause of his allies, the Vandals, and the Franks, at the same time, and almost in the spirit of romantic chivalry. The savage monarch professed himself the lover and the champion of the Princess Honoria. The sister of Valentinian was educated in the palace of Ravenna, and as her marriage might be productive of some danger to the state, she was raised, by the title of Augusta, 4152 above the hopes of the most presumptuous subject. But the fair Honoria had no sooner attained the sixteenth year of her age, than she detested the importunate greatness which must forever exclude her from the comforts of honourable love. In the midst of vain and unsatisfactory pomp, Honoria sighed, yielded to the impulse of nature, and threw herself into the arms of her chamberlain Eugenius. Her guilt and shame, such as the absurd language of imperious man, were soon betrayed by the appearances of pregnancy. But the disgrace of the royal family was published to the world by the imprudence of the Empress Placidia who dismissed her daughter, after a strict and shameful confinement, to a remote exile at Constantinople. 
The unhappy princess passed twelve or fourteen years in the irksome society of the sisters of Theodosius, and their chosen virgins. To whose crown Anuria could no longer aspire, and whose monastic assiduity of prayer, fasting, and vigils, she reluctantly imitated. Her impatience of long and hopeless celibacy urged her to embrace a strange and desperate resolution. The name of Attila was familiar and formidable at Constantinople, and his frequent embassies entertained a perpetual intercourse between his camp and the imperial palace. In the pursuit of love, or rather of revenge, the daughter of Placidia sacrificed every duty and every prejudice. And offered to deliver her person into the arms of a barbarian, of whose language she was ignorant, whose figure was scarcely human, and whose religion and manners she abhorred. By the ministry of a faithful eunuch, she transmitted to Attila a ring, the pledge of her affection, and earnestly conjured him to claim her as a lawful spouse, to whom he had been secretly betrothed. These indecent advances were received, however, with coldness and disdain, and the king of the Huns continued to multiply the number of his wives, till his love was awakened by the more forcible passions of ambition and avarice. The invasion of Gaul was preceded, and justified, by a formal demand of the princess Anuria, with a just and equal share of the imperial patrimony. His predecessors, the ancient Tangus, had often addressed, in the same hostile and peremptory manner, the daughters of China, and the pretensions of Attila were not less offensive to the majesty of Rome. A firm, but temperate, refusal was communicated to his ambassadors. The right of female succession, though it might derive a specious argument from the recent examples of Placidia and Pulcheria, was strenuously denied. And the indissoluble engagements of Honoria were opposed to the claims of her Scythian lover. 4153 On the discovery of her connection with the king of the Huns, the guilty princess had been sent away, as an object of horror, from Constantinople to Italy, her life was spared. But the ceremony of her marriage was performed with some obscure and nominal husband, before she was immured in a perpetual prison, to bewail those crimes and misfortunes, which Anuria might have escaped. Had she not been born the daughter of an emperor? 4154. A native of Gaul, and a contemporary, the learned and eloquent Sidonius, who was afterwards Bishop of Clermont, had made a promise to one of his friends, that he would compose a regular history of the War of Attila. If the modesty of Sidonius had not discouraged him from the prosecution of this interesting work, 4155 the historian would have related, with the simplicity of truth, those memorable events, to which the poet, in vague and doubtful metaphors, has concisely alluded. 4156 The kings and nations of Germany and Scythia, from the Volga perhaps to the Danube, obeyed the warlike summons of Attila. From the royal village, in the plains of Hungary his standard moved towards the west. And after a march of seven or eight hundred miles, he reached the conflux of the Rhine and the Necker, where he was joined by the Franks, who adhered to his ally, the elder of the sons of Clodion. A troop of light barbarians, who roamed in quest of plunder, might choose the winter for the convenience of passing the river on the ice. But the innumerable cavalry of the Huns required such plenty of forage and provisions, as could be procured only in a milder season, the Hercynian forests supplied materials for a bridge of boats. And the hostile myriads were poured, with resistless violence, into the Belgic provinces. 4157 The consternation of Gaul was universal, and the various fortunes of its cities have been adorned by tradition with martyrdoms and miracles. 4158 Troyes was saved by the merits of Saint Lupus, Saint Servatius was removed from the world, that he might not behold the ruin of Tongres, and the prayers of Saint Genevieve diverted the march of Attila from the neighborhood of Paris. But as the greatest part of the Gallic cities were alike destitute of saints and soldiers, they were besieged and stormed by the Huns, who practiced, in the example of Metz 4159 their customary maxims of war. They involved, in a promiscuous massacre, the priests who served at the altar, and the infants, who, in the hour of danger, had been providently baptized by the bishop, the flourishing city was delivered to the flames, and a solitary chapel of Asti. Stephen marked the place where it formerly stood. From the Rhine and the Moselle, Attila advanced into the heart of Gaul, crossed the Seine at Oser, and, after a long and laborious march, fixed his camp under the walls of Orleans. 
He was desirous of securing his conquests by the possession of an advantageous post, which commanded the passage of the lawyer. And he depended on the secret invitation of Sanjiban, king of the Alani, who had promised to betray the city, and to revolt from the service of the empire. But this treacherous conspiracy was detected and disappointed, Orleans had been strengthened with recent fortifications. And the assaults of the Huns were vigorously repelled by the faithful valor of the soldiers, or citizens, who defended the place. The pastoral diligence of Anianus, a bishop of primitive sanctity and consummate prudence, exhausted every art of religious policy to support their courage, till the arrival of the expected succors. After an obstinate siege, the walls were shaken by the battering rams, the Huns had already occupied the suburbs, and the people, who were incapable of bearing arms, lay prostrate in prayer. Anianus, who anxiously counted the days and hours, dispatched a trusty messenger to observe, from the rampart, the face of the distant country. He returned twice, without any intelligence that could inspire hope or comfort. But, in his third report, he mentioned a small cloud, which he had faintly described at the extremity of the horizon. It is the aid of God, exclaimed the bishop, in a tone of pious confidence. And the whole multitude repeated after him, It is the aid of God. The remote object, on which every eye was fixed, became each moment larger, and more distinct, the Roman and Gothic banners were gradually perceived. And a favorable wind blowing aside the dust, discovered, in deep array, the impatient squadrons of Aetius and Theodoric, who pressed forwards to the relief of Orleans. The facility with which Attila had penetrated into the heart of Gaul, may be ascribed to his insidious policy, as well as to the terror of his arms. His public declarations were skillfully mitigated by his private assurances. He alternately soothed and threatened the Romans and the Goths, and the courts of Ravenna and Thulaus, mutually suspicious of each other's intentions, beheld, with supine indifference, the approach of their common enemy. Aetius was the sole guardian of the public safety, but his wisest measures were embarrassed by a faction, which, since the death of Placidia, infested the imperial palace, the youth of Italy trembled at the sound of the trumpet. And the barbarians, who, from fear or affection, were inclined to the cause of Attila, awaited with doubtful and venal faith, the event of the war. The patrician passed the Alps at the head of some troops, whose strength and numbers scarcely deserved the name of an army. 4160 But on his arrival at Alls, or Lyons, he was confounded by the intelligence, that the Visigoths, refusing to embrace the defense of Gaul, had determined to expect, within their own territories, the formidable invader. Whom they professed to despise. The senator of Itis, who, after the honorable exercise of the Praetorian prefecture, had retired to his estate in Auvergne, was persuaded to accept the important embassy, which he executed with ability and success. He represented to Theodoric, that an ambitious conqueror, who aspired to the dominion of the earth, could be resisted only by the firm and unanimous alliance of the powers whom he labored to oppress. The lively eloquence of Avitus inflamed the Gothic warriors, by the description of the injuries which their ancestors had suffered from the Huns, whose implacable fury still pursued them from the Danube to the foot of the Pyrenees. He strenuously urged, that it was the duty of every Christian to save, from sacrilegious violation, the churches of God, and the relics of the saints, that it was the interest of every barbarian, who had acquired a settlement in Gaul. To defend the fields and vineyards, which were cultivated for his use, against the desolation of the Scythian shepherds. Theodoric yielded to the evidence of truth, adopted the measure at once the most prudent and the most honorable. And declared, that, as the faithful ally of Aetius and the Romans, he was ready to expose his life and kingdom for the common safety of Gaul. 4161 The Visigoths, who, at that time, were in the mature vigor of their fame and power, obeyed with alacrity the signal of war. Prepared their arms and horses, and assembled under the standard of their aged king, who was resolved, with his two eldest sons, Torismund and Theodoric, to command in person his numerous and valiant people. The example of the Goths determined several tribes or nations, that seemed to fluctuate between the Huns and the Romans. The indefatigable diligence of the patrician gradually collected the troops of Gaul and Germany, who had formerly acknowledged themselves the subjects, or soldiers, of the Republic, 
but who now claimed the rewards of voluntary service. And the rank of independent allies. The laity, the Armoricans, the Brians, the Saxons, the Burgundians, the Sarmatians, Orolani, the Ripuarians, and the Franks who followed Merovius as their lawful prince. Such was the various army, which, under the conduct of Aetius and Theodoric, advanced, by rapid marches to relieve Orleans, and to give battle to the innumerable host of Attila. 4162. On their approach the king of the Huns immediately raised the siege, and sounded a retreat to recall the foremost of his troops from the pillage of a city which they had already entered. 4163 The valor of Attila was always guided by his prudence. And as he foresaw the fatal consequences of a defeat in the heart of Gaul, he repassed the Seine, and expected the enemy in the plains of Chalons, whose smooth and level surface was adapted to the operations of his Scythian cavalry. But in this tumultuary retreat, the vanguard of the Romans and their allies continually pressed, and sometimes engaged, the troops whom Attila had posted in the rear. The hostile columns, in the darkness of the night and the perplexity of the roads, might encounter each other without design. And the bloody conflict of the Franks and Jeopardy, in which 154164 barbarians were slain, was a prelude to a more general and decisive action. The Catalanian fields 4165 spread themselves round Chalons, and extend, according to the vague measurement of Jornans, to the length of 150, and the breadth of 100 miles, over the whole province. Which is entitled to the appellation of a Champagne country. 4166 This spacious plain was distinguished, however, by some inequalities of ground, and the importance of a height, which commanded the camp of Attila, was understood and disputed by the two generals. The young and valiant Taurusman first occupied the summit. The Goths rushed with irresistible weight on the Huns, who labored to ascend from the opposite side, and the possession of this advantageous post inspired both the troops and their leaders with a fair assurance of victory. The anxiety of Attila prompted him to consult his priests and haruspices. It was reported, that, after scrutinizing the entrails of victims, and scraping their bones, they revealed, in mysterious language, his own defeat, with the death of his principal adversary. And that the barbarians, by accepting the equivalent, expressed his involuntary esteem for the superior merit of Aetius. But the unusual despondency, which seemed to prevail among the Huns, engaged Attila to use the expedient, so familiar to the generals of antiquity, of animating his troops by a military oration. And his language was that of a king, who had often fought and conquered at their head. 4167 He pressed them to consider their past glory, their actual danger, and their future hopes. The same fortune, which opened the deserts and morasses of Scythia to their unarmed valor, which had laid so many warlike nations prostrate at their feet, had reserved the joys of this memorable field for the consummation of their victories. The cautious steps of their enemies, their strict alliance, and their advantageous posts, he artfully represented as the effects, not of prudence, but of fear. The Visigoths alone were the strength and nerves of the opposite army. And the Huns might securely trample on the degenerate Romans, whose close and compact order betrayed their apprehensions, and who were equally incapable of supporting the dangers or the fatigues of a day of battle. The doctrine of predestination, so favorable to martial virtue, was carefully inculcated by the king of the Huns, who assured his subjects, that the warriors, protected by heaven, were safe and invulnerable amidst the darts of the enemy. But that the unerring fates would strike their victims in the bosom of inglorious peace. I myself, continued Attila, will throw the first javelin, and the wretch who refuses to imitate the example of his sovereign, is devoted to inevitable death. The spirit of the barbarians was rekindled by the presence, the voice, and the example of their intrepid leader, and Attila, yielding to their impatience, immediately formed his order of battle. At the head of his brave and faithful Huns, he occupied in person the center of the line. The nations subject to his empire, the Rugians, the Heruli, the Thuringians, the Franks, the Burgundians, were extended on either hand, over the ample space of the Catalanian fields, the right wing was commanded by Arderic, king of the Jeopardy. And the three valiant brothers, who reigned over the Ostrogoths, were posted on the left to oppose the kindred tribes of the Visigoths. 
the disposition of the allies was regulated by a different principle. Sanjiban, the faithless king of the Alani, was placed in the center, where his motions might be strictly watched, and that the treachery might be instantly punished. Aetius assumed the command of the left, and Theodoric of the right wing. While Torismund still continued to occupy the heights which appear to have stretched on the flank, and perhaps the rear, of the Scythian army. The nations from the Volga to the Atlantic were assembled on the plain of Chalons. But many of these nations had been divided by faction, or conquest, or emigration, and the appearance of similar arms and ensigns, which threatened each other, presented the image of a civil war. The discipline and tactics of the Greeks and Romans form an interesting part of their national manners. The attentive study of the military operations of Xenophon, or Caesar, or Frederick, when they are described by the same genius which conceived and executed them, may tend to improve, if such improvement can be wished, the art of destroying the human species. But the Battle of Chalons can only excite our curiosity by the magnitude of the object. Since it was decided by the blind impetuosity of barbarians, and has been related by partial writers, whose civil or ecclesiastical profession secluded them from the knowledge of military affairs. Cassiolorus, however, had familiarly conversed with many Gothic warriors, who served in that memorable engagement, a conflict, as they informed him, fierce, various, obstinate, and bloody. Such as could not be paralleled either in the present or in past ages. The number of the slain amounted to 162,000, or, according to another account, 300,000 persons. 4168 and these incredible exaggerations suppose a real and effective loss sufficient to justify the historian's remark, that whole generations may be swept away by the madness of kings, in the space of a single hour. After the mutual and repeated discharge of missile weapons, in which the archers of Scythia might signalize their superior dexterity, the cavalry and infantry of the two armies were furiously mingled in closer combat. The Huns, who fought under the eyes of their king pierced through the feeble and doubtful center of the allies, separated their wings from each other, and wheeling, with a rapid effort, to the left, directed their whole force against the Visigoths. As Theodoric rode along the ranks, to animate his troops, he received a mortal stroke from the javelin of Andiach, a noble Ostrogoth, and immediately fell from his horse. The wounded king was oppressed in the general disorder, and trampled under the feet of his own cavalry and this important death served to explain the ambiguous prophecy of the Heruspices. Attila already exulted in the confidence of victory, when the valiant Taurusman descended from the hills, and verified the remainder of the prediction. The Visigoths, who had been thrown into confusion by the flight or defection of the Alani, gradually restored their order of battle, and the Huns were undoubtedly vanquished, since Attila was compelled to retreat. He had exposed his person with the rashness of a private soldier, but the intrepid troops of the center had pushed forwards beyond the rest of the line, their attack was faintly supported, their flanks were unguarded. And the conquerors of Scythia and Germany were saved by the approach of the night from a total defeat. They retired within the circle of wagons that fortified their camp. And the dismounted squadrons prepared themselves for a defense, to which neither their arms, nor their temper, were adapted. The event was doubtful, but Attila had secured a last and honorable resource. The saddles and rich furniture of the cavalry were collected, by his order, into a funeral pile. And the magnanimous barbarian had resolved, if his entrenchments should be forced, to rush headlong into the flames, and to deprive his enemies of the glory which they might have acquired, by the death or captivity of Attila. 4169 but his enemies had passed the night in equal disorder and anxiety. The inconsiderate courage of Torismund was tempted to urge the pursuit, till he unexpectedly found himself, with a few followers, in the midst of the Scythian wagons. In the confusion of a nocturnal combat, he was thrown from his horse, and the Gothic prince must have perished like his father, if his youthful strength, and the intrepid zeal of his companions, had not rescued him from this dangerous situation. In the same manner, but on the left of the line, Aetius himself, separated from his allies, ignorant of their victory, and anxious for their fate, encountered and escaped the hostile troops that were scattered over the plains of Chalons. And at length reached the camp of the Goths, which he could only fortify with a slight rampart of shields, 
till the dawn of day. The imperial general was soon satisfied of the defeat of Attila, who still remained inactive within his entrenchments. And when he contemplated the bloody scene, he observed, with secret satisfaction, that the loss had principally fallen on the barbarians. The body of Theodoric, pierced with honorable wounds, was discovered under a heap of the slain, his subjects bewailed the death of their king and father. But their tears were mingled with songs and acclamations, and his funeral rites were performed in the face of a vanquished enemy. The Goths, clashing their arms, elevated on a buckler his eldest son Torismund, to whom they justly ascribed the glory of their success, and the new king accepted the obligation of revenge as a sacred portion of his paternal inheritance. Yet the Goths themselves were astonished by the fierce and undaunted aspect of their formidable antagonist, and their historian has compared Attila to a lion encompassed in his den, and threatening his hunters with redoubled fury. The kings and nations who might have deserted his standard in the hour of distress, were made sensible that the displeasure of their monarch was the most imminent and inevitable danger. All his instruments of martial music incessantly sounded a loud and animating strain of defiance, and the foremost troops who advanced to the assault were checked or destroyed by showers of arrows from every side of the entrenchments. It was determined, in a general council of war, to besiege the king of the Huns in his camp, to intercept his provisions, and to reduce him to the alternative of a disgraceful treaty or an unequal combat. But the impatience of the barbarians soon disdained these cautious and dilatory measures. And the mature policy of Aetius was apprehensive that, after the extirpation of the Huns, the Republic would be oppressed by the pride and power of the Gothic nation. The patrician exerted the superior ascendant of authority and reason to calm the passions, which the son of Theodoric considered as a duty. Represented, with seeming affection and real truth, the dangers of absence and delay and persuaded Torismund to disappoint, by his speedy return, the ambitious designs of his brothers, who might occupy the throne and treasures of Tholaus. 4170 After the departure of the Goths, and the separation of the allied army. Attila was surprised at the vast silence that reigned over the plains of Chalons, the suspicion of some hostile stratagem detained him several days within the circle of his wagons. And his retreat beyond the Rhine confessed the last victory which was achieved in the name of the Western Empire. Merovius and his Franks, observing a prudent distance, and magnifying the opinion of their strength by the numerous fires which they kindled every night, continued to follow the rear of the Huns till they reached the confines of Thuringia. The Thuringians served in the army of Attila, they traversed, both in their march and in their return, the territories of the Franks. And it was perhaps in this war that they exercised the cruelties which, about fourscore years afterwards, were revenged by the son of Clovis. They massacred their hostages, as well as their captives, two hundred young maidens were tortured with exquisite and unrelenting rage, their bodies were torn asunder by wild horses, or their bones were crushed under the weight of rolling wagons. And their unburied limbs were abandoned on the public roads, as a prey to dogs and vultures. Such were those savage ancestors, whose imaginary virtues have sometimes excited the praise and envy of civilized ages. 4171. Neither the spirit, nor the forces, nor the reputation, of Attila, were impaired by the failure of the Gallic expedition. In the ensuing spring he repeated his demand of the Princess Honoria, and her patrimonial treasures. The demand was again rejected, or eluded, and the indignant lover immediately took the field, passed the Alps, invaded Italy, and besieged Aquileia with an innumerable host of barbarians. Those barbarians were unskilled in the methods of conducting a regular siege, which, even among the ancients, required some knowledge, or at least some practice, of the mechanic arts. But the labor of many thousand provincials and captives, whose lives were sacrificed without pity, might execute the most painful and dangerous work. The skill of the Roman artists might be corrupted to the destruction of their country. The walls of Aquileia were assaulted by a formidable train of battering rams, movable turrets, and engines, that threw stones, darts, and fire. 4172 And the monarch of the Huns employed the forcible impulse of hope, fear, emulation, and interest, to subvert the only barrier which delayed the conquest of Italy. Aquileia was at that period one of the richest, the most populous, 
and the strongest of the maritime cities of the Adriatic coast. The Gothic auxiliaries, who appeared to have served under their native princes, Alaric and Antala, communicated their intrepid spirit. And the citizens still remembered the glorious and successful resistance which their ancestors had opposed to a fierce, inexorable barbarian, who disgraced the majesty of the Roman purple. Three months were consumed without effect in the siege of the Aquileia, till the want of provisions, and the clamours of his army, compelled Attila to relinquish the enterprise. And reluctantly to issue his orders, that the troops should strike their tents the next morning, and begin their retreat. But as he rode round the walls, pensive, angry, and disappointed, he observed a stork preparing to leave her nest, in one of the towers, and to fly with her infant family towards the country. He seized, with the ready penetration of a statesman, this trifling incident, which chance had offered to superstition. And exclaimed, in a loud and cheerful tone, that such a domestic bird, so constantly attached to human society, would never have abandoned her ancient seats, unless those towers had been devoted to impending ruin and solitude. 4173 The favorable omen inspired an assurance of victory, the siege was renewed and prosecuted with fresh vigor, a large breach was made in the part of the wall from whence the stork had taken her flight. The Huns mounted to the assault with irresistible fury, and the succeeding generation could scarcely discover the ruins of Aquileia. 4174 After this dreadful chastisement, Attila pursued his march. And as he passed, the cities of Altinum, Concordia, and Padua, were reduced into heaps of stones and ashes. The inland towns, Vicenza, Verona, and Bergamo, were exposed to the rapacious cruelty of the Huns. Milan and Pavia submitted, without resistance, to the loss of their wealth, and applauded the unusual clemency which preserved from the flames the public, as well as private, buildings, and spared the lives of the captive multitude. The popular traditions of Comum, Turin, or Medina, may justly be suspected, yet they concur with more authentic evidence to prove that Attila spread his ravages over the rich plains of modern Lombardy, which are divided by the Pe, and bounded by the Alps and Apennine. 4175 When he took possession of the royal palace of Milan, he was surprised and offended at the sight of a picture which represented the Caesars seated on their throne, and the princes of Scythia prostrate at their feet. The revenge which Attila inflicted on this monument of Roman vanity, was harmless and ingenious. He commanded a painter to reverse the figures and the attitudes. And the emperors were delineated on the same canvas, approaching in a suppliant posture to empty their bags of tributary gold before the throne of the Scythian monarch. 4176 The spectators must have confessed the truth and propriety of the alteration, and were perhaps tempted to apply, on this singular occasion, the well-known fable of the dispute between the lion and the man. 4177 It is a saying worthy of the ferocious pride of Attila, that the grass never grew on the spot where his horse had trod. Yet the savage destroyer undesignedly laid the foundation of a republic, which revived, in the feudal state of Europe, the art and spirit of commercial industry. The celebrated name of Venice, or Venetia, 4178 was formerly diffused over a large and fertile province of Italy, from the confines of Pannonia to the river Adua, and from the Pa to the Rhetian and Julian Alps. Before the eruption of the barbarians, fifty Venetian cities flourished in peace and prosperity, Aquileia was placed in the most conspicuous station, but the ancient dignity of Padua was supported by agriculture and manufactures. And the property of five hundred citizens, who were entitled to the equestrian rank, must have amounted, at the strictest computation, to one million seven hundred thousand pounds. Many families of Aquileia, Padua, and the adjacent towns, who fled from the sword of the Huns, found a safe, though obscure, refuge in the neighboring islands. 4179 At the extremity of the gulf, where the Adriatic feebly imitates the tides of the ocean, near a hundred small islands are separated by shallow water from the continent, and protected from the waves by several long slips of land, which admit the entrance of vessels through some secret and narrow channels. 4180 Till the middle of the 5th century, these remote and sequestered spots remained without cultivation, with few inhabitants, and almost without a name. But the manners of the Venetian fugitives, their arts and their government, were gradually formed by their new situation. 
and one of the epistles of Cassiodorus 4181 which describes their condition about seventy years afterwards, may be considered as the primitive monument of the Republic. 4182 The minister of Theodoric compares them, in his quaint declamatory style, to waterfowl, who had fixed their nests on the bosom of the waves. And though he allows, that the Venetian provinces had formerly contained many noble families, he insinuates, that they were now reduced by misfortune to the same level of humble poverty. Fish was the common, and almost the universal, food of every rank, their only treasure consisted in the plenty of salt, which they extracted from the sea, and the exchange of that commodity, so essential to human life, was substituted in the neighboring markets to the currency of gold and silver. A people, whose habitations might be doubtfully assigned to the earth or water, soon became alike familiar with the two elements, and the demands of avarice succeeded to those of necessity. The islanders, who, from Grotto to Cayazza, were intimately connected with each other, penetrated into the heart of Italy, by the secure, though laborious, navigation of the rivers and inland canals. Their vessels, which were continually increasing in size and number, visited all the harbors of the Gulf, and the marriage which Venice annually celebrates with the Adriatic, was contracted in her early infancy. The Epistle of Cassiodorus, the Praetorian Prefect, is addressed to the maritime tribunes. And he exhorts them, in a mild tone of authority, to animate the zeal of their countrymen for the public service, which required their assistance to transport the magazines of wine and oil from the province of Istria to the royal city of Ravenna. The ambiguous office of these magistrates is explained by the tradition, that, in the twelve principal islands, twelve tribunes, or judges, were created by an annual and popular election. The existence of the Venetian Republic under the Gothic Kingdom of Italy, is attested by the same authentic record, which annihilates their lofty claim of original and perpetual independence. 4183. The Italians, who had long since renounced the exercise of arms, were surprised, after forty years' peace, by the approach of a formidable barbarian, whom they abhorred, as the enemy of their religion, as well as of their republic. Amidst the general consternation, Aetius alone was incapable of fear, but it was impossible that he should achieve, alone and unassisted, any military exploits worthy of his former renown. The barbarians who had defended Gaul, refused to march to the relief of Italy, and the succors promised by the eastern emperor were distant and doubtful. Since Aetius, at the head of his domestic troops, still maintained the field, and harassed or retarded the march of Attila, he never showed himself more truly great, than at the time when his conduct was blamed by an ignorant and ungrateful people. 4184 If the mind of Valentinian had been susceptible of any generous sentiments, he would have chosen such a general for his example and his guide. But the timid grandson of Theodosius, instead of sharing the dangers, escaped from the sound of war. And his hasty retreat from Ravenna to Rome, from an impregnable fortress to an open capital, betrayed his secret intention of abandoning Italy, as soon as the danger should approach his imperial person. This shameful abdication was suspended, however, by the spirit of doubt and delay, which commonly adheres to pusillanimous counsels, and sometimes corrects their pernicious tendency. The Western Emperor, with the Senate and people of Rome, embraced the more salutary resolution of deprecating, by a solemn and suppliant embassy, the wrath of Attila. This important commission was accepted by Avienus, who, from his birth and riches, his consular dignity, the numerous train of his clients, and his personal abilities, held the first rank in the Roman Senate. The specious and artful character of Avienus 4185 was admirably qualified to conduct a negotiation either of public or private interest, his colleague Trigetius had exercised the Praetorian Prefecture of Italy. And Leo, Bishop of Rome, consented to expose his life for the safety of his flock. The genius of Leo 4186 was exercised and displayed in the public misfortunes. And he has deserved the appellation of great, by the successful zeal with which he labored to establish his opinions and his authority, under the venerable names of orthodox faith and ecclesiastical discipline. The Roman ambassadors were introduced to the tent of Attila, as he lay encamped at the place where the slow-winding Mincius is lost in the foaming waves of the Lake Benicus, 4187 and trampled, with his Scythian cavalry. The Farms of Catullus and Virgil 
4188 The barbarian monarch listened with favorable, and even respectful, attention, and the deliverance of Italy was purchased by the immense ransom, or dowry, of the Princess Honoria. The state of his army might facilitate the treaty, and hasten his retreat. Their martial spirit was relaxed by the wealth and idolence of a warm climate. The shepherds of the north, whose ordinary food consisted of milk and raw flesh, indulged themselves too freely in the use of bread, of wine, and of meat, prepared and seasoned by the arts of cookery. And the progress of disease revenged in some measure the injuries of the Italians. 4189 When Attila declared his resolution of carrying his victorious arms to the gates of Rome, he was admonished by his friends, as well as by his enemies, that Alaric had not long survived the conquest of the Eternal City. His mind, superior to real danger, was assaulted by imaginary terrors, nor could he escape the influence of superstition, which had so often been subservient to his designs. 4190 The pressing eloquence of Leo, his majestic aspect and sacerdotal robes, excited the veneration of Attila for the spiritual father of the Christians. The apparition of the two apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul, who menaced the barbarian with instant death, if he rejected the prayer of their successor, is one of the noblest legends of ecclesiastical tradition. The safety of Rome might deserve the interposition of celestial beings. And some indulgence is due to a fable, which has been represented by the pencil of Raphael, and the chisel of Algardi. 4191. Before the king of the Huns evacuated Italy, he threatened to return more dreadful, and more implacable, if his bride, the princess Honoria, were not delivered to his ambassadors within the terms stipulated by the treaty. Yet, in the meanwhile, Attila relieved his tender anxiety, by adding a beautiful maid, whose name was Ildico, to the list of his innumerable wives. 4192 Their marriage was celebrated with barbaric pomp and festivity, at his wooden palace beyond the Danube, and the monarch, oppressed with wine and sleep, retired at a late hour from the banquet to the nuptial bed. His attendants continued to respect his pleasures, or his repose, the greatest part of the ensuing day, till the unusual silence alarmed their fears and suspicions. And, after attempting to awaken Attila by loud and repeated cries, they at length broke into the royal apartment. They found the trembling bride sitting by the bedside, hiding her face with her veil, and lamenting her own danger, as well as the death of the king, who had expired during the night. 4193 An artery had suddenly burst, and as Attila lay in a supine posture, he was suffocated by a torrent of blood, which, instead of finding a passage through the nostrils, regurgitated into the lungs and stomach. His body was solemnly exposed in the midst of the plain, under a silken pavilion. And the chosen squadrons of the Huns, wheeling round in measured evolutions, chanted a funeral song to the memory of a hero, glorious in his life, invincible in his death, the father of his people, the scourge of his enemies. And the terror of the world. According to their national custom, the barbarians cut off a part of their hair, gashed their faces with unseemly wounds, and bewailed their valiant leader as he deserved, not with the tears of women, but with the blood of warriors. The remains of Attila were enclosed within three coffins, of gold, of silver, and of iron, and privately buried in the night, the spoils of nations were thrown into his grave, the captives who had opened the ground were inhumanly massacred. And the same Huns, who had indulged such excessive grief, feasted, with dissolute and intemperate mirth, about the recent sepulchre of their king. It was reported at Constantinople, that on the fortunate night on which he expired, Martian beheld in a dream the bow of Attila broken asunder, and the report may be allowed to prove. How seldom the image of that formidable barbarian was absent from the mind of a Roman emperor. 4194 the revolution which subverted the empire of the Huns, established the fame of Attila, whose genius alone had sustained the huge and disjointed fabric. After his death, the boldest chieftains aspired to the rank of kings. The most powerful kings refused to acknowledge a superior. And the numerous sons, whom so many various mothers bore to the deceased monarch, divided and disputed, like a private inheritance, the sovereign command of the nations of Germany and Scythia. The bold Arderic felt and represented the disgrace of this servile partition. And his subjects, 
the warlike jeopardy, with the Ostrogoths, under the conduct of three valiant brothers, encouraged their allies to vindicate the rights of freedom and royalty. In a bloody and decisive conflict on the banks of the river Netad, in Pannonia, the lance of the Jeopardy, the sword of the Goths, the arrows of the Huns, the Suvic infantry, the light arms of the Heruli, and the heavy weapons of the Alani, encountered or supported each other. And the victory of the Arderic was accompanied with the slaughter of thirty thousand of his enemies. Elek, the eldest son of Attila, lost his life and crown in the memorable Battle of Netad, his early valor had raised him to the throne of the Akatsires, a Scythian people, whom he subdued. And his father, who loved the superior merit, would have envied the death of Elek. 4195 His brother, Dengesic, with an army of Huns, still formidable in their flight and ruin, maintained his ground above fifteen years on the banks of the Danube. The palace of Attila, with the old country of Dacia, from the Carpathian hills to the Euxine, became the seat of a new power, which was erected by Arderic, king of the Jeopardy. The Pannonian conquests from Vienna to Sirmium, were occupied by the Ostrogoths. And the settlements of the tribes, who had so bravely asserted their native freedom, were irregularly distributed, according to the measure of their respective strength. Surrounded and oppressed by the multitude of his father's slaves, the kingdom of Dengesic was confined to the circle of his wagons, his desperate courage urged him to invade the Eastern Empire, he fell in battle. And his head ignominiously exposed in the Hippodrome, exhibited a grateful spectacle to the people of Constantinople. Attila had fondly or superstitiously believed, that Ernak, the youngest of his sons, was destined to perpetuate the glories of his race. The character of that prince, who attempted to moderate the rashness of his brother Dengesic, was more suitable to the declining condition of the Huns, and Ernak, with his subject hordes, retired into the heart of the Lesser Scythia. They were soon overwhelmed by a torrent of new barbarians, who followed the same road which their own ancestors had formerly discovered. The Jujan, or Avarez, whose residence is assigned by the Greek writers to the shores of the ocean, impelled the adjacent tribes. Till at length the Igurus of the north, issuing from the cold Siberian regions, which produced the most valuable furs, spread themselves over the desert, as far as the Burstenes and the Caspian Gates. And finally extinguished the empire of the Huns. 4196. Such an event might contribute to the safety of the Eastern Empire, under the reign of a prince who conciliated the friendship, without forfeiting the esteem, of the barbarians. But the Emperor of the West, the feeble and dissolute Valentinian, who had reached his thirty-fifth year without attaining the age of reason or courage, abused this apparent security, to undermine the foundations of his own throne. By the murder of the patrician Aetius. From the instinct of a base and jealous mind, he hated the man who was universally celebrated as the terror of the barbarians, and the support of the Republic. 4197 And his new favorite, the eunuch Heraclius, awakened the emperor from the supine lethargy, which might be disguised, during the life of Placidia 4198 by the excuse of filial piety. The fame of Aetius, his wealth and dignity, the numerous and martial train of barbarian followers, his powerful dependents, who filled the civil offices of the state, and the hopes of his son Gadentius, who was already contracted to Eudoxia. The emperor's daughter, had raised him above the rank of a subject. The ambitious designs, of which he was secretly accused, excited the fears, as well as the resentment, of Valentinian. Aetius himself, supported by the consciousness of his merit, his services, and perhaps his innocence, seems to have maintained a haughty and indiscreet behavior. The patrician offended his sovereign by a hostile declaration. He aggravated the offense, by compelling him to ratify, with a solemn oath, a treaty of reconciliation and alliance, he proclaimed his suspicions, he neglected his safety. And from a vain confidence that the enemy, whom he despised, was incapable even of a manly crime, he rashly ventured his person in the palace of Rome. Whilst he urged, perhaps with intemperate vehemence, the marriage of his son, Valentinian, drawing his sword, the first sword he had ever drawn, plunged it in the breast of a general who had saved his empire, his courtiers and eunuchs ambitiously struggled to imitate their master. And Aetius, pierced with a hundred wounds, fell dead in the royal presence. Boethius, the praetorian prefect, 
was killed at the same moment, and before the event could be divulged, the principal friends of the patrician were summoned to the palace, and separately murdered. The horrid deed, palliated by the specious names of justice and necessity, was immediately communicated by the emperor to his soldiers, his subjects, and his allies. The nations, who were strangers or enemies to Aetius, generously deplored the unworthy fate of a hero, the barbarians, who had been attached to his service, dissembled their grief and resentment, and the public contempt. Which had been so long entertained for Valentinian, was at once converted into deep and universal abhorrence. Such sentiments seldom pervade the walls of a palace, yet the emperor was confounded by the honest reply of a Roman, whose approbation he had not disdained to solicit. I am ignorant, sir, of your motives or provocations. I only know, that you have acted like a man who cuts off his right hand with his left, 4199. The luxury of Rome seems to have attracted the long and frequent visits of Valentinian, who was consequently more despised at Rome than in any other part of his dominions. A republican spirit was insensibly revived in the Senate, as their authority, and even their supplies, became necessary for the support of his feeble government. The stately demeanor of an hereditary monarch offended their pride, and the pleasures of Valentinian were injurious to the peace and honor of noble families. The birth of the Empress Eudoxia was equal to his own, and her charms and tender affection deserved those testimonies of love which her inconstant husband dissipated in vague and unlawful amours. Petronius Maximus, a wealthy senator of the Anician family, who had been twice consul, was possessed of a chaste and beautiful wife, her obstinate resistance served only to irritate the desires of Valentinian. And he resolved to accomplish them either by stratagem or force. Deep gaming was one of the vices of the court, the emperor, who, by chance or contrivance, had gained from Maximus a considerable sum, uncourteously exacted his ring as a security for the debt. And sent it by a trusty messenger to his wife, with an order, in her husband's name, that she should immediately attend the Empress Eudoxia. The unsuspecting wife of Maximus was conveyed in her litter to the imperial palace. The emissaries of her impatient lover conducted her to a remote and silent bedchamber, and Valentinian violated, without remorse, the laws of hospitality. Her tears, when she returned home, her deep affliction, and her bitter reproaches against a husband whom she considered as the accomplice of his own shame, excited Maximus to a just revenge, the desire of revenge was stimulated by ambition. And he might reasonably aspire, by the free suffrage of the Roman Senate, to the throne of a detested and despicable rival. Valentinian, who supposed that every human breast was devoid, like his own, of friendship and gratitude, had imprudently admitted among his guards several domestics and followers of Aetius. Two of these, of barbarian race were persuaded to execute a sacred and honorable duty, by punishing with death the assassin of their patron, and their intrepid courage did not long expect a favorable moment. Whilst Valentinian amused himself, in the field of Mars, with the spectacle of some military sports, they suddenly rushed upon him with drawn weapons, dispatched the guilty Heraclius, and stabbed the emperor to the heart. Without the least opposition from his numerous train, who seemed to rejoice in the tyrant's death. Such was the fate of Valentinian III, 4200 the last Roman emperor of the family of Theodosius. He faithfully imitated the hereditary weakness of his cousin and his two uncles, without inheriting the gentleness, the purity, the innocence, which alleviate, in their characters, the want of spirit and ability. Valentinian was less excusable, since he had passions, without virtues, even his religion was questionable. And though he never deviated into the paths of heresy, he scandalized the pious Christians by his attachment to the profane arts of magic and divination. As early as the time of Cicero and Varro, it was the opinion of the Roman augurs, that the twelve vultures which Romulus had seen, represented the twelve centuries, assigned for the fatal period of his city. 4201 This prophecy, disregarded perhaps in the season of health and prosperity, inspired the people with gloomy apprehensions, when the twelfth century, clouded with disgrace and misfortune, was almost elapsed. 
4202 and even posterity must acknowledge with some surprise, that the arbitrary interpretation of an accidental or fabulous circumstance has been seriously verified in the downfall of the Western Empire. But its fall was announced by a clearer omen than the flight of vultures, the Roman government appeared every day less formidable to its enemies, more odious and oppressive to its subjects. 4203 The taxes were multiplied with the public distress. Economy was neglected in proportion as it became necessary, and the injustice of the rich shifted the unequal burden from themselves to the people, whom they defrauded of the indulgences that might sometimes have alleviated their misery. The severe inquisition which confiscated their goods, and tortured their persons, compelled the subjects of Valentinian to prefer the more simple tyranny of the barbarians, to fly to the woods and mountains. Or to embrace the vile and abject condition of mercenary servants. They abjured and abhorred the name of Roman citizens, which had formerly excited the ambition of mankind. The Armorican provinces of Gaul, and the greatest part of Spain, were thrown into a state of disorderly independence, by the confederations of the Bugatti. And the imperial ministers pursued with proscriptive laws, and ineffectual arms, the rebels whom they had made. 4204 If all the barbarian conquerors had been annihilated in the same hour, their total destruction would not have restored the empire of the West, and if Rome still survived, she survived the loss of freedom, of virtue, and of honor. XXXVA, Total Extinction of the Western Empire Sack of Rome by Genseric, King of the Vandals. His Naval Depredations Succession of the Last Emperors of the West, Maximus, Avitus, Majorian, Severus, Anthemius, Olibrius, Glycerius, Nepos, Augustulus. Total extinction of the Western Empire. Reign of Odoacer, the first barbarian king of Italy. The loss or desolation of the provinces, from the ocean to the Alps, impaired the glory and greatness of Rome, her internal prosperity was irretrievably destroyed by the separation of Africa. The rapacious vandals confiscated the patrimonial estates of the senators, and intercepted the regular subsidies, which relieved the poverty and encouraged the idleness of the plebeians. The distress of the Romans was soon aggravated by an unexpected attack, and the province, so long cultivated for their use by industrious and obedient subjects, was armed against them by an ambitious barbarian. The Vandals and Alani, who followed the successful standard of Genseric, had acquired a rich and fertile territory, which stretched along the coast above ninety days' journey from Tangier to Tripoli. But their narrow limits were pressed and confined, on either side, by the sandy desert and the Mediterranean. The discovery and conquest of the black nations, that might dwell beneath the torrid zone, could not tempt the rational ambition of Genseric, but he cast his eyes towards the sea. He resolved to create a naval power, and his bold resolution was executed with steady and active perseverance. The woods of Mount Atlas afforded an inexhaustible nursery of timber, his new subjects were skilled in the arts of navigation and shipbuilding. He animated his daring vandals to embrace a mode of warfare which would render every maritime country accessible to their arms, the Moors and Africans were allured by the hopes of plunder. And, after an interval of six centuries, the fleets that issued from the port of Carthage again claimed the empire of the Mediterranean. The success of the Vandals, the conquest of Sicily, the sack of Palermo, and the frequent descents on the coast of Lucania, awakened and alarmed the mother of Valentinian, and the sister of Theodosius. Alliances were formed. And armaments, expensive and ineffectual, were prepared, for the destruction of the common enemy who reserved his courage to encounter those dangers which his policy could not prevent or elude. The designs of the Roman government were repeatedly baffled by his artful delays, ambiguous promises, and apparent concessions. And the interposition of his formidable confederate, the King of the Huns, recalled the emperors from the conquest of Africa to the care of their domestic safety. The revolutions of the palace, which left the Western Empire without a defender, and without a lawful prince, dispelled the apprehensions, and stimulated the avarice, of Genseric. He immediately equipped a numerous fleet of Vandals and Moors, and cast anchor at the mouth of the Tiber, about three months after the death of Valentinian, and the elevation of Maximus to the imperial throne. The private life of the senator Petronius Maximus 4205 was often alleged as a rare example of human felicity. 
His birth was noble and illustrious, since he descended from the Anitian family. His dignity was supported by an adequate patrimony in land and money, and these advantages of fortune were accompanied with liberal arts and decent manners, which adorn or imitate the inestimable gifts of genius and virtue. The luxury of his palace and table was hospitable and elegant. Whenever Maximus appeared in public, he was surrounded by a train of grateful and obsequious clients. 4206 And it is possible that among these clients, he might deserve and possess some real friends. His merit was rewarded by the favor of the prince and senate, he thrice exercised the office of Praetorian Prefect of Italy. He was twice invested with the consulship, and he obtained the rank of patrician. These civil honors were not incompatible with the enjoyment of leisure and tranquility. His hours, according to the demands of pleasure or reason, were accurately distributed by a water clock, and this avarice of time may be allowed to prove the sense which Maximus entertained of his own happiness. The injury which he received from the Emperor Valentinian appears to excuse the most bloody revenge. Yet a philosopher might have reflected, that, if the resistance of his wife had been sincere, her chastity was still inviolate, and that it could never be restored if she had consented to the will of the adulterer. A patriot would have hesitated before he plunged himself and his country into those inevitable calamities which must follow the extinction of the royal house of Theodosius. The imprudent Maximus disregarded these salutary considerations. He gratified his resentment and ambition, he saw the bleeding corpse of Valentinian at his feet, and he heard himself saluted emperor by the unanimous voice of the senate and people. But the day of his inauguration was the last day of his happiness. He was imprisoned, such is the lively expression of Sidonius, in the palace, and after passing a sleepless night, he sighed that he had attained the summit of his wishes, and aspired only to descend from the dangerous elevation. Oppressed by the weight of the diadem, he communicated his anxious thoughts to his friend in Quester Fulgentius. And when he looked back with unavailing regret on the secure pleasures of his former life, the emperor exclaimed, O fortunate Damocles, 4207 thy reign began and ended with the same dinner. A well-known allusion, which Fulgentius afterwards repeated as an instructive lesson for princes and subjects. The reign of Maximus continued about three months. His hours, of which he had lost the command, were disturbed by remorse, or guilt, or terror, and his throne was shaken by the seditions of the soldiers, the people, and the confederate barbarians. The marriage of his son Palladius with the eldest daughter of the late emperor, might tend to establish the hereditary succession of his family. But the violence which he offered to the empress Eudoxia, could proceed only from the blind impulse of lust or revenge. His own wife, the cause of these tragic events, had been seasonably removed by death. And the widow of Valentinian was compelled to violate her decent mourning, perhaps her real grief, and to submit to the embraces of a presumptuous usurper, whom she suspected as the assassin of her deceased husband. These suspicions were soon justified by the indiscreet confession of Maximus himself, and he wantonly provoked the hatred of his reluctant bride, who was still conscious that she was descended from a line of emperors. From the east, however, Eudoxia could not hope to obtain any effectual assistance, her father and her aunt Pulcheria were dead, her mother languished at Jerusalem in disgrace and exile. And the scepter of Constantinople was in the hands of a stranger. She directed her eyes towards Carthage, secretly implored the aid of the king of the Vandals, and persuaded Genseric to improve the fair opportunity of disguising his rapacious designs by the specious names of honor, justice, and compassion. 4208 Whatever abilities Maximus might have shown in a subordinate station, he was found incapable of administering an empire. And though he might easily have been informed of the naval preparations which were made on the opposite shores of Africa, he expected with supine indifference the approach of the enemy, without adopting any measures of defense, of negotiation, or of a timely retreat. When the Vandals disembarked at the mouth of the Tiber, the emperor was suddenly roused from his lethargy by the clamors of a trembling and exasperated multitude. The only hope which presented itself to his astonished mind was that of a precipitate flight, and he exhorted the senators to imitate the example of their prince. But no sooner did Maximus appear in the streets, than he was assaulted by a shower of stones, a Roman, or a Burgundian soldier, 
claimed the honor of the first wound, his mangled body was ignominiously cast into the Tiber. The Roman people rejoiced in the punishment which they had inflicted on the author of the public calamities, and the domestics of Eudoxia signalized their zeal in the service of their mistress. 4209. On the third day after the tumult, Genseric boldly advanced from the port of Ostia to the gates of the defenseless city. Instead of a sally of the Roman youth, there issued from the gates an unarmed and venerable procession of the bishop at the head of his clergy. 4210 The fearless spirit of Leo, his authority and eloquence, again mitigated the fierceness of a barbarian conqueror. The king of the Vandals promised to spare the unresisting multitude, to protect the buildings from fire, and to exempt the captives from torture. And although such orders were neither seriously given, nor strictly obeyed, the mediation of Leo was glorious to himself, and in some degree beneficial to his country. But Rome and its inhabitants were delivered to the licentiousness of the Vandals and Moors, whose blind passions revenged the injuries of Carthage. The pillage lasted fourteen days and nights. And all that yet remained of public or private wealth, of sacred or profane treasure, was diligently transported to the vessels of Genseric. Among the spoils, the splendid relics of two temples, or rather of two religions, exhibited a memorable example of the vicissitudes of human and divine things. Since the abolition of paganism, the capital had been violated and abandoned. Yet the statues of the gods and heroes were still respected, and the curious roof of gilt bronze was reserved for the rapacious hands of Genseric. 42.11 The holy instruments of the Jewish worship, 42.12 The gold table, and the gold candlestick with seven branches, originally framed according to the particular instructions of God Himself, and which were placed in the sanctuary of His temple, had been ostentatiously displayed to the Roman people in the triumph of Titus. They were afterwards deposited in the Temple of Peace, and at the end of four hundred years, the spoils of Jerusalem were transferred from Rome to Carthage, by a barbarian who derived his origin from the shores of the Baltic. These ancient monuments might attract the notice of curiosity, as well as of avarice. But the Christian churches, enriched and adorned by the prevailing superstition of the times, afforded more plentiful materials for sacrilege. And the pious liberality of Pope Leo, who melted six silver vases, the gift of Constantine, each of a hundred pounds weight, is an evidence of the damage which he attempted to repair. In the forty-five years that had elapsed since the Gothic invasion, the pomp and luxury of Rome were in some measure restored. And it was difficult either to escape, or to satisfy, the avarice of a conqueror, who possessed leisure to collect, and ships to transport, the wealth of the capital. The imperial ornaments of the palace, the magnificent furniture and wardrobe, the sideboards of massy plate, were accumulated with disorderly rapine, the gold and silver amounted to several thousand talents. Yet even the brass and copper were laboriously removed. Eudoxia herself, who advanced to meet her friend and deliverer, soon bewailed the imprudence of her own conduct. She was rudely stripped of her jewels. And the unfortunate empress, with her two daughters, the only surviving remains of the great Theodosius, was compelled, as a captive, to follow the haughty vandal, who immediately hoisted sail, and returned with a prosperous navigation to the port of Carthage. 4213 Many thousand Romans of both sexes, chosen for some useful or agreeable qualifications, reluctantly embarked on board the fleet of Genseric. And their distress was aggravated by the unfeeling barbarians, who, in the division of the booty, separated the wives from their husbands, and the children from their parents. The charity of Diagratius, Bishop of Carthage, 4214 was their only consolation in support. He generously sold the gold and silver plate of the church to purchase the freedom of some, to alleviate the slavery of others, and to assist the wants and infirmities of a captive multitude whose health was impaired by the hardships which they had suffered in their passage from Italy to Africa. By his order, two spacious churches were converted into hospitals, the sick were distributed into convenient beds, and liberally supplied with food and medicines. And the aged prelate repeated his visits both in the day and night, with an assiduity that surpassed his strength, and a tender sympathy which enhanced the value of his services. Compare this scene with the field of Cannae. 
and judge between Hannibal and the successor of St. Cyprian. 4215. The deaths of Aetius and Valentinian had relaxed the ties which held the barbarians of Gaul in peace and subordination. The seacoast was infested by the Saxons. The Alamanni and the Franks advanced from the Rhine to the Seine, and the ambition of the Goths seemed to meditate more extensive and permanent conquests. The Emperor Maximus relieved himself, by a judicious choice, from the weight of these distant cares, he silenced the solicitations of his friends, listened to the voice of fame, and promoted a stranger to the general command of the forces of Gaul. Avitus 4216 The stranger, whose merit was so nobly rewarded, descended from a wealthy and honorable family in the diocese of Auvergne. The convulsions of the times urged him to embrace, with the same ardor, the civil and military professions, and the indefatigable youth blended the studies of literature and jurisprudence with the exercise of arms and hunting. Thirty years of his life were laudably spent in the public service, he alternately displayed his talents in war and negotiation. And the soldier of Aetius, after executing the most important embassies, was raised to the station of Praetorian Prefect of Gaul. Either the merit of Avitus excited envy, or his moderation was desirous of repose, since he calmly retired to an estate, which he possessed in the neighborhood of Clermont. A copious stream, issuing from the mountain, and falling headlong in many a loud and foaming cascade, discharged its waters into a lake about two miles in length, and the villa was pleasantly seated on the margin of the lake. The baths, the porticos, the summer and winter apartments, were adapted to the purposes of luxury and use, and the adjacent country afforded the various prospects of woods, pastures, and meadows. 4217 In this retreat, where Avitus amused his leisure with books, rural sports, the practice of husbandry, and the society of his friends, 4218 he received the imperial diploma, which constituted him master general of the cavalry and infantry of Gaul. He assumed the military command, the barbarians suspended their fury, and whatever means he might employ, whatever concessions he might be forced to make, the people enjoyed the benefits of actual tranquility. But the fate of Gaul depended on the Visigoths, and the Roman general, less attentive to his dignity than to the public interest, did not disdain to visit Thulaus in the character of an ambassador. He was received with courteous hospitality by Theodoric, the king of the Goths. But while Avitus laid the foundations of a solid alliance with that powerful nation, he was astonished by the intelligence, that the Emperor Maximus was slain, and that Rome had been pillaged by the Vandals. A vacant throne, which he might ascend without guilt or danger, tempted his ambition, 4219 and the Visigoths were easily persuaded to support his claim by their irresistible suffrage. They loved the person of Avitus, they respected his virtues. And they were not insensible of the advantage, as well as honor, of giving an emperor to the West. The season was now approaching, in which the annual assembly of the seven provinces was held at Alls. Their deliberations might perhaps be influenced by the presence of Theodoric and his martial brothers, but their choice would naturally incline to the most illustrious of their countrymen. Avitus, after a decent resistance, accepted the imperial diadem from the representatives of Gaul, and his election was ratified by the acclamations of the barbarians and provincials. The formal consent of Martian, Emperor of the East, was solicited and obtained, but the Senate, Rome, and Italy, though humbled by their recent calamities, submitted with a secret murmur to the presumption of the Gallic usurper. Theodoric, to whom Avitus was indebted for the purple, had acquired the Gothic scepter by the murder of his elder brother Torismund. And he justified this atrocious deed by the design which his predecessor had formed of violating his alliance with the Empire. 4220 Such a crime might not be incompatible with the virtues of a barbarian. But the manners of Theodoric were gentle and humane, and posterity may contemplate without terror the original picture of a Gothic king, whom Sidonius had intimately observed, in the hours of peace and of social intercourse. In an epistle, dated from the court of Tholaus, the orator satisfies the curiosity of one of his friends, in the following description, 4221, by the majesty of his appearance. Theodoric would command the respect of those who are ignorant of his merit. And although he is born a prince, his merit would dignify a private station. He is of a middle stature, his body appears rather plump than fat, 
and in his well-proportioned limbs agility is united with muscular strength. 4222 If you examine his countenance, you will distinguish a high forehead, large shaggy eyebrows, an aquiline nose, thin lips, a regular set of white teeth, and a fair complexion, that blushes more frequently from modesty than from anger. The ordinary distribution of his time, as far as it is exposed to the public view, may be concisely represented. Before daybreak, he repairs, with a small train, to his domestic chapel, where the service is performed by the Aryan clergy. But those who presume to interpret his secret sentiments, consider this assiduous devotion as the effect of habit and policy. The rest of the morning is employed in the administration of his kingdom. His chair is surrounded by some military officers of decent aspect and behavior, the noisy crowd of his barbarian guards occupies the hall of audience. But they are not permitted to stand within the veils or curtains that conceal the council chamber from vulgar eyes. The ambassadors of the nations are successively introduced, Theodoric listens with attention, answers them with discreet brevity, and either announces or delays, according to the nature of their business, his final resolution. About eight, the second hour, he rises from his throne, and visits either his treasury or his stables. If he chooses to hunt, or at least to exercise himself on horseback, his bow is carried by a favorite youth. But when the game is marked, he bends it with his own hand, and seldom misses the object of his aim, as a king, he disdains to bear arms in such ignoble warfare. But as a soldier, he would blush to accept any military service which he could perform himself. On common days, his dinner is not different from the repast of a private citizen, but every Saturday, many honorable guests are invited to the royal table, which, on these occasions, is served with the elegance of Greece, the plenty of Gaul, and the order and diligence of Italy. 4223 The gold or silver plate is less remarkable for its weight than for the brightness and curious workmanship, the taste is gratified without the help of foreign and costly luxury. The size and number of the cups of wine are regulated with a strict regard to the laws of temperance, and the respectful silence that prevails, is interrupted only by grave and instructive conversation. After dinner, Theodoric sometimes indulges himself in a short slumber. And as soon as he wakes, he calls for the dice and tables, encourages his friends to forget the royal majesty, and is delighted when they freely express the passions which are excited by the incidents of play. At this game, which he loves as the image of war, he alternately displays his eagerness, his skill, his patience, and his cheerful temper. If he loses, he laughs, he is modest and silent if he wins. Yet, notwithstanding this seeming indifference, his courtiers choose to solicit any favor in the moments of victory, and I myself, in my applications to the king, have derived some benefit from my losses. 4224 About the ninth hour, three o'clock, the tide of business again returns, and flows incessantly till after sunset, when the signal of the royal supper dismisses the weary crowd of suppliants and pleaders. At the supper, a more familiar repast, buffoons and pantomimes are sometimes introduced, to divert, not to offend, the company, by their ridiculous wit, but female singers, and the soft, effeminate modes of music, are severely banished. And such martial tunes as animate the soul to deeds of valor are alone grateful to the ear of Theodoric. He retires from table, and the nocturnal guards are immediately posted at the entrance of the treasury, the palace, and the private apartments. When the king of the Visigoths encouraged Avitus to assume the purple, he offered his person and his forces, as a faithful soldier of the Republic. 4225 The exploits of Theodoric soon convinced the world that he had not degenerated from the warlike virtues of his ancestors. After the establishment of the Goths in Aquitaine, and the passage of the Vandals into Africa, the Suevi, who had fixed their kingdom in Galicia, aspired to the conquest of Spain, and threatened to extinguish the feeble remains of the Roman dominion. The provincials of Carthagena and Tarragona, afflicted by a hostile invasion, represented their injuries and their apprehensions. Count Fronto was dispatched, in the name of the Emperor of Itis, with advantageous offers of peace and alliance. And Theodoric interposed his weighty mediation, to declare, that, unless his brother-in-law, the King of the Suevi, immediately retired, he should be obliged to arm in the cause of justice and of Rome. 
Tell him, replied the haughty Recciarius, that I despise his friendship and his arms, but that I shall soon try whether he will dare to expect my arrival under the walls of Tholaus. Such a challenge urged Theodoric to prevent the bold designs of his enemy, he passed the Pyrenees at the head of the Visigoths, the Franks and Burgundians served under his standard. And though he professed himself the dutiful servant of Avitus, he privately stipulated, for himself and his successors, the absolute possession of his Spanish conquests. The two armies, or rather the two nations, encountered each other on the banks of the river Urbicus, about twelve miles from Astorga, and the decisive victory of the Goths appeared for a while to have extirpated the name and kingdom of the Suevi. From the field of battle Theodoric advanced to Braga, their metropolis, which still retained the splendid vestiges of its ancient commerce and dignity. 4226 His entrance was not polluted with blood. And the Goths respected the chastity of their female captives, more especially of the consecrated virgins, but the greatest part of the clergy and people were made slaves, and even the churches and altars were confounded in the universal pillage. The unfortunate king of the Suevi had escaped to one of the ports of the ocean, but the obstinacy of the winds opposed his flight, he was delivered to his implacable rival. And Recciarius, who neither desired nor expected mercy, received, with manly constancy, the death which he would probably have inflicted. After this bloody sacrifice to policy or resentment, Theodoric carried his victorious arms as far as Merida, the principal town of Lusitania, without meeting any resistance, except from the miraculous powers of Saint Eulalia. But he was stopped in the full career of success, and recalled from Spain before he could provide for the security of his conquests. In his retreat towards the Pyrenees, he revenged his disappointment on the country through which he passed. And, in the sack of Pollentia and Astorga, he showed himself a faithless ally, as well as a cruel enemy. Whilst the king of the Visigoths fought and vanquished in the name of Avitus, the reign of Avitus had expired. And both the honour and the interest of Theodoric were deeply wounded by the disgrace of a friend, whom he had seated on the throne of the Western Empire. 4227. The pressing solicitations of the Senate and people persuaded the Emperor of Vitus to fix his residence at Rome, and to accept the consulship for the ensuing year. On the first day of January, his son-in-law, Sidonius Apollinaris, celebrated his praises in a panegyric of six hundred verses. But this composition, though it was rewarded with a brass statue, 4228 seems to contain a very moderate proportion, either of genius or of truth. The poet, if we may degrade that sacred name, exaggerates the merit of a sovereign and a father. And his prophecy of a long and glorious reign was soon contradicted by the event. Avitus, at a time when the imperial dignity was reduced to a preeminence of toil and danger, indulged himself in the pleasures of Italian luxury, age had not extinguished his amorous inclinations. And he is accused of insulting, with indiscreet and ungenerous raillery, the husbands whose wives he had seduced or violated. 4229 But the Romans were not inclined either to excuse his faults or to acknowledge his virtues. The several parts of the empire became every day more alienated from each other, and the stranger of Gaul was the object of popular hatred and contempt. The Senate asserted their legitimate claim in the election of an emperor. And their authority, which had been originally derived from the old constitution, was again fortified by the actual weakness of a declining monarchy. Yet even such a monarchy might have resisted the votes of an unarmed senate, if their discontent had not been supported, or perhaps inflamed, by the Count Rissimer, one of the principal commanders of the barbarian troops, who formed the military defense of Italy. The daughter of Wolia, king of the Visigoths, was the mother of Rissimer, but he was descended, on the father's side, from the nation of the Suevi, 4230 His pride or patriotism might be exasperated by the misfortunes of his countrymen. And he obeyed, with reluctance, an emperor in whose elevation he had not been consulted. His faithful and important services against the common enemy rendered him still more formidable. 4231 And, after destroying on the coast of Corsica a fleet of vandals, which consisted of sixty galleys, Rissima returned in triumph with the appellation of the Deliverer of Italy. He chose that moment to signify to Avitus, that his reign was at an end, and the feeble emperor, at a distance from his Gothic allies, was compelled, 
after a short and unavailing struggle to abdicate the purple. By the clemency, however, or the contempt, of Rissimer 4232 he was permitted to descend from the throne to the more desirable station of Bishop of Placentia, but the resentment of the Senate was still unsatisfied. And their inflexible severity pronounced the sentence of his death. He fled towards the Alps, with the humble hope, not of arming the Visigoths in his cause, but of securing his person and treasures in the sanctuary of Julian, one of the tutelar saints of Auvergne. 4233 disease, or the hand of the executioner, arrested him on the road, yet his remains were decently transported to Brevas, or Brud, in his native province, and he reposed at the feet of his holy patron. 4234 Avitus left only one daughter, the wife of Sidonius Apollinaris, who inherited the patrimony of his father-in-law, lamenting, at the same time, the disappointment of his public and private expectations. His resentment prompted him to join, or at least to countenance, the measures of a rebellious faction in Gaul, and the poet had contracted some guilt, which it was incumbent on him to expiate, by a new tribute of flattery to the succeeding emperor. 4235. The successor of Avitus presents the welcome discovery of a great and heroic character, such as sometimes arise, in a degenerate age, to vindicate the honor of the human species. The Emperor Majorian has deserved the praises of his contemporaries, and of posterity, and these praises may be strongly expressed in the words of a judicious and disinterested historian, that he was gentle to his subjects. That he was terrible to his enemies, and that he excelled, in every virtue, all his predecessors who had reigned over the Romans, 4236 such a testimony may justify at least the panegyric of Sidonius. And we may acquiesce in the assurance, that, although the obsequious orator would have flattered, with equal zeal, the most worthless of princes, the extraordinary merit of his object confined him, on this occasion, within the bounds of truth. 4237 Majorian derived his name from his maternal grandfather, who, in the reign of the great Theodosius, had commanded the troops of the Illyrian frontier. He gave his daughter in marriage to the father of Majorian, a respectable officer, who administered the revenues of Gaul with skill and integrity, and generously preferred the friendship of Aetius to the tempting offer of an insidious court. His son, the future emperor, who was educated in the profession of arms, displayed, from his early youth, intrepid courage, premature wisdom, and unbounded liberality in a scanty fortune. He followed the standard of Aetius, contributed to his success, shared, and sometimes eclipsed, his glory, and at last excited the jealousy of the patrician, or rather of his wife, who forced him to retire from the service. 4238 Majorian, after the death of Aetius, was recalled and promoted, and his intimate connection with Count Rissimer was the immediate step by which he ascended the throne of the Western Empire. During the vacancy that succeeded the abdication of Avitus, the ambitious barbarian, whose birth excluded him from the imperial dignity, governed Italy with the title of patrician. Resigned to his friend the conspicuous station of Master General of the Cavalry and Infantry. And, after an interval of some months, consented to the unanimous wish of the Romans, whose favor Majorian had solicited by a recent victory over the Alamanni. 4239 He was invested with the purple at Ravenna, and the epistle which he addressed to the Senate, will best describe his situation and his sentiments. Your election, conscript fathers and the ordinance of the most valiant army, have made me your emperor. Point forty two forty May the propitious deity direct and prosper the counsels and events of my administration, to your advantage and to the public welfare. For my own part, I did not aspire, I have submitted to reign, nor should I have discharged the obligations of a citizen if I had refused, with base and selfish ingratitude, to support the weight of those labors, which were imposed by the Republic. Assist, therefore, the prince whom you have made, partake the duties which you have enjoined, and may our common endeavors promote the happiness of an empire, which I have accepted from your hands. Be assured, that, in our times, justice shall resume her ancient vigor, and that virtue shall become, not only innocent, but meritorious. Let none, except the authors themselves, be apprehensive of delations 4241 which, as a subject, I have always condemned, and, as a prince, will severely punish. Our own vigilance, and that of our father, the patrician Rissimer, shall regulate all military affairs, 
and provide for the safety of the Roman world, which we have saved from foreign and domestic enemies. 4242 You now understand the maxims of my government, you may confide in the faithful love and sincere assurances of a prince who has formerly been the companion of your life and dangers. Who still glories in the name of Senator, and who is anxious that you should never repent the judgment which you have pronounced in his favor. The Emperor, who, amidst the ruins of the Roman world, revived the ancient language of law and liberty, which Trajan would not have disclaimed, must have derived those generous sentiments from his own heart. Since they were not suggested to his imitation by the customs of his age, or the example of his predecessors. 4243. The private and public actions of Majorian are very imperfectly known, but his laws, remarkable for an original cast of thought and expression, faithfully represent the character of a sovereign who loved his people. Who sympathized in their distress, who had studied the causes of the decline of the empire, and who was capable of applying, as far as such reformation was practicable, judicious and effectual remedies to the public disorders. 4244 His regulations concerning the finances manifestly tended to remove, or at least to mitigate, the most intolerable grievances. I. From the first hour of his reign, he was solicitous, I translate his own words, to relieve the weary fortunes of the provincials, oppressed by the accumulated weight of indictions and superindictions. 4245 With this view he granted a universal amnesty, a final and absolute discharge of all arrears of tribute, of all debts, which, under any pretense, the fiscal officers might demand from the people. This wise dereliction of obsolete, vexatious, and unprofitable claims, improved and purified the sources of the public revenue. And the subject who could now look back without despair, might labor with hope and gratitude for himself and for his country. 2. In the assessment and collection of taxes, Majorian restored the ordinary jurisdiction of the provincial magistrates. And suppressed the extraordinary commissions which had been introduced, in the name of the emperor himself, or of the praetorian prefects. The favorite servants, who obtained such irregular powers, were insolent in their behavior, and arbitrary in their demands, they affected to despise the subordinate tribunals, and they were discontented. If their fees and profits did not twice exceed the sum which they condescended to pay into the treasury. One instance of their extortion would appear incredible, were it not authenticated by the legislator himself. They exacted the whole payment in gold, but they refused the current coin of the empire, and would accept only such ancient pieces as were stamped with the names of Faustina or the Antonines. The subject, who was unprovided with these curious medals, had recourse to the expedient of compounding with their rapacious demands. Or if he succeeded in the research, his imposition was doubled, according to the weight and value of the money of former times. 4246 The municipal corporations, says the emperor, the lesser senates, so antiquity has justly styled them, deserve to be considered as the heart of the cities, and the sinews of the republic. And yet so low are they now reduced, by the injustice of magistrates and the venality of collectors, that many of their members, renouncing their dignity and their country, have taken refuge in distant and obscure exile. He urges, and even compels, their return to their respective cities, but he removes the grievance which had forced them to desert the exercise of their municipal functions. They are directed, under the authority of the provincial magistrates, to resume their office of levying the tribute. But, instead of being made responsible for the whole sum assessed on their district, they are only required to produce a regular account of the payments which they have actually received, and of the defaulters who are still indebted to the public. 4. But Majorian was not ignorant that these corporate bodies were too much inclined to retaliate the injustice and oppression which they had suffered, and he therefore revives the useful office of the defenders of cities. He exhorts the people to elect, in a full and free assembly, some man of discretion and integrity, who would dare to assert their privileges, to represent their grievances, to protect the poor from the tyranny of the rich. And to inform the emperor of the abuses that were committed under the sanction of his name and authority. The spectator who casts a mournful view over the ruins of ancient Rome, is tempted to accuse the memory of the Goths and Vandals, for the mischief which they had neither leisure, nor power, nor perhaps inclination, to perpetrate. The tempest of war might strike some lofty turrets to the ground, 
but the destruction which undermined the foundations of those massy fabrics was prosecuted, slowly and silently, during a period of ten centuries. And the motives of interest, that afterwards operated without shame or control, were severely checked by the taste and spirit of the Emperor Majorian. The decay of the city had gradually impaired the value of the public works. The circus and theatres might still excite, but they seldom gratified, the desires of the people, the temples, which had escaped the zeal of the Christians, were no longer inhabited, either by gods or men. The diminished crowds of the Romans were lost in the immense space of their baths and porticos, and the stately libraries and halls of justice became useless to an indolent generation, whose repose was seldom disturbed, either by study or business. The monuments of consular, or imperial, greatness were no longer revered, as the immortal glory of the capital, they were only esteemed as an inexhaustible mine of materials, cheaper, and more convenient than the distant quarry. Specious petitions were continually addressed to the easy magistrates of Rome, which stated the want of stones or bricks, for some necessary service, the fairest forms of architecture were rudely defaced, for the sake of some paltry, or pretended. Repairs And the degenerate Romans, who converted the spoil to their own emolument, demolished, with sacrilegious hands, the labours of their ancestors. Major Ian, who had often sighed over the desolation of the city, applied a severe remedy to the growing evil. Point 4247 he reserved to the prince and senate the sole cognizance of the extreme cases which might justify the destruction of an ancient edifice. Imposed a fine of fifty pounds of gold, two thousand pounds sterling, on every magistrate who should presume to grant such a legal and scandalous license, and threatened to chastise the criminal obedience of their subordinate officers. By a severe whipping, and the amputation of both their hands. In the last instance, the legislator might seem to forget the proportion of guilt and punishment. But his zeal arose from a generous principle, and Major Ian was anxious to protect the monuments of those ages, in which he would have desired and deserved to live. The emperor conceived, that it was his interest to increase the number of his subjects. And that it was his duty to guard the purity of the marriage bed, but the means which he employed to accomplish these salutary purposes are of an ambiguous, and perhaps exceptionable, kind. The pious maids, who consecrated their virginity to Christ, were restrained from taking the veil till they had reached their fortieth year. Widows under that age were compelled to form a second alliance within the term of five years, by the forfeiture of half their wealth to their nearest relations, or to the state. Unequal marriages were condemned or annulled. The punishment of confiscation and exile was deemed so inadequate to the guilt of adultery, that, if the criminal returned to Italy, he might, by the express declaration of Major Ian, be slain with impunity. 4248 While the Emperor Major Ian assiduously labored to restore the happiness and virtue of the Romans, he encountered the arms of Genseric, from his character and situation their most formidable enemy. A fleet of Vandals and Moors landed at the mouth of the Liris, or Garigliano, but the imperial troops surprised and attacked the disorderly barbarians, who were encumbered with the spoils of Campania. They were chased with slaughter to their ships, and their leader, the king's brother-in-law, was found in the number of the slain. 4249 such vigilance might announce the character of the new reign. But the strictest vigilance, and the most numerous forces, were insufficient to protect the long-extended coast of Italy from the depredations of a naval war. The public opinion had imposed a nobler and more arduous task on the genius of Major Ian. Rome expected from him alone the restitution of Africa, and the design, which he formed, of attacking the Vandals in their new settlements, was the result of bold and judicious policy. If the intrepid emperor could have infused his own spirit into the youth of Italy, if he could have revived in the field of Mars, the manly exercises in which he had always surpassed his equals, he might have marched against Genseric at the head of a Roman army. Such a reformation of national manners might be embraced by the rising generation. But it is the misfortune of those princes who laboriously sustain a declining monarchy, that, to obtain some immediate advantage, or to avert some impending danger, they are forced to countenance, and even to multiply, the most pernicious abuses. Major Ian, like the weakest of his predecessors, 
was reduced to the disgraceful expedient of substituting barbarian auxiliaries in the place of his unwarlike subjects, and his superior abilities could only be displayed in the vigor and dexterity with which he wielded a dangerous instrument. So apt to recoil on the hand that used it. Besides the confederates, who were already engaged in the service of the empire, the fame of his liberality and valor attracted the nations of the Danube, the Burasthenes, and perhaps of the Tanais. Many thousands of the bravest subjects of Attila, the Jeopardy, the Ostrogoths, the Rugians, the Burgundians, the Suevi, the Alani, assembled in the plains of Liguria, and their formidable strength was balanced by their mutual animosities. 4250 They passed the Alps in a severe winter. The emperor led the way, on foot, and in complete armor. Sounding, with his long staff, the depth of the ice, or snow, and encouraging the Scythians, who complained of the extreme cold, by the cheerful assurance, that they should be satisfied with the heat of Africa. The citizens of Lyons had presumed to shut their gates, they soon implored, and experienced, the clemency of Majorian. He vanquished Theodoric in the field and admitted to his friendship and alliance a king whom he had found not unworthy of his arms. The beneficial, though precarious, reunion of the greater part of Gaul and Spain, was the effect of persuasion, as well as of force. 4251 And the independent Bugatti, who had escaped, or resisted, the oppression, of former reigns, were disposed to confide in the virtues of Majorian. His camp was filled with barbarian allies. His throne was supported by the zeal of an affectionate people, but the emperor had foreseen, that it was impossible, without a maritime power, to achieve the conquest of Africa. In the First Punic War, the Republic had exerted such incredible diligence, that, within sixty days after the first stroke of the axe had been given in the forest, a fleet of 160 galleys proudly rowed at anchor in the sea. 4252 Under circumstances much less favorable, Majorian equaled the spirit and perseverance of the ancient Romans. The woods of the Apennine were felled, the arsenals and manufactures of Ravenna and Misenum were restored. Italy and Gaul vied with each other in liberal contributions to the public service. And the imperial navy of three hundred large galleys, with an adequate proportion of transports and smaller vessels, was collected in the secure and capacious harbour of Carthagena in Spain. 4253 The intrepid countenance of Majorian animated his troops with a confidence of victory, and, if we might credit the historian Procopius, his courage sometimes hurried him beyond the bounds of prudence. Anxious to explore, with his own eyes, the state of the Vandals, he ventured, after disguising the color of his hair, to visit Carthage, in the character of his own ambassador, and Genseric was afterwards mortified by the discovery that he had entertained and dismissed the emperor of the Romans. Such an anecdote may be rejected as an improbable fiction, but it is a fiction which would not have been imagined, unless in the life of a hero. 4254. Without the help of a personal interview, Genseric was sufficiently acquainted with the genius and designs of his adversary. He practiced his customary arts of fraud and delay, but he practiced them without success. His applications for peace became each hour more submissive, and perhaps more sincere, but the inflexible Majorian had adopted the ancient maxim, that Rome could not be safe, as long as Carthage existed in a hostile state. The king of the Vandals distrusted the valor of his native subjects, who were enervated by the luxury of the south, 4255 he suspected the fidelity of the vanquished people, who abhorred him as an Aryan tyrant. And the desperate measure, which he executed, of reducing Mauritania into a desert, 4256 could not defeat the operations of the Roman emperor, who was at liberty to land his troops on any part of the African coast. But Genseric was saved from impending and inevitable ruin by the treachery of some powerful subjects, envious, or apprehensive, of their master's success. Guided by their secret intelligence, he surprised the unguarded fleet in the Bay of Carthagena, many of the ships were sunk, or taken, or burnt, and the preparations of three years were destroyed in a single day. 4257 After this event, the behavior of the two antagonists showed them superior to their fortune. The Vandal, instead of being elated by this accidental victory, immediately renewed his solicitations for peace. The Emperor of the West, 
who was capable of forming great designs, and of supporting heavy disappointments, consented to a treaty, or rather to a suspension of arms. In the full assurance that, before he could restore his navy, he should be supplied with provocations to justify a second war. Major Ian returned to Italy, to prosecute his labors for the public happiness. And, as he was conscious of his own integrity, he might long remain ignorant of the dark conspiracy which threatened his throne and his life. The recent misfortune of Carthagena sullied the glory which had dazzled the eyes of the multitude. Almost every description of civil and military officers were exasperated against the reformer, since they all derived some advantage from the abuses which he endeavored to suppress. And the patrician Rissimer impelled the inconstant passions of the barbarians against a prince whom he esteemed and hated. The virtues of Majorian could not protect him from the impetuous sedition, which broke out in the camp near Tortona, at the foot of the Alps. He was compelled to abdicate the imperial purple, five days after his abdication, it was reported that he died of a dysentery. 4258 and the humble tomb, which covered his remains, was consecrated by the respect and gratitude of succeeding generations. 4259 The private character of Majorian inspired love and respect. Malicious calumny and satire excited his indignation, or, if he himself were the object, his contempt. But he protected the freedom of wit, and, in the hours which the emperor gave to the familiar society of his friends, he could indulge his taste for pleasantry, without degrading the majesty of his rank. 4260. It was not, perhaps, without some regret, that Rissimer sacrificed his friend to the interest of his ambition, but he resolved, in a second choice, to avoid the imprudent preference of superior virtue and merit. At his command, the obsequious Senate of Rome bestowed the imperial title on Libius Severus, who ascended the throne of the West without emerging from the obscurity of a private condition. History has scarcely deigned to notice his birth, his elevation, his character, or his death. Severus expired, as soon as his life became inconvenient to his patron. 4261 And it would be useless to discriminate his nominal reign in the vacant interval of six years, between the death of Majorian and the elevation of Anthemius. During that period, the government was in the hands of Rissimer alone. And, although the modest barbarian disclaimed the name of king, he accumulated treasures, formed a separate army, negotiated private alliances, and ruled Italy with the same independent and despotic authority. Which was afterwards exercised by Odoacer and Theodoric. But his dominions were bounded by the Alps, and two Roman generals, Marcellinus and Egidius, maintained their allegiance to the Republic, by rejecting, with disdain, the phantom which he styled an emperor. Marcellinus still adhered to the old religion, and the devout pagans, who secretly disobeyed the laws of the Church and State, applauded his profound skill in the science of divination. But he possessed the more valuable qualifications of learning, virtue, and courage. 4262 The study of the Latin literature had improved his taste. And his military talents had recommended him to the esteem and confidence of the great Aetius, in whose ruin he was involved. By a timely flight, Marcellinus escaped the rage of Valentinian, and boldly asserted his liberty amidst the convulsions of the Western Empire. His voluntary, or reluctant, Submission to the authority of Major Ian, was rewarded by the government of Sicily, and the command of an army, stationed in that island to oppose, or to attack, the Vandals. But his barbarian mercenaries, after the emperor's death, were tempted to revolt by the artful liberality of Rissimer. At the head of a band of faithful followers, the intrepid Marcellinus occupied the province of Dalmatia, assumed the title of Patrician of the West, secured the love of his subjects by a mild and equitable reign. Built a fleet which claimed the dominion of the Adriatic, and alternately alarmed the coasts of Italy and of Africa. 4263 Egidius, the master general of Gaul, who equaled, or at least who imitated, the heroes of ancient Rome, 4264 proclaimed his immortal resentment against the assassins of his beloved master. A brave and numerous army was attached to his standard, and, though he was prevented by the arts of Rissimer, and the arms of the Visigoths, from marching to the gates of Rome, he maintained his independent sovereignty beyond the Alps. And rendered the name of Egidius, respectable both in peace and war. 
The Franks, who had punished with exile the youthful follies of Childeric, elected the Roman general for their king, his vanity, rather than his ambition, was gratified by that singular honor. And when the nation, at the end of four years, repented of the injury which they had offered to the Merovingian family, he patiently acquiesced in the restoration of the lawful prince. The authority of Aegidius ended only with his life, and the suspicions of poison and secret violence, which derived some countenance from the character of Rissimer, were eagerly entertained by the passionate credulity of the Gauls. 4265. The Kingdom of Italy, a name to which the Western Empire was gradually reduced, was afflicted, under the reign of Rissimer, by the incessant depredations of the Vandal pirates. 4266 In the spring of each year, they equipped a formidable navy in the port of Carthage, and Genseric himself, though in a very advanced age, still commanded in person the most important expeditions. His designs were concealed with impenetrable secrecy, till the moment that he hoisted sail. When he was asked, by his pilot, what course he should steer, leave the determination to the winds, replied the barbarian, with pious arrogance winky face. They will transport us to the guilty coast, whose inhabitants have provoked the divine justice, but if Genseric himself deigned to issue more precise orders, he judged the most wealthy to be the most criminal. The Vandals repeatedly visited the coasts of Spain, Liguria, Tuscany, Campania, Lucania, Brutium, Apulia, Calabria, Venetia, Dalmatia, Epirus, Greece, and Sicily, they were tempted to subdue the island of Sardinia. So advantageously placed in the center of the Mediterranean. And their arms spread desolation, or terror, from the columns of Hercules to the mouth of the Nile. As they were more ambitious of spoil than of glory, they seldom attacked any fortified cities, or engaged any regular troops in the open field. But the celerity of their motions enabled them, almost at the same time, to threaten and to attack the most distant objects, which attracted their desires. And as they always embarked a sufficient number of horses, they had no sooner landed, than they swept the dismayed country with a body of light cavalry. Yet, notwithstanding the example of their king, the native Vandals and Alani insensibly declined this toilsome and perilous warfare. The hardy generation of the first conquerors was almost extinguished, and their sons, who were born in Africa, enjoyed the delicious baths and gardens which had been acquired by the valor of their fathers. Their place was readily supplied by a various multitude of Moors and Romans, of captives and outlaws. And those desperate wretches, who had already violated the laws of their country, were the most eager to promote the atrocious acts which disgraced the victories of Genseric. In the treatment of his unhappy prisoners, he sometimes consulted his avarice, and sometimes indulged his cruelty. And the massacre of five hundred noble citizens of Xant or Zacynthus, whose mangled bodies he cast into the Ionian Sea, was imputed, by the public indignation, to his latest posterity. Such crimes could not be excused by any provocations. But the war, which the king of the Vandals prosecuted against the Roman Empire was justified by a specious and reasonable motive. The widow of Valentinian, Eudoxia, whom he had led captive from Rome to Carthage, was the sole heiress of the Theodosian house, her elder daughter, Eudocia, became the reluctant wife of Hanaric, his eldest son. And the stern father, asserting a legal claim, which could not easily be refuted or satisfied, demanded a just proportion of the imperial patrimony. An adequate, or at least a valuable, compensation, was offered by the eastern emperor, to purchase a necessary peace. Eudoxia and her younger daughter, Placidia, were honorably restored, and the fury of the Vandals was confined to the limits of the western empire. The Italians, destitute of a naval force, which alone was capable of protecting their coasts, implored the aid of the more fortunate nations of the East, who had formerly acknowledged, in peace and war, the supremacy of Rome. But the perpetual divisions of the two empires had alienated their interest and their inclinations, the faith of a recent treaty was alleged. And the Western Romans, instead of arms and ships, could only obtain the assistance of a cold and ineffectual mediation. The haughty Rissimer, who had long struggled with the difficulties of his situation, was at length reduced to address the throne of Constantinople, in the humble language of a subject. And Italy submitted, 
as the price and security of the alliance, to accept a master from the choice of the Emperor of the East. 4267 It is not the purpose of the present chapter, or even of the present volume, to continue the distinct series of the Byzantine history. But a concise view of the reign and character of the Emperor Leo, may explain the last efforts that were attempted to save the falling empire of the West. 4268 Since the death of the younger Theodosius, the domestic repose of Constantinople had never been interrupted by war or faction. Pulcheria had bestowed her hand, and the scepter of the East, on the modest virtue of Martian, he gratefully reverenced her august rank and virgin chastity. And, after her death, he gave his people the example of the religious worship that was due to the memory of the imperial saint. 4269 Attentive to the prosperity of his own dominions, Martian seemed to behold, with indifference, the misfortunes of Rome and the obstinate refusal of a brave and active prince, to draw his sword against the Vandals, was ascribed to a secret promise, which had formerly been exacted from him when he was a captive in the power of Genseric. 4270 The death of Martian, after a reign of seven years, would have exposed the East to the danger of a popular election. If the superior weight of a single family had not been able to incline the balance in favor of the candidate whose interest they supported. The patrician Aspar might have placed the diadem on his own head, if he would have subscribed the Nicene Creed. 4271 During three generations, the armies of the East were successively commanded by his father, by himself, and by his son Ardaburius. His barbarian guards formed a military force that overawed the palace and the capital, and the liberal distribution of his immense treasures rendered Aspar as popular as he was powerful. He recommended the obscure name of Leo of Thrace a military tribune, and the principal steward of his household. His nomination was unanimously ratified by the Senate. And the servant of Aspar received the imperial crown from the hands of the patriarch or bishop, who was permitted to express, by this unusual ceremony, the suffrage of the deity. 4272 This emperor, the first of the name of Leo, has been distinguished by the title of the Great, from a succession of princes, who gradually fixed in the opinion of the Greeks a very humble standard of heroic, or at least of royal, perfection. Yet the temperate firmness with which Leo resisted the oppression of his benefactor, showed that he was conscious of his duty and of his prerogative. Aspar was astonished to find that his influence could no longer appoint a prefect of Constantinople, he presumed to reproach his sovereign with a breach of promise, and insolently shaking his purple, it is not proper, said he that the man who is invested with this garment, should be guilty of lying. Nor is it proper, replied Leo, that a prince should be compelled to resign his own judgment, and the public interest, to the will of a subject. 4273 After this extraordinary scene, it was impossible that the reconciliation of the emperor and the patrician could be sincere, or, at least, that it could be solid and permanent. An army of Isaurians 4274 was secretly levied, and introduced into Constantinople. And while Leo undermined the authority, and prepared the disgrace, of the family of Aspar, his mild and cautious behavior restrained them from any rash and desperate attempts, which might have been fatal to themselves, or their enemies. The measures of peace and war were affected by this internal revolution. As long as Aspar degraded the majesty of the throne, the secret correspondence of religion and interest engaged him to favor the cause of Genseric. When Leo had delivered himself from that ignominious servitude, he listened to the complaints of the Italians, resolved to extirpate the tyranny of the Vandals, and declared his alliance with his colleague, Anthemius, whom he solemnly invested with the diadem and purple of the West. The virtues of Anthemius have perhaps been magnified, since the imperial descent, which he could only deduce from the usurper Procopius, has been swelled into a line of emperors. 4275 But the merit of his immediate parents, their honors, and their riches, rendered Anthemius one of the most illustrious subjects of the East. His father, Procopius, obtained, after his Persian embassy, the rank of general and patrician. And the name of Anthemius was derived from his maternal grandfather, the celebrated prefect, who protected, with so much ability and success, the infant reign of Theodosius. The grandson of the prefect was raised above the condition of a private subject, by his marriage with Euphemia, the daughter of the emperor Martian. 
This splendid alliance, which might supersede the necessity of merit, hastened the promotion of Anthemius to the successive dignities of Count, of Master General, of Consul, and of Patrician. And his merit or fortune claimed the honours of a victory, which was obtained on the banks of the Danube, over the Huns. Without indulging in extravagant ambition, the son-in-law of Martian might hope to be his successor. But Anthemius supported the disappointment with courage and patience, and his subsequent elevation was universally approved by the public, who esteemed him worthy to reign, till he ascended the throne. 4276 The Emperor of the West marched from Constantinople, attended by several counts of high distinction, and a body of guards almost equal to the strength and numbers of a regular army, he entered Rome in triumph. And the choice of Leo was confirmed by the Senate, the people, and the barbarian confederates of Italy. 4277 The solemn inauguration of Anthemius was followed by the nuptials of his daughter and the patrician Rissimer, a fortunate event, which was considered as the firmest security of the union and happiness of the state. The wealth of two empires was ostentatiously displayed, and many senators completed their ruin, by an expensive effort to disguise their poverty. All serious business was suspended during this festival, the courts of justice were shut. The streets of Rome, the theatres, the places of public and private resort, resounded with hymeneal songs and dances, and the royal bride, clothed in silken robes, with a crown on her head, was conducted to the palace of Rissimer, who had changed his military dress for the habit of a consul and a senator. On this memorable occasion, Sidonius, whose early ambition had been so fatally blasted, appeared as the orator of Auvergne, among the provincial deputies who addressed the throne with congratulations or complaints. 4278 The calends of January were now approaching, and the venal poet, who had loved Avitus, and esteemed Majorian, was persuaded by his friends to celebrate, in heroic verse, the merit, the felicity, the second consulship, and the future triumphs. Of the Emperor Anthemius Sidonius pronounced, with assurance and success, a panegyric which is still extant, and whatever might be the imperfections, either of the subject or of the composition, the welcome flatterer was immediately rewarded with the prefecture of Rome. A dignity which placed him among the illustrious personages of the empire, till he wisely preferred the more respectable character of a bishop and a saint. 4279 the Greeks ambitiously commend the piety and Catholic faith of the emperor whom they gave to the West. Nor do they forget to observe, that when he left Constantinople, he converted his palace into the pious foundation of a public bath, a church, and a hospital for old men. 4280 Yet some suspicious appearances are found to sully the theological fame of Anthemius. From the conversation of Philotheus, a Macedonian sectary, he had imbibed the spirit of religious toleration. And the heretics of Rome would have assembled with impunity, if the bold and vehement censure which Pope Hilary pronounced in the Church of St. Peter, had not obliged him to abjure the unpopular indulgence. 4281 Even the pagans, a feeble and obscure remnant, conceived some vain hopes, from the indifference, or partiality, of Anthemius. And his singular friendship for the philosopher Severus, whom he promoted to the consulship, was ascribed to a secret project of reviving the ancient worship of the gods. 4282 These idols were crumbled into dust, and the mythology which had once been the creed of nations, was so universally disbelieved, that it might be employed without scandal, or at least without suspicion, by Christian poets. 4283 Yet the vestiges of superstition were not absolutely obliterated, and the festival of the Lupercalia, whose origin had preceded the foundation of Rome, was still celebrated under the reign of Anthemius. The savage and simple rites were expressive of an early state of society before the invention of arts and agriculture. The rustic deities who presided over the toils and pleasures of the pastoral life, Pan, Faunus, and their train of satyrs, were such as the fancy of shepherds might create, sportive, petulant, and lascivious. Whose power was limited, and whose malice was inoffensive. A goat was the offering the best adapted to their character and attributes, the flesh of the victim was roasted on willow spits. And the riotous youths, who crowded to the feast, ran naked about the fields, with leather thongs in their hands, communicating, as it was supposed, the blessing of fecundity to the women whom they touched. 
4284 The altar of Pan was erected, perhaps by Evander the Arcadian, in a dark recess in the side of the Palatine Hill, watered by a perpetual fountain, and shaded by a hanging grove. A tradition, that, in the same place, Romulus and Remus were suckled by the wolf, rendered it still more sacred and venerable in the eyes of the Romans, and this sylvan spot was gradually surrounded by the stately edifices of the Forum. 4285 After the conversion of the imperial city, the Christians still continued, in the month of February, the annual celebration of the Lupercalia, to which they ascribed a secret and mysterious influence on the genial powers of the animal and vegetable world. The bishops of Rome were solicitous to abolish a profane custom, so repugnant to the spirit of Christianity. But their zeal was not supported by the authority of the civil magistrate, the inveterate abuse subsisted till the end of the 5th century, and Pope Gelasius, who purified the capital from the last stain of idolatry, appeased by a formal apology. The Murmurs of the Senate and People 4286 In all his public declarations, the Emperor Leo assumes the authority, and professes the affection, of a father, for his son Anthemius, with whom he had divided the administration of the universe. 4287 The situation, and perhaps the character, of Leo, dissuaded him from exposing his person to the toils and dangers of an African war. But the powers of the Eastern Empire were strenuously exerted to deliver Italy and the Mediterranean from the Vandals, and Genseric, who had so long oppressed both the land and sea, was threatened from every side with a formidable invasion. The campaign was opened by a bold and successful enterprise of the prefect Heraclius. 4288 The troops of Egypt, Thebes, and Libya, were embarked, under his command, and the Arabs, with a train of horses and camels, opened the roads of the desert. Heraclius landed on the coast of Tripoli, surprised and subdued the cities of that province, and prepared, by a laborious march, which Cato had formerly executed, 4289 to join the imperial army under the walls of Carthage. The intelligence of this loss extorted from Genseric some insidious and ineffectual propositions of peace, but he was still more seriously alarmed by the reconciliation of Marcellinus with the two empires. The independent patrician had been persuaded to acknowledge the legitimate title of Anthemius, whom he accompanied in his journey to Rome, the Dalmatian fleet was received into the harbours of Italy. The active valour of Marcellinus expelled the Vandals from the island of Sardinia, and the languid efforts of the West added some weight to the immense preparations of the Eastern Romans. The expense of the naval armament, which Leo sent against the Vandals, has been distinctly ascertained, and the curious and instructive account displays the wealth of the declining empire. The royal domains, or private patrimony of the prince, supplied 17,000 pounds of gold, 47,000 pounds of gold, and 700,000 of silver, were levied and paid into the treasury by the Praetorian prefects. But the cities were reduced to extreme poverty, and the diligent calculation of fines and forfeitures, as a valuable object of the revenue, does not suggest the idea of a just or merciful administration. The whole expense, by whatsoever means it was defrayed, of the African campaign, amounted to the sum of 130,000 pounds of gold, about 5 millions 200,000 pounds sterling. At a time when the value of money appears, from the comparative price of corn, to have been somewhat higher than in the present age. 4290 The fleet that sailed from Constantinople to Carthage, consisted of 1113 ships, and the number of soldiers and mariners exceeded 100,000 men. Basiliscus, the brother of the Empress Varina, was entrusted with this important command. His sister, the wife of Leo, had exaggerated the merit of his former exploits against the Scythians. But the discovery of his guilt, or incapacity, was reserved for the African war and his friends could only save his military reputation by asserting, that he had conspired with Aspar to spare Genseric, and to betray the last hope of the Western Empire. Experience has shown, that the success of an invader most commonly depends on the vigor and celerity of his operations. The strength and sharpness of the first impression are blunted by delay. The health and spirit of the troops insensibly languish in a distant climate, the naval and military force, a mighty effort which perhaps can never be repeated, is silently consumed. 
And every hour that is wasted in negotiation, accustoms the enemy to contemplate and examine those hostile terrors, which, on their first appearance, he deemed irresistible. The formidable navy of Basiliscus pursued its prosperous navigation from the Thracian Bosphorus to the coast of Africa. He landed his troops at Cape Bona, or the Promontory of Mercury, about forty miles from Carthage. 4291 The army of Heraclius, and the fleet of Marcellinus, either joined or seconded the imperial lieutenant, and the vandals who opposed his progress by sea or land, were successively vanquished. 4292 If Basiliscus had seized the moment of consternation, and boldly advanced to the capital, Carthage must have surrendered, and the kingdom of the Vandals was extinguished. Genseric beheld the danger with firmness, and eluded it with his veteran dexterity. He protested, in the most respectful language, that he was ready to submit his person, and his dominions, to the will of the emperor. But he requested a truce of five days to regulate the terms of his submission, and it was universally believed, that his secret liberality contributed to the success of this public negotiation. Instead of obstinately refusing whatever indulgence his enemy so earnestly solicited, the guilty, or the credulous, Basiliscus consented to the fatal truce. And his imprudent security seemed to proclaim, that he already considered himself as the conqueror of Africa. During this short interval, the wind became favorable to the designs of Genseric. He manned his largest ships of war with the bravest of the Moors and Vandals, and they towed after them many large barks, filled with combustible materials. In the obscurity of the night, these destructive vessels were impelled against the unguarded and unsuspecting fleet of the Romans, who were awakened by the sense of their instant danger. Their close and crowded order assisted the progress of the fire, which was communicated with rapid and irresistible violence. And the noise of the wind, the crackling of the flames, the dissonant cries of the soldiers and mariners, who could neither command nor obey, increased the horror of the nocturnal tumult. Whilst they labored to extricate themselves from the fire ships, and to save at least a part of the navy, the galleys of Genseric assaulted them with temperate and disciplined valor. And many of the Romans, who escaped the fury of the flames, were destroyed or taken by the victorious vandals. Among the events of that disastrous night, the heroic, or rather desperate, courage of John, one of the principal officers of Basiliscus, has rescued his name from oblivion. When the ship, which he had bravely defended, was almost consumed, he threw himself in his armor into the sea, disdainfully rejected the esteem and pity of Genso, the son of Genseric, who pressed him to accept honorable quarter. And sunk under the waves. Exclaiming, with his last breath, that he would never fall alive into the hands of those impious dogs. Actuated by a far different spirit, Basiliscus, whose station was the most remote from danger, disgracefully fled in the beginning of the engagement, returned to Constantinople with the loss of more than half of his fleet and army, and sheltered his guilty head in the sanctuary of Asti. Sophia, till his sister, by her tears and entreaties, could obtain his pardon from the indignant emperor. Heraclius effected his retreat through the desert. Marcellinus retired to Sicily, where he was assassinated, perhaps at the instigation of Rissimer, by one of his own captains. And the king of the Vandals expressed his surprise and satisfaction, that the Romans themselves should remove from the world his most formidable antagonists. 4293 After the failure of this great expedition, 4294 Genseric again became the tyrant of the sea, the coasts of Italy, Greece, and Asia, were again exposed to his revenge and avarice, Tripoli and Sardinia returned to his obedience. He added Sicily to the number of his provinces, and before he died, in the fullness of years and of glory, he beheld the final extinction of the Empire of the West. 4295. During his long and active reign, the African monarch had studiously cultivated the friendship of the barbarians of Europe, whose arms he might employ in a seasonable and effectual diversion against the two empires. After the death of Attila, he renewed his alliance with the Visigoths of Gaul. And the sons of the elder Theodoric, who successively reigned over that warlike nation, were easily persuaded, by the sense of interest, to forget the cruel affront which Genseric had inflicted on their sister. 4296 The death of the Emperor Majorian delivered Theodoric II from the restraint of fear, and perhaps of honor, 
he violated his recent treaty with the Romans. And the ample territory of Narbonne, which he firmly united to his dominions, became the immediate reward of his perfidy. The selfish policy of Ricimer encouraged him to invade the provinces which were in the possession of Aegidius, his rival. But the active count, by the defense of Alls, and the victory of Orleans, saved Gaul, and checked, during his lifetime, the progress of the Visigoths. Their ambition was soon rekindled. And the design of extinguishing the Roman Empire in Spain and Gaul was conceived, and almost completed, in the reign of Euric, who assassinated his brother Theodoric, and displayed, with a more savage temper, superior abilities. Both in peace and war. He passed the Pyrenees at the head of a numerous army, subdued the cities of Saragossa and Pampeluna, vanquished and battled the martial nobles of the Tarragonese province, carried his victorious arms into the heart of Lusitania, and permitted the Suevi to hold the kingdom of Galicia under the Gothic monarchy of Spain. 4297 The efforts of Euric were not less vigorous, or less successful, in Gaul. And throughout the country that extends from the Pyrenees to the Rhone and the Loire, Berry and Auvergne were the only cities, or dioceses, which refused to acknowledge him as their master. 4298 In the defense of Clermont, their principal town, the inhabitants of Auvergne sustained, with inflexible resolution, the miseries of war, pestilence, and famine. And the Visigoths, relinquishing the fruitless siege, suspended the hopes of that important conquest. The youth of the province were animated by the heroic, and almost incredible, valor of Ictitius, the son of the emperor of Itus, 4299 who made a desperate sally with only eighteen horsemen, boldly attacked the Gothic army, and, after maintaining a flying skirmish, retired safe and victorious within the walls of Clermont. His charity was equal to his courage, in a time of extreme scarcity, for thousand poor were fed at his expense, and his private influence levied an army of Burgundians for the deliverance of Auvergne. From his virtues alone the faithful citizens of Gaul derived any hopes of safety or freedom. And even such virtues were insufficient to avert the impending ruin of their country, since they were anxious to learn, from his authority and example, whether they should prefer the alternative of exile or servitude. 4300 The public confidence was lost, the resources of the state were exhausted, and the Gauls had too much reason to believe, that Anthemius, who reigned in Italy, was incapable of protecting his distressed subjects beyond the Alps. The feeble emperor could only procure for their defense the service of twelve thousand British auxiliaries. Ryothemus, one of the independent kings, or chieftains, of the island, was persuaded to transport his troops to the continent of Gaul, he sailed up the lawyer, and established his quarters in Berry. Where the people complained of these oppressive allies, till they were destroyed or dispersed by the arms of the Visigoths. 4301. One of the last acts of jurisdiction, which the Roman Senate exercised over their subjects of Gaul, was the trial and condemnation of Arvandus, the Praetorian prefect. Sidonius, who rejoices that he lived under a reign in which he might pity and assist a state criminal, has expressed, with tenderness and freedom, the faults of his indiscreet and unfortunate friend. 4302 From the perils which he had escaped, Arvandus imbibed confidence rather than wisdom, and such was the various, though uniform, imprudence of his behavior, that his prosperity must appear much more surprising than his downfall. The second prefecture, which he obtained within the term of five years, abolished the merit and popularity of his preceding administration. His easy temper was corrupted by flattery, and exasperated by opposition. He was forced to satisfy his importunate creditors with the spoils of the province, his capricious insolence offended the nobles of Gaul, and he sunk under the weight of the public hatred. The mandate of his disgrace summoned him to justify his conduct before the Senate, and he passed the Sea of Tuscany with a favorable wind, the presage, as he vainly imagined, of his future fortunes. A decent respect was still observed for the proefectorian rank, and on his arrival at Rome, Arvandus was committed to the hospitality, rather than to the custody, of Flavius Acellus, the Count of the Sacred Largesses, who resided in the capital. 4303 He was eagerly pursued by his accusers, the four deputies of Gaul, who were all distinguished by their birth, their dignities, or their eloquence. 
In the name of a great province, and according to the forms of Roman jurisprudence, they instituted a civil and criminal action, requiring such restitution as might compensate the losses of individuals, and such punishment as might satisfy the justice of the state. Their charges of corrupt oppression were numerous and weighty, but they placed their secret dependence on a letter which they had intercepted, and which they could prove, by the evidence of his secretary, to have been dictated by Arvandus himself. The author of this letter seemed to dissuade the king of the Goths from a peace with the Greek emperor, he suggested the attack of the Britons on the lawyer. And he recommended a division of Gaul, according to the law of nations, between the Visigoths and the Burgundians. 4304 These pernicious schemes, which a friend could only palliate by the reproaches of vanity and indiscretion, were susceptible of a treasonable interpretation. And the deputies had artfully resolved not to produce their most formidable weapons till the decisive moment of the contest. But their intentions were discovered by the zeal of Sidonius. He immediately apprised the unsuspecting criminal of his danger, and sincerely lamented, without any mixture of anger, the haughty presumption of Arvandus, who rejected, and even resented, the salutary advice of his friends. Ignorant of his real situation, Arvandus showed himself in the capital in the white robe of a candidate, accepted indiscriminate salutations and offers of service, examined the shops of the merchants, the silks and gems. Sometimes with the indifference of a spectator, and sometimes with the attention of a purchaser. And complained of the times, of the senate, of the prince, and of the delays of justice. His complaints were soon removed. An early day was fixed for his trial. And Arvandus appeared, with his accusers, before a numerous assembly of the Roman Senate. The mournful garb which they affected, excited the compassion of the judges, who were scandalized by the gay and splendid dress of their adversary, and when the prefect Arvandus, with the first of the Gallic deputies, were directed to take their places on the senatorial benches, the same contrast of pride and modesty was observed in their behavior. In this memorable judgment, which presented a lively image of the old republic, the Gauls exposed, with force and freedom, the grievances of the province. And as soon as the minds of the audience were sufficiently inflamed, they recited the fatal epistle. The obstinacy of Arvandus was founded on the strange supposition, that a subject could not be convicted of treason, unless he had actually conspired to assume the purple. As the paper was read, he repeatedly, and with a loud voice, acknowledged it for his genuine composition, and his astonishment was equal to his dismay, when the unanimous voice of the Senate declared him guilty of a capital offence. By their decree, he was degraded from the rank of a prefect to the obscure condition of a plebeian, and ignominiously dragged by servile hands to the public prison. After a fortnight's adjournment, the Senate was again convened to pronounce the sentence of his death. But while he expected, in the island of Aesculapius, the expiration of the thirty days allowed by an ancient law to the vilest malefactors, 4305 his friends interposed, the emperor Anthemius relented. And the prefect of Gaul obtained the milder punishment of exile and confiscation. The faults of Arvandus might deserve compassion, but the impunity of Serenatus accused the justice of the Republic, till he was condemned and executed, on the complaint of the people of Auvergne. That flagitious minister, the Catalan of his age and country, held a secret correspondence with the Visigoths, to betray the province which he oppressed, his industry was continually exercised in the discovery of new taxes and obsolete offences. And his extravagant vices would have inspired contempt, if they had not excited fear and abhorrence. 4306. Such criminals were not beyond the reach of justice. But whatever might be the guilt of Rissimer, that powerful barbarian was able to contend or to negotiate with the prince, whose alliance he had condescended to accept. The peaceful and prosperous reign which Anthemius had promised to the West, was soon clouded by misfortune and discord. Rissimer, apprehensive, or impatient, of a superior, retired from Rome, and fixed his residence at Milan. An advantageous situation either to invite or to repel the warlike tribes that were seated between the Alps and the Danube. 4307 Italy was gradually divided into two independent and hostile kingdoms. And the nobles of Liguria, who trembled at the near approach of a civil war, fell prostrate at the feet of the patrician, and conjured him to spare their unhappy country. For my own part, 
replied Rissimer, in a tone of insolent moderation, I am still inclined to embrace the friendship of the Galatian. 4308 But who will undertake to appease his anger, or to mitigate the pride, which always rises in proportion to our submission? They informed him, that Epiphanius, Bishop of Pavia 4309 united the wisdom of the serpent with the innocence of the dove. And appeared confident, that the eloquence of such an ambassador must prevail against the strongest opposition, either of interest or passion. Their recommendation was approved. And Epiphanius, assuming the benevolent office of mediation, proceeded without delay to Rome, where he was received with the honours due to his merit and reputation. The oration of a bishop in favour of peace may be easily supposed. He argued, that, in all possible circumstances, the forgiveness of injuries must be an act of mercy, or magnanimity, or prudence. And he seriously admonished the emperor to avoid a contest with a fierce barbarian, which might be fatal to himself, and must be ruinous to his dominions. And Themius acknowledged the truth of his maxims. But he deeply felt, with grief and indignation, the behavior of Rissimer, and his passion gave eloquence and energy to his discourse. What favors, he warmly exclaimed, have we refused to this ungrateful man? What provocations have we not endured? Regardless of the majesty of the purple, I gave my daughter to a goth, I sacrificed my own blood to the safety of the Republic. The liberality which ought to have secured the eternal attachment of Rissimer has exasperated him against his benefactor. What wars has he not excited against the empire? How often has he instigated and assisted the fury of hostile nations? Shall I now accept his perfidious friendship? Can I hope that he will respect the engagements of a treaty, who has already violated the duties of a son? But the anger of Anthemius evaporated in these passionate exclamations he insensibly yielded to the proposals of Epiphanius. And the bishop returned to his diocese with the satisfaction of restoring the peace of Italy, by a reconciliation, 4310 of which the sincerity and continuance might be reasonably suspected. The clemency of the emperor was extorted from his weakness. And Rissimer suspended his ambitious designs till he had secretly prepared the engines with which he resolved to subvert the throne of Anthemius. The mask of peace and moderation was then thrown aside. The army of Rissimer was fortified by a numerous reinforcement of Burgundians and Oriental Suevi, he disclaimed all allegiance to the Greek emperor, marched from Milan to the gates of Rome, and fixing his camp on the banks of the Anio, impatiently expected the arrival of Olibrius, his imperial candidate. The senator Olibrius, of the Anician family, might esteem himself the lawful heir of the Western Empire. He had married Placidia, the younger daughter of Valentinian, after she was restored by Genseric, who still detained her sister Eudoxia, as the wife, or rather as the captive, of his son. The king of the Vandals supported, by threats and solicitations, the fair pretensions of his Roman ally, and assigned, as one of the motives of the war, the refusal of the senate and people to acknowledge their lawful prince, and the unworthy preference which they had given to a stranger. 4311 The friendship of the public enemy might render Olibrius still more unpopular to the Italians. But when Rissimer meditated the ruin of the emperor Anthemius, he tempted, with the offer of a diadem, the candidate who could justify his rebellion by an illustrious name and a royal alliance. The husband of Placidia, who, like most of his ancestors, had been invested with the consular dignity, might have continued to enjoy a secure and splendid fortune in the peaceful residence of Constantinople. Nor does he appear to have been tormented by such a genius as cannot be amused or occupied, unless by the administration of an empire. Yet Olibrius yielded to the importunities of his friends, perhaps of his wife. Rashly plunged into the dangers and calamities of a civil war, and, with the secret connivance of the Emperor Leo, accepted the Italian purple, which was bestowed, and resumed, at the capricious will of a barbarian. He landed without obstacle, for Genseric was master of the sea, either at Ravenna, or the port of Ostia, and immediately proceeded to the camp of Rissimer, where he was received as the sovereign of the Western world. 4312. The patrician, who had extended his posts from the Anio to the Melvian Bridge, already possessed two quarters of Rome, the Vatican and the Geniculum, which are separated by the Tiber from the rest of the city. 
4313 and it may be conjectured, that an assembly of seceding senators imitated, in the choice of Alibrius, the forms of a legal election. But the body of the Senate and people firmly adhered to the cause of Anthemius. And the more effectual support of a Gothic army enabled him to prolong his reign, and the public distress, by a resistance of three months, which produced the concomitant evils of famine and pestilence. At length Rissimer made a furious assault on the bridge of Hadrian, or St. Angelo, and the narrow pass was defended with equal valour by the Goths, till the death of Gilmer, their leader. The victorious troops, breaking down every barrier, rushed with irresistible violence into the heart of the city, and Rome, if we may use the language of a contemporary pope, was subverted by the civil fury of Anthemius and Rissimer. 43-14 The unfortunate Anthemius was dragged from his concealment, and inhumanly massacred by the command of his son-in-law, who thus added a third, or perhaps a fourth, emperor to the number of his victims. The soldiers, who united the rage of factious citizens with the savage manners of barbarians, were indulged, without control, in the license of rapine and murder, the crowd of slaves and plebeians, who were unconcerned in the event, could only gain by the indiscriminate pillage. And the face of the city exhibited the strange contrast of stern cruelty and dissolute intemperance. For thousand three hundred and fifteen forty days after this calamitous event, the subject, not of glory, but of guilt, Italy was delivered, by a painful disease, from the tyrant Rissimer, who bequeathed the command of his army to his nephew Gundibald. One of the princes of the Burgundians. In the same year all the principal actors in this great revolution were removed from the stage, and the whole reign of Alibrius, whose death does not betray any symptoms of violence, is included within the term of seven months. He left one daughter, the offspring of his marriage with Placidia, and the family of the great Theodosius, transplanted from Spain to Constantinople, was propagated in the female line as far as the eighth generation. 4316 Whilst the vacant throne of Italy was abandoned to lawless barbarians, 4317 the election of a new colleague was seriously agitated in the Council of Leo. The Empress Verena, studious to promote the greatness of her own family, had married one of her nieces to Julius Nepos, who succeeded his uncle Marcellinus in the sovereignty of Dalmatia. A more solid possession than the title which he was persuaded to accept, of Emperor of the West. But the measures of the Byzantine court were so languid and irresolute, that many months elapsed after the death of Anthemius, and even of Alibrius, before their destined successor could show himself, with a respectable force. To his Italian subjects. During that interval, Glycerius, an obscure soldier, was invested with the purple by his patron Gundibald. But the Burgundian prince was unable, or unwilling, to support his nomination by a civil war, the pursuits of domestic ambition recalled him beyond the Alps 4318 and his client was permitted to exchange the Roman scepter for the bishopric of Salona. After extinguishing such a competitor, the Emperor Nepos was acknowledged by the Senate, by the Italians, and by the provincials of Gaul, his moral virtues, and military talents, were loudly celebrated. And those who derived any private benefit from his government, announced, in prophetic strains, the restoration of the public felicity. 4319 Their hopes, if such hopes had been entertained, were confounded within the term of a single year, and the Treaty of Peace, which ceded overdue to the Visigoths, is the only event of his short and inglorious reign. The most faithful subjects of Gaul were sacrificed, by the Italian emperor, to the hope of domestic security. 4320 But his repose was soon invaded by a furious sedition of the barbarian confederates, who, under the command of Orestes, their general, were in full march from Rome to Ravenna. Nepos trembled at their approach. And, instead of placing a just confidence in the strength of Ravenna, he hastily escaped to his ships, and retired to his Dalmatian principality, on the opposite coast of the Adriatic. By this shameful abdication, he protracted his life about five years, in a very ambiguous state, between an emperor and an exile, till he was assassinated at Salona by the ungrateful Glycerius, who was translated, perhaps as the reward of his crime, to the Archbishopric of Milan. 4321. The nations who had asserted their independence after the death of Attila, were established, by the right of possession or conquest, 
in the boundless countries to the north of the Danube, or in the Roman provinces between the river and the Alps. But the bravest of their youth enlisted in the army of confederates, who formed the defense and the terror of Italy. 4322 And in this promiscuous multitude, the names of the Heruli, the Syri, the Alani, the Tersilingi, and the Rugians appear to have predominated. The example of these warriors was imitated by Orestes 4323 the son of Tatalus, and the father of the last Roman emperor of the West. Orestes, who has been already mentioned in this history, had never deserted his country. His birth and fortunes rendered him one of the most illustrious subjects of Pannonia. When that province was ceded to the Huns, he entered into the service of Attila, his lawful sovereign, obtained the office of his secretary, and was repeatedly sent ambassador to Constantinople, to represent the person, and signify the commands. Of the imperious monarch. The death of that conqueror restored him to his freedom, and Orestes might honorably refuse either to follow the sons of Attila into the Scythian desert, or to obey the Ostrogoths, who had usurped the dominion of Pannonia. He preferred the service of the Italian princes, the successors of Valentinian. And as he possessed the qualifications of courage, industry, and experience, he advanced with rapid steps in the military profession, till he was elevated, by the favor of Nepos himself, to the dignities of patrician and master general of the troops. These troops had been long accustomed to reverence the character and authority of Orestes, who affected their manners, conversed with them in their own language, and was intimately connected with their national chieftains. By long habits of familiarity and friendship. At his solicitation they rose in arms against the obscure Greek, who presumed to claim their obedience. And when Orestes, from some secret motive, declined the purple, they consented, with the same facility, to acknowledge his son Augustulus as the emperor of the West. By the abdication of Nepos, Orestes had now attained the summit of his ambitious hopes. But he soon discovered, before the end of the first year, that the lessons of perjury and ingratitude, which a rebel must inculcate, will be resorted to against himself. And that the precarious sovereign of Italy was only permitted to choose, whether he would be the slave, or the victim, of his barbarian mercenaries. The dangerous alliance of these strangers had oppressed and insulted the last remains of Roman freedom and dignity. At each revolution, their pay and privileges were augmented, but their insolence increased in a still more extravagant degree. They envied the fortune of their brethren in Gaul, Spain, and Africa, whose victorious arms had acquired an independent and perpetual inheritance. And they insisted on their peremptory demand, that a third part of the lands of Italy should be immediately divided among them. Orestes, with a spirit, which, in another situation, might be entitled to our esteem, chose rather to encounter the rage of an armed multitude, than to subscribe the ruin of an innocent people. He rejected the audacious demand. And his refusal was favorable to the ambition of Odoacer, a bold barbarian, who assured his fellow soldiers, that, if they dared to associate under his command, they might soon extort the justice which had been denied to their dutiful petitions. From all the camps and garrisons of Italy, the confederates, actuated by the same resentment and the same hopes, impatiently flocked to the standard of this popular leader. And the unfortunate patrician, overwhelmed by the torrent, hastily retreated to the strong city of Pavia, the episcopal seat of the holy Epiphanites. Pavia was immediately besieged, the fortifications were stormed, the town was pillaged. And although the bishop might labor, with much zeal and some success, to save the property of the church, and the chastity of female captives, the tumult could only be appeased by the execution of Orestes. 4324 His brother Paul was slain in an action near Ravenna, and the helpless Augustulus, who could no longer command the respect, was reduced to implore the clemency, of Odoacer. That successful barbarian was the son of Eid Khan, who, in some remarkable transactions, particularly described in a preceding chapter, had been the colleague of Orestes himself. 4325 The honor of an ambassador should be exempt from suspicion. And Eid Khan had listened to a conspiracy against the life of his sovereign. But this apparent guilt was expiated by his merit or repentance, his rank was eminent and conspicuous he enjoyed the favor of Attila. And the troops under his command, who guarded, in their turn, 
the royal village, consisted of a tribe of Sirai, his immediate and hereditary subjects. In the revolt of the nations, they still adhered to the Huns. And more than twelve years afterwards, the name of Eid Khan is honorably mentioned, in their unequal contests with the Ostrogoths, which was terminated, after two bloody battles, by the defeat and dispersion of the Sirai. 4326 Their gallant leader, who did not survive this national calamity, left two sons, Onulf and Odoacer, to struggle with adversity, and to maintain as they might, by rapine or service, the faithful followers of their exile. Onulf directed his steps towards Constantinople, where he sullied, by the assassination of a generous benefactor, the fame which he had acquired in arms. His brother Odoacer led a wandering life among the barbarians of Naricum, with a mind and a fortune suited to the most desperate adventures. And when he had fixed his choice, he piously visited the cell of Severinus, the popular saint of the country, to solicit his approbation and blessing. The lowness of the door would not admit the lofty stature of Odoacer, he was obliged to stoop. But in that humble attitude the saint could discern the symptoms of his future greatness, and addressing him in a prophetic tone, pursue, said he, your design, proceed to Italy, you will soon cast away this coarse garment of skins. And your wealth will be adequate to the liberality of your mind. 4327 The barbarian, whose daring spirit accepted and ratified the prediction, was admitted into the service of the Western Empire, and soon obtained an honorable rank in the guards. His manners were gradually polished, his military skill was improved, and the confederates of Italy would not have elected him for their general, unless the exploits of Odoacer had established a high opinion of his courage and capacity. 4328 Their military acclamations saluted him with the title of king. But he abstained, during his whole reign, from the use of the purple and diadem 4329 lest he should offend those princes, whose subjects, by their accidental mixture, had formed the victorious army. Which time and policy might insensibly unite into a great nation. Royalty was familiar to the barbarians, and the submissive people of Italy was prepared to obey, without a murmur, the authority which he should condescend to exercise as the vicegerent of the Emperor of the West. But Odoacer had resolved to abolish that useless and expensive office, and such is the weight of antique prejudice, that it required some boldness and penetration to discover the extreme facility of the enterprise. The unfortunate Augustulus was made the instrument of his own disgrace, he signified his resignation to the Senate. And that assembly, in their last act of obedience to a Roman prince, still affected the spirit of freedom, and the forms of the constitution. An epistle was addressed, by their unanimous decree, to the Emperor Zeno, the son-in-law and successor of Leo, who had lately been restored, after a short rebellion, to the Byzantine throne. They solemnly disclaim the necessity, or even the wish, of continuing any longer the imperial succession in Italy. Since, in their opinion, the majesty of a sole monarch is sufficient to pervade and protect, at the same time, both the East and the West. In their own name, and in the name of the people, they consent that the seat of universal empire shall be transferred from Rome to Constantinople. And they basely renounce the right of choosing their master, the only vestige that yet remained of the authority which had given laws to the world. The Republic, they repeat that name without a blush, might safely confide in the civil and military virtues of Odoacer. And they humbly request, that the Emperor would invest him with the title of patrician, and the administration of the Diocese of Italy. The deputies of the Senate were received at Constantinople with some marks of displeasure and indignation, and when they were admitted to the audience of Zeno, he sternly reproached them with their treatment of the two emperors, Anthemius and Nepos whom the East had successively granted to the prayers of Italy. The first, continued he, you have murdered, the second you have expelled, but the second is still alive, and whilst he lives he is your lawful sovereign. But the prudent Zeno soon deserted the hopeless cause of his abdicated colleague. His vanity was gratified by the title of sole emperor, and by the statues erected to his honor in the several quarters of Rome, he entertained a friendly, though ambiguous, correspondence with the patrician Odoacer. And he gratefully accepted the imperial ensigns, the sacred ornaments of the throne and palace, which the barbarian was not unwilling to remove from the sight of the people. 
4330. In the space of twenty years since the death of Valentinian, nine emperors had successively disappeared. And the son of Orestes, a youth recommended only by his beauty, would be the least entitled to the notice of posterity, if his reign, which was marked by the extinction of the Roman Empire in the West, did not leave a memorable era in the history of mankind. 4331 The patrician Orestes had married the daughter of Count Romulus, of Patovio in Naricum, the name of Augustus, notwithstanding the jealousy of power, was known at Aquileia as a familiar surname. And the appellations of the two great founders, of the city and of the monarchy, were thus strangely united in the last of their successors. 4332 The son of Orestes assumed and disgraced the names of Romulus Augustus. But the first was corrupted into Momilus, by the Greeks, and the second has been changed by the Latins into the contemptible diminutive Augustulus. The life of this inoffensive youth was spared by the generous clemency of Odoacer, who dismissed him, with his whole family, from the imperial palace, fixed his annual allowance at six thousand pieces of gold, and assigned the castle of Lucullus, in Campania, for the place of his exile or retirement. 4333 As soon as the Romans breathed from the toils of the Punic War, they were attracted by the beauties and the pleasures of Campania, and the country house of the elder Scipio at Laternum exhibited a lasting model of their rustic simplicity. 4334 The delicious shores of the Bay of Naples were crowded with villas. And Scylla applauded the masterly skill of his rival, who had seated himself on the lofty promontory of Misenum, that commands, on every side, the sea and land, as far as the boundaries of the horizon. 4335 The villa of Marius was purchased, within a few years, by Lucullus, and the price had increased from 2,500, to more than fourscore thousand, pounds sterling. 4336 It was adorned by the new proprietor with Grecian arts and Asiatic treasures, and the houses and gardens of Lucullus obtained a distinguished rank in the list of imperial palaces. 4337 When the Vandals became formidable to the sea coast, the Lucullan villa, on the promontory of Misenum, gradually assumed the strength and appellation of a strong castle, the obscure retreat of the last emperor of the West. About twenty years after that great revolution, it was converted into a church and monastery, to receive the bones of Saint Severinus. They securely reposed, amidst though the broken trophies of Cimbric and Armenian victories till the beginning of the tenth century. When the fortifications, which might afford a dangerous shelter to the Saracens, were demolished by the people of Naples. 4338. Odoacer was the first barbarian who reigned in Italy, over a people who had once asserted their just superiority above the rest of mankind. The disgrace of the Romans still excites our respectful compassion, and we fondly sympathize with the imaginary grief and indignation of their degenerate posterity. But the calamities of Italy had gradually subdued the proud consciousness of freedom and glory. In the age of Roman virtue the provinces were subject to the arms, and the citizens to the laws, of the Republic. Till those laws were subverted by civil discord, and both the city and the province became the servile property of a tyrant. The forms of the constitution, which alleviated or disguised their abject slavery, were abolished by time and violence. The Italians alternately lamented the presence or the absence of the sovereign, whom they detested or despised, and the succession of five centuries inflicted the various evils of military license, capricious despotism, and elaborate oppression. During the same period, the barbarians had emerged from obscurity and contempt, and the warriors of Germany and Scythia were introduced into the provinces, as the servants, the allies, and at length the masters, of the Romans, whom they insulted or protected. The hatred of the people was suppressed by fear, they respected the spirit and splendor of the martial chiefs who were invested with the honors of the empire, and the fate of Rome had long depended on the sword of those formidable strangers. The stern Ricimer, who trampled on the ruins of Italy, had exercised the power, without assuming the title, of a king, and the patient Romans were insensibly prepared to acknowledge the royalty of Odoacer and his barbaric successors. The king of Italy was not unworthy of the high station to which his valor and fortune had exalted him, his savage manners were polished by the habits of conversation. And he respected, though a conqueror and a barbarian, the institutions, and even the prejudices, 
of his subjects. After an interval of seven years, Odoacer restored the consulship of the West. For himself, he modestly, or proudly, declined an honor which was still accepted by the emperors of the East, but the curule chair was successively filled by eleven of the most illustrious senators. 4339 and the list is adorned by the respectable name of Basilius, whose virtues claimed the friendship and grateful applause of Sidonius, his client. 4340 The laws of the emperors were strictly enforced, and the civil administration of Italy was still exercised by the praetorian prefect and his subordinate officers. Odoacer devolved on the Roman magistrates the odious and oppressive task of collecting the public revenue, but he reserved for himself the merit of seasonable and popular indulgence. 4341 Like the rest of the barbarians, he had been instructed in the Arian heresy, but he revered the monastic and episcopal characters, and the silence of the Catholics attest the toleration which they enjoyed. The peace of the city required the interposition of his prefect Basilius in the choice of a Roman pontiff, the decree which restrained the clergy from alienating their lands was ultimately designed for the benefit of the people, whose devotions would have been taxed to repair the dilapidations of the church. 4342 Italy was protected by the arms of its conqueror, and its frontiers were respected by the barbarians of Gaul and Germany, who had so long insulted the feeble race of Theodosius. Odoacer passed the Adriatic, to chastise the assassins of the Emperor Nepos, and to acquire the maritime province of Dalmatia. He passed the Alps, to rescue the remains of Naricum from Fava, or Philetheus, king of the Rugians, who held his residence beyond the Danube. The king was vanquished in battle, and led away prisoner. A numerous colony of captives and subjects was transplanted into Italy, and Rome, after a long period of defeat and disgrace, might claim the triumph of her barbarian master. 4343. Notwithstanding the prudence and success of Odoacer, his kingdom exhibited the sad prospect of misery and desolation. Since the age of Tiberius, the decay of agriculture had been felt in Italy. And it was a just subject of complaint, that the life of the Roman people depended on the accidents of the winds and waves. 4344 In the division and the decline of the empire, the tributary harvests of Egypt and Africa were withdrawn. The numbers of the inhabitants continually diminished with the means of subsistence, and the country was exhausted by the irretrievable losses of war, famine, 4345 and pestilence. St. Ambrose has deplored the ruin of a populous district, which had been once adorned with the flourishing cities of Bologna, Medina, Regium, and Placentia. 4346 Pope Gelasius was a subject of Odoacer. And he affirms, with strong exaggeration, that in Emilia, Tuscany, and the adjacent provinces, the human species was almost extirpated. 4347 The plebeians of Rome, who were fed by the hand of their master, perished or disappeared, as soon as his liberality was suppressed, the decline of the arts reduced the industrious mechanic to idleness and want. And the senators, who might support with patience the ruin of their country, bewailed their private loss of wealth and luxury. 4348 One third of those ample estates, to which the ruin of Italy is originally imputed, 4349 was extorted for the use of the conquerors. Injuries were aggravated by insults. The sense of actual sufferings was embittered by the fear of more dreadful evils. And as new lands were allotted to the new swarms of barbarians, each senator was apprehensive lest the arbitrary surveyors should approach his favorite villa, or his most profitable farm. The least unfortunate were those who submitted without a murmur to the power which it was impossible to resist. Since they desired to live, they owed some gratitude to the tyrant who had spared their lives. And since he was the absolute master of their fortunes, the portion which he left must be accepted as his pure and voluntary gift. 4350 The distress of Italy 4351 was mitigated by the prudence and humanity of Odoacer, who had bound himself, as the price of his elevation, to satisfy the demands of a licentious and turbulent multitude. The kings of the barbarians were frequently resisted, deposed, or murdered, by their native subjects, and the various bands of Italian mercenaries, who associated under the standard of an elective general, claimed a larger privilege of freedom and rapine. A monarchy destitute of national union, and hereditary right, 
hastened to its dissolution. After a reign of fourteen years, Odoacer was oppressed by the superior genius of Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths. A hero alike excellent in the arts of war and of government, who restored an age of peace and prosperity, and whose name still excites and deserves the attention of mankind. XVI, Conversion of the Barbarians to Christianity Origin Progress, and Effects of the Monastic Life. Conversion of the Barbarians to Christianity and Arianism. Persecution of the Vandals in Africa. Extinction of Arianism among the Barbarians. The indissoluble connection of civil and ecclesiastical affairs has compelled, and encouraged, me to relate the progress, the persecutions, the establishment, the divisions, the final triumph, and the gradual corruption, of Christianity. I have purposely delayed the consideration of two religious events, interesting in the study of human nature, and important in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. I, the institution of the monastic life, 4352 and 2. The conversion of the northern barbarians. I, prosperity and peace introduced the distinction of the vulgar and the ascetic Christians. 4353 The loose and imperfect practice of religion satisfied the conscience of the multitude. The prince or magistrate, the soldier or merchant, reconciled their fervent zeal and implicit faith, with the exercise of their profession, the pursuit of their interest, and the indulgence of their passions, but the ascetics, who obeyed and abused the rigid precepts of the gospel, were inspired by the savage enthusiasm which represents man as a criminal, and God as a tyrant. They seriously renounced the business, and the pleasures, of the age, abjured the use of wine, of flesh, and of marriage, chastised their body, mortified their affections, and embraced a life of misery, as the price of eternal happiness. In the reign of Constantine, the ascetics fled from a profane and degenerate world, to perpetual solitude, or religious society. Like the first Christians of Jerusalem, 4354-4355 they resigned the use, or the property of their temporal possessions. Established regular communities of the same sex, and a similar disposition, and assumed the names of hermits, monks, and anachorets, expressive of their lonely retreat in a natural or artificial desert. They soon acquired the respect of the world, which they despised, and the loudest applause was bestowed on this divine philosophy, 4356 which surpassed, without the aid of science or reason, the laborious virtues of the Grecian schools. The monks might indeed contend with the Stoics, in the contempt of fortune, of pain, and of death, the Pythagorean silence and submission were revived in their servile discipline. And they disdained, as firmly as the cynics themselves, all the forms and decencies of civil society. But the votaries of this divine philosophy aspired to imitate a purer and more perfect model. They trod in the footsteps of the prophets, who had retired to the desert, 4357 and they restored the devout and contemplative life, which had been instituted by the Essenians, in Palestine and Egypt. The philosophic eye of Pliny had surveyed with astonishment a solitary people, who dwelt among the palm trees near the Dead Sea, who subsisted without money, who were propagated without women, and who derived from the disgust and repentance of mankind a perpetual supply of voluntary associates. 4358. Egypt, the fruitful parent of superstition, afforded the first example of the monastic life. Antony, 4359 an illiterate 4360 youth of the lower parts of Thebes, distributed his patrimony, 4361 deserted his family and native home, and executed his monastic penance with original and intrepid fanaticism. After a long and painful novitiate, among the tombs, and in a ruined tower, he boldly advanced into the desert three days' journey to the eastward of the Nile. Discovered a lonely spot, which possessed the advantages of shade and water, and fixed his last residence on Mount Khalsam, near the Red Sea, where an ancient monastery still preserves the name and memory of the saint. 4362 The curious devotion of the Christians pursued him to the desert, and when he was obliged to appear at Alexandria, in the face of mankind, he supported his fame with discretion and dignity. He enjoyed the friendship of Athanasius, whose doctrine he approved, and the Egyptian peasant respectfully declined a respectful invitation from the Emperor Constantine. The Venerable Patriarch, 
for Antony attained the age of one hundred and five years, beheld the numerous progeny which had been formed by his example and his lessons. The prolific colonies of monks multiplied with rapid increase on the sands of Libya, upon the rocks of Thebes, and in the cities of the Nile. To the south of Alexandria, the mountain, and adjacent desert, of Nitria, were peopled by five thousand anachorets. And the traveller may still investigate the ruins of fifty monasteries, which were planted in that barren soil by the disciples of Antony. 4363 In the Upper Thebes, the vacant island of Teben, 4364 was occupied by Pacomius and 1400 of his brethren. That holy abbot successively founded nine monasteries of men, and one of women. And the festival of Easter sometimes collected fifty thousand religious persons, who followed his angelic rule of discipline. 4365 The stately and populous city of Oxyrhynchus, the seat of Christian orthodoxy, had devoted the temples, the public edifices, and even the ramparts, to pious and charitable uses. And the bishop, who might preach in twelve churches, computed ten thousand females and twenty thousand males, of the monastic profession. 4366 The Egyptians, who gloried in this marvelous revolution, were disposed to hope, and to believe, that the number of the monks was equal to the remainder of the people. 4367 And posterity might repeat the saying, which had formerly been applied to the sacred animals of the same country, that in Egypt it was less difficult to find a god than a man. Athanasius introduced into Rome the knowledge and practice of the monastic life, and a school of this new philosophy was opened by the disciples of Antony, who accompanied their primate to the holy threshold of the Vatican. The strange and savage appearance of these Egyptians excited, at first, horror and contempt, and, at length, applause and zealous imitation. The senators, and more especially the matrons, transformed their palaces and villas into religious houses. And the narrow institution of six vestals was eclipsed by the frequent monasteries, which were seated on the ruins of ancient temples, and in the midst of the Roman Forum. 4368 Inflamed by the example of Antony, a Syrian youth, whose name was Hilarion, 4369 fixed his dreary abode on a sandy beach, between the sea and the morass, about seven miles from Gaza. The austere penance, in which he persisted forty-eight years, diffused a similar enthusiasm, and the holy man was followed by a train of two or three thousand anachorets, whenever he visited the innumerable monasteries of Palestine. The fame of Basil 4370 is immortal in the monastic history of the East. With a mind that had tasted the learning and eloquence of Athens. With an ambition scarcely to be satisfied with the archbishopric of Caesarea, Basil retired to a savage solitude in Pontus. And deigned, for a while, to give laws to the spiritual colonies which he profusely scattered along the coast of the Black Sea. In the West, Martin of Tours, 4371 a soldier, a hermit, a bishop, and a saint, established the monasteries of Gaul. Two thousand of his disciples followed him to the grave, and his eloquent historian challenges the deserts of Thebes to produce, in a more favorable climate, a champion of equal virtue. The progress of the monks was not less rapid, or universal, than that of Christianity itself. Every province, and, at last, every city, of the empire, was filled with their increasing multitudes. And the bleak and barren isles, from Larens to Lipari, that arose out of the Tuscan Sea, were chosen by the Anachorets for the place of their voluntary exile. An easy and perpetual intercourse by sea and land connected the provinces of the Roman world. And the life of Hilarion displays the facility with which an indigent hermit of Palestine might traverse Egypt, embark for Sicily, escape to Epirus, and finally settle in the island of Cyprus. 4372 The Latin Christians embraced the religious institutions of Rome. The pilgrims, who visited Jerusalem, eagerly copied, in the most distant climates of the earth, the faithful model of the monastic life. The disciples of Antony spread themselves beyond the tropic, over the Christian empire of Ethiopia. 4373 The monastery of Banker, 4374 in Flintshire, which contained above two thousand brethren, dispersed a numerous colony among the barbarians of Ireland. 4375 in Iona, one of the Hebrides, which was planted by the Irish monks, diffused over the northern regions a doubtful ray of science and superstition. 
4376. These unhappy exiles from social life were impelled by the dark and implacable genius of superstition. Their mutual resolution was supported by the example of millions, of either sex, of every age, and of every rank. And each proselyte who entered the gates of a monastery, was persuaded that he trod the steep and thorny path of eternal happiness. 4377 But the operation of these religious motives was variously determined by the temper and situation of mankind. Reason might subdue, or passion might suspend, their influence, but they acted most forcibly on the infirm minds of children and females, they were strengthened by secret remorse or accidental misfortune. And they might derive some aid from the temporal considerations of vanity or interest. It was naturally supposed, that the pious and humble monks, who had renounced the world to accomplish the work of their salvation, were the best qualified for the spiritual government of the Christians. The reluctant hermit was torn from his cell, and seated, amidst the acclamations of the people, on the episcopal throne, the monasteries of Egypt, of Gaul, and of the East, supplied a regular succession of saints and bishops. And ambition soon discovered the secret road which led to the possession of wealth and honors. 4378 The popular monks, whose reputation was connected with the fame and success of the order, assiduously labored to multiply the number of their fellow captives. They insinuated themselves into noble and opulent families. And the specious arts of flattery and seduction were employed to secure those proselytes who might bestow wealth or dignity on the monastic profession. The indignant father bewailed the loss, perhaps, of an only son. 4379 The credulous maid was betrayed by vanity to violate the laws of nature, and the matron aspired to imaginary perfection, by renouncing the virtues of domestic life. Paula yielded to the persuasive eloquence of Jerem. 4380 And the profane title of mother-in-law of God 4381 tempted that illustrious widow to consecrate the virginity of her daughter Eustochium. By the advice, and in the company, of her spiritual guide, Paula abandoned Rome and her infant son. Retired to the holy village of Bethlehem, founded a hospital and four monasteries, and acquired, by her alms and penance, an eminent and conspicuous station in the Catholic Church. Such rare and illustrious penitents were celebrated as the glory and example of their age, but the monasteries were filled by a crowd of obscure and abject plebeians 4382 who gained in the cloister much more than they had sacrificed in the world. Peasants, slaves, and mechanics, might escape from poverty and contempt to a safe and honorable profession, whose apparent hardships are mitigated by custom, by popular applause, and by the secret relaxation of discipline. 4383 The subjects of Rome, whose persons and fortunes were made responsible for unequal and exorbitant tributes, retired from the oppression of the imperial government. And the pusillanimous youth preferred the penance of a monastic, to the dangers of a military, life. The affrighted provincials of every rank, who fled before the barbarians, found shelter and subsistence, whole legions were buried in these religious sanctuaries. And the same cause, which relieved the distress of individuals, impaired the strength and fortitude of the empire. 4384. The monastic profession of the ancients 4385 was an act of voluntary devotion. The inconstant fanatic was threatened with the eternal vengeance of the god whom he deserted, but the doors of the monastery were still open for repentance. Those monks, whose conscience was fortified by reason or passion, were at liberty to resume the character of men and citizens, and even the spouses of Christ might accept the legal embraces of an earthly lover. 4386 The examples of scandal, and the progress of superstition, suggested the propriety of more forcible restraints. After a sufficient trial, the fidelity of the novice was secured by a solemn and perpetual vow. And his irrevocable engagement was ratified by the laws of the church and state. A guilty fugitive was pursued, arrested, and restored to his perpetual prison. And the interposition of the magistrate oppressed the freedom and the merit, which had alleviated, in some degree, the abject slavery of the monastic discipline. 4387 The actions of a monk, his words, and even his thoughts, were determined by an inflexible rule. 4388 Or a capricious superior, the slightest offenses were corrected by disgrace or confinement, extraordinary fasts, or bloody flagellation. 
and disobedience, murmur, or delay, were ranked in the catalog of the most heinous sins. 4389 A blind submission to the commands of the abbot, however absurd, or even criminal, they might seem, was the ruling principle, the first virtue of the Egyptian monks, and their patience was frequently exercised by the most extravagant trials. They were directed to remove an enormous rock, assiduously to water a barren staff, that was planted in the ground, till, at the end of three years, it should vegetate and blossom like a tree, to walk into a fiery furnace. Or to cast their infant into a deep pond, and several saints, or madmen, have been immortalized in monastic story, by their thoughtless and fearless obedience. 4390 The freedom of the mind, the source of every generous and rational sentiment, was destroyed by the habits of credulity and submission. And the monk, contracting the vices of a slave, devoutly followed the faith and passions of his ecclesiastical tyrant. The peace of the Eastern Church was invaded by a swarm of fanatics, incapable of fear, or reason, or humanity. And the imperial troops acknowledged, without shame, that they were much less apprehensive of an encounter with the fiercest barbarians. 4391 Superstition has often framed and consecrated the fantastic garments of the monks, 4392 but their apparent singularity sometimes proceeds from their uniform attachment to a simple and primitive model, which the revolutions of fashion have made ridiculous in the eyes of mankind. The father of the Benedictines expressly disclaims all idea of choice of merit, and soberly exhorts his disciples to adopt the coarse and convenient dress of the countries which they may inhabit. 4393 The monastic habits of the ancients varied with the climate, and their mode of life, and they assumed, with the same indifference, the sheepskin of the Egyptian peasants, or the cloak of the Grecian philosophers. They allowed themselves the use of linen in Egypt, where it was a cheap and domestic manufacture, but in the West they rejected such an expensive article of foreign luxury. 4394 It was the practice of the monks either to cut or shave their hair. They wrapped their heads in a cowl to escape the sight of profane objects, their legs and feet were naked, except in the extreme cold of winter, and their slow and feeble steps were supported by a long staff. The aspect of a genuine anachoret was horrid and disgusting, every sensation that is offensive to man was thought acceptable to God. And the angelic rule of Tibet condemned the salutary custom of bathing the limbs in water, and of anointing them with oil. 4395 4396 The austere monks slept on the ground, on a hard mat, or a rough blanket. And the same bundle of palm leaves served them as a seat in the day, and a pillow in the night. Their original cells were low, narrow huts, built of the slightest materials. Which formed, by the regular distribution of the streets, a large and populous village, enclosing, within the common wall, a church, a hospital, perhaps a library, some necessary offices, a garden, and a fountain or reservoir of fresh water. Thirty or forty brethren composed a family of separate discipline and diet, and the great monasteries of Egypt consisted of thirty or forty families. Pleasure and guilt are synonymous terms in the language of the monks, and they discovered, by experience, that rigid fasts, and abstemious diet, are the most effectual preservatives against the impure desires of the flesh. 4397 The rules of abstinence which they imposed, or practiced, were not uniform or perpetual, the cheerful festival of the Pentecost was balanced by the extraordinary mortification of Lent, the fervor of new monasteries was insensibly relaxed. And the voracious appetite of the Gauls could not imitate the patient and tempered virtue of the Egyptians. 4398 The disciples of Antony and Pacomius were satisfied with their daily pittance 4399 of twelve ounces of bread, or rather biscuit, 4400 which they divided into two frugal repasts, of the afternoon and of the evening. It was esteemed a merit, and almost a duty, to abstain from the boiled vegetables which were provided for the refectory. But the extraordinary bounty of the abbot sometimes indulged them with the luxury of cheese, fruit, salad, and the small dried fish of the Nile. 4401 A more ample latitude of sea and river fish was gradually allowed or assumed. But the use of flesh was long confined to the sick or travelers, and when it gradually prevailed in the less rigid monasteries of Europe, a singular distinction was introduced. As if birds, whether wild or domestic, 
had been less profane than the grosser animals of the field. Water was the pure and innocent beverage of the primitive monks. And the founder of the Benedictines regrets the daily portion of half a pint of wine, which had been extorted from him by the intemperance of the age. 4402 Such an allowance might be easily supplied by the vineyards of Italy. And his victorious disciples, who passed the Alps, the Rhine, and the Baltic, required, in the place of wine, an adequate compensation of strong beer or cider. The candidate who aspired to the virtue of evangelical poverty, abjured, at his first entrance into a regular community, the idea, and even the name, of all separate or exclusive possessions. 4403 The brethren were supported by their manual labor. And the duty of labor was strenuously recommended as a penance, as an exercise, and as the most laudable means of securing their daily subsistence. 4404 For the garden and fields, which the industry of the monks had often rescued from the forest or the morass, were diligently cultivated by their hands. They performed, without reluctance, the menial offices of slaves and domestics. And the several trades that were necessary to provide their habits, their utensils, and their lodging, were exercised within the precincts of the great monasteries. The monastic studies have tended, for the most part, to darken, rather than to dispel, the cloud of superstition. Yet the curiosity or zeal of some learned solitaries has cultivated the ecclesiastical, and even the profane, sciences. And posterity must gratefully acknowledge, that the monuments of Greek and Roman literature have been preserved and multiplied by their indefatigable pens. 4405 But the more humble industry of the monks, especially in Egypt, was contented with the silent, sedentary occupation of making wooden sandals, or of twisting the leaves of the palm tree into mats and baskets. The superfluous stock, which was not consumed in domestic use, supplied, by trade, the wants of the community, the boats of Teben, and the other monasteries of Thebais, descended the Nile as far as Alexandria. And, in a Christian market, the sanctity of the workman might enhance the intrinsic value of the work. The novice was tempted to bestow his fortune on the saints, in whose society he was resolved to spend the remainder of his life. And the pernicious indulgence of the laws permitted him to receive, for their use, any future accessions of legacy or inheritance. 4406 Melania contributed her plate, 300 pounds weight of silver. And Paula contracted an immense debt, for the relief of their favorite monks, who kindly imparted the merits of their prayers and penance to a rich and liberal sinner. 4407 Time continually increased, and accidents could seldom diminish, the estates of the popular monasteries, which spread over the adjacent country and cities, and, in the first century of their institution. The infidel Zosimus has maliciously observed, that, for the benefit of the poor, the Christian monks had reduced a great part of mankind to a state of beggary. 4408 As long as they maintained their original fervor, they approved themselves, however, the faithful and benevolent stewards of the charity, which was entrusted to their care. But their discipline was corrupted by prosperity, they gradually assumed the pride of wealth, and at last indulged the luxury of expense. Their public luxury might be excused by the magnificence of religious worship, and the decent motive of erecting durable habitations for an immortal society. But every age of the Church has accused the licentiousness of the degenerate monks who no longer remembered the object of their institution, embraced the vain and sensual pleasures of the world, which they had renounced 4409 and scandalously abused the riches which had been acquired by the austere virtues of their founders. 4410 Their natural descent, from such painful and dangerous virtue, to the common vices of humanity, will not, perhaps, excite much grief or indignation in the mind of a philosopher. The lives of the primitive monks were consumed in penance and solitude, undisturbed by the various occupations which fill the time, and exercise the faculties, of reasonable, active, and social beings. Whenever they were permitted to step beyond the precincts of the monastery, two jealous companions were the mutual guards and spies of each other's actions. And, after their return, they were condemned to forget, or, at least, to suppress, whatever they had seen or heard in the world. Strangers, who professed the Orthodox faith, were hospitably entertained in a separate apartment. But their dangerous conversation was restricted to some chosen elders of approved discretion and fidelity. 
except in their presence, the monastic slave might not receive the visits of his friends or kindred. And it was deemed highly meritorious, if he afflicted a tender sister, or an aged parent, by the obstinate refusal of a word or look. 4411 amongst themselves passed their lives, without personal attachments, among a crowd which had been formed by accident, and was detained, in the same prison, by force or prejudice. Recluse fanatics have few ideas or sentiments to communicate, a special license of the abbot regulated the time and duration of their familiar visits. And, at their silent meals, they were enveloped in their cowls, inaccessible, and almost invisible, to each other. 4412 study is the resource of solitude, but education had not prepared and qualified for any liberal studies the mechanics and peasants who filled the monastic communities. They might work, but the vanity of spiritual perfection was tempted to disdain the exercise of manual labor, and the industry must be faint and languid, which is not excited by the sense of personal interest. According to their faith and zeal, they might employ the day, which they passed in their cells, either in vocal or mental prayer, they assembled in the evening, and they were awakened in the night, for the public worship of the monastery. The precise moment was determined by the stars, which are seldom clouded in the serene sky of Egypt, and a rustic horn, or trumpet, the signal of devotion, twice interrupted the vast silence of the desert. 4413 Even sleep, the last refuge of the unhappy, was rigorously measured, the vacant hours of the monk heavily rolled along, without business or pleasure, and, before the close of each day, he had repeatedly accused the tedious progress of the sun. 4414 In this comfortless state, superstition still pursued and tormented her wretched votaries. 4415 The repose which they had sought in the cloister was disturbed by a tardy repentance, profane doubts, and guilty desires. And, while they considered each natural impulse as an unpardonable sin, they perpetually trembled on the edge of a flaming and bottomless abyss. From the painful struggles of disease and despair, these unhappy victims were sometimes relieved by madness or death. And, in the sixth century, a hospital was founded at Jerusalem for a small portion of the austere penitents, who were deprived of their senses. 4416 Their visions, before they attained this extreme and acknowledged term of frenzy, have afforded ample materials of supernatural history. It was their firm persuasion, that the air, which they breathed, was peopled with invisible enemies. With innumerable demons, who watched every occasion, and assumed every form, to terrify, and above all to tempt, their unguarded virtue. The imagination, and even the senses, were deceived by the illusions of distempered fanaticism. And the hermit, whose midnight prayer was oppressed by involuntary slumber, might easily confound the phantoms of horror or delight, which had occupied his sleeping in his waking dreams. 4417. The monks were divided into two classes, the Cenobites, who lived under a common and regular discipline, and the Anachorets, who indulged their unsocial, independent fanaticism. 4418 The most devout, or the most ambitious, of the spiritual brethren, renounced the convent, as they had renounced the world. The fervent monasteries of Egypt, Palestine, and Syria, were surrounded by a Laura 4419 a distant circle of solitary cells, and the extravagant penance of hermits was stimulated by applause and emulation. 4420 they sunk under the painful weight of crosses and chains, and their emaciated limbs were confined by collars, bracelets, gauntlets, and greaves of massy and rigid iron. All superfluous encumbrance of dress they contemptuously cast away. And some savage saints of both sexes have been admired, whose naked bodies were only covered by their long hair. They aspired to reduce themselves to the rude and miserable state in which the human brute is scarcely distinguishable above his kindred animals. And the numerous sect of Anachorets derived their name from their humble practice of grazing in the fields of Mesopotamia with the common herd. 4421 They often usurped the den of some wild beast whom they affected to resemble. They buried themselves in some gloomy cavern, which art or nature had scooped out of the rock, and the marble quarries of Thebes are still inscribed with the monuments of their penance. 4422 The most perfect hermits are supposed to have passed many days without food, many nights without sleep, and many years without speaking. And glorious was the man, I abuse that name, 
who contrived any cell or seat of a peculiar construction, which might expose him, in the most inconvenient posture, to the inclemency of the seasons. Among these heroes of the monastic life, the name and genius of Simeon Stylites 4423 have been immortalized by the singular invention of an aerial penance. At the age of thirteen, the young Syrian deserted the profession of a shepherd, and threw himself into an austere monastery. After a long and painful novitiate, in which Simeon was repeatedly saved from pious suicide, he established his residence on a mountain, about thirty or forty miles to the east of Antioch. Within the space of a mandra, or circle of stones, to which he had attached himself by a ponderous chain, he ascended a column, which was successively raised from the height of nine, to that of sixty, feet from the ground. 4424 In this last and lofty station, the Syrian Anachoret resisted the heat of thirty summers, and the cold of as many winters. Habit and exercise instructed him to maintain his dangerous situation without fear or giddiness, and successively to assume the different postures of devotion. He sometimes prayed in an erect attitude, with his outstretched arms in the figure of a cross, but his most familiar practice was that of bending his meager skeleton from the forehead to the feet. And a curious spectator, after numbering 1244 repetitions, at length desisted from the endless account. The progress of an ulcer in his thigh 4425 might shorten, but it could not disturb, this celestial life. And the patient hermit expired, without descending from his column. A prince, who should capriciously inflict such tortures, would be deemed a tyrant. But it would surpass the power of a tyrant to impose a long and miserable existence on the reluctant victims of his cruelty. This voluntary martyrdom must have gradually destroyed the sensibility both of the mind and body. Nor can it be presumed that the fanatics, who torment themselves, are susceptible of any lively affection for the rest of mankind. A cruel, unfeeling temper has distinguished the monks of every age and country, their stern indifference, which is seldom mollified by personal friendship, is inflamed by religious hatred. And their merciless seal has strenuously administered the holy office of the Inquisition. The monastic saints, who excite only the contempt and pity of a philosopher, were respected, and almost adored, by the prince and people. Successive crowds of pilgrims from Gaul and India saluted the divine pillar of Simeon, the tribes of Saracens disputed in arms the honor of his benediction, the queens of Arabia and Persia gratefully confessed his supernatural virtue. And the angelic hermit was consulted by the younger Theodosius, in the most important concerns of the church and state. His remains were transported from the mountain of Telenissa, by a solemn procession of the patriarch, the master general of the east, six bishops, twenty-one counts or tribunes, and six thousand soldiers. And Antioch revered his bones, as her glorious ornament and impregnable defense. The fame of the apostles and martyrs was gradually eclipsed by these recent and popular anachorets, the Christian world fell prostrate before their shrines. And the miracles ascribed to their relics exceeded, at least in number and duration, the spiritual exploits of their lives. But the golden legend of their lives 4426 was embellished by the artful credulity of their interested brethren. And a believing age was easily persuaded, that the slightest caprice of an Egyptian or a Syrian monk had been sufficient to interrupt the eternal laws of the universe. The favorites of heaven were accustomed to cure inveterate diseases with a touch, a word, or a distant message, and to expel the most obstinate demons from the souls or bodies which they possessed. They familiarly accosted, or imperiously commanded, the lions and serpents of the desert, infused vegetation into a sapless trunk, suspended iron on the surface of the water passed the Nile on the back of a crocodile, and refreshed themselves in a fiery furnace. These extravagant tales, which display the fiction without the genius, of poetry, have seriously affected the reason, the faith, and the morals, of the Christians. Their credulity debased and vitiated the faculties of the mind, they corrupted the evidence of history, and superstition gradually extinguished the hostile light of philosophy and science. Every mode of religious worship which had been practiced by the saints, every mysterious doctrine which they believed, was fortified by the sanction of divine revelation. And all the manly virtues were oppressed by the servile and pusillanimous reign of the monks. 
if it be possible to measure the interval between the philosophic writings of Cicero and the sacred legend of Theodoret, between the character of Cato and that of Simeon. We may appreciate the memorable revolution which was accomplished in the Roman Empire within a period of 500 years. 2. The progress of Christianity has been marked by two glorious and decisive victories, over the learned and luxurious citizens of the Roman Empire. And over the warlike barbarians of Scythia and Germany, who subverted the empire, and embraced the religion, of the Romans. The Goths were the foremost of these savage proselytes. And the nation was indebted for its conversion to a countryman, or, at least, to a subject, worthy to be ranked among the inventors of useful arts, who have deserved the remembrance and gratitude of posterity. A great number of Roman provincials had been led away into captivity by the Gothic bands, who ravaged Asia in the time of Gallienus, and of these captives, many were Christians, and several belonged to the ecclesiastical order. Those involuntary missionaries, dispersed as slaves in the villages of Dacia, successively labored for the salvation of their masters. The seeds which they planted, of the evangelic doctrine, were gradually propagated. And before the end of a century, the pious work was achieved by the labors of Ulfilas, whose ancestors had been transported beyond the Danube from a small town of Cappadocia. Ulfilas, the bishop and apostle of the Goths, 4427 acquired their love and reverence by his blameless life and indefatigable zeal, and they received, with implicit confidence, the doctrines of truth and virtue which he preached and practiced. He executed the arduous task of translating the scriptures into their native tongue, a dialect of the German or Teutonic language. But he prudently suppressed the four books of kings, as they might tend to irritate the fierce and sanguinary spirit of the barbarians. The rude, imperfect idiom of soldiers and shepherds, so ill-qualified to communicate any spiritual ideas, was improved and modulated by his genius, and Ulfilas, before he could frame his version, was obliged to compose a new alphabet of twenty-four letters. 4428 4 of which he invented, to express the peculiar sounds that were unknown to the Greek and Latin pronunciation. 4429 But the prosperous state of the Gothic Church was soon afflicted by war and intestine discord, and the chieftains were divided by religion as well as by interest. Fritigern, the friend of the Romans, became the proselyte of Ulfilas. While the haughty soul of Athanaric disdained the yoke of the empire and of the gospel, the faith of the new converts was tried by the persecution which he excited. A wagon, bearing aloft the shapeless image of Thor, perhaps, or of Woden, was conducted in solemn procession through the streets of the camp. And the rebels, who refused to worship the god of their fathers, were immediately burnt, with their tents and families. The character of Ulfilas recommended him to the esteem of the eastern court, where he twice appeared as the minister of peace. He pleaded the cause of the distressed Goths, who implored the protection of Valens, and the name of Moses was applied to this spiritual guide, who conducted his people through the deep waters of the Danube to the land of promise. 4430 The devout shepherds, who were attached to his person, and tractable to his voice, acquiesced in their settlement, at the foot of the Mesian mountains, in a country of woodlands and pastures, which supported their flocks and herds and enabled them to purchase the corn and wine of the more plentiful provinces. These harmless barbarians multiplied in obscure peace and the profession of Christianity. 4431. Their fiercer brethren, the formidable Visigoths, universally adopted the religion of the Romans, with whom they maintained a perpetual intercourse, of war, of friendship, or of conquest. In their long and victorious march from the Danube to the Atlantic Ocean, they converted their allies, they educated the rising generation. And the devotion which reigned in the camp of Alaric, or the court of Thulaus, might edify or disgrace the palaces of Rome and Constantinople. 4432 During the same period, Christianity was embraced by almost all the barbarians, who established their kingdoms on the ruins of the Western Empire. The Burgundians in Gaul, the Suevi in Spain, the Vandals in Africa, the Ostrogoths in Pannonia, and the various bands of mercenaries, that raised Odoacer to the throne of Italy. The Franks and the Saxons still persevered in the errors of paganism. But the Franks obtained the monarchy of Gaul by their submission to the example of Clovis, 
and the Saxon conquerors of Britain were reclaimed from their savage superstition by the missionaries of Rome. These barbarian proselytes displayed an ardent and successful zeal in the propagation of the faith. The Merovingian kings, and their successors, Charlemagne and the Othos, extended, by their laws and victories, the dominion of the cross. England produced the Apostle of Germany, and the Evangelic light was gradually diffused from the neighborhood of the Rhine, to the nations of the Elba, the Vistula, and the Baltic. 4433 the different motives which influence the reason, or the passions, of the barbarian converts, cannot easily be ascertained. They were often capricious and accidental. A dream, an omen, the report of a miracle, the example of some priest, or hero, the charms of a believing wife, and, above all, the fortunate event of a prayer, or vow, which, in a moment of danger, they had addressed to the God of the Christians. 4434 The early prejudices of education were insensibly erased by the habits of frequent and familiar society, the moral precepts of the gospel were protected by the extravagant virtues of the monks. And the spiritual theology was supported by the visible power of relics, and the pomp of religious worship. But the rational and ingenious mode of persuasion, which a Saxon bishop 4435 suggested to a popular saint, might sometimes be employed by the missionaries, who labored for the conversion of infidels. Admit, says the sagacious disputant, whatever they are pleased to assert of the fabulous, and carnal, genealogy of their gods and goddesses, who are propagated from each other. From this principle deduce their imperfect nature, and human infirmities, the assurance they were born, and the probability that they will die. At what time, by what means, from what cause, were the eldest of the gods or goddesses produced? Do they still continue, or have they ceased, to propagate? If they have ceased, summon your antagonists to declare the reason of this strange alteration. If they still continue, the number of the gods must become infinite. And shall we not risk, by the indiscreet worship of some impotent deity, to excite the resentment of his jealous superior? The visible heavens and earth, the whole system of the universe, which may be conceived by the mind, is it created or eternal? If created, how, or where, could the gods themselves exist before creation? If eternal, how could they assume the empire of an independent and pre-existing world? Urge these arguments with temper and moderation. Insinuate, at seasonable intervals, the truth and beauty of the Christian revelation, and endeavor to make the unbelievers ashamed, without making them angry. This metaphysical reasoning, too refined, perhaps, for the barbarians of Germany, was fortified by the grosser weight of authority in popular consent. The advantage of temporal prosperity had deserted the pagan cause, and passed over to the service of Christianity. The Romans themselves, the most powerful and enlightened nation of the globe, had renounced their ancient superstition. And, if the ruin of their empire seemed to accuse the efficacy of the new faith, the disgrace was already retrieved by the conversion of the victorious Goths. The valiant and fortunate barbarians, who subdued the provinces of the West, successively received, and reflected, the same edifying example. Before the age of Charlemagne, the Christian nations of Europe might exult in the exclusive possession of the temperate climates, of the fertile lands, which produced corn, wine, and oil. While the savage idolaters, and their helpless idols, were confined to the extremities of the earth, the dark and frozen regions of the north. 4436. Christianity, which opened the gates of heaven to the barbarians, introduced an important change in their moral and political condition. They received, at the same time, the use of letters, so essential to a religion whose doctrines are contained in a sacred book. And while they studied the divine truth, their minds were insensibly enlarged by the distant view of history, of nature, of the arts, and of society. The version of the scriptures into their native tongue, which had facilitated their conversion, must excite among their clergy some curiosity to read the original text, to understand the sacred liturgy of the church, and to examine. In the writings of the fathers, the chain of ecclesiastical tradition. These spiritual gifts were preserved in the Greek and Latin languages, which concealed the inestimable monuments of ancient learning. The immortal productions of Virgil, Cicero, and Livy, 
which were accessible to the Christian barbarians, maintained a silent intercourse between the reign of Augustus and the times of Clovis and Charlemagne. The emulation of mankind was encouraged by the remembrance of a more perfect state, and the flame of science was secretly kept alive, to warm and enlighten the mature age of the Western world. In the most corrupt state of Christianity, the barbarians might learn justice from the law, and mercy from the gospel. And if the knowledge of their duty was insufficient to guide their actions, or to regulate their passions, they were sometimes restrained by conscience, and frequently punished by remorse. But the direct authority of religion was less effectual than the Holy Communion, which united them with their Christian brethren in spiritual friendship. The influence of these sentiments contributed to secure their fidelity in the service, or the alliance, of the Romans, to alleviate the horrors of war, to moderate the insolence of conquest, and to preserve, in the downfall of the empire, a permanent respect for the name and institutions of Rome. In the days of paganism, the priests of Gaul and Germany reigned over the people, and controlled the jurisdiction of the magistrates. And the zealous proselytes transferred an equal, or more ample, measure of devout obedience, to the pontiffs of the Christian faith. The sacred character of the bishops was supported by their temporal possessions. They obtained an honorable seat in the legislative assemblies of soldiers and freemen, and it was their interest, as well as their duty, to mollify, by peaceful counsels, the fierce spirit of the barbarians. The perpetual correspondence of the Latin clergy, the frequent pilgrimages to Rome and Jerusalem, and the growing authority of the popes, cemented the union of the Christian Republic, and gradually produced the similar manners. And common jurisprudence, which have distinguished, from the rest of mankind, the independent, and even hostile, nations of modern Europe. But the operation of these causes was checked and retarded by the unfortunate accident, which infused a deadly poison into the cup of salvation. Whatever might be the early sentiments of Ulfilas, his connections with the empire and the church were formed during the reign of Arianism. The Apostle of the Goths subscribed the Creed of Rimini. Professed with freedom, and perhaps with sincerity, that the Son was not equal, or consubstantial to the Father, 4437 communicated these errors to the clergy and people. And infected the barbaric world with a heresy 4438 which the great Theodosius proscribed and extinguished among the Romans. The temper and understanding of the new proselytes were not adapted to metaphysical subtleties. But they strenuously maintained, what they had piously received, as the pure and genuine doctrines of Christianity. The advantage of preaching and expounding the scriptures in the Teutonic language promoted the apostolic labors of Ulfilas and his successors, and they ordained a competent number of bishops and presbyters for the instruction of the kindred tribes. The Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Suevi, and the Vandals, who had listened to the eloquence of the Latin clergy, 4439 preferred the more intelligible lessons of their domestic teachers. And Arianism was adopted as the national faith of the warlike converts, who were seated on the ruins of the Western Empire. This irreconcilable difference of religion was a perpetual source of jealousy and hatred. And the reproach of barbarian was embittered by the more odious epithet of heretic. The heroes of the North, who had submitted, with some reluctance, to believe that all their ancestors were in hell, 4440 were astonished and exasperated to learn, that they themselves had only changed the mode of their eternal condemnation. Instead of the smooth applause, which Christian kings are accustomed to expect from their royal prelates, the Orthodox bishops and their clergy were in a state of opposition to the Arian courts. And their indiscreet opposition frequently became criminal, and might sometimes be dangerous. 4441 The pulpit, that safe and sacred organ of sedition, resounded with the names of Pharaoh and Holofernes. 4442 The public discontent was inflamed by the hope or promise of a glorious deliverance, and the seditious saints were tempted to promote the accomplishment of their own predictions. Notwithstanding these provocations, the Catholics of Gaul, Spain, and Italy, enjoyed, under the reign of the Arians, the free and peaceful exercise of their religion. Their haughty masters respected the zeal of a numerous people, resolved to die at the foot of their altars, and the example of their devout constancy was admired and imitated by the barbarians themselves. The conquerors evaded, however, 
the disgraceful reproach, or confession, of fear, by attributing their toleration to the liberal motives of reason and humanity. And while they affected the language, they imperceptibly imbibed the spirit, of genuine Christianity. The peace of the Church was sometimes interrupted. The Catholics were indiscreet, the barbarians were impatient. And the partial acts of severity or injustice, which had been recommended by the Arian clergy, were exaggerated by the Orthodox writers. The guilt of persecution may be imputed to Euric, king of the Visigoths, who suspended the exercise of ecclesiastical, or, at least, of episcopal functions, and punished the popular bishops of Aquitaine with imprisonment, exile, and confiscation. 4443 But the cruel and absurd enterprise of subduing the minds of a whole people was undertaken by the Vandals alone. Genseric himself, in his early youth, had renounced the Orthodox communion. And the apostate could neither grant, nor expect, a sincere forgiveness. He was exasperated to find that the Africans, who had fled before him in the field, still presumed to dispute his will in synods and churches. And his ferocious mind was incapable of fear or of compassion. His Catholic subjects were oppressed by intolerant laws and arbitrary punishments. The language of Genseric was furious and formidable. The knowledge of his intentions might justify the most unfavorable interpretation of his actions, and the Arians were reproached with the frequent executions which stained the palace and the dominions of the tyrant. Arms and ambition were, however, the ruling passions of the monarch of the sea. But Huneric, his inglorious son, who seemed to inherit only his vices, tormented the Catholics with the same unrelenting fury which had been fatal to his brother, his nephews, and the friends and favorites of his father. And even to the Arian patriarch, who was inhumanly burnt alive in the midst of Carthage. The religious war was preceded and prepared by an insidious truce, persecution was made the serious and important business of the Vandal court. And the loathsome disease which hastened the death of Huneric, revenged the injuries, without contributing to the deliverance, of the church. The throne of Africa was successively filled by the two nephews of Huneric. By Gundamund, who reigned about twelve, and by Thrasimund, who governed the nation about twenty-seven, years. Their administration was hostile and oppressive to the Orthodox party. Gundamund appeared to emulate, or even to surpass, the cruelty of his uncle, and, if at length he relented, if he recalled the bishops, and restored the freedom of Athanasian worship, a premature death intercepted the benefits of his tardy clemency. His brother, Thrasimund, was the greatest and most accomplished of the Vandal kings, whom he excelled in beauty, prudence, and magnanimity of soul. But this magnanimous character was degraded by his intolerant zeal and deceitful clemency. Instead of threats and tortures, he employed the gentle, but efficacious, powers of seduction. Wealth, dignity, and the royal favor, were the liberal rewards of apostasy. The Catholics, who had violated the laws, might purchase their pardon by the renunciation of their faith. And whenever Thrasimund meditated any rigorous measure, he patiently waited till the indiscretion of his adversaries furnished him with a specious opportunity. Bigotry was his last sentiment in the hour of death. And he exacted from his successor a solemn oath, that he would never tolerate the sectaries of Athanasius. But his successor, Hilderic, the gentle son of the savage Huneric, preferred the duties of humanity and justice to the vain obligation of an impious oath, and his accession was gloriously marked by the restoration of peace and universal freedom. The throne of that virtuous, though feeble monarch, was usurped by his cousin Gelimer, a zealous Arian, but the Vandal kingdom, before he could enjoy or abuse his power, was subverted by the arms of Belisarius. And the Orthodox party retaliated the injuries which they had endured. 4444. The passionate declamations of the Catholics, the sole historians of this persecution, cannot afford any distinct series of causes and events. Any impartial view of the characters, or councils, but the most remarkable circumstances that deserve either credit or notice, may be referred to the following heads, I. In the original law, which is still extant, 4445 Huneric expressly declares, and the declaration appears to be correct, that he had faithfully transcribed the regulations and penalties of the imperial edicts, against the heretical congregations. 
the clergy, and the people, who dissented from the established religion. If the rights of conscience had been understood, the Catholics must have condemned their past conduct or acquiesced in their actual suffering. But they still persisted to refuse the indulgence which they claimed. While they trembled under the lash of persecution, they praised the laudable severity of Hunneric himself, who burnt or banished great numbers of Manichaeans. 4446 And they rejected, with horror, the ignominious compromise, that the disciples of Arius and of Athanasius should enjoy a reciprocal and similar toleration in the territories of the Romans, and in those of the Vandals. 4447 2. The practice of a conference, which the Catholics had so frequently used to insult and punish their obstinate antagonists, was retorted against themselves. 4448 At the command of Hunneric, 466 Orthodox bishops assembled at Carthage, but when they were admitted into the hall of audience, they had the mortification of beholding the Arian Cyrilet exalted on the patriarchal throne. The disputants were separated after the mutual and ordinary reproaches of noise and silence, of delay and precipitation, of military force and of popular clamor. One martyr and one confessor were selected among the Catholic bishops. Twenty-eight escaped by flight, and eighty-eight by conformity, forty-six were sent into Corsica to cut timber for the Royal Navy. And three hundred and two were banished to the different parts of Africa, exposed to the insults of their enemies, and carefully deprived of all the temporal and spiritual comforts of life. 44-49 The hardships of ten years' exile must have reduced their numbers. And if they had complied with the law of Thrasimund, which prohibited any episcopal consecrations, the Orthodox Church of Africa must have expired with the lives of its actual members. They disobeyed, and their disobedience was punished by a second exile of 220 bishops into Sardinia where they languished fifteen years, till the accession of the gracious Hilderic. 4450 The two islands were judiciously chosen by the malice of their Arian tyrants. Seneca, from his own experience, has deplored and exaggerated the miserable state of Corsica 4451 and the plenty of Sardinia was overbalanced by the unwholesome quality of the air. 4452 -3. The zeal of Genseric and his successors, for the conversion of the Catholics, must have rendered them still more jealous to guard the purity of the Vandal faith. Before the churches were finally shut, it was a crime to appear in a barbarian dress. And those who presumed to neglect the royal mandate were rudely dragged backwards by their long hair. 4453 The Palatine officers, who refused to profess the religion of their prince, were ignominiously stripped of their honors and employments. Banished to Sardinia and Sicily, or condemned to the servile labors of slaves and peasants in the fields of Utica. In the districts which had been peculiarly allotted to the Vandals, the exercise of the Catholic worship was more strictly prohibited. And severe penalties were denounced against the guilt both of the missionary and the proselyte. By these arts, the faith of the barbarians was preserved, and their zeal was inflamed, they discharged, with devout fury, the office of spies, informers, or executioners. And whenever their cavalry took the field, it was the favorite amusement of the march to defile the churches, and to insult the clergy of the adverse faction. 4454 The citizens who had been educated in the luxury of the Roman province, were delivered, with exquisite cruelty, to the moors of the desert. A venerable train of bishops, presbyters, and deacons, with a faithful crowd of 4,096 persons, whose guilt is not precisely ascertained, were torn from their native homes, by the command of Hunneric. During the night they were confined, like a herd of cattle, amidst their own orger, during the day they pursued their march over the burning sands. And if they fainted under the heat and fatigue, they were goaded, or dragged along, till they expired in the hands of their tormentors. 4455 These unhappy exiles, when they reached the Moorish huts, might excite the compassion of a people, whose native humanity was neither improved by reason, nor corrupted by fanaticism, but if they escaped the dangers. They were condemned to share the distress of a savage life. v. It is incumbent on the authors of persecution previously to reflect, whether they are determined to support it in the last extreme. They excite the flame which they strive to extinguish. And it soon becomes necessary to chastise the contumacy, as well as the crime, of the offender. 
The fine, which he is unable or unwilling to discharge, exposes his person to the severity of the law. And his contempt of lighter penalties suggests the use and propriety of capital punishment. Through the veil of fiction and declamation we may clearly perceive, that the Catholics more especially under the reign of Hanaric, endured the most cruel and ignominious treatment. 4456 respectable citizens, noble matrons, and consecrated virgins, were stripped naked, and raised in the air by pulleys, with a weight suspended at their feet. In this painful attitude their naked bodies were torn with scourges, or burnt in the most tender parts with red-hot plates of iron. The amputation of the ears the nose, the tongue, and the right hand, was inflicted by the Arians. And although the precise number cannot be defined, it is evident that many persons, among whom a bishop 4457 and a proconsul 4458 may be named, were entitled to the crown of martyrdom. The same honor has been ascribed to the memory of Count Sebastian, who professed the Nicene Creed with unshaken constancy, and Genseric might detest, as a heretic, the brave and ambitious fugitive whom he dreaded as a rival. 4459 A new mode of conversion, which might subdue the feeble and alarm the timorous, was employed by the Arian ministers. They imposed, by fraud or violence, the rites of baptism and punished the apostasy of the Catholics, if they disclaimed this odious and profane ceremony, which scandalously violated the freedom of the will, and the unity of the sacrament. 4460 The hostile sects had formerly allowed the validity of each other's baptism, and the innovation, so fiercely maintained by the Vandals, can be imputed only to the example and advice of the Donatists. 7. The Arian clergy surpassed in religious cruelty the king and his Vandals, but they were incapable of cultivating the spiritual vineyard, which they were so desirous to possess. A patriarch 4461 might seat himself on the throne of Carthage. Some bishops, in the principal cities, might usurp the place of their rivals, but the smallness of their numbers, and their ignorance of the Latin language 4462 disqualified the barbarians for the ecclesiastical ministry of a great church. And the Africans, after the loss of their orthodox pastors, were deprived of the public exercise of Christianity. 8. The emperors were the natural protectors of the Homoousian doctrine. And the faithful people of Africa, both as Romans and as Catholics, preferred their lawful sovereignty to the usurpation of the barbarous heretics. During an interval of peace and friendship, Hanaric restored the cathedral of Carthage. At the intercession of Zeno, who reigned in the east, and of Placidia, the daughter and relict of emperors, and the sister of the queen of the Vandals. 4463 But this decent regard was of short duration. And the haughty tyrant displayed his contempt for the religion of the empire, by studiously arranging the bloody images of persecution, in all the principal streets through which the Roman ambassador must pass in his way to the palace. 4464 An oath was required from the bishops, who were assembled at Carthage, that they would support the succession of his son Hilderic, and that they would renounce all foreign or transmarine correspondence. This engagement, consistent, as it should seem, with their moral and religious duties, was refused by the more sagacious members 4465 of the assembly. Their refusal, faintly colored by the pretense that it is unlawful for a Christian to swear, must provoke the suspicions of a jealous tyrant. The Catholics, oppressed by royal and military force, were far superior to their adversaries in numbers and learning. With the same weapons which the Greek 4466 and Latin fathers had already provided for the Arian controversy, they repeatedly silenced, or vanquished, the fierce and illiterate successors of Ophelas. The consciousness of their own superiority might have raised them above the arts and passions of religious warfare. Yet, instead of assuming such honorable pride, the orthodox theologians were tempted, by the assurance of impunity, to compose fictions, which must be stigmatized with the epithets of fraud and forgery. They ascribed their own polemical works to the most venerable names of Christian antiquity, the characters of Athanasius and Augustine were awkwardly personated by Vigilius and his disciples. 4467 In the famous Creed, which so clearly expounds the mysteries of the Trinity in the Incarnation, is deduced, with strong probability, from this African school. 4468 Even the scriptures themselves were profaned by their rash and sacrilegious hands. 
The memorable text, which asserts the unity of the three who bear witness in heaven, 4469 is condemned by the universal silence of the Orthodox Fathers, ancient versions, and authentic manuscripts. 4470 It was first alleged by the Catholic bishops whom Huneric summoned to the Conference of Carthage. 4471 An allegorical interpretation, in the form, perhaps, of a marginal note, invaded the text of the Latin Bibles, which were renewed and corrected in a dark period of ten centuries. 4472 After the invention of printing, 4473 The editors of the Greek Testament yielded to their own prejudices, or those of the times. 4474 And the pious fraud, which was embraced with equal zeal at Rome and at Geneva, has been infinitely multiplied in every country and every language of modern Europe. The example of fraud must excite suspicion, and the specious miracles by which the African Catholics have defended the truth and justice of their cause, may be ascribed, with more reason, to their own industry. Then to the visible protection of heaven. Yet the historian, who views this religious conflict with an impartial eye, may condescend to mention one preternatural event, which will edify the devout and surprise the incredulous. Tip Asa, 4475 A maritime colony of Mauritania, 16 miles to the east of Caesarea, had been distinguished, in every age, by the orthodox zeal of its inhabitants. They had braved the fury of the Donatists. 4476 They resisted, or eluded, the tyranny of the Arians. The town was deserted on the approach of an heretical bishop most of the inhabitants who could procure ships passed over to the coast of Spain. And the unhappy remnant, refusing all communion with the usurper, still presumed to hold their pious, but illegal, assemblies. Their disobedience exasperated the cruelty of Huneric. A military count was dispatched from Carthage to Tipesa, he collected the Catholics in the Forum, and, in the presence of the whole province, deprived the guilty of their right hands and their tongues. But the holy confessors continued to speak without tongues, and this miracle is attested by Victor, an African bishop, who published a history of the persecution within two years after the event. 4477 If any one, says Victor, should doubt of the truth, let him repair to Constantinople, and listen to the clear and perfect language of Restitutus, the subdeacon, one of these glorious sufferers. Who is now lodged in the palace of the Emperor Zeno, and is respected by the devout empress. At Constantinople we are astonished to find a cool, a learned, and unexceptionable witness, without interest, and without passion. Aeneas of Gaza, a Platonic philosopher, has accurately described his own observations on these African sufferers. I saw them myself, I heard them speak, I diligently inquired by what means such an articulate voice could be formed without any organ of speech, I used my eyes to examine the report of my ears. I opened their mouth, and saw that the whole tongue had been completely torn away by the roots, an operation which the physicians generally supposed to be mortal. 4478 The testimony of Aeneas of Gaza might be confirmed by the superfluous evidence of the Emperor Justinian, in a perpetual edict, of Count Marcellinus, in his Chronicle of the Times. And of Pope Gregory I, who had resided at Constantinople, as the minister of the Roman pontiff. 4479 They all lived within the compass of a century. And they all appealed to their personal knowledge, or the public notoriety, for the truth of a miracle, which was repeated in several instances, displayed on the greatest theatre of the world, and submitted, during a series of years. To the calm examination of the senses. This supernatural gift of the African confessors, who spoke without tongues, will command the assent of those, and of those only, who already believe, that their language was pure and orthodox. But the stubborn mind of an infidel, is guarded by secret, incurable suspicion, and the Arian, or Sicinian, who has seriously rejected the doctrine of a trinity, will not be shaken by the most plausible evidence of an Athanasian miracle. The Vandals and the Ostrogoths persevered in the profession of Arianism till the final ruin of the kingdoms which they had founded in Africa and Italy. The barbarians of Gaul submitted to the orthodox dominion of the Franks. And Spain was restored to the Catholic Church by the voluntary conversion of the Visigoths. This salutary revolution 4480 was hastened by the example of a royal martyr, whom our calmer reason may style an ungrateful rebel. 
Leovigild, the Gothic monarch of Spain, deserved the respect of his enemies, and the love of his subjects. The Catholics enjoyed a free toleration, and his Arian synods attempted, without much success, to reconcile their scruples by abolishing the unpopular rite of a second baptism. His eldest son Hermenegild, who was invested by his father with the royal diadem, and the fair principality of Boetica, contracted an honorable and orthodox alliance with a Merovingian princess, the daughter of Sigibert, king of Austrasia, and of the famous Brunchild. The beauteous Ingundis, who was no more than thirteen years of age, was received, beloved, and persecuted, in the Arian court of Toledo. And her religious constancy was alternately assaulted with blandishments and violence by Goisvinta, the Gothic queen, who abused the double claim of maternal authority. 4481 Incensed by her resistance, Goisvinta seized the Catholic princess by her long hair, inhumanly dashed her against the ground, kicked her till she was covered with blood, and at last gave orders that she should be stripped and thrown into a basin, or fish pond. 4482 Love and honor might excite Hermenegild to resent this injurious treatment of his bride, and he was gradually persuaded that Ingundi suffered for the cause of divine truth. Her tender complaints, and the weighty arguments of Leander, Archbishop of Seville, accomplished his conversion and the heir of the Gothic monarchy was initiated in the Nicene faith by the solemn rites of confirmation. 4483 The rash youth, inflamed by zeal, and perhaps by ambition, was tempted to violate the duties of a son and a subject. And the Catholics of Spain, although they could not complain of persecution, applauded his pious rebellion against an heretical father. The civil war was protracted by the long and obstinate sieges of Merida, Cordova, and Seville, which had strenuously espoused the party of Hermenegild. He invited the Orthodox barbarians, the Suvi, and the Franks, to the destruction of his native land, he solicited the dangerous aid of the Romans, who possessed Africa, and a part of the Spanish coast. And his holy ambassador, the Archbishop Leander, effectually negotiated in person with the Byzantine court. But the hopes of the Catholics were crushed by the active diligence of the monarch who commanded the troops and treasures of Spain. And the guilty Hermenegild, after his vain attempts to resist or to escape, was compelled to surrender himself into the hands of an incensed father. Leavagild was still mindful of that sacred character. And the rebel, despoiled of the regal ornaments, was still permitted, in a decent exile, to profess the Catholic religion. His repeated and unsuccessful treasons at length provoked the indignation of the Gothic king. And the sentence of death, which he pronounced with apparent reluctance, was privately executed in the Tower of Seville. The inflexible constancy with which he refused to accept the Arian communion, as the price of his safety, may excuse the honours that have been paid to the memory of Saint Hermenegild. His wife and infant son were detained by the Romans in ignominious captivity, and this domestic misfortune tarnished the glories of Leavigild, and embittered the last moments of his life. His son and successor, Recard, the first Catholic king of Spain, had imbibed the faith of his unfortunate brother, which he supported with more prudence and success. Instead of revolting against his father, Recard patiently expected the hour of his death. Instead of condemning his memory, he piously supposed, that the dying monarch had abjured the errors of Arianism, and recommended to his son the conversion of the Gothic nation. To accomplish that salutary end, Recard convened an assembly of the Arian clergy and nobles, declared himself a Catholic, and exhorted them to imitate the example of their prince. The laborious interpretation of doubtful texts, or the curious pursuit of metaphysical arguments, would have excited an endless controversy. And the monarch discreetly proposed to his illiterate audience two substantial and visible arguments, the testimony of earth, and of heaven. The earth had submitted to the Nicene Synod, the Romans, the barbarians, and the inhabitants of Spain, unanimously professed the same orthodox creed, and the Visigoths resisted, almost alone, the consent of the Christian world. A superstitious age was prepared to reverence, as the testimony of heaven, the preternatural cures, which were performed by the skill or virtue of the Catholic clergy. The baptismal fonts of Osset in Boetica, 4484 which were spontaneously replenished every year, on the vigil of Easter, 
4485 and the miraculous shrine of St. Martin of Tours, which had already converted the Suvic prince and people of Galicia. 4486 The Catholic king encountered some difficulties on this important change of the national religion. A conspiracy, secretly fomented by the Queen Dowager, was formed against his life. And two counts excited a dangerous revolt in the Narbonese Gaul. But Recard disarmed the conspirators, defeated the rebels, and executed severe justice, which the Arians, in their turn, might brand with the reproach of persecution. Eight bishops, whose names betray their barbaric origin, abjured their errors, and all the books of Arian theology were reduced to ashes, with the house in which they had been purposely collected. The whole body of the Visigoths and Suevi were allured or driven into the pale of the Catholic communion. The faith, at least of the rising generation, was fervent and sincere, and the devout liberality of the barbarians enriched the churches and monasteries of Spain. Seventy bishops, assembled in the Council of Toledo, received the submission of their conquerors, and the zeal of the Spaniards improved the Nicene Creed, by declaring the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Son, as well as from the Father. A weighty point of doctrine, which produced, long afterwards, the schism of the Greek and Latin churches. 4487 The royal proselyte immediately saluted and consulted Pope Gregory, surnamed the Great, a learned and holy prelate, whose reign was distinguished by the conversion of heretics and infidels. The ambassadors of Record respectfully offered on the threshold of the Vatican his rich presents of gold and gems, they accepted, as a lucrative exchange, the hairs of St. John the Baptist, a cross, which enclosed a small piece of the true wood. And a key, that contained some particles of iron which had been scraped from the chains of St. Peter. 4488. The same Gregory, the spiritual conqueror of Britain, encouraged the pious Theodolinda, queen of the Lombards, to propagate the Nicene faith among the victorious savages, whose recent Christianity was polluted by the Arian heresy. Her devout labors still left room for the industry and success of future missionaries, and many cities of Italy were still disputed by hostile bishops. But the cause of Arianism was gradually suppressed by the weight of truth, of interest, and of example. And the controversy, which Egypt had derived from the Platonic school, was terminated, after a war of three hundred years, by the final conversion of the Lombards of Italy. 4489 The first missionaries who preached the gospel to the barbarians, appealed to the evidence of reason, and claimed the benefit of toleration. 4490 But no sooner had they established their spiritual dominion, than they exhorted the Christian kings to extirpate, without mercy, the remains of Roman or barbaric superstition. The successors of Clovis inflicted one hundred lashes on the peasants who refused to destroy their idols, the crime of sacrificing to the demons was punished by the Anglo-Saxon laws with the heavier penalties of imprisonment and confiscation. And even the wise Alfred adopted, as an indispensable duty, the extreme rigor of the Mosaic institutions. 4491 But the punishment and the crime were gradually abolished among a Christian people. The theological disputes of the schools were suspended by propitious ignorance, and the intolerant spirit which could find neither idolaters nor heretics, was reduced to the persecution of the Jews. That exiled nation had founded some synagogues in the cities of Gaul, but Spain, since the time of Hadrian, was filled with their numerous colonies. 4492 The wealth which they accumulated by trade, and the management of the finances, invited the pious avarice of their masters, and they might be oppressed without danger, as they had lost the use, and even the remembrance, of arms. Seisbut, a Gothic king, who reigned in the beginning of the 7th century, proceeded at once to the last extremes of persecution. 4493 90,000 Jews were compelled to receive the sacrament of baptism. The fortunes of the obstinate infidels were confiscated, their bodies were tortured, and it seems doubtful whether they were permitted to abandon their native country. The excessive zeal of the Catholic king was moderated, even by the clergy of Spain, who solemnly pronounced an inconsistent sentence, that the sacraments should not be forcibly imposed. But that the Jews who had been baptized should be constrained, for the honor of the Church, to persevere in the external practice of a religion which they disbelieved and detested. Their frequent relapses provoked one of the successors of Seisput to banish the whole nation from his dominions, 
and a council of Toledo published a decree, that every Gothic king should swear to maintain this salutary edict. But the tyrants were unwilling to dismiss the victims, whom they delighted to torture, or to deprive themselves of the industrious slaves, over whom they might exercise a lucrative oppression. The Jews still continued in Spain, under the weight of the civil and ecclesiastical laws, which in the same country have been faithfully transcribed in the Code of the Inquisition. The Gothic kings and bishops at length discovered, that injuries will produce hatred, and that hatred will find the opportunity of revenge. A nation, the secret or professed enemies of Christianity, still multiplied in servitude and distress. And the intrigues of the Jews promoted the rapid success of the Arabian conquerors. 4494. As soon as the barbarians withdrew their powerful support, the unpopular heresy of Arius sunk into contempt and oblivion. But the Greeks still retained their subtle and loquacious disposition, the establishment of an obscure doctrine suggested new questions, and new disputes. And it was always in the power of an ambitious prelate, or a fanatic monk, to violate the peace of the church, and, perhaps, of the empire. The historian of the empire may overlook those disputes which were confined to the obscurity of schools and synods. The Manichaeans, who labored to reconcile the religions of Christ and of Zoroaster, had secretly introduced themselves into the provinces, but these foreign sectaries were involved in the common disgrace of the Gnostics. And the imperial laws were executed by the public hatred. The rational opinions of the Pelagians were propagated from Britain to Rome, Africa, and Palestine, and silently expired in a superstitious age. But the East was distracted by the Nestorian and Eutychian controversies, which attempted to explain the mystery of the Incarnation, and hastened the ruin of Christianity in her native land. These controversies were first agitated under the reign of the younger Theodosius, but their important consequences extend far beyond the limits of the present volume. The metaphysical chain of argument, the contests of ecclesiastical ambition, and their political influence on the decline of the Byzantine Empire, may afford an interesting and instructive series of history. From the general councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon, to the conquest of the East by the successors of Muhammad.